Talmud, Masya Bamath A C H A P T E R I Mishnah 15 categories of women exempt their rivals and the rivals of their rivals and so on ad infinitum from the Halizah and from the Levi marriage and these are they his daughter, the daughter of his daughter, and the daughter of his son, the daughter of his wife, the daughter of her son, and the daughter of her daughter, his mother-in-law, his mother-in-law's mother, and his father-in-law's mother, his maternal sister, his mother's sister, his wife's sister, and his maternal brother's wife, Talmud, Masya Bamath be the wife of his brother who was not his contemporary and his daughter-in-law, all these exempt their rivals and the rivals of their rivals, and so on ad infinitum from the Halizah and from the Levi marriage. If however any among these died or made a declaration of refusal or were divorced or were found incapable of procreation, their rivals are permitted, though of course one cannot say of a man's mother-in-law the mother of his mother-in-law and of the mother of his father-in-law that they were found incapable of procreation or that they made a declaration of refusal how is the exemption of their rivals by the women mentioned to be understood if a man's daughter or any other of these forbidden relatives was married to his brother who had also another wife at the time when he died then as his daughter is exempt so is her rival exempt if his daughter's rival went and married a second brother of his who also had yet another wife when he died then as the rival of his daughter is exempt so is also his daughter's rival's rival exempt even if there were a hundred brothers how is one to understand the statement that if they had died their rivals are permitted if a man's daughter or any other of these forbidden relatives was married to his brother who had also another wife then if his daughter died or was divorced and his brother died subsequently her rival is permitted the rival of anyone who is entitled to make a declaration of refusal but did not exercise her right must perform Halizah if her husband died childless and may not contract leave our marriage Gemara consider all these are deduced from the exemption of a wife's sister why then was not his wife's sister mentioned first and if it be replied that the Tana enumerated the forbidden relatives in the order of the degrees of their respective severity and that in our mission represents the view of our Simeon who regards burning as the severest it may be retorted that if that is the case his mother-in-law should have been mentioned first since scripture enunciated the principle of burning in the case of a mother-in-law and furthermore his daughter-in-law should have come immediately after his mother-in-law since next to burning stoning is the severest penalty but this in fact is the proper reply since the prohibition of intercourse with his daughter has been arrived at by exposition it is given preference Talmud. Masya Bamathay the law surely concerning all the others also was arrived at by exposition granted that in respect of exemption from the Levi marriage the law in relation to them was arrived at by exposition the principle of prohibition of sexual intercourse with them has been explicitly enunciated in scripture while as regards his daughter the very principle underlying the prohibition of intercourse with her has been arrived at by exposition for Rabba stated our Isaac be of Dimi. Told me Hena is derived from Hena and Sima is derived from Sima now that it has been stated that preference is given to whatever is arrived at by exposition the Tana should have placed his wife's sister last as he was dealing with the prohibition due to sisterhood he mentioned also his wife's sister then let him relegate the entire passage to the end but this is really the explanation the Tana follows the order of the respective degrees of kinship he therefore mentions first his daughter the daughter of his daughter and the daughter of his son because they are his own next of kin and since he enumerated three generations of his relatives in descending order he enumerated also three generations of her relatives in descending order having enumerated three generations of her relatives in descending order he proceeded to enumerate also three generations of her relatives in ascending order he then mentions his sister and his mother's sister who are his blood relatives and while dealing with prohibitions due to brotherhood he also mentions his wife's sister and it would indeed have been proper that his daughter-in-law should be placed before the wife of his brother who was not his contemporary since it is not on account of kinship that the latter is forbidden but as he was dealing with the prohibition due to brotherhood he mentioned also the wife of his brother who was not his contemporary and then mentioned his daughter-in-law what argument can be advanced for Using the expression exempt and not that a prohibit if prohibit had been used it might have been assumed that the Levi marriage only was forbidden but that Eliza must nevertheless be performed hence it was taught that Eliza also need not be performed let it then be stated she is forbidden to perform Eliza no harm surely is thereby done but why indeed should not the expression of prohibition be applicable to Eliza if you were to say that Eliza is permissible one might say that Levi marriage is also permitted as a rival is forbidden only where the commandment of the Levi marriage is applicable but is permitted where the commandment is not applicable it was therefore necessary to use the expression exempt what justification is there for stating from the Eliza and from the Levi marriage when it would have been sufficient to state from the Levi marriage only if from the Levi marriage only had been stated it might have been assumed that she must perform Eliza though she is exempt from the Levirate marriage hence it was taught that whoever is subject to the obligation of Levirate marriage is also subject to Eliza and whosoever is not subject to the obligation of the Levirate marriage is not subject to Eliza let it first be stated from the Levirate marriage and then from the Eliza or else only from the Eliza this mission represents the view of Abbasal who maintains that the commandment of Eliza takes precedence over that of Levirate marriage what was intended to be excluded by the numeral at the beginning and what again was intended to be excluded by the numeral at the end Talmud, Masya Bamathi they were intended to exclude the respective rulings of Rab and RC what however do the numerals exclude according to Rab and RC if they share each other's views one numeral would serve to exclude the rival of one who made a declaration of refusal and the other to exclude the rival of a Wife whom her husband remarried after having divorced her if they do not share the views of each other each would regard one numeral as serving to exclude the ruling of his colleague and the other numeral as serving to exclude either the rival of one who made a declaration of refusal or the rival of a wife whom her husband remarried after having divorced her according to Rab and RC these should have been enumerated in our mission this could not be done because the law of it. Rival's rival is not applicable to these cases whence is this law derived from what our rabbis taught and thou shalt not take a woman to her sister to be a rival to her to uncover her nakedness Allah beside her in her lifetime what need was there for the expression Allah because it was stated her husband's brother shall go in Allah unto her it might have been imagined that scripture speaks even of any of all the forbidden relatives enumerated in the Torah hence it was here stated Allah. And elsewhere it was also stated Allah just as elsewhere it is in the case of a precept so here also it is in the case of a precept and yet did not the all merciful say thou shalt not take we are thus in a position to know the law concerning herself whence do we derive the law concerning her rival from the scriptural expression to be a rival to her we have so far deduced the law concerning her rival only whence do we arrive at the law concerning her rival's rival from the fact that scripture uses the expression lezerer and not that of Lazar thus we have deduced the law concerning a wife's sister whence is the law concerning the other forbidden relatives to be inferred it can be answered as a wife's sister is singled out and that she is a forbidden relative the penalty for presumptuous intercourse with her is karat and for unwitting intercourse is an offering and she is forbidden to the lover so also any woman who is a forbidden relative and the penalty for presumptuous Intercourse with whom is Karat and for unwitting intercourse a sin offering is forbidden to the lover. Now we know the law concerning themselves only whence is the law concerning their rivals deduced. It may be answered as a wife's sister is singled out and that she is a forbidden relative. Karat is incurred by presumptuous intercourse with her and a sin offering for unwitting intercourse and she is forbidden to the lover and her rival is forbidden. So also in the case of any woman who is a forbidden relative and for presumptuous intercourse with whom is incurred the penalty of Karat and for unwitting intercourse a sin offering and who is forbidden to the lover her rival is forbidden. Hence have the sages said 15 categories of women exempt their rivals and their rivals' rivals and so on ad infinitum from the Halizah and from the Levi right marriage. One might assume that the six more rigidly forbidden relatives are also included in the ruling so that their rivals also are. Forbidden hence it must be stated as a wife's sister is singled out in that she is a forbidden relative Karath is incurred for presumptuous intercourse with her and a sin offering for unwitting intercourse she may be married to the other brothers but is forbidden to the lover and her rival is forbidden so also in the case of any woman who is a forbidden relative for presumptuous intercourse with whom is incurred the penalty of Karath and for unwitting intercourse a sin offering who may marry
supersede even a mere prohibition Talmud, Masya Bamatha, because it is written, Thou shalt not wear a mingled stuff, thou shalt make the twisted cords and our Eliezer said, Whence is the rule of proximity of texts derived from the Torah as it is said, they are established forever and ever, they are done in truth and uprightness. Furthermore, our she's hate stated in the name of our Eliezer who stated it in the name of our Eliezer B. Ezra, whence is it proved that a sister in law who falls to the lot of a lover who is afflicted with boils is not muzzled from the biblical text, thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the corn and in close proximity to it is written, if brethren dwell together. Furthermore, our Joseph said, even he who does not base interpretations on the proximity of biblical text anywhere else does base them on the text in Deuteronomy for our Judah who does not elsewhere base any interpretations on textual proximity bases such interpretations on the Deuteronomy. Text and whence is it proved that elsewhere he does not advance such interpretation from what has been taught? Ben Isaiah said it was stated, Thou shalt not suffer a sorceress to live, and it is also stated, Whosoever lieth with a beast shall surely be put to death. One subject was placed near the other to indicate that as a man who lies with a beast is to suffer the death penalty of stoning, so also is a sorceress to suffer the death penalty of stoning. Said our Judah to him, Shall we because one subject was placed in close proximity to the other lead out a person to be stoned? In truth, the penalty of the sorceress is derived from the following the necromancer and the charmer were included among the sorcerers. Why then were they mentioned separately in order that the others may be compared to them and to tell you that as the necromancer and the charmer are subject to the death penalty of stoning, so is a sorceress also subject to the penalty of stoning, and whence is it proved that in Deuteronomy he does advance such interpretation from what we learned a man may marry a woman who has been outraged or seduced by his father or his son our Judah prohibits in the case of a woman outraged or seduced by one's father and in connection with this argument said in the name of Rab what is our Judah's reason because it is written a man shall not take his father's wife and shall not uncover his father's skirt the skirt which his father saw he shall not uncover and whence is it inferred that this is written with reference to an outraged woman from the preceding section of the text where it is written and the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver near which it is stated a man shall not take etc and the rabbis if one text had occurred in close proximity to the other the exposition would have been justified now however that it does not occur in close proximity it must be concluded that the context speaks of a woman who is awaiting it Decision of the lover and that in marrying such a woman a son transgresses two negative precepts and what is the reason why our Judah derives laws from the proximity of text in Deuteronomy if you wish I might say because there the deduction is obvious and if you prefer I might say because there the text is superfluous if you prefer I might say because there the deduction is obvious for otherwise the all merciful should have written the prohibition in the section of forbidden relatives and if you prefer I might say because there the text is superfluous for otherwise the all merciful should have written a man shall not take his father's wife what need was there for adding and shall not uncover his father's skirt Talmud Masya Bamath hence it must be concluded that the text was meant to provide a superfluous text similarly in the case of Ksitsis if you wish I might reply because there the deduction is obvious and if you prefer I might reply because there the Text is superfluous if you prefer I might say because there the deduction is obvious for otherwise the all merciful should have written the precept in the section of Ksitsis with what other practical rule in view has he written it here and if you prefer I might reply because there the text is superfluous for observe it is written neither shall there come upon the garment of two kinds of stuff mingled together what need then was there for stating thou shalt not wear a mingled stuff. Hence it must be concluded that the object was to provide a superfluous text but surely both these texts are required for if the all merciful had only written neither shall there come upon the it might have been assumed that all kinds of putting on were forbidden by the all merciful even that of clothes dealers hence the all merciful has written thou shalt not wear a mingled stuff showing that the putting on must be of the same nature as that of wearing for personal comfort and if the all Merciful had only written thou shalt not wear it might have been assumed that only wear is forbidden because the pleasure derived therefrom is great but not mere putting on hence the all merciful has written neither shall there come upon the if so the all merciful should have written thou shalt not wear a mingled stuff what need was there for adding wool and linen for observe it is written neither shall there come upon the a garment of two kinds of stuff mingled together and in connection with this atana of the school of our Ishmael taught whereas garments generally were mentioned in the Torah and in one particular case scripture specified wool and linen all must consequently be understood as having been made of wool and linen what need then was there for the all merciful specific mention of wool and linen consequently it must be concluded that its object was to provide a superfluous text but the text is still required for another purpose for it might have been assumed that the limitation applies only to putting on where the benefit is not great, but that in respect of where the benefit from which is great, any two kinds were forbidden by the all merciful. Hence, has the all merciful written wool and linen. If so, scripture should have omitted it altogether, and the law would have been deduced by analogy between mingled stuff and mingled stuff. The latter of which occurs in connection with the law of putting on as to the tana of the school of our Ishmael is the reason why mingled stuff is permitted in Ksitsis because the all merciful has written wool and linen. But if he had not done so, would it have been assumed that the all merciful had forbidden two kinds of stuff in the Ksitsis? But surely it is written, and they shall make them fringes in the corners of their garments. And the of the school of our Ishmael taught wherever garment is written, such as is made of wool or flax, is meant. And yet the all merciful said that in them purple shall be. Inserted and purple surely is wool and whence is it deduced that purple is wool since linen is flax purple must be wool the text was necessary for it might have been assumed that the interpretation is according to Rabba for Rabba pointed out a contradiction it is written the corner which implies that the fringes must be of the same kind of material as that of the corner but then it is also written wool and linen how then are these texts to be reconciled wool and linen discharge the obligation to provide fringes both for a garment of the same as well as of a different kind of material while other kinds of material discharge the obligation for a garment made of the same kind of material but not for one made of a different kind of material but the tana of the school of our Ishmael surely does not hold the same view as Rabba the text is still necessary for it might have been assumed that Rabba's line of argument should be followed the corner implies that the fringes must be made of the same kind of material as the corner and then what the all merciful meant was this make wool fringes for wool garments and linen ones for linen only when you make wool fringes for wool garments you must dye them but no wool fringes may be made for linen or linen fringes for wool hence the all merciful has written wool and linen to indicate that even wool fringes may be made for linen garments or linen fringes for woolen garments Talmud, Masya Bamatha this is satisfactory according to the view of the Tana of the school of our Ishmael as to the rabbis however how do they arrive at the deduction they derive it from his head for it was taught scripture stated his head what need was there for it whereas it has been stated ye shall not round the corners of your head one might infer that this law applies to a leper also hence it was explicitly stated his head and this Tana is of the opinion that rounding all the head is also regarded as rounding this conclusion however may be refuted the reason why the prohibition of rounding may be superseded is because it is not applicable to everybody but the inference is derived from his beard as it was taught his beard what need was there for stating it whereas it was said neither shall they shave off the corners of their beard one might infer that this prohibition applies also to a leper's priest hence it was explicitly stated his beard and since there is no object in applying it to a prohibition which is not incumbent upon everybody let it be applied to a prohibition which is incumbent upon all but this is still required for its own context for since it might have been assumed that as priests are different from other people scripture having imposed upon them additional commandments and so even a prohibition which does not apply to everybody is not superseded in their case therefore it was necessary to teach us that it does supersede in truth the inference comes from his head in the manner deduced by the following tana for it was taught his head what need was there for mentioning it whereas scripture had stated there shall no razor come upon his head one might infer that the same prohibition is applicable to a leper's Nazirite also hence it was explicitly stated his head this however may be refuted the reason why a leper's Nazirite may shave his head is because he is also in a position to obtain absolution for were not this the reason what then of the accepted rule that no positive precept may
Threads are to hang down if so scripture should have stated thou shalt not wear a mingled stuff wool and linen what need was there to add together consequently it must have been intended for the purpose of allowing a free text for the deduction but this text too is required for the deduction that two stitches form a combination and that one stitch does not if so the all merciful should have written thou shalt not wear wool and linen together what need was there for inserting mingled stuff. Hence it must be concluded that the purpose was to allow a free text for deduction but is not this text still required for the deduction that mingled stuff is not forbidden unless it was hackled spun and twisted but the fact is that all this is deduced from the expression of mingled stuff so far it has been shown that a positive precept supersedes a mere prohibition where however do we find that it supersedes also a prohibition involving karat and that in consequence the explicit expression Allah should be required to forbid it and if it be replied that this might be deduced from circumcision it may be retorted circumcision stands in a different category for concerning it thirteen covenants were made from the paschal lamb the paschal lamb also stands in a different category since it too involves karat from the daily offering the daily offering also stands in a different category since it is also a regular offering now though it cannot be derived from one it might be derived from two from which shall it be derived if the reply is let it be derived from circumcision and the paschal lamb it may be retorted these also involve karat from the paschal lamb and the daily offering both are also intended for the most high from circumcision and the daily offering both were also enforced before the giving of the law this being according to the view of him who holds that the burnt offering which Israel offered in the wilderness was the daily burnt offering nor can the derivation be made from all of them since they were all enforced before the giving of the law but this is the reason for the need of a special text it might have been assumed that this should be derived from the precept of honoring one's father and mother for it was taught since one might have assumed that the honoring of one's father and mother should supersede the sabbath it was explicitly stated ye shall fear every man his mother and his father and ye shall keep my Sabbaths it is the duty of all of you to honor me now is not the case in point one where the parent said to him slaughter for me or cook for me and the reason why the parent must not be obeyed is because the all merciful has written ye shall keep my sabbaths but had that not been so it would have superseded no talmud masi of talmud masi of this is a case of striving and you say that it does not supersede even in such a case but then what of the generally accepted rule that a positive precept supersedes a prohibition should it not be inferred from this case that it does not supersede and if it be replied that the prohibitions of the sabbath are different because they are more stringent surely the following tenet may be pointed out speaks of prohibitions generally yet no one advances any objection for it was taught since it might have been assumed that if his father had said to him defile yourself or if he said to him do not restore he must obey him it was explicitly stated ye shall fear every man his mother and his father and ye shall keep my sabbaths it is the duty of all of you to honor me the real reason is because this objection may be advanced those are in a different category since they are also essentials in the execution of the precept but the reason is because it might have been assumed that this should be derived from the precept of the building of the sanctuary for it was taught since it might have been assumed that the Building of the sanctuary should supersede the Sabbath. It was explicitly stated, Ye shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. It is the duty of all of you to honor me now is not the case in point one of the Father's order to his son to build or to demolish, and yet the reason why it does not supersede the Sabbath is because the All Merciful has written, Ye shall keep my Sabbaths, but had that not been written, it would have superseded. No, the case in point is one of ass driving, and you say that it does not supersede a prohibition even in such a case, but one of the generally accepted rule that a positive precept supersedes a prohibition, should we not infer from this case that it does not supersede, and if it be replied that the prohibitions of the Sabbath are different because they are of a more stringent nature, surely the following tenet may be pointed out speaks of prohibitions generally, yet no one advances any refutation for it was taught since it might have been. Assume that if his father had said to him defile yourself or if he said to him do not restore he must obey him hence it was explicitly stated ye shall fear every man his mother and his father etc it is the duty of all of you to honor me the true reason is because this objection may be advanced those are in a different category since they are also essentials in the execution of the precept but the law relating to essentials in the execution of a precept could be derived from the previously cited text that is so indeed what need then was there for the text ye shall keep my sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary it is required for the following deduction as it might have been imagined that a man should reverence the sanctuary it was explicitly stated in the scriptures ye shall keep my sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary the expression of keeping was used in relation to the sabbath and in the same verse that of reverence in relation to the sanctuary in order that the following Comparison may be made as in the case of keeping used in relation to the Sabbath Talmud, Masya Bamath B1 does not reverence the Sabbath but him who ordered the observance of the Sabbath so in the case of reverence used in relation to the sanctuary one is not to reverence the sanctuary but him who gave the commandment concerning the sanctuary and what is regarded as the reverence of the sanctuary a man shall not enter the temple mount with his stick shoes or money bag or with dust upon his feet nor may he use it for making a shortcut and spitting is there forbidden by inference of an oriad magus this however might apply only to the time when the sanctuary was in existence whence is it deduced that the same holds good of the time when the sanctuary no longer existed was expressly stated in scripture ye shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary as the keeping that was used in relation to the Sabbath holds good forever so also the reverence used in relation to the Sanctuary must hold good forever really the reason is because it might have been assumed that this should be derived from the prohibition of kindling a fire on the Sabbath for a tana of the school of our Ishmael taught wherefore was it stated ye shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations wherefore was it stated surely if one is to follow our Jose it was to intimate that kindling a fire on the Sabbath is a prohibition only and if one is to follow our Nathan it was to intimate that even a single transgression involves one in the prescribed penalties for it was taught the prohibition of kindling a fire on the Sabbath was mentioned separately in order to indicate that its transgression is a prohibition only so our Jose while our Nathan maintains that the intention was to intimate that even a single transgression involves the offender in the prescribed penalties and Rabbah explained that the tana found difficult the expression of habitations arguing thus what need was therefore. Scripture to state habitations is not this obvious for consider the observance of the Sabbath is a personal obligation and any personal obligation is valid both in the land of Israel and outside the land what need then was there for the all merciful to write it in connection with the Sabbath this was explained by a disciple in the name of our Ishmael whereas it was stated in the scriptures and if a man have committed a sin worthy of death and he be put to death one might infer that the death penalty may be executed both on weekdays and on the Sabbath and as regards the application of the text everyone that profaneth it shall surely be put to death this might be said to refer to the several kinds of labor other than the execution of a judicial death sentence or again it might be inferred that it refers even to a judicial execution of a death sentence and as regards the application of he shall surely be put to death this might be said to refer to weekdays but not to the Sabbath. Or again it might be thought to apply also to the Sabbath hence it was expressly stated ye shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations and further on it is stated and these things shall be for a statute of judgment unto you throughout your generations in all your habitations as the expression of habitations mentioned below refers to the Bethdin so the expression habitations mentioned here refers also to the Bethdin and concerning this the all merciful said ye shall kindle no fire now are we not to assume this statement to be in agreement with the view of our Nathan who holds that the object was to intimate that even a single transgression involves the offender in the prescribed penalties and the reason is because the all merciful has written ye shall kindle no fire but had that not been the case it would have superseded the Sabbath no this may be according to our Jose granted however that it is according to the view of our Jose might it not be suggested that our Jose said that Kindling a fire on the Sabbath is mentioned separately in order to indicate that it is a mere prohibition in the case only of ordinary burning. The burning by the Bethdin, however, is surely a case of boiling of the metal bar concerning which Arshis hate said that there is no difference between the boiling of a metal bar and the boiling of dyes. Arshim I.B. Ashi replied this tana requires scriptural text not because elsewhere he holds that a positive precept supersedes a prohibition but because this might have been obtained by inference of Anori Ad
He argued it might be inferred a minority admagus that the burial of a Methmizwa should supersede the Sabbath, thus if the temple service which supersedes the Sabbath is superseded by the burial of a Methmizwa by deduction from or for his sister, how much more should the Sabbath which is superseded by the temple service be superseded by the burial of a Methmizwa? Hence it was explicitly stated, ye shall kindle no fire, etc. According to our previous assumption, however, that a positive precept supersedes a prohibition, what is meant by or it might rather, etc. It is this that was meant as regards the application of the text, everyone that profaneth it shall surely be put to death. It might have been said to apply to the several kinds of labor other than the execution of a judicial death sentence, but that a judicial death sentence does supersede the Sabbath for a positive precept supersedes the prohibition, then he argued it might be suggested that a positive precept supersedes. A prohibition in the case of a mere prohibition only has it however been heard to supersede a prohibition which involves Karath then he concluded even where a positive precept supersedes a prohibition is not the prohibition of a more serious nature than the precept and yet the positive precept comes and supersedes the prohibited on what grounds then should a distinction be made between a minor and a major prohibition hence it was explicitly stated ye shall kindle no fire etc but this is the reason why a specific text was needed it might have been assumed that this case of a brother's wife should be regarded as a subject which was included in a general proposition and was subsequently singled out in order to predicate another law the predication of which is not intended to apply to itself alone but to the whole of the general proposition for it was taught a subject which was included in a general proposition and was subsequently singled out etc how is this to be understood but the soul that eateth of the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offerings that pertain unto the Lord having his uncleanness upon him were not peace offerings included among the other holy things why then were they subsequently singled out in order that the others may be compared to them and in order to tell you that as peace offerings are distinguished by being consecrated objects of the altar so must also all other things be consecrated objects of the altar the objects consecrated for temple repair only being excluded similarly here it might have been argued since a brother's wife was included among all the other forbidden relatives why was she singled out in order that the others may be compared to her and in order to tell you that as a brother's wife is permitted so also are all the other forbidden relatives permitted are these however similar they're both the general proposition and the particular specification relate to a prohibition but here the general proposition relates to a prohibition while the particular specification relates to something which is permitted this surely is rather to be compared to an object that was included in a general proposition and was subsequently singled out in order to be made the subject of a fresh statement which you cannot restore to the restrictions of the general proposition unless scripture specifically restores it for it was taught anything which was included in a general proposition and was subsequently excluded in order to be made the subject of a fresh statement cannot be restored to the restrictions of the general proposition unless scripture has explicitly restored it how may this principle be illustrated and he shall kill the elam in the place where they kill the sin offering and the burnt offering in the place of the sanctuary for as the sin offering is the priest so is the guilt offering now since there was no need to state as the sin offering so is the guilt offering why did scripture explicitly state as the sin offering so the guilt offering because seeing that the guilt offering of the leper was singled out in order to impart a new law concerning the thumb of the right hand and the great toe of the right foot it might have been assumed that it required no application of blood to and no burning of the prescribed portions of the sacrifice upon the altar Talmud, Masya Bamath hence it was explicitly stated as the sin offering so is the guilt offering as the sin offering requires application of the blood to and burning of the prescribed portions upon the altar so does the guilt offering also require application of the blood to and burning of the prescribed portions upon the altar had scripture not restored it however it would have been assumed that it was singled out only in respect of what was explicitly specified but not in any other respect so also here I would assume only a brother's wife who was explicitly mentioned can be said to be permitted but not any of the other Forbidden relatives, but it might have been assumed that the law of a wife's sister should be deduced from what has been found in the case of a brother's wife as a lover may marry his brother's wife, so he may also marry his wife's sister. Are however the two cases similar? In the one case, there is only one prohibition, in the other, there are two prohibitions. It might have been assumed that since she was permitted in respect of one prohibition, she was also permitted in the case of the other end. Whence is it derived that we assume that since something was permitted in one respect, it was also permitted in the other from what was taught in the case of a lover whose eighth day of purification fell on the Passover, even who having observed the discharge of semen on that day had taken a ritual bath? The sages said, although no other Tebal may enter the temple mount, this one may enter, for it is better that the positive precept, the non observance of which involves Karat shall. Supersede the positive precept, the infringement of which involves no Karath, and in connection with this, are Yohanan said according to the Torah, not even the infringement of the positive precept is involved, for it is said, and Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah before the new court. What is meant by the new court? Rabbi replied that they enacted their own new laws ordaining that a Tebal must not enter the camp of the Levites. And Ullah said, What is the reason since he was given permission in respect of his leprosy? Permission was also given to him in respect of his discharge of the semen, but is this case similar to that of Ullah Talmud? Masya Bamathay, the comparison might well be justified where the deceased brother married first, and the surviving brother married his brother's wife's sister afterwards, for in this case, since the prohibition of brother's wife was removed, that of wife's sister is also removed, but where the surviving brother had married first, and the deceased brother had married subsequently the prohibition of wife sister was surely enforced first furthermore even where the deceased had married first the comparison would be justified in the case where the deceased had married and died and the surviving brother had married afterwards so that the widow was eligible in the interval where however the deceased had married and before he died his wife sister was married by his surviving brother his widow was never for a moment eligible for his brother does not admit that if the leper observed semen on the night preceding the eighth day of his purification he must not project his hand into the sanctuary on account of his thumb because at the time he was eligible to bring the sacrifice of the cleansed leper he was not free from uncleanness but this is really the explanation if Allah was at all needed it was for such a case as where the deceased brother had married first and died and the surviving brother Married the widow's sister subsequently if you prefer I can say that the reason is because it might have been deduced by means of Arjuna's analogy for Arjuna others say Arhuna son of Arjashua said scripture stated for whosoever shall do any of these abominations shall be cut off all forbidden relatives were compared to a brother's wife so in this case also it might have been said as a brother's wife is permitted so also are all other forbidden relatives permitted hence the all. Merciful has written Allah said Araha of Difti Durban consider all forbidden relatives might be compared to a brother's wife and might equally be compared to a wife's sister what reason do you see for comparing them to a wife's sister compare them rather to a brother's wife if you wish I might say when a comparison may be made for increasing as well as for decreasing restrictions that for increasing restrictions must be preferred if you prefer however I might say in the former cases there. Are two prohibitions in the one as well as in the other, and a double prohibition may justly be inferred from a double prohibition in the latter case. However, only one prohibition is involved, and a double prohibition may not be inferred from a single one. Rabbi said that a forbidden relative herself may not contract the Levirate marriage requires no scriptural text to prove it, since no positive precept can supersede a prohibition which involves Karath if a scriptural text was at all needed. It was for the purpose of forbidding a rival, and in the case of a forbidden relative, is no scriptural text required to prohibit her Levirate marriage. Surely it was taught thus we are in a position to know the law concerning herself on account of her rival. Was it not taught? However, now we know the law concerning themselves on account of their rivals. Come and your rabbi said instead of and take scripture stated and take her and instead of and perform the duty of a husband's brother. Scripture stated and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her in order to prohibit the Levirate marriage of forbidden relatives and their rivals read to forbid the Levirate marriage of the rivals of the forbidden relatives but two texts surely were mentioned was not one for the forbidden relative and the other for her rival no both were for the rival but one indicates prohibition of a rival where the precept is applicable and the other indicates permission to marry the rival. Where the precept is not applicable what is the reason because instead of and perform the duty of a husband's brother scripture stated and per
A text was needed at all Talmud, Mas Yavamat B. It was for the purpose of permitting arrival where the precept is not applicable. What is the reason scripture stated Allah to indicate that only in the case of Antuver is she forbidden where the other, however, may not she is permitted? Said Rami B. Hamad to Rabba, might it not be suggested that the forbidden relative herself is permitted where the precept is not applicable is not such an argument contrary to the principle of inference of Minoriad. Majus being forbidden where the precept is applicable, would she be permitted where the precept is not applicable? The case of a rival, the first reply could prove it since she is forbidden where the precept is applicable and is permitted where the precept is not applicable. It is for your sake the other replied that scripture states in her lifetime so long as she lives but is not the expression in her lifetime required for the exclusion of the prohibition of marriage after her death. This is deduced from the text and a woman to her sister. If the deduction were only from the text and a woman to her sister, it might have been said that if she was divorced, the sister would be permitted. Hence, it was expressly stated in her lifetime so long as she is alive, even though she has been divorced, her sister must not be married. But said Arhuna B. Talafa in the name of Rabba, two scriptural texts are available. It is written, Thou shalt not take a woman to her sister to be a rival to her. Implying two, and it is also written to uncover her nakedness, which implies that only one is forbidden. How then are the two texts to be reconciled where the precept is applicable? Both are forbidden where the precept is not applicable. She is forbidden, but her rival is permitted. Might not the deduction be reversed where the precept is applicable? She is forbidden, but her rival is permitted. But where the precept is not applicable, both are forbidden. If so, Allah should not have been stated. Said R. Ashi to Arkahana, whence is it derived that the expression Allah indicates prohibition? Is it not possible that it implies permission and that it is this that the All-Merciful meant to imply thou shalt not take a woman to her sister to be a rival to her, neither herself nor her rival, where unto her is not applicable, but where unto her is applicable, both are permitted. If so, how could the uncovering of the nakedness of one be possible if in the case where the precept is applicable, both are? Permitted and if where the precept is not applicable, both are forbidden. Reverting to the above text, Rabbi said instead of and take scripture stated and take her and instead of and perform the duty of a husband's brother, scripture stated and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her in order to prohibit the Levirate marriage of forbidden relatives and their rivals are then rivals mentioned here at all. And furthermore, the law of rivals has been derived from the expression to be her rival. The expression to be her rival is employed by Rabbi for our Simeon's deduction, where however is the rival mentioned. What he meant is this if so, scripture should have stated and take why then did it state and he shall take her to indicate that wherever there are two to be taken, he having the choice of marrying whichever he prefers, both are permitted, but if not both are forbidden and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her indicates that where Levirate marriage is applicable there. Is the rival forbidden where however Levirate marriage is not applicable the rival is permitted as to the rabbis to what do they apply the verse and he shall take her they require it for the deduction of our Jose Bihanna for our Jose Bihanna said and he shall take her teaches that he may divorce her with a letter of divorce and that he may remarry her and he shall perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her even against her will and rabbi the law of our Jose Bihanna is deduced from to a wife and that the marriage may take place against her will is deduced from her husband's brother shall go in unto her what does rabbi do with the expression Allah he requires it for another deduction as we learned the Beth Din are under no obligation unless they rule concerning a prohibition the punishment for which is correct if the transgression was willful and a sin offering if the transgression was unwitting and so it is with the anointed high priest Talmud Mas Yabamathan or R. They liable in respect of idolatry unless they rule concerning a matter the punishment for which is correct if it was committed willfully and a sin offering if committed unwittingly and we also learn for the unwitting transgression of any commandment in the Torah the penalty for which if committed willfully is correct and if committed unwittingly a sin offering the private individual brings a sin offering of a lamb or a she goat the ruler brings a goat and the anointed high priest and the Beth didn't bring a bullock in the case of idolatry the individual and the ruler and the anointed high priest bring a she goat while the Beth didn't bring a bullock and a goat the bullock for a burnt offering and the goat for a sin offering whence is this deduced from the following for our rabbis taught when the sin wherein they have sinned is known rabbi said here we read Allah and further on we also read Allah as further on the prohibition involves the penalty of correct if the transgression was Willful and that of a sin offering if it was unwitting, so here also the ruling must be concerning a prohibition which involves the penalty of Karath if the transgression was willful and that of a sin offering if it was unwitting proof has thus been it is for the case of the congregation whence for that of the anointed high priest it is written in relation to the high priest so as to bring guilt upon the people this shoes that the anointed high priest is like the congregation and for an individual and a ruler the inference is made by a comparison of things with things nor are they liable in respect of idolatry unless their ruling concerned a matter the punishment for which is Karath if it was committed willfully and a sin offering if committed unwittingly as regards the congregation in the matter of idolatry deduction is made by comparison between from the eyes and from the eyes the law of a private individual a ruler and an anointed high priest is deduced from and if one soul which implies that there is no distinction between a private individual ruler and an anointed high priest while the Bob connects them with the previous subject and consequently the latter may be deduced from the former whence however do the rabbis arrive at this inference they deduce it from the biblical interpretation which our Joshua believe I taught to his son ye shall have one law for him that doth in error but the soul that doth with a high hand etc all the Torah is compared to the prohibition of idolatry as in regard to idolatry obligation is incurred only where the offense involves the punishment of Karath when it was committed willfully and a sin offering when committed unwittingly so also in the case of any other transgression it must be such as involves Karath when committed willfully and a sin offering when committed unwittingly proof has thus been found for the case of a private individual ruler and an anointed high priest both in regard to Idolatry and the rest of the commandments whence however is it proved that the same law applies also to the congregation in the case of idolatry scripture said and if one soul and the former may be deduced from the latter whence however is it deduced that the same law applies to the congregation in the case of the other commandments deduction is made by comparison between from the eyes and from the eyes and what does Rabbi do with the text of one law he applies it to the following. Whereas we find that scripture made distinction between individuals and a group individuals being punished by stoning and their money therefore being spared while a group are punished by the sword and their money is consequently destroyed one might also assume that a distinction should be made in respect of their sacrifices hence it was explicitly stated ye shall have one law or hilkia of hadronia demur is the reason because the all merciful has written ye shall have one law so that had it not so been written it might have been thought that a distinction should be made in respect of their sacrifices what however could they bring should they bring a bullock the congregation surely brings a bullock for the transgression of any one of all the other commandments should they bring a lamb an individual surely brings a lamb if he transgressed any of the other commandments a he go to ruler brings one in the case of transgression of any of the other commandments a bullock for a burnt offering and a goat for a sin offering such surely are brought by the congregation in the case of idolatry should they then bring a she goat this surely is also the sin offering of a private individual the text was required because it might have been suggested that whereas the congregation in the case of an erroneous ruling brings a bullock for a burnt offering and a he go for a sin offering these should also bring the same sacrifices but in the reverse order or it might have been Assumed to be necessary, but that there was no remedy, hence it was necessary to teach us. Said Levi to Rabbi, what ground is there for stating 15 16 should have been stated? The other replied, It seems to me that this man has no brains in his head. Do you mean he continued a man's mother who had been outraged by his father? The case of a man's mother who has been outraged by his father is a matter in dispute between our Judah and the rabbis, and the author of our mission does not deal with any controversial matter. But does he not surely the prohibition due to a rabbinical ordinance and the prohibition due to the lover's sanctity concerning which our Akiva and the rabbis are in dispute are mentioned? We mean in our chapter, but surely it was taught Beth Shammai permit rivals to the other brothers, and Beth Hillel prohibit them the view of Beth Shammai, where it is in contradiction to that of Beth Hillel is of no consequence. Is there not the case of the wife of a man's brother who was?
Application of Rab's statement in this case is possible only according to the view of our Simeon and not according to that of the rabbis. The author of our Mishnah does not deal with any matter which is in dispute and our Safra interprets it as referring also to the wife of a brother who was not his contemporary and in his opinion it is possible in the case of six brothers in accordance with the view of our Simeon Talmud. Mas Yabamathe and your mnemonic is died born and performed the Levirate. Marriage died born and performed the Levirate. Marriage rabbi does not accept these rules. Our Adikarina stated before our Kahana in the name of Rabba Rabbi in fact does accept these rules but it was this that he meant to say to Levi the application of the statement to a woman outraged by one's father is possible only in one of its parts. It is impossible however to apply it in both its parts for if Jacob outraged his two sisters it is possible to apply that part of the statement relating. To her sister who is her sister-in-law but not that of she who is forbidden to one brother may be permitted to the other and if the outrage two strangers it is possible to apply the statement she who is forbidden to one brother may be permitted to the other but not that of her sister who is her sister-in-law or as she said rabbi in fact does not accept these rules and our mission does deal with matters in dispute and as to the meaning of it seems to me that this man has no brains in his head. Which he addressed to him what he meant was this why did you not carefully consider our mission for our mission represents the view of our Judah who forbids the marriage of a woman that was outraged by one's father as it was taught six forbidden relatives come under greater restrictions since they are to be married to strangers only and their rivals are permitted these are his mother his father's wife and his father's sister etc now what is meant by his mother if it be assumed to mean one. Who was legally married to his father such a woman surely is his father's wife must it not consequently mean one who was outraged by his father and yet it was stated since they are to be married to strangers only implying to strangers only but not to the brothers now who has been heard to hold such an opinion surely it was our Judah who forbids marriage with a woman who was outraged by one's father hence it was not included in our mission said Rabbanu to Arashi such a Levirate relationship is possible even according to our Judah if and when one had married illegally the author of the mission is not concerned with an if said Arashi to our Kahana this is also possible without the if where Jacob outraged his daughter-in-law begot from her son and then Reuben died without issue and she thus came into Levirate relationship with her son and since she is forbidden to him her rival also is likewise forbidden the other replied the author of our mission deals only with lawful brotherhood. But not with brotherhood, which is due to a forbidden act. Levi nevertheless inserted it in his mission for Levi taught one's mother sometimes exempts her rival, and sometimes she does not exempt her. If his mother, for instance, was lawfully married to his father, and then she was married to his paternal brother who subsequently died, such a mother does not exempt her rival Talmud. Mas Yabamath B. If his mother, however, was a woman that had been outraged by his father and was then married to his paternal brother who subsequently died, such a mother does exempt her rival. And though the sages taught in our mission 15, we must add a case like this as a 16th Rush Lakish said to our Yohan, and according to Levi, who maintains that an if is also included, let our mission also include the case of a lover who gave a lizard to his sister in law and later betrothed her and died without issue, for since the widow of such a one is forbidden, her rival also is forbidden. The other replied because. In this case the law of the rival of the rival cannot be applied but could he not have answered him that the brothers are only subject to the penalties of a negative precept and that those who are subject to the penalties of a negative precept are under the obligations of Eliza and the Levirate marriage he answered him in accordance with the view he holds according to my view he argued the brothers are only subject to the penalties of a negative precept and those who are subject to the penalties of a negative precept are under the obligations of Eliza and the Levirate marriage but even according to your view that they are subject to the penalty of correct the case could not have been included in our mission because the law of the rival's rival cannot be applied it has been stated where a lover had performed the ceremonial of Eliza with his sister-in-law and then betrothed her Rush Lakish holds that he is not subject to the penalty of correct for the Haliza but the other brothers are subject to Kareth for the Haliza in the case of the rival both he and the other brothers are subject to Kareth for a rival Aryohanan however holds that neither he nor the other brothers are subject to Kareth either for the Haliza or for her rival what is the reason of Rush Lakish scripture stated that doth not build since he has not built he must never again build he himself is thus placed under the prohibition of building no more but his brothers remain in the same position in which they were before furthermore the prohibition to build no more applies only to herself her rival however remains under the same prohibition as before and Aryohanan is it inconceivable that at first Haliza should be allowed to be performed by any one of the brothers and with either of the widows of the deceased brother and that now one or other of these persons should be involved in Kareth but in point of fact he merely acts as agent for the brothers while she acts as agent for her rival are Yohanan pointed out to Rush Lakish the following objection if a lover who submitted to Eliza from his sister-in-law later betrothed her and died the widow requires Eliza from the surviving brothers now according to me who maintains that the surviving brothers are subject to the penalties of a negative precept only one can well understand why she requires Eliza from the other brothers according to you however why should she require Eliza explained and on the lines of your reasoning the final clause if one of the brothers actually betrothed her she has no claim upon him or she's hate reply the final clause represents the opinion of our Akiva who holds that a betrothal with those who are subject thereby to the penalties of a negative precept is of no validity should it not then have been stated according to the view of our Akiva she has no claim upon him Talmud Masyabamatha this is rather a difficulty or as she holds the same opinion as Rush Lakish and explains. It in accordance with the ruling of our Simeon Rabbanah holds the same opinion as Aryohanan and explains it in accordance with the ruling of the rabbis Arashi holds the same opinion as Rush Lakish and explains it in accordance with the ruling of our Simeon thus if a lover who submitted to Eliza from his sister-in-law had subsequently betrothed her she requires Eliza from the brothers who are these brothers those born subsequently according to whose view according to that of our Simeon if one of the previously born brothers however betrothed her she has no claim upon him according to whose view according to that of Rush Lakish Rabbanah holds the same opinion as Aryohanan and explains it in accordance with the ruling of the rabbis thus if a lover who submitted to Eliza from his sister-in-law had subsequently betrothed her she requires Eliza from the brothers who are these brothers those born prior to the Eliza according to whom according to Aryohanan if one of the subsequently Born brothers, however, betrothed her, she has no claim upon him according to whose view, according to that of the rabbis, it has been stated in the case where the Eber had intercourse with his sister in law and one of the other brothers had intercourse with her rival. There is a difference of opinion between our Aha and Rabbin. One said it involves a transgression subject to Kareth, and the other said the transgression of a positive precept. He who said a transgression subject to Kareth follows. Rush Lakish and he who said the transgression of a positive precept follows our Yohan and Rab Judah said in the name of Rab the rival of Asoda is forbidden. What is the reason? Because uncleanness is ascribed to her as to the cases of incest are historians and objection. Our Simeon said the intercourse or Eliza of the brother of the first husband exempts her rival. Rab can answer you. I speak of Asoda that is biblically forbidden, and you talk of Asoda that is only rabbinically forbidden, but as to him who raised this objection, what did he imagine? He thought that rabbinical provisions were given the same force as biblical laws are as she raised an objection. If she entered with the man into a private place and remained with him for a period sufficient for the consummation of defilement, she is forbidden to her house. She may not eat of terima, and if he died, she must undergo the ceremony of Eliza Talmud. Mas Yabamath B, though she may not marry the lover, Rab can answer you. I speak of a definite soda, and you speak of a doubtful one, but why should a definite soda be different? Obviously, because in relation to her, the expression of uncleanness is used is not, however, the expression of uncleanness also used in relation to a doubtful soda, for it was taught our Jose B. Kipper said in the name of our Eliezer, the remarriage by a husband of his divorced wife is forbidden after marriage and permitted after betrothal, because it is stated in the scriptures after that she is defiled the sages. However say the one as well as the other is forbidden and the expression after that she is defiled implies the inclusion of a soda who secluded herself with a man the underlying meaning of secluded herself is sexual intercourse why then did he say secluded herself
Rabbis had applied the expression uncleanness to the soda also bear its ordinary meaning or since it was once torn away from its ordinary meaning it must in all respects so remain others say according to the rabbis no question arises for since the text has once been torn away from its ordinary meaning it must in all respects so remain the question however arises according to the view of our Jose B. Kippur what is the law is it assumed that although our Jose B. Kippur stated that the expression of uncleanness refers to the remarriage of a divorced wife the all-merciful has written she is an abomination to indicate that she is an abomination but not her rival or is the implication perhaps that she is an abomination but her children are not a rival however being an abomination the other replied you have learned that if one of them was a permitted wife and the other a forbidden one if he submit to Eliza he must submit to that of the forbidden one and if he marries he marries the permitted one now what is meant by permitted and forbidden if it be suggested that permitted means permitted for all the world and forbidden means forbidden for all the world what practical difference in view of the fact that she is in either case suitable for him could this make to him consequently permitted must mean permitted to him and forbidden forbidden to him and this may happen where he remarried his divorced wife and yet it was taught and if he marries he marries the permitted one no Permitted may still mean permitted to all the world and forbidden forbidden for all the world and as to your question what practical difference in view of the fact that she is in either case suitable for him could this make one must take into account the moral lesson of our Joseph for our Joseph stated here rabbi taught that a man shall not pour the water out of his cistern so long as others may require it come and here where a man remarried his divorced wife after she had been married she and her rival are to perform the halizah is it possible to say she and her rival consequently it must mean either she or her rival did you not however have recourse to an interpretation you might as well interpret thus she is to perform halizah while her rival may either perform halizah or be married by the lover our high b abba said our yohan and inquired as to what is the law in regard to a rival of a divorced woman whom her former husband remarried after her second marriage said rmi to him inquire Rather regarding herself concerning herself I have no question since her case may be inferred a minori ad majus if she is forbidden to him to whom she was originally permitted how much more so to the man to whom she was originally forbidden the question however remains concerning her rival is the inference a minori ad majus strong enough to exclude a rival or not our nomin b Isaac taught as follows our high b abbas said our yohan and inquired as to what is the law in regard to a divorced woman whom her husband remarried after her second marriage said rmi to him inquire rather regarding her rival concerning her rival I have no question for an inference a minori ad majus is not strong enough to exclude a rival the question however remains regarding herself is the inference a minori ad majus strong enough to be acted upon where a precept is involved or not Talmud, Mas Yabam, the other replied you have learned that if one of them was a permitted wife and the other a forbidden one if she submits to Eliza, he must submit to that of the forbidden one and if he marries he marries the permitted one now what is meant by permitted and forbidden if it be suggested that permitted means permitted to all the world and forbidden means forbidden to all the world what practical difference in view of the fact that she is in either case suitable for him could this make to him consequently permitted must mean permitted to him and forbidden forbidden to him and this may happen where he remarries his divorced wife and yet it was taught if he marries he marries the permitted one no permitted may still mean permitted to all the world and forbidden forbidden to all the world and as to your question what practical difference in view of the fact that she is in either case suitable for him could this make one must take into account the moral lesson of our Joseph for our Joseph said your rabbi taught that a man shall not pour the water out of his cistern so long as others may require it Come and here where a man remarried his divorced wife after she had been married she and her rival are to perform Eliza is it possible to say she and her rival consequently it must mean either she or her rival did you not however have recourse to an interpretation you might as well interpret thus she is to perform Eliza while her rival may either perform Eliza or be married by the lover our Levi Bimel said in the name of Marakba in the name of Samuel the rival of Amim and at his forbidden to whom is she forbidden if it be suggested to the brothers it may be retorted and now that she herself is permitted for Samuel said if she refused one brother she is permitted to marry the other is there any question that her rival is permitted hence it means to himself wherein however does Amim and at that she is in consequence permitted to the other brothers obviously and that she had taken no action in relation to them but her rival also had taken no action in relation to them it is an enactment made to prevent marriage with the rival of one's daughter who was a meme and at his however the rival of one's daughter who was a meme and at forbidden surely we learned if however any among these died or made a declaration of refusal or were divorced etc their rivals are permitted now against whom was a declaration of refusal made if it be suggested that she refused the husband and this case is identical with that of a divorced woman consequently it must refer to refusal of the lover no it may in fact refer to the refusal of a husband but there are two kinds of divorce wherein however does the refusal of a husband differ obviously and that she thereby annuls the original marriage but when she refused the lover she has also annulled the original marriage it differs in respect of what Rami B. Ezekiel had learned for Rami B. Ezekiel learned if she declared her refusal against the husband she is permitted to marry his father if against the lover she is Forbidden to his father from this it clearly follows that from the moment she becomes subject to the Levirate marriage she is looked upon as his daughter-in-law similarly here also she is looked upon as the rival of his daughter from the moment she becomes subject to the Levirate marriage said R.C. the rival of a woman incapable of procreation is forbidden for it is said in the scriptures and it shall be that the firstborn that she beareth which excludes a woman incapable of procreation since she does not bear R.C.'s hate raised an objection in the case where three brothers were married to three women who were strangers to one another and one of them having died the second brother addressed to her among and died behold these must perform the halizah but may not marry the lover for it is said and one of them die etc her husband's brother shall go in unto her only she who is tied to one lover but not she who is tied to two lovers and concerning this it was taught R. Joseph said. This is the rival of a paternal brother's wife whose prohibition is due to her double subjection to the Levirate marriage a case the like of which we do not find throughout the Torah now what does the expression this is exclude does it not exclude the rival of a woman incapable of procreation who is permitted no it excludes the rival of a woman incapable of procreation who is forbidden what then is meant by the expression this is it is that in this case where the subjection to the Levirate marriage has caused the prohibition her rival requires Eliza in the case however of a woman incapable of procreation even Eliza is not required what is the reason the prohibition of the one is pentacle that of the other only rabbinical we learned if however any among these died or made a declaration of refusal or were divorced or were found incapable of procreation their rivals are permitted this is no difficulty the one is a case where he knew her defect while the other is a case where he did not know of it the inference from our mission also proves this for it was stated were found and not where this proves it Rabbi said Talmud, Mas Yavamath be the law is that the rival of a woman incapable of procreation is permitted even though he knew her defect and even the rival of one's own daughter who was incapable of procreation is permitted but what about the expression were found in our mission read where when Rabin came he stated in the name of our Yohan and the rival of a Mim and at the rival of a woman incapable of procreation as well as the rival of a divorced woman who had been remarried to her former husband are all permitted Arbabai recited before our nomin three categories of women may use an absorbent in their marital intercourse a minor a pregnant woman and a nursing woman the minor because otherwise she might become pregnant and as a result might die a pregnant woman because otherwise she might cause her foetus to degenerate into a sandal in nursing woman because otherwise she might have to wean her child prematurely and this would result in his death and what is the age of such a minor from the age of 11 years and one day until the age of 12 years and one day one who is under or over this age must carry on her marital intercourse in the usual manner this is the opinion of our mayor the sages however say the one as well as the other carries on her marital intercourse in the usual manner and mercy will be vouchsafed from heaven for it is said in the scriptures the lord preserveth the simple since it has been stated because she might become pregnant and as a result might die it may be implied that it is possible for a minor to be pregnant and not die but if so one could imagine a case where a mother-in-law should be in a position to make a declaration of refusal whereas we learned one cannot say of a man's mother-in-law the mother of his mother-in-law and the mother of his father-in-law that they were found incap
Stated a girl may exercise the right of refusal until the black predominates admits in the case of children Talmud, Masya Amath ARZ but however stated no children are possible prior to the appearance of the marks of puberty then let an examination be held there is a possibility that they might have fallen off this reply is perfectly satisfactory according to him who holds that such a possibility is taken into consideration what however can be said according to him who holds that no. Such contingency need be considered even according to him who holds that no such contingency need be considered the possibility must be taken into consideration in this case on account of the pains of birth how is the exemption of their rivals by the women mentioned to be understood etc. Whence is this law deduced Rab Judah replied from scripture which stated Lizira implying that the Torah included many rivals are as she replied it is arrived at by reasoning why is a rival forbidden surely. Because she takes the place of the forbidden relative the rival's rival also takes the place of the forbidden relative how is one to understand the statement that if they had died etc. even if he married first and then divorced this then would be contradictory to the following mission of the case of three brothers two of whom were married to two sisters and the third was married to a stranger and one of the husbands of the sisters divorced his wife while the one who married the stranger died. And he who had divorced his wife then married the widow and died is one concerning which it has been said that if they died or were divorced their rivals are permitted the reason then is because the divorce took place first and the marriage was subsequent to it but had the marriage taken place first and the divorce after it the rival would not have been permitted our Jeremiah replied break it up he who taught the one did not teach the other the one Tana is of the opinion that it is the death which subjects the widow to the Levi rate marriage while the other holds the opinion that it is the original marriage that subjects her to the Levi rate marriage Rabba said both statements may in fact represent the views of one Tana it being a case of this and there is no need to state that whosoever is entitled to make a declaration of refusal etc then let her declare her refusal now and thus enable her rival to be married to the lover may it then be suggested that the supports are Ashai for Arashai said she may annul the lover's mamar by her declaration of refusal but may not sever by such a declaration the Levi bond know the case of the rival of a forbidden relative is different for Rami B. Ezekiel learned if a minor made a declaration of refusal against her husband she is permitted to marry his father if however she made her declaration of refusal against the lover she is forbidden to marry his father from this it clearly follows that from the moment she becomes subject to the Levi marriage she is looked upon as his daughter-in-law similarly here also she is looked upon as the rival of his daughter from the moment she becomes subject to the Levi marriage mission in the case of the following six relatives marriage with whom is more restricted than with these and that they may only be married to strangers marriage with their rivals is permitted his mother his father's wife his father's sister his paternal sister his father's brothers Wife and his paternal brother's wife Beth Shammai permit the rivals to the surviving brothers and Beth Hillel prohibit them Talmud, Mas Yev if they perform the Elizabeth Beth Shammai declare them ineligible to marry a priest and Beth Hillel declare them to be eligible if they were married to the lovers Beth Shammai declare them eligible to marry a priest and Beth Hillel declare them ineligible though these forbade what the others permitted and these regarded as ineligible what they Others declared eligible Beth Shammai nevertheless did not refrain from marrying women from the families of Beth Hillel nor did Beth Hillel refrain from marrying women from the families of Beth Shammai similarly in respect of all questions of ritual cleanness and uncleanness which these declared clean where the others declared unclean neither of them abstained from using the utensils of the others for the preparation of food that was ritually clean Gemara Arsimian B because he said what is Beth Shammai's reason because it is written the outside wife of the dead shall not be married unto one not of his kin outside implies that there is also an internal and the all-merciful said she shall not marry unto one not of his kin and Beth Hillel they require the text for the exposition which Rab Judah reported in the name of Rab for Rab Judah stated in the name of Rab once is it deduced that betrothal by a stranger is of no validity in the case of a sister-in-law for it is said in the scriptures the wife of the dead shall not be married outside unto one not of his kin there shall be no validity in any marriage of a stranger with her and Beth Shammai is it written Lahas surely Husa was written and Beth Hillel since the expression used was Husa it is just the same as if Lahas had been written as it was taught Arniamai said in the case of every word which requires a lame at the beginning scripture has placed a he at the end and at the school of Ar Following examples were given Elim Elim Mahane Mahane Mamizraim Mizraim Adai Belatai Malyur Ashalim Amid Barah once do Beth Shammai derive the deduction made by Rab Judah in the name of Rab it is derived from unto one not of his kin then let Beth Hillel also derive it from unto one not of his kin this is so indeed what need then was there for Husa to include one who was only betrothed and the others they derive it from the use of Hahusa where Husa could have been used and it. Others a deduction from Husa Hahusa does not appeal to them Rabba said Beth Shammai's reason is that one prohibition cannot take effect on another prohibition this explanation is satisfactory in the case where the deceased had married first and the surviving brother married afterwards since the prohibition of marrying a wife's sister could not come and take effect on the prohibition of marrying a brother's wife where however the surviving brother had married first and the deceased married. Later the prohibition of wife's sister was surely first since the prohibition of a brother's wife cannot take effect on the prohibition of wife's sister any of the other widows is the rival of a forbidden relative to whom the precept of the Levi rate marriage is inapplicable and is consequently permitted if they had performed the Elizabeth Shammai declare them ineligible etc. is not this obvious it had to be stated in order to exclude the instruction of our Yohan and Binri who said come and let us issue an ordinance that the rivals perform the Elizabeth do not marry the lover hence it was taught that Beth Hillel declare them eligible if they were married to the lovers etc. Beth Hillel declare them ineligible what need again was there for this because it was taught if they performed the Elizabeth it was also taught if they were married to the lovers we learned elsewhere the scroll of Esther is read on the 11th the 12th the 13th the 14th or the 15th of Adar but not earlier or later said Resh Lakish to Aryohan and apply here the text of Lotai Kodi to you shall not form separate sex is not Lotai Kodi required for its own context the all-merciful having said you shall not inflict upon yourselves any bruise for the dead if so scripture should have said Lotai Kodi to why did it say Lotai Kodi to hence it must be inferred that its object was this might it not then be suggested that the entire text refers to this only if so scripture should have said Lotai God why did it say Lotai Kodi to hence the two deductions the former answered have you not yet learned wherever it is customary to do manual labor on the Passover even till midday it may be done wherever it is customary not to do any work it may not be done the first said to him I am speaking to you of a prohibition for our shaman be Abba said in the name of Aryohan and scripture having said to confirm these days of Purim in their appointed times the sages have ordained for them Different times and you speak to me of a custom but is there no prohibition there surely we learned Beth Shammai prohibit work during the night and Beth Hillel permitted the other said to him in that case anyone seeing a man abstaining from work would suppose him to be out of work but do not Beth Shammai permit the rivals to the other brothers and Beth Hillel forbid them Talmud, Mas Yev do you imagine that Beth Shammai acted in accordance with their views Beth Shammai did not act in accordance with their views are Yohanan however said they certainly acted in accordance with their views here and they differ on the same point as do Rab and Samuel for Rab maintains that Beth Shammai did not act in accordance with their views while Samuel maintains that they certainly did act in accordance with their views when if it be suggested prior to the decision of the heavenly voice then what reason has he who maintains that they did not act in accordance with their own view if However after the decision of the heavenly voice what reason has he who maintains that they did act in accordance with their views if you wish I could say prior to the decision of the heavenly voice and if you prefer I could say after the heavenly voice if you wish I could say prior to the heavenly voice when for instance Beth Hillel were in the majority one maintains that they did not act according to their view for the obvious reason that Beth Hillel were in the majority while the other maintains that they did act according to their view because a majority is to be followed only where both sides are equally matched in this case however Beth Shammai were keener of intellect and if you prefer I could say after the heavenly voice one maintains that they did not act according to their view for the obvious reason that the heavenly voice had already
However, of two courts of law in the same town, the difference in practice does not matter. Come and here in the place of our Eliezer wood was cut on the Sabbath, wherewith to produce charcoal on which to forge the iron in the place of our Hosea the Galilee, and the flesh of hell was eaten with milk in the place of our Eliezer only, but not in the place of our Akiba, for we learned our Akiba laid it down as a general rule that any labor which may be performed on the Sabbath eve does not supersede the Sabbath. What an objection is this? The case surely is different when the varied practices are respectively confined to different localities. What entity who raised this question imagine it might have been assumed that owing to the great restrictions of the Sabbath, different localities are regarded as one place, hence it was necessary to teach us that the law was not so come and here are bad whenever he happened to be in the place of our Joshua Bili by carried a candle, but when he happened to be. In the place of our Yohanan, he did not carry a candle. What question is this? Has it not been said that the case is different when the varied practices are respectively confined to varied localities? This is the question. How could Arabau act in one place in one way and in another place in another way? Arabau is of the same opinion as our Joshua Bilibai, but when he happened to be in our Yohanan's place, he did not move a candle out of respect for our Yohanan, but his attendant surely was also there. He gave his attendant the necessary instructions come and here, though these forbade what the others permitted. Beth Shammai nevertheless did not refrain from marrying women from the families of Beth Hillel, nor did Beth Hillel refrain from marrying women from the families of Beth Shammai. Now, if it be said that they did not act in accordance with their own view, one can well understand why they did not refrain from intermarrying with one another. If, however, it be said that they did act in Accordance with their own view, why did they not refrain that Beth Shammai did not refrain from marrying women from the families of Beth Hillel may well be justified because such are the children of persons guilty only of the infringement of a negative precept. But why did not Beth Hillel refrain from marrying women from the families of Beth Shammai? Such surely being children of persons who are guilty of an offense involving Karath are bastards, and if it be suggested that Beth Hillel are of the opinion that the descendant of those who are guilty of an offense involving Karath is not a bastard, surely it may be retorted. Our Eliezer said, although Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel are in disagreement on the questions of rivals, they concede that a bastard is only he who is descended from a marriage which is forbidden as incest and punishable with Karath. Does not this then conclusively prove that they did not act in accordance with their own view? No, they acted indeed in accordance with. Their own view, but they informed them of the existence of any such cases and they kept away. This may also be proved by logical inference, for in the final clause it was stated similarly in respect of all the questions of ritual cleanness and uncleanness, which these declared clean, where the others declared unclean, neither of them abstained from using the utensils of the others for the preparation of food that was ritually clean. Talmud, Masya Bamath, be now if it be agreed that the required information was supplied, one well understands why they did not abstain. If, however, it be assumed that no such information was supplied, one can still understand why Beth Shammai did not abstain from using the utensils of Beth Hillel, since that which was regarded by Beth Hillel as ritually unclean was deemed by Beth Shammai to be ritually clean, but why did not Beth Hillel abstain from using the utensils of Beth Shammai when that which was deemed clean by Beth Shammai was regarded as unclean by Beth Hillel must it not then be concluded that they supplied them with the required information. Our point is thus proved in what respect is the one more conclusive proof than the other. It might have been thought that the case of arrival receives due publicity, hence it was necessary for the inference from the final clause to be cited reverting to the previous text. Our Eliezer said, although Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel are in disagreement on the question of rivals, they concede that a bastard is only he who is descended from a marriage forbidden as incest and punishable by Gareth who concedes if it be said Beth Shammai to Beth Hillel. This surely is obvious since the children of those who are guilty of the infringement of a negative precept are deemed legitimate. Must it not consequently be the case that Beth Hillel conceded to Beth Shammai, but this very case is subject to the penalty of Gareth. The fact is that Beth Shammai conceded to Beth Hillel and the purpose was to exclude it. Opinion of our Akiba who maintains that a descendant from persons guilty of the infringement of a negative precept is deemed a bastard, hence it was taught that a descendant from persons guilty of the infringement of a negative precept is not deemed a bastard. Come and here, although Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel are in disagreement on the questions of rival sisters, an old bill of divorce, a doubtfully married woman, a woman whom her husband had divorced and who stayed with him over the night in an in money valuables, a parata and the value of a parata, Beth Shammai did not nevertheless abstain from marrying women of the families of Beth Hillel, nor did Beth Hillel refrain from marrying those of Beth Shammai. This is to teach you that they should love and friendship towards one another, thus putting into practice the scriptural text love, ye truth and peace. Our Simeon said they abstained from marrying in cases of certainty, but did not abstain in doubtful cases. Now, if you agree that they Acted in accordance with their own views, one can well understand why they abstained. If, however, you assume that they did not so act, why did they abstain? And how do you understand this? Even if it be granted that they did act in accordance with their own views, one can only understand why Beth Hillel abstained from intermarrying with Beth Shammai, because the latter, in the opinion of Beth Hillel, were guilty of offenses involving Karath, and their descendants were consequently bastards as to Beth Shammai. However, why did they abstain from intermarrying with Beth Hillel when they were, even in the opinion of Beth Shammai, only guilty of the infringement of a negative precept, and their descendants were consequently legitimate? As Arnaman said elsewhere, that the statement was required only for the case of the rival herself. So here also the statement is required for the case of the rival herself. Why is a doubtful case different from a case of a certainty? Obviously, because it is forbidden. Is not a doubtful case also forbidden? Do not read from a doubtful case but from a case unknown since when they received the information they kept away and what does he teach us thereby that they should love and friendship to one another but this is exactly the same as the first clause he teaches us this that the entire mission represents the views of our Simeon come and here our Yohanan Binuri said how is this law to be promulgated in Israel were we to act in accordance with the ruling of Beth Shammai the child would in accordance with the ruling of Beth Hillel be a bastard and were we to act in accordance with the ruling of Beth Hillel the child according to the ruling of Beth Shammai would be tainted come then and let us issue an ordinance that the rivals Talmud, Masya Bamatha perform the Elizabeth but do not marry any of the brothers they had hardly time to conclude the matter before confusion set and said our Simeon be Gamaliel to them what now could we do with previous rivals now if you assume that they acted in accordance with their own rulings. One can understand why he said, "What shall we do?" If, however, you assume that they did not so act, what is the meaning of "What shall we do?" Our Naman B. Isaac replied, "This was required only in the case of the rival herself, and this is the meaning of the objection. What shall we do? How shall we, according to Beth Shammai, proceed with those rivals who married in accordance with the rulings of Beth Hillel? Should they be asked to perform the halizah, they would become despised by their husbands, and should you say, let them be despised? It could be retorted, her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. Come and here, our Tarfan said, would that the rival of my daughter were to fall to my lot, so that I could marry her, read that I could make her marry another. But he said, would it implies objection to the ordinance of our Yohanan Nuri? Come and here, it happened that our Gamaliel's daughter was married to his brother." Abba who died without issue and that Argamaliel married her rival, but how do you understand this was Argamaliel one of the disciples of Beth Shammai, but this is the explanation Argamaliel's daughter was different because she was incapable of procreation since however it was stated in the final clause others say that Argamaliel's daughter was incapable of procreation it may be inferred that the first tana is of the opinion that she was not incapable of procreation the difference between them is the question whether he knew her defect or not and if you wish I might say that the difference between them is the case where he married the rival first and subsequently divorced his wife and if you wish I might say that the difference between them is whether a stipulation in the case of matrimonial intercourse is valid our measure she raised an objection it once happened that our Akiba gathered the fruit of an etrog on the first of Shabbat and subjected it to two tithes one in Accordance with the ruling of Beth Shammai and the other in accordance with the ruling of Beth Hillel, this proves that they did act in accordance with their rulings. Our Akiba was uncertain of his tradition, not knowing whether
Increase the volume of the water come and hear our Eliezer Bizotic said when I was learning Torah with our Yohanan the Horonite I noticed that in the years of dirt he used to eat dry bread with salt I went home and related it to my father who said to me take some olives to him when I brought these to him and he observed that they were moist he said to me I eat no olives I again went out and communicated the matter to my father who said to me go tell him that the jar was broached only the least had. Blocked up the breach and we learned a jar containing pickled olives Beth Shammai said need not be broached but Beth Hillel say it must be broached they admit however that where it had been broached and the least had blocked up the holes it is clean and though he was a disciple of Shammai he always conformed in practice to the rulings of Beth Hillel now if it be conceded that they did act in accordance with their own rulings one can well understand why his action was worthy of note if however it were to be contended that they did not so act in what respect was his conduct noteworthy come and here our Joshua was asked what is the law in relation to the rival of one's daughter he answered them it is a question in dispute between Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel but he was asked in accordance with whose ruling is the established law why should you he said to them put my head between two great mountains between two great groups of disputants I between Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel I fear they might crush my head I may testify to you however concerning two great families who flourished in Jerusalem namely the family of Beth Zeboim of Ben Achmei and the family of Ben Kapai of Ben Mikoshish that they were descendants of rivals and yet some of them were high priests who ministered upon the altar now if it be conceded that they acted in accordance with their own rulings it is quite intelligible why he said I fear if however it be suggested that they did not so act why did he say I fear but even if it be granted that they did act according to their rulings what cause had he for saying I fear surely our Joshua said that a bastard was only he who was a descendant of one of those who are subject to capital punishments which are within the jurisdiction of the Beth granted that he was not a bastard he is nevertheless tainted as may be deduced by inference of an oriad mages from the case of the widow if the son of a widow who is not forbidden to all is nevertheless tainted how much more so the son of a rival who is forbidden to all they asked him concerning rivals and he answered them about the sons of the rivals they really asked him two questions what is the law concerning the rivals and if some ground could be found in their case in favor of the ruling of Beth what is the law according to Beth Shammai in regard to the sons of the rivals who married in accordance with the ruling of Beth what practical difference is there today Solution may be found according to Beth for the question of the child of a man who remarried his divorce wife do we apply the inference of Minori Ad Magus arguing thus if the son of a widow who was married to a high priest who is not forbidden to all is nevertheless tainted how much more so the son of her who is forbidden to all or is it possible to refute the argument thus the case of the widow is different because she herself is profaned and he said to them with reference to the rivals. I am afraid Talmud, Mas Yabamath as to the sons of the rivals I may testify to you come and here in the days of Ardosa Bihar Kindness the rival of a daughter was permitted to marry the brothers from this it may be inferred that Beth Shammai acted in accordance with their own rulings this proves the point to turn to the main text in the days of Ardosa Bihar Kindness the rival of a daughter was permitted to marry the brothers this ruling was very disturbing to the sages because he was a great Scholar and his eyes were dim so that he was unable to come to the house of study when a discussion took place as to who should go and communicate with him or Joshua said to them I will go and who after him are Eliezer B. Ezra and who after him are Akiva they went and stood at the entrance of his house his maid entered and told him master the sages of Israel are come to you let them enter he said to her and they entered taking hold of our Joshua he made him sit upon a golden couch the latter said to him master will you ask your other disciple to sit down who is he the master inquired our Eliezer B. Ezra has our friend Ezra's son the master exclaimed and applied to him the scriptural text I have been young and now I am old yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor to see begging bread and so took hold of him also and made him sit upon a golden couch master said he will you ask your next disciple also to sit down and who is he the master asked Akiva the son of Joseph you are the master exclaimed Akiva the son of Joseph whose name is known from one end of the world to the other sit down my son sit down may men like you multiply in Israel thereupon they began to address to him all sorts of questions on legal practice until they reached that of a daughter's rival what is the halacha they asked him in the case of a daughter's rival this he answered them is a question in dispute between Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel in accordance with whose ruling is it halacha the halacha he replied is in accordance with the ruling of Beth Hillel but indeed they said to him it was stated in your name that the halacha is in accordance with the ruling of Beth Shammai he said to them did you hear Dosa or the son of Harkinus by the life of our master they replied we heard no son's name mentioned I have he said to them a younger brother who is a daredevil and his name is Jonathan and he is one of the disciples of Shammai take care that he does not Overwhelm you on questions of established practice because he has 300 answers to prove that the daughter's rival is permitted but I call heaven and earth to witness that upon this order set the prophet Haggai and delivered the following three rulings that a daughter's rival is forbidden that in the lands of Ammon and Moab the tithe of the poor is to be given in the seventh year and that proselytes may be accepted from the Cordinians and the Tarmatides attended taught when they came. They entered through one door when they went out they issued through three different doors he came upon our Akiba submitted his objections to him and silenced him are you he called out Akiba whose name rings from one end of the world to the other you are blessed indeed to have one fame while you have not yet attained the rank of oxherds not even replied our Akiba that of shepherds in the lands of Ammon and Moab the tithe of the poor is given in the seventh year because a master said those who came. Up from Egypt had conquered many cities which those who came up from Babylon did not conquer and the first sanctification was intended for that time only but not for the future hence they were allowed cultivation in order that the poor might find their support there in the seventh year and that proselytes may be accepted from the Cordinians and the Tarmatides but the law surely is not so for Rami B. Ezekiel learned no proselyte may be accepted from the Cordinians or as she replied the statement was Cartuanians as people in fact speak of disqualified Cartuanians others say Rami B. Ezekiel learned no proselytes are to be accepted from the Cartuanians are not Cartuanians the same as Cordinians or as she replied no Cartuanians are a class by themselves and Cordinians are a class by themselves as people in fact speak of disqualified Cartuanians both are Yohanan and Subya maintained that no proselytes may be accepted from the Tarmatides did our Yohanan however say such a thing surely we Learned all blood stains on women's garments that come from Rikam are levitically clean and Arjuna declares them unclean because the people there were proselytes though misguided those that come from the heathens are levitically clean and the difficult point was raised Talmud, Masya Bamath that having stated categorically those that came from the heathens he must also imply even those from Tarmat and Aryohanan replied this proves that proselytes may be accepted from Tarmat and if it be replied that Aryohanan only said this but he himself does not hold this view surely Aryohanan said the Halashad is in accordance with an anonymous mission it is a question in dispute between Amram as to what was actually the view of Aryohanan why are no proselytes to be accepted from Tarmat Aryohanan and Sabya give different reasons one says on account of the slaves of Solomon and the other says on account of the daughters of Jerusalem according to him who says on account of it. Slaves of Solomon the reason is quite intelligible because he may hold the opinion that the child of a heathen or a slave who had intercourse with a daughter in Israel is a bastard according to him however who said on account of the daughters of Jerusalem what is the reason our Joseph and the rabbis dispute the point and both of them in the name of Rabbi Barhanda one maintains that the number was 12,000 footmen and 6,000 archers and the other maintains that there were 12,000 men and of these 600 archers at the time when the heathens entered the temple everyone made for the gold and the silver but they made for the daughters of Jerusalem as it is said in the scriptures they have ravished the women in Zion the maidens in the cities of Judah are Samuel Binaman he said in the name of our Jonathan the following verse was uttered by the genius of the universe I have been young and now I am old for who else could have said it if the Holy One blessed be. He be suggested is there any old age in his case then David must have said it but was he so old consequently it must be concluded that the genius of the universe had said it or Samuel B. Naman he further said in the name of our Jonathan what is the meaning of the scriptural text the adversary has spread out his
Karak Moshki Hitki and Dunki Aryu had answered all these were enumerated in order to declare them as being unfit when however I mentioned the matter in the presence of Samuel he said to me thy son implies that he who is descended from an Israelitish woman may be called thy son but thy son who is descended from a heathen woman is not called thy son but her son but surely there were also daughters and Rabbanah had said from this it may be inferred that thy daughter's son born from a union with a even is called thy son there is a tradition that the women of that generation were sterilized others read when I mentioned the matter in the presence of Samuel he said to me they did not move from there until they had declared them to be perfect even as it is said in the scriptures they have dealt treacherously against the Lord for they have begotten strange children our Joseph sat behind Arkahana while Arkahana sat before Rab Judah and while sitting he made the following statement Israel will make a festival when Tarmat will have been destroyed but surely it was destroyed that was Tamat Arashi said Tarmat and Tamat are identical but the city was rebuilt when it was destroyed on one side it was settled on the other side and when the other side was destroyed it was settled on the first side Arham sat before Ola and was engaged in discussing a traditional law when the latter remarked what a man and how much more important would he have been had not Harpania been his native town as the other was embarrassed he said to him where do you pay poll tax to Pumnahara the other replied if so Ola said you belong to Pumnahara what is the meaning of Harpania Arzara replied a mountain whither everybody turns in the very day it was taught whosoever did not know his family and his tribe made his way to the Rabbah said and it was deeper than the netherworld for in the scripture it is said I shall ransom them from the power of the netherworld I shall redeem them from death but for the unfitness of these there is no remedy at all the unfit of Harpania on account of the unfit of Meshan and the unfit of Meshan on account of the unfit of Tarmat and the unfit of Tarmat on account of the slaves of Solomon thus it is that people say the small cab and the big cab roll down to the netherworld from the netherworld to Tarmat from Tarmat to Meshan and from Meshan to Harpania chapter 2 Mishnah how is the exemption of her rival by the wife of his brother who was not his contemporary to be understood if there were two brothers one of whom died and after a third brother was born the second took in leave irate marriage his deceased brother's wife and then died himself the first woman is exempt as the wife of his brother who was not his contemporary and the second is exempt as her rival if he addressed to her Amar and died the second must perform Eliza but may not enter into the leave irate marriage Amar said he who uses the expression First commits no error and he who uses the expression second also commits no error he who uses the expression Talmud, Mas Yabamat B first commits no error since first may signify first to be subject to the Levirate marriage and he who uses the expression second also commits no error since second may signify second to marry does not our Mishnah however include also the case of one who contracted the Levirate marriage first and subsequently married his other wife what then is meant by second. Second in respect of her marriages where in the scriptures is the prohibition of marrying the wife of his brother who was not his contemporary written Rab Judah replied in the name of Rab scripture states that brethren dwell together i.e. dwell in the world at the same time the wife of one's brother who was not his contemporary is consequently excluded together implies who are together in respect of inheritance of eternal brother is therefore excluded Rabbi said that legal brothers are. Only those who are descended from the same father is deduced by a comparison of this brotherhood with the brotherhood of the sons of Jacob as there the brotherhood was derived from the father and not from the mother so here also the brotherhood spoken of is that from the father and not from the mother let him rather deduce this brotherhood from the brotherhood of forbidden relatives brethren may be deduced from brethren but not brethren from thy brother what practical difference is there? Between the two expressions surely the school of our Ishmael taught and the priest shall return and the priest shall come returning and coming are the same thing such an analogy is drawn only where there is no other identical word when however there occurs another word which is identical the analogy is made only with that which is identical let him then deduce this brotherhood from the brotherhood in the case of Lot since it is written in the scriptures for we are brethren it stands to reason. That the deduction should be made from the sons of Jacob because the analogous expression is available for the purpose for it could have been written thy servants are twelve sons of one man and yet brethren also was written hence it must be inferred that the word was made available for the deduction it was necessary for scripture to write brethren and it was also necessary to write together for had the all merciful written brethren only it might have been suggested that this brotherhood should be deduced from the brotherhood in the case of Lot and were you to reply that the analogous word is not available for deduction your statement would be negative the analogous word being indeed available for whereas he could have written friends and yet wrote brethren the inference must be that the object was to render it available for analogous deduction hence the all merciful has written together implying only those who are together in respect of inheritance if on the other hand the All Merciful had only written together it might have been said to refer to such as have the same father and mother hence both expressions were required but how could you have arrived at such an opinion the All Merciful has surely made the Levirate marriage dependent on inheritance and inheritance is derived from the father and not from the mother it was necessary for it might have been assumed that whereas this is an anomaly a forbidden relative having been permitted the brotherhood must therefore be both paternal and maternal hence it was necessary to teach us that the law was not so are who not said in the name of Rabbi a woman awaiting the decision of the lover died the lover is permitted to marry her mother this obviously shows that he is of the opinion that no Levirate bond exists let him then say the Halachah is in accordance with the view of him who said no Levirate bond exists if he had said so it might have been suggested that this applied only to the case of two but that in the case of one a Levi bond does exist then let him say the Halachah is in accordance with him who said no Levi bond exists even in the case of one lover if he had said so it might have been assumed even where she is alive hence he taught us that only after death and not when she is still alive because it is forbidden to abolish the commandment of Levi marriages we learned if his deceased brother's wife died he may marry her sister which implies that her sister only may be married but not her mother the same law applies even to her mother only because he taught in the earlier clause if his wife died he is permitted to marry her sister in which case only her sister is meant and not her mother since the latter is biblically prohibited he also taught in the latter clause he is permitted to marry her sister Rab Judah however said if a woman awaiting the decision of the lover died the lover is still forbidden to marry her mother this obviously implies that he is of the opinion that a Levi bond exists, let him then say the Halachah is in accordance with the view of him who said a Levi bond exists. If he had said so, it might have been suggested that this applied only to the case of one, but in the case of two, no Levi bond exists. But the dispute surely centered around the question of two, but this is really the reply. If he had said so, Talmud, Mas Yabamath, it might have been assumed that this holds good only while she is alive, but that after death the bond is broken. Hence, it was taught that the Levi bond is not automatically dissolved. May it be suggested that the following supports his view if his deceased brother's wife died, the Eber is permitted to marry her sister, which implies her sister only, but not her mother. The same law may apply even to her mother, but because he taught in the earlier clause, if his wife died, he is permitted to marry her sister, in which case her sister only is permitted and not her mother. The Latter being forbidden biblically, he also taught in the latter clause he is permitted to marry her sister Arhuna Bihai raised an objection if he addressed the Mammar to her and died the second must perform Eliza but may not enter into the Levirate marriage the reason then is because he addressed to her the Mammar but had he not addressed the Mammar to her the second also would have been permitted to enter into the Levirate marriage with him now if it be maintained that the Levirate bond does exist the second owing to this bond would be the rival of the wife of his brother who was not his contemporary rabbi replied the same law that the second must perform the Eliza with but may not be married to the lover applies even to the case where no Mammar was addressed to her and the Mammar was mentioned only in order to exclude the view of Beth Shammai since they maintain that the Mammar affects a perfect contract he teaches us that it was not so Abbe pointed out that Following objection to him in the case of two contemporary brothers, one of whom died without issue, and the second determined to address a mammar to his deceased brother's wife, but before he managed to address a mammar to her, a third brother was born, and he himself died. The first is exempt as the wife of his brother who was not his contemporary, while the second either performs the halizah or enters into the Levirate marriage. Now, if it be maintained that a Levirate bond does exist, the second, owing to this bond, would
Precept of Levi rate marriages would be annulled if, however, no Levi rate bond exists. Let also the precept of the Levi rate marriage be annulled for Argamaliel, who holds that no Levi rate bond exists, also maintains that the precept of the Levi rate marriage may be annulled. As we learned, Argamaliel said if she made a declaration of refusal, well and good. If she did not make a declaration of refusal, let the elder sister wait until the minor grows up and this one is then exempt as his wife's sister. The other said to him, Are you pointing out a contradiction between the opinion of Armeir and that of Argamaliel? No reply. Abay, we mean to say this does Armeir provide even against a doubtful annulment, and Argamaliel does not provide even against a certainty. It is quite possible that he who does not provide makes no provision even against a certain annulment, while he who does provide makes provision even against a doubtful annulment. Said Abay to our Joseph Rabjuda's statement is. Samuels for we learn Talmud, Masya Bamath B. If the brother of the lover had betrothed the sister of the widow who was awaiting the lover's decision, he is told so it has been stated in the name of Arjuna B. But there await until your brother has taken action. And Samuel said the Halacha is in accordance with the ruling of Arjuna B. But there the other asked him what objection could there be if the statement be attributed to Rab? Is it the contradiction between the two statements of Rab? Surely it is possible that these Amram are in dispute as to what was the opinion of Rab since this ruling was stated with certainty in the name of Samuel. While as to Rab's view on the matter, Amram differ. We do not ignore the statement attributing it with certainty to Samuel in favor of the one which involves Amram in a dispute as to the opinion of Rab. Said Arkahana, I reported the statement in the presence of Arzibat of Nihardia when he said you teach it thus our version is explicit Rab Judah. Stated in the name of Samuel, if a woman awaiting the decision of the lover died, the lover is forbidden to marry her mother, from which it naturally follows that he is of the opinion that a Levi-Rate bond exists. Samuel is here consistent, for Samuel said the Halachah is in accordance with the view of Arjuna B. But there is said both statements are necessary, for had he only stated a Levi-Rate bond exists, it might have been assumed to refer to the case of one lover only, but not to that of two hands. We are taught that the same law applies also to two, and if it had only been stated the Halachah is in accordance with the opinion of Arjuna B. But there it might have been assumed that the Levi-Rate bond is in force while the widow is alive, but that after her death the bond is dissolved. Hence we are taught that the Levi-Rate bond is not dissolved automatically. Mishnah, if there were two brothers and one of them died, and the second performed the Levi-Rate marriage with his deceased brother's wife. And after a third brother was born, the second died. The first is exempt on account of her being the wife of his brother who was not his contemporary, while the second is exempt as her rival. If he addressed to her a mamar and died, the second must perform the haliza, but she may not be taken in Levi rate marriage. Arsimian said he may either take in Levi rate marriage whichever of them he desires, or he may participate in the haliza with whichever of them he desires. Gemara Arashai said Arsimian. Disputed the first case also whence is this inferred from the existence cf a superfluous mission for in accordance with whose view was it necessary to teach the clause of the first mission if it be suggested according to that of the rabbis it may be retorted if when the Levi rate marriage had taken place first and the birth occurred afterwards in which case he found her permitted the rabbis nevertheless forbade her is there any need for them to specify prohibition in the case where the birth occurred first and the marriage took place afterwards consequently it must have been required in connection with the view of Arsimian and the first mission was taught in order to point out to you how far Arsimian is prepared to go while the last mission was taught in order to show you how far the rabbis are prepared to go it would indeed have been logical for Arsimian to express his dissent in the first case but he waited for the rabbis to conclude their statement and then he Expressed his dissent with their entire statement. How, in view of what has been said, is it possible, according to Arsimian, to find a case of a wife of his brother who was not his contemporary in the case of one brother who died and a second brother was subsequently born, or also in the case of two brothers where the second has neither taken the widow in the Levi rate marriage nor died? One can well understand Arsimian's reason where the Levi rate marriage took place first and the birth afterwards. For in this case he found her permitted where, however, the birth occurred first and the Levi rate marriage took place afterwards. What reason could be advanced? He holds the opinion that a Levi rate bond exists and that such a bond is like actual marriage. Our Joseph demurred if Arsimian is in doubt as to whether in the case of a Levi rate bond and a Mamar combined the widow should or should not be regarded as married, neither be any doubt in the case of a Levi rate bond alone. Whence is this? Known we have learned in the case where three brothers were married to three women who were strangers to one another and one of the brothers having died the second brother addressed to her a mamar and died behold these must perform halizah with but may not marry the surviving lover for it is said in the scriptures and one of them die etc her husband's brother shall go in unto her only she who is tied to one lover but not she who is tied to two lovers our Simeon said he may take in Levi rate marriage whichever of them he pleases and submits to the halizah of the other he must not take both widows in Levi rate marriage since it is possible that a Levi rate bond exists and thus the two sisters in law would be coming Talmud Masya Bamatha from one house nor must he take one in Levi rate marriage and thereby exempt the other for it is possible that the Levi rate bond is not as binding as actual marriage and the two sisters in law would thus be coming from two houses from is it? Clearly follows that he is in doubt and should you reply that biblically one of the widows may indeed be taken in Levi rate marriage and the other is thereby exempt but that this procedure had rabbinically been forbidden as a preventive measure against the possibility of the assumption that where two sisters in law came from two houses one may be taken in Levi rate marriage and the other is thereby exempt without any further ceremonial surely it may be pointed out Arsimian's reason is because of his doubt as to the validity of the lover's mamar for it was taught Arsimian said to the sages if the mamar of the second brother is valid he is marrying the wife of the second and if the mamar of the second is invalid he is marrying the wife of the first said Abbe to him do you not make any distinction between the Levi rate bond with one lover and the Levi rate bond with two lovers it is quite possible that Arsimian said the Levi rate bond is like actual marriage in the case of one Lover only but not in that of two lovers does Arsimian however recognize such a distinction surely it was taught Arsimian has laid down a general rule that wherever the birth preceded the marriage the widow is neither to perform halizah nor to be taken in Levi rate marriage if the marriage preceded the birth she may either perform the halizah or be taken in Levi rate marriage does not this apply to one lover and yet it is stated she is neither to perform halizah nor to be taken in Levi rate marriage no it applies to two lovers but in the case of one lover may she in such circumstances also either perform halizah or contract Levi rate marriage if so instead of stating if the marriage preceded the birth she may either perform halizah or be taken in Levi rate marriage the distinction should have been drawn in this very case itself thus this applies only to the case of two brothers in law but with one brother in law she may either perform halizah or be taken in Levi rate marriage Entire passage dealt with two brothers in law, what then is meant by the general rule, and a further objection was raised by Arashai. If there were three brothers and two of them were married to two sisters, or to a woman and her daughter, or to a woman and her daughter's daughters, or to a woman and her son's daughter, behold, these must perform the halizah but may not be taken in Levi rate marriage. Arsimian, however, exempts them now if it be assumed that Arsimian is of the opinion that the Levi rate bond has the same force as actual marriage. Let the third brother take the first widow in Levi rate marriage and let the other be thereby exempt. Aram replied, The meaning of exempt is that he exempts the second widow, but has it not been taught? Arsimian exempts them both. Rabba replied, The second of the one peer and the second of the other peer. Rabba, however, was mistaken in the interpretation of the four peers, for in the first instance we have twice the word or, and furthermore, if Rabbis. Interpretation were the correct one, it should have read Arsimian exempts the four. Furthermore, it was taught Arsimian exempts both from the Halizah and from the Levi rate marriage, for it is said in the scriptures, and thou shalt not take a woman to her sister to he rival to her when they become rivals to one another, you may not marry even one of them. But said Arashi, if they had become subject to the lover one after the other, the law would indeed have been so here. However, we are dealing with the case where both become subject to him at the same time, and Arsimian shares the view of our J
Address the Mangmar her rival is not exempt if he married her and died and a third brother was subsequently born or if a third brother was born and subsequently he married her and died both widows are exempt from the Halizah and the Libarit marriage if he married her and after that a third brother was born and then he himself died both widows are exempt from the Halizah and the Libarit marriage this is the opinion of Armadir Arsimian however said since when he came into the world he found her permitted to him and she was never forbidden to him even for one moment he may take in Libarit marriage whichever of them he desires or he may participate in the Halizah with whichever of them he desires now in accordance with whose view was the case in the latter clause taught if it be suggested that it was taught in accordance with the view of Armadir it might be observed that as Armadir draws no distinction between marriage that was followed by birth and birth that was followed by marriage all these cases should have been combined in one statement consequently it must have been in accordance with the view of Arsimian who thus differs only in the case where the Levi marriage was followed by birth but does not differ where birth was followed by Levi marriage our point is thus proved the master said if the second intended to address a mamar to his deceased brother's wife but before he was able to do so a third brother was born while he himself died the first widow is exempt as the wife of the brother who was not his contemporary and the second may either perform the or be taken in Levi marriage what is meant by he intended and what by he was not able if he did it, it is an accomplished fact and if he did not do it, it is not an accomplished fact in fact this is the meaning he intended with her consent and he was not able with her consent but against her wish this however is not in agreement with the view of rabbi for it was taught if a Man addressed a mangmar to his deceased brother's wife against her consent. Rabbi regards this as legal betrothal, but the sages say this is not a legal betrothal. What is Rabbi's reason? He deduces this form of betrothal from the intercourse with the wife of a deceased brother, as the intercourse with the wife of a deceased brother may be affected against her will. So may the betrothal of the wife of a deceased brother be affected against her will. And the rabbis they deduce it from the usual form of betrothal, as the usual betrothal can be affected with the woman's consent only. So may the betrothal of a yebama be affected with her consent only. On what principle do they differ? One master is of the opinion that matters relating to a yebama should be inferred from matters relating to a yebama, and the masters are of the opinion that matters of betrothal should be inferred from matters of betrothal. If, however, he addressed a mangmar to the widow, and subsequently a third brother was. Born or if a third brother was born first and he addressed the mamar to the widow subsequently and died the first widow is exempt as the wife of his brother who was not his contemporary while the second must perform the halizah though she may not be taken in Levi marriage Arsimian said intercourse or halizah with the one of them exempts her rival what is Arsimian referring to if it should be suggested to the case where the third brother was born first and he addressed the mamar subsequently surely it has been stated that where birth preceded marriage Arsimian does not differ from the rabbis but the reference is to the case where the mamar was addressed first and the third brother was born subsequently hence if he participated in halizah with her to whom the second brother had addressed the mamar her rival is not exempt because the subjection of the rival is a certainty while the subjection of her to whom the mamar had been addressed is doubtful and no Doubt may override a certainty our manasseh easy but sat in the presence of Arhuna and in the course of the session he said what is our Simeon's reason what is our Simeon's reason surely it is as it has been stated the reason is because when he was born he found her permitted to him and she was never forbidden him even for one moment but the question rather is what is the reason of the rabbi's scripture said a slash id take her to him to wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her the former Levirate attachment still remains with her but then what of the following where we learned if he married her she is regarded as his wife in every respect and in connection with this our Jose Bihanna said this teaches Talmud Masya Bamatha that he may divorce her with a letter of divorce and that he may remarry her let it there also he said and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her the former Levirate attachment still remains with her and consequently she should require Eliza also there the case is different since scripture stated and take her to him to wife as soon as he married her she becomes his wife in every respect if so the same deduction should be applied here also surely the all merciful has written and performed the duty of a husband's brother unto her and why the differentiation it stands to reason that permission should be applied to that which is also otherwise permitted and that prohibition should be applied to that which is also otherwise prohibited according to our Simeon however who stated because when he was born he found her permitted and she was never forbidden to him even for one moment the brother if this reason is tenable should be allowed to take in Levi marriage his maternal sister whom his paternal brother had married prior to his birth dying subsequently since when he was born he found her permitted whether did the prohibition of sister vanish here also whether did the prohibition of the wife of it brother who was not his contemporary vanished the one is a prohibition which can never be lifted the other is a prohibition which may be lifted mission a general rule has been laid down in respect of the deceased brother's wife wherever she is prohibited as a forbidden relative she may neither perform the halizah nor be taken in Levi right marriage if she is prohibited by virtue of a commandment or by virtue of holiness she must perform the halizah and may not be taken in Levi right marriage if her sister is also her sister in law she may perform the halizah or may be taken in Levi right marriage prohibited by virtue of a commandment refers to the secondary degrees in relationship forbidden by the ruling of the scribes prohibited by virtue of holiness refers to the following forbidden categories a widow to a high priest a divorced woman or one that had performed halizah to a common priest a female bastard or a nethin to an Israelite and a daughter of an Israelite to a nathan or a Bastard Gemara, what was the general rule meant to include? Raphraim B. Papa replied to include the rival of a woman who was incapable of procreation in agreement with the view of R.C. Some there are who say whenever her prohibition is that of a forbidden relative, then only is her rival forbidden. When, however, her prohibition is not that of a forbidden relative, her rival is not forbidden. What was this meant to exclude? Raphraim replied to exclude the rival of one incapable of procreation, contrary to the view of R.C. If her sister is also her sister in law, etc., whose sister, if the sister of her who is forbidden by virtue of an ordinance of the scribes be suggested, fit may be objected since Pentateuch Ali, she is subject to the lover, he would come in marital contact with the sister of her who is connected with him by the Levi bond. It means the sister of her who is prohibited to him as a forbidden relative, prohibited by virtue of a commandment, refers to the secondary degrees Y.R. These designated prohibited by virtue of a commandment have a reply because it is a commandment to obey the rulings of the sages prohibited by virtue of holiness a widow to a high priest a divorced woman or one who had performed the halizah to a common priest why are these designated prohibited by virtue of holiness because it is written in the scriptures they shall be holy unto their god it was taught our Judah reverses the order prohibited by virtue of a commandment refers to the following prohibited categories a widow to a high priest a divorced woman or one that had performed halizah to a common priest and why are these designated prohibited by virtue of a commandment because it is written in the scriptures these are the commandments prohibited by virtue of holiness refers to the secondary degrees of relationship forbidden by the rulings of the scribes and why are these designated prohibited by virtue of holiness have a reply because whosoever acts in accordance with it Rulings of the rabbis is called the holy man said Rabbi to him and he who does not act in accordance with the rulings of the rabbis is not called the holy man nor is he called a wicked man either no said Rabbi sanctify yourself by that which is permitted to you a widow to a high priest an unqualified ruling is laid down making no distinction between an Isuan widow and an Arisan widow now one can well understand the reason the case of an Isuan widow since marriage with her is forbidden by a positive and a negative precept and no positive precept may override both a negative and a positive precept in the case however of an Arisan widow marriage with whom is forbidden by a negative precept only let the positive precept override the negative one argument replied in the name of Rab scripture stated and his brother's wife shall go up to the gate where there was no need to state his brother's wife why then was his brother's wife specified to indicate that there is a case of Another brother's wife who goes up for Elizabeth does not go up for Levi marriage and who is she one of those prohibited by a negative precept might it not be said to include also such as are subject to the penalty of correct scripture said if the man like not to take if he likes however he may take her in Levi marriage hence it is to be inferred that whosoever may go up to enter into Levi marriage may also go
of a commandment participated in Elizabeth refers to the one forbidden by virtue of holiness robber raised an objection he who is wounded in the stones or has his privy member cut off a man made saris and an old man may either participate in Elizabeth or contract by marriage how if these died and were survived by brothers and by wives and those brothers arose and addressed a mamar to the widows or gave them letters of divorce or participated with them in Elizabeth their actions are legally valid if they had intercourse with them the widows become their lawful wives if the brothers died and they arose and addressed a mamar to their wives or gave them divorce or participated with them in Elizabeth their actions are valid and if they had intercourse with them the widows become their lawful wives but they may not retain them because it is said in the scriptures he that is wounded in the stones or has his privy member cut off shall not enter into the assembly of the Lord. Now if it could be assumed that those forbidden by a negative precept are Pentateuch ally subject to Elizabeth and not to Levi right marriage why should the widows become their lawful wives if they had intercourse with them but said Rabbi say rather that an heiress and widow is forbidden by both a positive and a negative precept for it is written in the scriptures they shall be holy unto their God what however can be said in respect of a bastard or a nethin it is written and sanctify yourselves if so. All the negative precepts of the Torah should be regarded as positive and negative since it is written in the scriptures and sanctify yourselves but said Rabbi the fact is that an heiress and widow is forbidden as a preventive measure against the marriage of an Esau and widow what however can be replied in respect of a bastard and a nethin of the prohibition in the case where a precept is applicable is a preventive measure against a marriage where no precept is applicable if so let ones. Paternal brother's wife not be allowed Levi right marriage as a preventive measure against marriage with the wife of his maternal brother we all merciful made Levi right marriage dependent on inheritance and the relationship is therefore well known a woman and who has no children should not be taken in Levi right marriage as a preventive measure against the marriage of a woman who has children the all merciful made Levi right marriage dependent on the absence of children and the fact would be well known the wife of one's contemporary brother should not be taken in Levi right marriage as a preventive measure against marriage with the wife of one's brother who was not one's contemporary the all merciful has made it dependent on dwelling together and the fact is well known all women should not be taken in Levi right marriage as a preventive measure against the marriage of a woman incapable of procreation this is unusual a bastard and an ethnic also are unusual but said Robert, this is. The reason the first act of intercourse is forbidden as a preventive measure against the second act of intercourse it has been taught likewise if they had intercourse with any of the forbidden women they acquire her as wife by the first act of intercourse but may not keep her for a second act of intercourse subsequently rob others say are as she said the statement I made is valueless for Rush Lakish said wherever you come upon a combination of a positive and a negative precept and you are able to act in conformity with both well and good but if not the positive precept must override the negative similarly here it is possible to perform Elizabeth whereby one is enabled to keep the positive as well as the negative precept an objection was raised if they had intercourse with any of the forbidden women they acquire her as wife this is indeed a refutation and was stated concerning an act of intercourse between a high priest and a widow there is a difference of opinion between our Yohanan and R. Eliezer one maintains that it does not exempt her rival and the other maintains that it does exempt her rival Talmud, Mas Yavamatha Talmud, Mas Yavamatha in the case of an Esu and widow they both agree that it does not exempt since no positive precept may override a combination of a positive and a negative precept they differ however in the case of an Eris and widow he who maintains that it exempts does so because a positive precept supersedes a negative one and he who maintains that it does not exempt holds that the positive precept here does not supersede the negative one since in this case Eliza is possible an objection was raised if they had intercourse with any of the forbidden women they acquire her as wife this is indeed a refutation may this be assumed to provide a refutation of the view of Resh Lakish also Resh Lakish can answer you I said it only in the case where the precept is fulfilled here however Eliza is a substitute for the Levi right marriage is not a fulfillment of the precept Rabbah said where in the Torah may an allusion be found to the prohibition of relations in the second degree it is said for all these abominations have the men of the land done the expression these implies grave abominations from which it may be inferred that there are milder ones and what are these the cases of incest of the second degree what proof is there that this is an expression of gravity because it is written in the scriptures and the mighty of the land he took away may it be assumed that this view differs from that of our Levi for our Levi said the punishments for false measures are more rigorous than those for marrying forbidden relatives for in the latter case the word used is L but in the former Eli implies rigor but Eli implies greater rigor than L is not Eli written also in connection with forbidden relatives that Eli has been written to exclude the sin of false measures from the penalty of Kareth. In what respect then are they more rigorous in the case of the former repentance is possible and that of the latter repentance is impossible Rab Judah said it may be derived from the following yet he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs in relation to which Ulla said in the name of our Eliezer before Solomon appeared the Torah was like a basket without handles when Solomon came he affixed handles to it Arashi said it may be derived from the following avoid it pass not by it turn from it and pass on said Arashi Arashi's interpretation may be represented by the simile of a man who guards an orchard if he guards it from without all of it is protected if however he guards it from within only that section in front of him is protected but that which is behind him is not protected the statement of Arashi however is mere fiction there the section in front of him at least is protected while here were it not for the prohibition of incest of the second degree one would Having crossed upon the very domain of incest, Arkahana said it may be derived from here, therefore shall ye keep my charge, provide a charge to my charge, said Abbe to our Joseph, this surely is Pentateuchal, it is Pentateuchal, but the rabbis have expounded it, all the Torah surely was expounded by the rabbis, but the fact is that the prohibition is rabbinical, while the scriptural text is adduced as a mere proper rabbis taught who are the forbidden relatives in the second degree, his mother's mother, his father's mother, his father's father's wife, his mother's father's wife, the wife of his father's maternal brother, the wife of his mother's maternal brother, the daughter in law of his son, daughter in law, his daughter, a man is permitted to marry the wife of his father in law and the wife of his stepson, but is forbidden to marry the daughter of his stepson, his stepson is permitted to marry his wife and his daughter, the wife of his stepson may say to him, I am permitted to you, though. Daughter is forbidden to you is not the daughter of his stepson forbidden it being written in the scriptures her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter as he wished to state in the latter clause the wife of his stepson may say to him I am permitted to you though my daughter is forbidden to you and though my daughter is forbidden to you Pentateuch ally the rabbis did not forbid me as a preventive measure he stated in the previous clause also the daughter of his stepson if so could not be wife of his father-in-law also say I am permitted to you and my daughter is forbidden to you since she is his wife's sister the prohibition of the one is permanent that of the other is not rab said four categories of women forbidden in the second degree are subject to a limitation of these rab new three the wife of a mother's maternal brother the wife of a father's maternal brother and one's daughter in law Z-E-I-R-I, however adds also the wife of his mother's father said our B Isaac. Your mnemonic sign is above that of Rabbi does not Rab include it because she might be mistaken for the wife of one's father's father and Z-I-R-I hither one usually goes but hither one does not usually go is not the prohibition of one's daughter-in-law Talmud, Mas Yabamoth be Pentateuchal it being written in the scriptures thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy daughter-in-law read the daughter-in-law of his son but is there any limitation for the daughter-in-law of one's son surely it was taught his daughter-in-law is a forbidden relative and the daughter-in-law of his son is a forbidden relative of the second degree and the same principle is to be applied to one son and son's son to the end of all generations but read the daughter-in-law of his daughter for our said I heard from a great man and who is here am I the following statement the daughter-in-law is forbidden only on account of the daughter-in-law and when the soothsayers told me you will be a teacher I thought if I would be a great man I would explain it on my own and should I be a scripture teacher of little children I would ask the rabbis who come to the schoolhouse now I am in a position to explain it on my own the daughter-in-law of one's daughter was forbidden only on account of the daughter-in-law of one son said Abba to Rabbi I can explain it to you take as an example a daughter-in-law of the
His father's father's wife is a forbidden relative of the second degree and yet was his mother's father's wife forbidden as a preventive measure against his father's father's wife and what is the reason because they are both called grandfather the wife of his father's paternal brother is a forbidden relative the wife of his father's maternal brother is a forbidden relative of the second degree and yet was the wife of his mother's paternal brother forbidden as a preventive against the wife of his father's maternal brother and what is the reason because they are both called uncle what then is the law come and here when our Judah B. Sheila came he stated that in the West the rule was laid down that whenever a female is a forbidden relative the wife of the male is forbidden in the second degree as a preventive measure and Robert remarked is this a general rule surely one's mother-in-law is a forbidden relative and yet is one's father-in-law's wife permitted the daughter of his mother-in-law is a forbidden relative and yet is the wife of the son of his mother-in-law permitted his stepdaughter is a forbidden relative and yet is the wife of his stepson permitted the daughter of his stepdaughter is a forbidden relative and yet is the wife of the son of his stepson permitted what then does our Judah B. Sheila's reported rule include does it not then include the case of the wife of a mother's maternal brother since wherever a female is a forbidden relative the wife of the male is forbidden in the second degree as a preventive measure what is the difference between those and this in this case she becomes related to him by one act of betrothal in those cases they do not become related to him until two acts of betrothal have taken place our messerchi of the saint is sent to our poppy will our master instruct us as to what is the law concerning the wife of the father's father's paternal brother and the father's father's sister seeing that the degree below is incest has a Preventive measure been issued in respect also of the degree above or perhaps not since the relationship has branched off come and here who are the forbidden relatives of the second degree etc and these were not enumerated among them some might have been mentioned and others omitted what other omissions were made such as to justify this omission also the forbidden relatives of the second degree of the school of our high were also omitted Amimar permitted the wife of one's father's father's brother and one's father's father's sister said Arhilel to Arashi I saw the list of forbidden relatives of the second degree of Mar the son of Urbana and sixteen were written down as forbidden cases would they not be the eight of the birth of the six of the school of our high and these two and all sixteen but according to your view there should be seventeen since there is also the case of the wife of a mother's maternal brother who in accordance with our decision is forbidden this is no Difficulty Talmud, Masi of Amatha, those two which resemble one another are reckoned as one and thus the total is sixteen but after all I saw that these were written down as forbidden the other said to him granted that this is so would you have relied upon that list if the cases had been written down as permitted as Mar the son of Urbana signed them you would have argued now then that they have been written down as forbidden you might also argue Mar the son of Urbana has not signed them it was taught at the school of Arhai the third generation of his son of his daughter of the son of his wife or of the daughter of his wife is forbidden as incest of the second degree the fourth generation through his father-in-law or his mother-in-law is forbidden as incest of the second degree said Rabbanu to Arashi why is the wife included in the ascending line and not included in the descending line in the case of the ascending line where the prohibition is due to his wife she is Included in the descending line where the prohibition is not due to his wife, she is not included, but surely there is the case of the son of his wife and the daughter of his wife whose prohibition is due to his wife who is nevertheless not included as he enumerated three generations in the descending line on his side and did not include her. He also enumerated three generations in the descending line on her side and did not include her said Arashi to Arkahana are the second degrees of incest of the school of Arhai subject to the limitation or not come and here what Rab said four categories of forbidden women are subject to a limitation but no more but is it not possible that Rab was only referring to that very the come and here the third and the fourth which implies the third and fourth generations only but no further but is it not possible that this meant from the third generation onwards and from the fourth generation onwards Rabba said to Arnaman has the master seen the young. Scholar who came from the West and stated the question was raised in the West whether the second degrees of incest were forbidden as a preventive measure among proselytes or not the other replied seeing that even in respect of actual incest but for the fear that they might be said to have exchanged a religion of stricter for one of more easygoing sanctity the rabbis would not have imposed upon them any preventive measures is there any question that they should have done so in respect of the second degree said Arnaman as the subject of proselytes has come up let us say something about the maternal brothers may not tender evidence if however they did their evidence is valid paternal brothers may tender evidence without challenge Amimar said even maternal brothers may tender evidence without challenge and why is this case different from incest matters of incest lie in everybody's hands evidence is entrusted to Beth Din and they know that one who has become a proselyte is like a child newly born mission if one has any kind of brother that brother imposes upon his brother's wife the obligation of the Levirate marriage and is deemed to be his brother in every respect from this is excluded a brother born from a slave or even if one has any kind of son that son exempts his father's wife from the Levirate marriage is liable to punishment for striking or cursing his father and is deemed to be a son in every respect from this is excluded the son of a slave. Or even tomorrow what does the expression any kind of of Judah said it includes a bastard is not this obvious surely he is his brother it might have been assumed that brotherhood here should be deduced from brotherhood in the case of the sons of Jacob as there they were all legitimate and untainted so here also the brothers must be legitimate and untainted hence we were taught that it is not so might we still suggest that it is so since he has at any rate the power to confer. Exemption from the Levirate marriage Talmud, Masi of Amath he also has the power to impose the obligation of the Levirate marriage and is deemed to be his brother in every respect in respect of what an actual practice that he is to be his heir and that he may defile himself for him is not this obvious he being his brother whereas it is written except for his kin that is near unto him and the master had said that his kin refers to his wife while on the other hand it is written a husband among his people shall not defile himself to profane himself which verses taken together mean some kind of husband may defile himself and some kind of husband may not and how is this to be understood he may defile himself for his lawful wife but may not defile himself for his unlawful wife and so here it might have been assumed that he may defile himself for a legitimate brother but may not defile himself for an illegitimate brother hence it was taught that it is hot so might we still suggest that it is so in that case she is liable at any moment to be sent away but here he is his brother from this is excluded a brother born from a slave or even what is the reason scripture stated the wife and her children shall be the masters if one has any kind of son that son exempts etc what does any kind include rab judah said it includes a bastard what is the reason because scripture stated and have no and low child which implies hold an inquiry concerning him and is liable to punishment for striking him but why one should apply here the scriptural text nor curse a ruler of that people only when he practices the deeds of that people as our finahas in the name of our papa said elsewhere when he repented so here also it is a case where he repented is such a persona however capable of penitence surely we learned Simeon Bimanasia said that which is crooked cannot be made straight refers to him who had intercourse with a forbidden relative and begot from her a bastard. Now at any rate he is practicing the deeds of that people our rabbis taught he who has intercourse with his sister who is also the daughter of his father's wife is guilty on account of both his sister and his father's wife's daughter our Jose son of our Judah said he is only guilty on account of his sister but not of the daughter of his father's wife what is the rabbis reason observed they would say it is written the nakedness of thy sister the daughter of thy father or the daughter of thy mother. What need was there for the nakedness of thy father's wife's daughter begotten of thy father she is thy sister in order to intimate that he is guilty on account of both his sister and his father's wife's daughter and our Jose son of our Judah scripture stated she is thy sister you can hold him guilty on account of his sister but you cannot hold him guilty for his father's wife's daughter and to what do the rabbis apply the expression she is thy sister they require it for the deduction that a man is guilty on account of his sister who is the daughter of his father and the daughter of his mother thus indicating that no prohibition may be deduced by logical argument and our Jose son of our Judah if so the all-merciful should have written thy sister what need was there for she is to indicate that you may hold him guilty on account of thy sister but you cannot hold him guilty on account of his father's wife's daughter and the rabbis although thy sister was written it was also necessary to write she is in order that no one should suggest that elsewhere a prohibition may be deduced by
The penalties of negative precepts are proper applied. The betrothal of those forbidden under negative precept is valid for it is written in the scriptures. If a man have two wives, the one beloved and the other hated, can it be said that the omnipresent loves the one or hates the other? But beloved means beloved in her marriage, hated means hated in her marriage, and yet the all merciful has said, if have might it be taken to exclude those who are liable to Gareth Robert replied, Scripture said that nakedness of thy sister, the daughter of thy father, or the daughter of thy mother, whether born at home or born abroad, whether your father is told you may keep her, or whether your father is told let her go, the all merciful said she is thy sister. Will you suggest that what is meant is whether your father is told you may keep her, or whether your father is told let her go, the all merciful said she is thy sister to include his sister from a slave, and the heathen scripture stated the father's wives. Daughter only she with whom your father can enter into marital relationship but a sister from a slave or a heathen is excluded and what ground is there for this it is logical to include those subject to Gareth since generally their betrothal is valid on the contrary a slave and a heathen should have been included since on embracing the Jewish faith betrothal with himself is also valid when any of these adopts the Jewish faith she becomes a different person once do the rabbis deduce it. Exclusion of a slave and a heathen they deduce it from the wife and her children shall be her masters and our Jose son of our Judah one text refers to a slave and the other to a heathen and both are required for had we been informed concerning the exclusion of the slave it might have been thought that this was so in her case because she has no recognized ancestry but not in that of a heathen who has recognized ancestry and had we been informed of the exclusion of the heathen he might have been assumed that this was so in her case because she stands under no obligation in relationship to the observance of commandments but not in that of a slave who is in some respects attached to the observance of the commandments hence both were required with reference to the rabbis we have discovered the reason for the exclusion of a slave once do they derive the exclusion of the heathen and should you suggest that we might derive it by inference from the slave those were surely needed are Yohanan replied in the name of our Simeon B.O.H. scripture stated for he will turn away thy son from following me thy son born from an Israelitish woman is called thy son but thy son who was born from a heathen is not called thy son but her son said Rubina from this it follows that the son of your daughter who derives from a heathen is called thy son does this imply that Rubina is of the opinion that if a heathen or a slave had intercourse with the daughter of Israel the child is Considered fit though he is admittedly no bastard neither is he considered fit he is rather regarded as a tainted Israelite but does not the text occur in connection with the seven nations for he will turn away includes all who turn away this is satisfactory if we follow our Simeon who expounds his own reasons for scriptural precepts whence however do the rabbis derive it according to their view who is the Tana who disputes the opinion of our Jose son of our Judah it is our Simeon Talmud, Mas. Yevamoth be Mishnah if a man betrothed one of two sisters and does not know which of them he has betrothed he must give a letter of divorce to the one as well as to the other if he died leaving a brother the latter must participate in the Halizah with both of them if he had two brothers one is to participate in the Halizah and the other may contract the Levirate marriage if they anticipated the Beth Din and married them they are not to be parted from them if two men betrothed two sisters and the one does not know whom he betrothed and the other does not know whom he betrothed the one must give two letters of divorce and the other must also give two letters of divorce if they died and the one left the brother and the other also left the brother the one brother must participate in the halizah with the two widows and the other also must participate in the halizah with the two widows if one left one brother and the other left two the one brother must participate in the halizah with the two widows and as regards the two one participates in the halizah and the other may contract the levirate marriage if they anticipated the beth din and married them they are not to be deprived of them if one left two brothers and the other also left two one brother of the one participates in the halizah with one widow and one brother of the second participates in the halizah with the other widow and then the other brother of the first may contract levirate marriage with the halizah of it Second and the other brother of the second may contract the Levirate marriage with the Haliza of the first if both anticipated the Beth Din and participated in the Haliza the other two must not both contract the Levirate marriage but one must participate in the Haliza and the other may then contract the Levirate marriage if both anticipated the Beth Din and married they are not to be deprived of them Gamar is it to be inferred from here that even betrothal which cannot culminate in Canubial intercourse is also valid here we are dealing with the case where they were known but were later confused this may also be proved by deduction since it was stated and he does not know and it was not stated and it was not known this proves it what then does our mission teach us the second clause was necessary if he died and left the brother the latter must participate in the Haliza with both of them if he had two brothers one is to participate in the Haliza and the other may contract the Levirate marriage only Halizah must be first and the Levirate marriage afterwards but not the Levirate marriage first since thereby he might infringe the interdict against the sister of her who is connected with him by the Levirate bond if two men betrothed two sisters etc. Does this imply that a betrothal which cannot culminate in connubial intercourse is also valid here also it is a case where they were known but were subsequently confused this may also be proved by deduction since it was stated and the one does not know and it is not stated and it is not known this proves it what then does our mission teach us it was necessary to have the latter clause if they died and one left one brother and the other left two the one brother must participate in the Halizah with the two widows and as regards the two one participates in the Halizah and the other may contract the Levirate marriage is not this obvious being in the same case as the first clause it might have been assumed. That Levirate marriage should be forbidden in the case of two brothers as a preventive measure against the case of one hence we were taught that it was not so and also that Halizah must be first and the Levirate marriage afterwards but the Levirate marriage must not take place first for thereby one might infringe the interdict against the Yebamah's marriage to a stranger if one left two brothers and the other also left two etc. What need was there again for this statement it is surely the same it might have been assumed that the marriage should be forbidden as a preventive measure against marrying without previous Halizah hence we were taught that no such measure was enacted wherein does this case differ from the following in which we learned in the case of four brothers two of whom were married to two sisters and those who were married to the sisters died behold their widows may only perform the Halizah but may not be taken in Levirate marriage by either of the lovers. What a comparison Talmud, Mas Yavamatha there if one is to follow the view of him who said that a Levirate bond does exist a Levirate bond exists and if one is to follow him who said that it is forbidden to annul the precept of Levirate marriage well it is forbidden to annul the precept of Levirate marriage here however it is possible to assume that everyone will happen to get his own if both anticipated the Beth Din and married they are not to be parted from them etc. Sheila recited even if both were priests what is the reason because a Haliza is only rabbinically forbidden and in the case of a doubtful Haliza the rabbis enacted no preventive measures but is a Haliza only rabbinically forbidden surely it was taught from put away one might only infer the prohibition concerning a divorced woman once that of a Haliza hence it was explicitly stated and a woman the prohibition is really rabbinical and the scriptural text is a mere prohibition of the commandment of the Levirate. Marriage devolves upon the surviving elder brother if a younger brother however forestalled him he is entitled to enjoy the privilege allowed to marry one of the widows he would not be able either to contract Levirate marriage or to participate in Eliza with the other widow she being forbidden to him as his wife's sister should the other brother happen to die before he married that widow and thus the entire precept of Levirate marriage would in such a case be an old Gemara or rabbis. Learned and it shall be that the firstborn implies that the commandment of the Levirate marriage devolves upon the surviving elder brother that she beareth excludes a woman who is incapable of procreation since she cannot bear children shall succeed in the name of his brother in respect of inheritance you say in respect of inheritance perhaps it does not mean that but in respect of the name of the deceased for instance was called Joseph the child shall be called Joseph if Yohanan he shall be called Yohanan here it is stated shall succeed in the name of his brother and elsewhere it is stated they shall be called after the name of their brethren in their inheritance as the name that was mentioned there has reference to inheritance so the name which was mentioned here has also reference to inheritance that his name be not blotted out excludes a eunuch whose name is blotted out said Rabbah although throughout the Torah no text loses its ordinary meaning here the Gezerah Shawah has come and entirely deprived the text of its ordinary meaning but apart from the Gezerah Shawah
Scripture stated and one of them died does not this include also the case where the firstborn died and so the all-merciful has said that the younger shall perform the duty of the Levirate marriage but perhaps the text speaks of a case where the younger died and the all-merciful says that the firstborn shall perform the duty of the Levirate marriage surely the all-merciful has excluded the wife of his brother who was not his contemporary may it be suggested that where there is no firstborn the younger brother if he forestalled the Bethdin is entitled to the privilege but that where there is a firstborn the younger brother even if he forestalled him is not entitled to the privilege script stated if brethren dwell together the dwelling of one brother was compared to that of the other may it be suggested that where there is a firstborn one turns to the eldest but where there is no firstborn one does not turn to the eldest why then did Abbe the elder teach that the commandment to Perform the duty of the Levirate marriage is incumbent upon the elder brother if he refuses the younger brother is approached if he also refuses the elder is approached again scripture has designated him as the firstborn as with the firstborn the causes his birthright so with the elder brother the causes his seniority might it be said that when the firstborn performs the duty of the Levirate marriage he also takes the inheritance but when an ordinary brother performs the duty of the Levirate marriage he does not take the inheritance scripture stated shall succeed in the name of his brother and behold he has succeeded but since the all merciful called him the firstborn Talmud Masyabamath be what practical ruling was thereby intended to impair his rights as a firstborn does not take a double portion in his father's prospective property in the same way as he does in that which is already in his possession so does this one take no double portion in his father's Prospective property as he does in that which is already in his possession mission if a man is suspected of intercourse with a slave who was later emancipated or with a heathen who subsequently became a proselyte he must not marry her if however he did marry her they need not be parted if a man is suspected of intercourse with a married woman who in consequence was taken away from her husband he must let her go even though he had married her Gemara this implies that she may become a proper proselyte but against this a contradiction is raised both a man who became a proselyte for the sake of a woman and a woman who became a proselyte for the sake of a man and similarly a man who became a proselyte for the sake of a royal board or for the sake of joining Solomon's servants are no proper proselytes these are the words of Arniamai for Arniamai used to say neither lion proselytes nor dream proselytes nor the proselytes of Mordecai and Esther are proper proselytes unless they become converted at the present time. How can it be said at the present time? Say as at the present time. Surely concerning this, it was stated that our Isaac B. Samuel B. Martha said in the name of Rab the Halachah is in accordance with the opinion of him who maintained that they were all proper proselytes. If so, this should have been permitted altogether. On account of the reason given by R.C. for R.C. said, put away from the afroward mouth and perverse lips, etc. Our rabbis learned no. Proselytes will be accepted in the days of the Messiah in the same manner. No proselytes were accepted in the days of David nor in the days of Solomon. Said R. L. Azer, what scriptural support is there for this view? Behold, he shall be a proselyte who is converted for my own sake. He who lives with you shall be settled among you. He only who lives with you in your poverty shall be settled among you. But no other if a man is suspected of intercourse with a married woman, etc. Rab said this must be. Confirmed by witnesses said Arshis hate it seems that Rab made the statement while he was sleepy and about to doze off for it was taught if a man is suspected of intercourse with a married woman who in consequences was taken away from her husband and was subsequently divorced by another man he need not part with her once he has married her now how is this to be understood if it is a case where witnesses are available of what avail is it that another man stepped in and checked the rumor must. We not then conclude that this is a case where there were no witnesses and the reason is because another man stepped in and checked the rumor but had that not happened she would have been taken away from him Rab can answer you the same law that where witnesses are available she is taken away from him and that where no witnesses are available she is not taken away applies also to the case where no other man stepped in and checked the rumor but this it is that was meant even if another man stepped in and checked the rumor it is not proper for him to marry her an objection was raised this has been said in the case only where she had no children but if she has children she must not be divorced if however witnesses to the seduction presented themselves she must go away from him even if she had ever so many children Rab explains our mission as dealing with the case where she has children and witnesses against her are available what however impels Rab to explain our mission as dealing with the case where she has children and where witnesses against her are available and to give as the reason why she is to be taken away because witnesses are available and to imply that if witnesses are not available she is not taken away let him rather explain our mission as dealing with the case where she has no children and has to be taken away even though no witnesses are available Robert replied our mission presented a difficulty to him what point was there he argued for using the expression was taken away it should have been stated he parted from her but any such expression as was taken away implies by the Bethdin and the Bethdin take away only where witnesses are available if you prefer I may say that that Beritha represents the view of Rabbi for it was taught when a peddler leaves a house and a woman within his fasting her sinar since the thing is ugly she must said Rabbi go if spittle is found on the upper part of the curtain bed since the thing is ugly. She must said Rabbi go Talmud, Mas Yabamath if shoes lie under the bed since the thing is ugly she must said Rabbi go shoes one can surely see whose they are say rather the marks of shoes the law is in accordance with the view of Rabbi and the law is in accordance with the view of Rabbi this then represents a contradiction between one law and the other there is no contradiction one refers to a rumor that had ceased the other to a rumor that had not ceased where the rumor has not ceased. Though no witnesses are available, the law is according to Rabbi where the rumor has ceased, but witnesses are available, the law is according to Rabbi for how long must a rumor continue in order to be regarded as uninterrupted? Abbe replied, Mother told me that a town rumor must remain uncontradicted for a day and a half. This has been said only in the case where it was not interrupted in the meantime, if however it was interrupted in the meantime, well it was interrupted, this however is only when the interruption was not due to intimidation, but if it was due to intimidation, well it was due to intimidation, this however has been said only in the case where no enemies are about, but where enemies are about, well it must have been the enemies who published the rumor. We learned elsewhere if a man divorced his wife because of a bad name, he must not remarry her if on account of a vow, he must not remarry her, Rabbi son of Arhuna sent to Rabbi son of Arnaman, will our master instruct? As to whether he must part with her if he did remarry her, the other replied, We have learned that if a man is suspected of intercourse with a married woman who in consequence was taken away from her husband, he must let her go even though he has married her. He said to him, Are these two cases at all alike there? She was taken away here, he had let her go, and Rabbi son of Arnaman in our mission also we learned he let her go, but even now are they at all alike here? It is the husband, there it is. The seducer, the other replied, They are indeed alike for here. The rabbi said he must not marry her, and if he did marry, he must let her go, and there also the rabbis would say he must not remarry her, and if he did remarry, he must let her go. This, however, is not much of an argument there. He lends color to the rumor while here it might well be assumed that he investigated the rumor and found it to be groundless mission. A man who brings a letter of divorce from a country beyond the sea and States it was written in my presence and it was signed in my presence must not marry the divorcer's wife similarly if he states he died I killed him or we killed him he must not marry his wife Arjuna said if the statement is killed him the woman may not marry anyone if however it is we killed him the woman may marry again Gamar the reason then is because he came from a country beyond the sea in which case we have to entirely upon him but had he come from the land of Israel in which case we need not depend upon him would he have been allowed to marry the divorcer's wife but surely when the statement is he died in which case we do not depend entirely upon him since a master said a woman makes careful inquiry before she marries and yet it was stated he must not marry his wife there no document exists but here a document does exist for thus we have learned wherein lies the difference between the admissibility of a letter of divorce and that of evidence of death in that the document supplies the proof similarly if he states he died I killed him or we killed him he must not marry his wife only he then must not marry his wife she however may be married to another man but surely our Joseph said if a man stated so and so committed pederasty with me against my will he and any other witness may be combined to procure his execution if however he said with my consent he is a wicked man concerning whom the Torah said put not thy hand with the wicked to be an
Manasseh who adopted the view of Arjuna, I killed him, etc. We killed him, a Mary, etc. What is the practical difference between I killed him and we killed him? Rabjuda said, Our mission speaks of the case where he said, I was present together with his murderers. Has it not, however, been taught? They said to Arjuna, It once happened that a robber, when led out to his execution in the Cappadocian Pass, said to those present, Go and tell the wife of Simeon Bikoan that I killed her husband when I entered Lut. Others say, When he entered Lut and his wife was permitted to marry again, he answered them, Is there any proof from there? It was a case where he said, I was present together with his murderers, but it was stated a robber, he was apprehended on account of robbery, but it was stated, Led out to his execution, he was sentenced by a heathen court of law who executed without due investigation mission. A sage who has pronounced a woman forbidden to her husband because of a vow must not. Marry her himself if however a woman made a declaration of refusal or performed Eliza in his presence he may marry her since he was but one of the Beth Dingamara this implies that if he had disallowed her vow he would have been permitted to marry her what then are the circumstances if he acted alone could one disallow a vow surely our high B. Avin said in the name of Aram Rome that it was taught to disallow ants of vows is to be carried out by three if however three were present would they be suspected surely we learned if however a woman made a declaration of refusal or performed Eliza in his presence he may marry her since he was but one of the Beth in the fact is that he acted alone and as our Hista said in the name of our by a fully qualified individual so here also it is a case of one fully qualified individual if a woman made a declaration of refusal or performed Eliza etc the reason then is because he was one of a Beth but had he been one of a group of Two only would he not have been permitted wherein and does this case differ from the following concerning which it was taught if witnesses signed on a document relating to a purchase field or on a letter of divorce the rabbis do not apprehend such collusion it is this very thing that he taught us is that the opinion of him who said that a declaration of refusal may be made in the presence of two is to be rejected and that one is to infer that a declaration of refusal must be made in the presence of three the question was raised if he married her must he part from her our Kahana said though he married he must part from her our Ashi said once he has married he need not part from her our Zudi at the school of our Papa recited a teaching in accordance with the opinion of him who said that if he married her he need not part from her said the rabbis to our Ashi is this a tradition or a matter of opinion he answered them it is a mission if a man is suspected of intercourse with a slave who was subsequently emancipated or with a heathen who subsequently became a proselyte low he must not marry her if however he did marry her the marriage need not be dissolved which proves Talmud, Masi of Amethyst that once a woman was married she is not taken away because of a mere rumor and so here also the woman married is not to be taken away because of a rumor Mishnah if all these had wives who subsequently died the other women are permitted to marry them if they were married to others and were subsequently divorced or widowed they may be married to these these are also permitted to their sons or brothers Gemara only if they died but not if they were divorced said our Hillel to Arashi surely it was taught even if they were divorced this is no difficulty the one refers to the case where they led a quarrel some like the other where they had no quarrels if you prefer I might say that the one as well as the other refers to the case where there were no quarrels and yet there is no difficulty the former is a case where the husband had led onto the divorce in the latter she led onto the divorce if they were married etc it was now assumed that death has reference to the case of death and divorce to that of divorce must it then be said that our mission is in disagreement the delivery of the letter of divorce by the messenger or the evidence of the man who testified to their husband's deaths with the view of rabbi for had it been in agreement with rabbi third marriage would not have been allowed for he said that two occurrences constitute a hazaka no death has reference to divorce and divorce to death these are also permitted to their sons or brothers wherein is this different from the following where it was taught a man who is suspected of intercourse with a woman is forbidden to marry her mother her daughter and her sister it is the usual thing for women to pay frequent visits to other women it is not usual however for men to pay frequent Visits to other men or this also women who do not cause one another to be forbidden by their cohabitation do not particularly mind one another men however who do cause one another to be forbidden by their cohabitation do mind one another if so the same law should also apply to one's father the meaning is there is no need thus there is no need to state that the law is applicable to one's father before whom a son is shy but in the case of one son before whom a father is not shy it might have been assumed that this law was not to be applied hence we were informed that the same law was applicable to a son also chapter 3 mission in the case of four brothers two of whom were married to two sisters if those who were married to the sisters died behold these must perform Elizabeth but may not be taken in leave right marriage by the brothers if they had already married them they must dismiss them or Eliza said Betcham I hold that they may retain them and Bethilel. Hold that they must dismiss them if one of the sisters was forbidden to one of the brothers under the prohibition of incest he is forbidden to marry her but may marry her sister while to the second brother both are forbidden if one sister was forbidden by virtue of a commandment or by virtue of holiness she must perform the Elizabeth but may not be taken in leave by right marriage if one of the sisters was forbidden to one brother under the law of incest and the other sister was forbidden to the other under the law of incest she who is forbidden to the one is permitted to the other and she who is forbidden to the other is permitted to the first this is the case concerning which it has been said when her sister is her sister in law she may either perform Elizabeth or be taken in leave by right marriage Gamara this then implies that a Levi right bond exists for if no Levi right bond exists observe this point these widows come from two different houses let one brother take in Levi right marriage to one and the other brother the other as a matter of fact it may still be assumed that no Levi right bond exists but the Levi right marriage is nevertheless forbidden because he is of the opinion that it is forbidden to annul the precept of Levi right marriage it being possible that while one of the brothers married one of the widowed sisters the other brother would die and the precept of Levi right marriage would be annulled if so the same applies to three brothers also this may be regarded as the case of there is no need etc thus there is no need to state three since the precept of Levi right marriage would inevitably have to be annulled but in the case of four it might have been assumed that one need not take precautions against possible death hence we were informed that even in such a case Levi right marriage is forbidden if so Talmud Masi of be the same applies to five brothers also the possibility that two might die need not be taken into consideration Rabbi son of R. Who not said in the name of Rabbi three sisters who are sisters in law fell to the lot of two brothers who are their brothers in law one of the brothers participates in her Eliza with one and the other brother participates in the Eliza with the other but the third requires Eliza from both said Rabbi to him since you say that the third widow requires submission to Eliza by both brothers you must be holding the opinion that either a bond exists and that the Eliza is of an impaired character and that as an impaired Eliza it must go the round of all the brothers but if so the same should apply to the first two sisters also if they had become subject to the lovers at the same time the law would indeed have been so the statement of our mission however was required only in the case where they become subject to the evers one after another when the first sister became subject to the obligation of the Levi right marriage Reuben participated in her Eliza when they Second came under the obligation Simeon participated in her Eliza when the third came under the obligation if the one brother participated in her Eliza he removed his only Levi bond and when the other participated in the Eliza he likewise removed his only Levi bond but surely Rab said that no Levi bond exists the statement he made in accordance with the opinion of him who maintains that a Levi bond does exist Samuel however stated that one brother participates in the Eliza with all of them but consider we have heard Samuel say that a proper Eliza is required for Samuel said Talmud Masi of Amethi, if he participated in the Eliza with the sisters the rivals are not exempt how then should Reuben where the Eliza of Simeon has the force of a valid Eliza participate in an impaired Eliza by saying one brother participates in the Eliza with all of them he also meant the third widow but surely all of them was stated as the majority is on his side may be described as all of them if you prefer I might say only in respect of exempting one's rival did Samuel say that proper Eliza was required as regards exempting herself however any Eliza sets are free to turn to the main text Samuel said if he participated in the Eliza with the sisters the rivals are not exempt ff with the rivals the sisters are exempt if he participated in the Eliza with the one who had been divorced her rival is not thereby exempt if with the rival the divorced woman is exempt if he participated
Aliyah and only subsequently participated in the Halizah of Rachel. Rachel's Halizah is a defective one, but Leah's rival should be exempt when he said that the rivals are not exempt. He meant indeed the rival of Rachel, but surely he used the expression rivals, rivals. Generally, if so, how could the sisters be exempt if he participated in the Halizah with their rivals? Is Rachel exempt by the Halizah of her rival? Surely we learned a man is forbidden to marry the rival of the relative of his Halizah. Samuel also is of the same opinion but draws a distinction according to the manner in which one began or did not begin. If one began with the sisters, he must not finish with the rivals, for we learned a man is forbidden to marry the rival of the relative of his Halizah. But if he began with the rivals, he may finish even with the sisters, for we learned a man is permitted to marry the relative of the rival of his Halizah. Or as she said, your former assumption may still be upheld and yet no difficulty. Arises because the Levi rate bond is not strong enough to make the rival equal to the forbidden relative herself. It was taught in agreement with the view of Arashi. If the lover participated in the Halizah with the sisters, their rivals are not thereby exempt. But if with the rivals, the sisters are thereby exempt. What is the reason? Obviously, because he is of the opinion that a Levi rate bond exists and that that bond is not strong enough to make the rival equal to the forbidden relative herself. Are. Abu B. Memel said, Who is the author of this Beth Shammai? For we learned Beth Shammai permit the rivals to the surviving brothers. If so, let them be taken in Levi rate marriage. Also, this is in agreement with our Yohan and Binri, who said, Come, let us issue an ordinance that the rivals perform the Halizah, but do not marry the lover. But did not a master say that they had hardly time to conclude the matter before confusion set in Arnam and B. Isaac replied after him, They reordained it. The question was. Raised Talmud, Mas Yavamath be between the one who was given a letter of divorce and the other to whom the Mangmar had been addressed who is to be preferred is she who was divorced to be preferred or is perhaps she to whom the Mangmar had been addressed to be preferred since she is nearer to him in respect to intercourse or as she replied come and here our Gamaliel however admits that a letter of divorce after a Mangmar and a Mangmar after a letter of divorce is valid now if a letter of divorce has the preference the Mangmar after it should have no validity and if the Mangmar has the preference the divorce after it should have no validity consequently it must be concluded that they have both equal validity this proves that Arunah said in the name of Rabbi two sisters who were sisters in law became subject to one lover the one is permitted when he has participated in her Halizah and the other is permitted when he has participated in her Halizah if the first died he is permitted to marry. The second and there is no need to state that if the second died the first is permitted since as a sister-in-law who was permitted and forbidden and then again permitted she returns to her former state of permissibility are Yohanan however said if the second died he is permitted to marry the first but if the first died he is forbidden to marry the second what is the reason because any sister-in-law to whom the injunction her husband's brother shall go in unto her cannot be applied at the time of her coming under the obligation of the Levi rate marriage is indeed like the wife of a brother who has children and is consequently forbidden but does not rab hold the same view surely rab said any woman to whom the injunction her husband's brother should go in unto her cannot be applied at the time of her coming under the obligation of the Levi rate marriage is indeed like the wife of a brother who has children and is consequently forbidden that statement applies only to the case where the Woman is faced with the prohibition of a wife sister which is pentacle here however the prohibition due to the Levi rate bond is only rabbinical Our Jose B. Hanan raised the following objection against our Yohanan in the case of four brothers two of whom were married to two sisters if those who were married to the sisters died behold these must perform Halizah but may not be taken in Levi rate marriage but while let one of the brothers take on the duty of participating in the Halizah with the second widow and thus place the first widow in relation to the second in the category of a deceased brother's wife that was permitted and forbidden and then again permitted and thus she would return to her former state of permissibility the other replied I do not know who was the author of the statement concerning the sisters but let him rather reply that the meaning of the expression of must perform the Halizah which had been used indeed signifies that only one is to perform the Halizah. The expression used was they must perform the halizah. Then let him reply that the expressions they must perform the halizah refers to women generally who perform the halizah. It was stated, behold, these let him then reply that this is a case where halizah was already performed by the first dash. The expression these must perform halizah Talmud. Mas Yavamath is an instruction as to what it is the proper thing to do. Let him reply that it was a preventive measure against the possibility of it. Lovers participating first in the halizah of the first it was stated but may not be taken in Levi rate marriage. I.e., the law of the Levi rate marriage is not applicable here at all. Let him then reply that it was a preventive measure in case he might die. It being forbidden to annul the precept of Levi rate marriage. Our Yohanan makes no provision against possible death. Then let him reply that it is the ruling of our Eliezer who said that so long as she remained forbidden to him for one moment, she is. Forbidden to him forever since the latter clause represents the view of our Eliezer the first clause cannot represent his view then let him reply that it is a case where they fell under the obligation at the same time and that it represents the opinion of our Jose the Galilean who maintains that it is possible to ascertain simultaneity the Tana would not have recorded an anonymous mission in agreement with the view of our Jose the Galilean let him reply that it is a case where it is not known which came under the obligation first if that were the case how could it have been stated even if they had already married them they must dismiss them in the case of the first at least one can understand the reason since he can be told who permitted her to you in the case however of the second the lover could surely claim my friend has taken the second in Levi marriage and I take the first this then is the reason why he said to him I do not know who was the author of the statement Concerning the sisters we learned if one of the sisters was forbidden to one of the brothers under the prohibition of incest he is forbidden to marry her but may marry her sister while to the second brother both are forbidden it was now assumed that his mother-in-law came under the obligation first now why should both sisters be forbidden let the son-in-law undertake the duty of marrying first that sister who is not his mother-in-law and his mother-in-law in relation to the other lover would thereby come into the same category as a sister-in-law that was permitted and forbidden and then permitted again who returns to her former state of permissibility our papa replied they are forbidden in a case where she who was not his mother-in-law came under the obligation first our Eliezer said Beth I hold etc the following was taught our Eliezer said Beth I hold that they may retain them and Beth Hillel hold that they must dismiss them our Simeon said they may retain them Abba. Saul said Beth Hillel uphold in this matter the milder rule for it was Beth Shammai who said that the women must be dismissed while Beth Hillel said they may be retained whose view does our Simeon represent if that of Beth Shammai he is merely repeating our Eliza if that of Beth Hillel he is repeating Abbasol it was this that he meant in this matter there is no dispute at all between Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel if one of the sisters etc but we have learned this already when her sister is her sister-in-law she may either perform Eliza or be taken in Levi rate marriage both are necessary for had the law been stated there it might have been assumed to apply to that case alone because there is no need to enact a preventive measure against a second brother but not to the case here where it might be advisable to issue a preventive measure against a second brother and had the law been stated here it might have been assumed to apply to this case alone because there is a second Brother who proves it, but not to that case where no second brother exists, hence were both required by virtue of a commandment, etc. But we have already learned this also. Talmud, Mas Yavamath B. If she is forbidden by virtue of a commandment or by virtue of holiness, she must perform Halizah and may not be taken in Levi rate marriage. There is a question of one forbidden by virtue of a commandment alone, but here it is a case of one forbidden by virtue of a commandment and by virtue of her sister, since it might have been assumed that the prohibition by virtue of a commandment shall take the same rank as the prohibition by the law of incest, and her sister should therefore be taken in Levi rate marriage. Hence we were taught that the law is not so, but how could she possibly be taken in Levi rate marriage since Pentateuch Ali she is to submit to him, he would come in contact with the sister of his Ezekiah. It might have been thought that such provision was made by the rabbis for the sake of the precept hence we were taught that it was not so if one of the sisters etc what need was there again for the statement surely it is precisely identical with the one before for what difference is there whether a woman is forbidden to one or to two both are required for had
Do say that in the case of the one brother the prohibition by a commandment is to be given the same force as the prohibition by the law of incest and that also in the case of the other brother the prohibition by a commandment is to be given the same force as the prohibition by the law of incest and that the sisters may consequently be taken and leave our right marriage hence we were taught that such an assumption is not to be made Rab Judah said in the name of Rab and so did our high teach in the case. Of all these it may happen that she who is forbidden to one brother may be permitted to the other and that her sister who is her sister-in-law may either perform the halizah or be taken in the Levi-rate marriage and Rab Judah interpreted it as referring to those from one's mother-in-law onward but not to the first six categories what is the reason because this is only possible in the case of a daughter born from a woman who had been outraged but not in that of a daughter born from a legal marriage and the author of that mission deals only with cases of legal matrimony and not with those of outraged women Abbe however interprets it as referring also to a daughter from a woman that had been outraged because since the application of Rab's statement is quite possible in her case it matters not whether she was born from a woman who was legally married or from one that had been outraged but not to the wife of a brother who was not his contemporary since this is possible only. According to the view of our Simeon and not according to that of the rabbis and he does not deal with any matter which is a subject of controversy but our Safra interprets it as referring also to the wife of a brother who was not his contemporary and this is possible in the case of six brothers in accordance with the view of our Simeon and your mnemonic is died born and performed the Levi marriage died born and performed the Levi marriage suppose for instance Reuben and Simeon were married to two sisters and Levi and Judah were married to two strangers when Reuben died Issachar was born and Levi took the widow in Levi marriage when Simeon died Zebulun was born and Judah took the second widow in Levi marriage when Levi and Judah subsequently died without issue and their widows fell under the obligation of the Levi marriage before Issachar and Zebulun she who is forbidden to the one is permitted to the other while she who is forbidden to the other is permitted. To the first in the example of her sister who is her sister-in-law what need was there for Judah to contract the Levi-rate marriage even if Judah did not contract any Levi-rate marriage it is also possible owing to the rival this satisfactorily explains the case of the rival what can be said however in respect of the rival's rival if for instance Gad and Asher also subsequently married the mission if two of three brothers were married to two sisters or to a woman and her daughter or to a woman and her daughter's daughter or to a woman and her son's daughter behold these must perform the halizah but may not be taken in Levi-rate marriage our Simeon however exempts them if one of them was forbidden to him by the law of incest he is forbidden to marry her but is permitted to marry her sister if however the prohibition is due to a commandment or to holiness they must perform the halizah but may not be taken in Levi-rate marriage Gemara it was taught our Simeon exempts both from the halizah and the Levi rate marriage for it is said in the scriptures and thou shalt not take a woman to her sister to be a rival to her when they become rivals to one another you may not marry even one of them if one of them was etc what need was there again for the statement surely it is the same it was necessary because of the opinion of our Simeon as it might have been assumed that since our Simeon had said that two sisters were neither to perform the nor to be taken in Levi rate marriage a preventive measure should be enacted against two sisters generally hence we were taught that it was not so if however the prohibition is due to a commandment etc Talmud, Mas Yabamatha but did not our Simeon state that two sisters are neither to perform the nor to be taken in Levi rate marriage this is a preventive measure against any other case where the prohibition is due to a commandment this is a satisfactory explanation in respect of herself what however can be said in respect of her sister the provision was made in the case of her sister as a preventive measure against herself, but surely no such preventive measures were made in the case where one was forbidden as incest. The case of incest is different because people are well acquainted with it, and it is well known. Mishnah: If two of three brothers were married to two sisters, and the third was unmarried, and when one of the sisters' husbands died, the unmarried brother addressed to her a mamar, and then his second brother died. Beth. Shammai say his wife remains with him while the other is exempt as being his wife's sister. Beth Hillel, however, maintained that he must dismiss his wife by a letter of divorce and by Eliza and his brother's wife by Eliza. This is the case in regard to which it was said, "Woe to him because of his wife, and woe to him because of his brother's wife." Gemara: What was this? Is meant to exclude to exclude the statement of our Joshua and to indicate that we do not act in accordance with his view, but. Either in accordance with that of our Gamaliel or that of our Eliezer, our Eliezer said it must not be assumed that a Mammar according to Beth Shammai constitutes a perfect Kanyan so that if he wishes to dismiss her a letter of divorce is sufficient but rather that according to Beth Shammai a Mammar constitutes a Kanyan only so far as to keep out the rival said Arab and we also have learned the same thing Beth Shammai said they may retain them which implies that they may only retain them but that they may not marry them at the outset Talmud, Mas Yabamath be now if it could be assumed that a Mammar according to Beth Shammai constitutes a perfect Kanyan let the one lover address a Mammar and constitute thereby a Kanyan and let the other also address a Mammar and thereby constitute a Kanyan what then is it your inference that it keeps the rival completely out let then one lover address a Mammar and keep her out and let the other lover also address a Mammar and keep her out what? However, may be said in reply that a permitted Mammar does keep the rival out while a forbidden Mammar does not keep her out. So also here, even according to him who maintains that a Mammar constitutes a perfect Kanyan, only a permitted Mammar constitutes a Kanyan, but a forbidden one does not. Our Ashi taught it in the following manner. Our Eliezer said it must not be assumed that a Mammar according to Beth Shammai keeps the rival completely out and that she does not require even Eliza, but rather it keeps her out and still leaves a partial bond. Said Arab, and we also have learned the same thing. Beth Shammai said they may retain them, which implies that they may only retain them, but that they may not marry them at the outset. Now, if it could have been assumed that a Mammar according to Beth Shammai keeps a rival out completely, let the one lover address a Mammar and thus keep her out and let the other also address a Mammar and so keep her out, but surely it was taught Beth Shammai say. His wife remains with him while the other is exempt as his wife's sister. The fact is a Yebamah who is eligible for all is also eligible for a part. A Yebamah who is not eligible for all is not eligible for a part. Rabbi inquired, does a Mammar according to Beth Shammai constitute marriage or betrothal? Said Abbe to him on what practical issue does this question bear? Shall I say on the issue of inheriting from her, defiling himself to her, or annulling her vows? Surely it could be answered. That seeing that in the case of ordinary betrothal, our high taught that where the wife has only been betrothed, the husband is neither subject to the laws of Onan nor may he defile himself for her, and she in his case is likewise not subject to the laws of Onan nor may she defile herself for him, and that if she dies, he does not inherit from her, though if he dies, she collects her kathu. But is there any need to speak of the case where a Mammar had been addressed? Rather, the question is in. Respect of introduction into the bridal canopy does it constitute a marriage and therefore no introduction into the bridal canopy is required or does it perhaps constitute betrothal and consequently introduction into the bridal canopy is required the other replied if where he did not address to her any mammar it is written in scripture her husband's brother shall go in unto her even against her will is there any need to speak of the case where he has addressed to her a mammar the former retorted yes since I maintain that whenever a lover has addressed a mammar to his sister in law the Levi bond disappears and she comes under the bond of betrothal what then is the decision come and here in the case of a widow awaiting the decision of the lover whether there be one lover or two lovers our Eliza said he may annul her vows our Joshua said only where she is waiting for one and not for two our Akiva said neither when she is waiting for one nor for two now we pondered. Thereon one can well understand our Akiva since he may hold that no Levi-rate bond exists even in the case of one according to our Joshua the Levi-rate bond may exist where there is one lover but not where there are two lovers according to our Eliezer however granted that a Levi-rate bond exists one can understand why in the case of one he may annul but why also in the case of two and RMI replied here it is a case where he addressed to her a Mammar and the statement represents the opinion of Beth. Shammai who maintained that a Mammar constitutes a perfect Kanyan now if it be granted that it constitutes a marriage it is quite intelligible why he may annul her
Two sisters and the third was married to a stranger and one of the sisters' husbands died and the brother who was married to the stranger married his wife and then died himself. The first is exempt as being a wife's sister and the second is exempt as being her rival. If however he had only addressed to her Mamar and died the stranger is to perform the halizah but may not contract the Levi rate marriage tomorrow. The reason is because he had addressed to her Mamar had he however not addressed a Mamar to her the stranger also would have had to be taken in Levi rate marriage. This proof said Arnaman that no Levi rate bond exists even in the case of one brother Mishnah. If two of three brothers were married to two sisters and the third was married to a stranger and when the brother who was married to the stranger died one of the sisters' husbands married his wife and then died himself. The first is exempt in that she is his wife's sister and the other is exempt as her rival if however he had only addressed to her Mamar and died the stranger must perform Halizah but may not be taken in Levi rate marriage tomorrow what need was there again for the law in this Mishnah surely it is the same if there were the wife's sister is only a rival to the stranger it has been said that the stranger is forbidden how much more so here where the stranger is a rival to a wife's sister the Tana had taught first this while the other was regarded by him as a permissible case and so he permitted her later however he came to regard it as a case that was to be forbidden and as it was dear to him he placed it first while the other Mishnah was allowed to stand in its original form Mishnah if two of three brothers were married to two sisters and the third was married to a stranger and when one of the sisters husbands died the brother who was married to the stranger married his wife and then the wife of the second brother died and afterwards the brother who was married to the Stranger died also behold she is forbidden to him for all time since she was forbidden to him for one moment Gemara Rab Judah said in the name of Rab any Yebama to whom the instruction her husband's brother shall go in unto her cannot be applied at the time she becomes subject to the Levirate marriage is indeed like the wife of a brother who has children and is consequently forbidden what new thing does he teach us surely we have learned she is forbidden to him for all time since she was forbidden to him for one moment it might have been assumed that this applies only to the case where she was not suitable for him at all during the period of her first subjection but that where she was at all suitable for him during her first subjection it might have been assumed that she should be permitted hence he taught us that it was not so but we have learned this also if two brothers were married to two sisters and one of the brothers died and afterwards the wife of the second brother Died behold she is forbidden to him for all time since she was forbidden to him for one moment it might have been assumed that this law is applicable only there because she was completely forced out of that house but here where she was not entirely forced out of that house it might have been said that as she is suitable for the brother who married the stranger she is also suitable for the other brother hence he taught us that she was not Mishnah if two of three brothers were married to two sisters and the third was married to a stranger and one of the sisters husbands divorced his wife and when the brother who was married to the stranger died he who had divorced his wife married her and then died himself this is a case concerning which it was said and if any of these died or were divorced their rivals are permitted tomorrow the reason is because he had divorced his wife first and his brother died afterwards but if the other had died first and he divorced his wife Afterwards she is forbidden said Arashi this proves that a Levi rate bond exists even where two brothers are involved but as to Arashi's inference does not that of Arnaman present a difficulty Arashi can answer you the same law that the stranger is to perform the halizah and that she is not to be taken in Levi rate marriage is applicable even to the case where no Mamar had been addressed and the only reason why Mamar was at all mentioned was in order to exclude the ruling of Beth Shammai. Since they maintain that a Mamar constitutes Talmud, Mas Yabamath be a perfect Kanyan he taught us that the Halachah is not in accordance with Beth Shammai but then as to Arnaman's inference does not that of Arashi present a difficulty and should you reply that the same law that her rival is permitted is also applicable to the case where he died first and the other brother divorced his wife afterwards what it could be objected with this is excluded might exclude the case where he Married her first and then divorced his wife. This might be a satisfactory explanation if he holds the view of our Jeremiah who said, Break it up, he who taught the one did not teach the other. For if this is so, one Tana may hold the opinion that it is death that causes the subjection, while the other might be of the opinion that it is the original marriage that causes the subjection, and this is would thus exclude the case where he first married and then divorced, if however he is of the same opinion as Rabbah who said both statements may in fact represent the views of one Tana, it being a case of this, and there is no need to state that what does this is exclude, he has no alternative but to adopt the view of our Jeremiah, and according to Rabbah, the explanation would be satisfactory if he held the view of our Ashi, for then this is would exclude the case of one who died without first divorcing his wife, if however he holds the same view as Arnaman, what would this is exclude, he has no. Alternative but to accept the view of Arashi Mishnah if in the case of any one of all these the betrothal or divorce was in doubt behold these rivals must perform the halizah but may not be taken in Levi rate marriage what is meant by doubtful betrothal if when he threw to her a token of betrothal it was uncertain whether it fell nearer to him or nearer to her this is a case of doubtful betrothal doubtful divorce if he wrote a letter of divorce in his own handwriting and it bore no signatures of witnesses or if it bore signatures but no date or if it bore a date but the signature of only one witness this is a case of doubtful divorce Gemara in the case of divorce however it is not stated it was uncertain whether it fell nearer to him or nearer to her what is the reason Rabbi replied this woman is in a state of permissibility to all men would you forbid her marriage because of a doubt you must not forbid her because of a doubt said Abbe to him if so let us also in the matter of Betrothal say this woman is in a state of permissibility to the lover would you forbid her because of a doubt you must not forbid her because of a doubt there it leads to a restriction but it is a restriction which may lead to a relaxation for sometimes he would betroth her sister by betrothal that was not uncertain or it might occur that another man would betroth her also by a betrothal that was not uncertain and as the master has forbidden her rival to be taken in Levi rate marriage it would be assumed that the betrothal of the first was valid and that that of the latter was not Talmud. Mas Yabamath since she is required to perform Halizah it is sufficiently known that it is a mere restriction if so let him in the case of divorce also state it and require her to perform Halizah and it will be sufficiently known that it was a mere restriction were you to say that she was to perform Halizah it might also be assumed that she may be taken in Levi rate marriage but here also were you to say that she is to perform Halizah, she might also be taken in Levi rate marriage. Well, let her be taken in Levi rate marriage, and it will not matter at all, since thereby she only retains her former status. Have raised the following objection against him if the house collapsed upon him and upon his brother's daughter, and it is not known which of them had died first. Her rival must perform Halizah, but may not contract the Levi rate marriage. But why here also it may be said this woman finds herself in the status of permissibility to all. Would you forbid her marriage on the basis of a doubt? You must not forbid her on the basis of a doubt. And should you suggest that here also the prohibition is due to a restriction, it may be retorted that it is a restriction which may result in a relaxation. For should you say that she is to perform the Halizah, she might also be taken in Levi rate marriage in respect of divorce, which is a frequent occurrence. The rabbis enacted a Preventive measure in respect of the collapse of a house which is not a frequent occurrence the rabbis did not enact any preventive measure or else in the case of divorce where the forbidden relative is demonstrably alive were her rival to be required to perform halizah it might have been thought that the rabbis had ascertained that the letter of divorce was a valid document and the rival might therefore be taken in Levi rate marriage in the case of a house that has collapsed however could the rabbis have ascertained who was first killed in the ruin have we not learned a similar law in the case of divorce surely we learned if she stood in a public domain and he threw it to her she is divorced if it fell nearer to her but if nearer to him she is not divorced if it was equidistant she is divorced and not divorced and when it was asked what is the practical effect of this the reply was that if he was a priest she is forbidden to him and if she is a forbidden relative her rival must Perform the halizah. We do not say, however, that were you to rule that she must perform halizah, she might also be taken in Levi rate marriage. Concerning this statement, surely it was said both Rabbah and our Joseph maintain that here we are dealing with two groups of witnesses, one of which declare that it was nearer to her, and the other declares that it was nearer to him, which creates a doubt involving a
a sound state of mind and another peer came and declared that the sale was effected while he was in a state of lunacy and Arashi said put two against two Talmud, Mas Yavamat B and let the land remain in the possession of the lunatic rather said Abay its friend tell concerning it that which was taught in connection with betrothal is also to be applied to divorce and what was taught in connection with divorce is also to be applied to betrothal said Rabba to him if its friend telleth. Concerning it what was the object of stating this is rather said Rabba whatever is applicable to betrothal is also to be applied to divorce but certain points are applicable to divorce which cannot be applied to betrothal and this is which was mentioned in the case of divorce is not to be taken literally as this is was used in connection with betrothal only because it was also used in connection with divorce what was this is mentioned in connection with betrothal meant to exclude to exclude. The question of date which is inapplicable to betrothal and wherefore was no date ordained to be entered in documents of betrothal this may well be satisfactorily explained according to him who holds that the date is required in a letter of divorce on account of the usufruct since a betrothed woman has no need to reclaim usufruct according to him however who holds that it was ordained on account of one sister's daughter the insertion of a date should have been ordained in the case. Of betrothal also since some men betrothed with money and others betrothed with a document the rabbis did not ordain the inclusion of a date said Ara Hassan of our Joseph to Arashi what about the case of a slave of whom some acquire possession by means of money and others by means of a deed yet the inclusion of a date has nevertheless been ordained by the rabbis in that case acquisition is generally by means of a deed here it is generally by means of money if you prefer I might say because it is. Impossible for how should one proceed were it to be left with her she might erase it were it to be left with him it might happen that the betrothed might be his sister's daughter and he would shield her were it to be left with the witness as well if they remember they could come and tender their evidence and if they do not they may sometimes consult the document and then come and tender evidence while the all merciful said out of their mouth but not out of their writing if so let the same argument be applied to divorce also there it comes to save her here it comes to condemn her mission in the case where three brothers were married to three women who were strangers to one another and one of them having died the second brother addressed to her among and died behold these must perform Elizabeth may not be taken in leave right marriage for it is said and one of them died etc her husband's brother shall go in unto her only she who is bound to one lover but not she who is Bound to two lovers are Simeon said he may take in Levirate marriage whichever of these he wishes and then participate in the Eliza with the other Gemara if however the Levirate bond with two lovers is Pentateuch even Eliza should not be required but it is only rabbinical preventive measure having been enacted against the possible assumption that two sisters-in-law coming from the same house may both be taken in Levirate marriage then let one be taken in Levirate marriage and the other be required to perform Eliza preventive measure has been enacted against the possible assumption that one house was partially built Talmud, Masi of and partially pulled down well let the assumption be made had he first contracted the Levirate marriage and then participated in the Eliza no objection could be raised the preventive measure however has been enacted against the possibility of his participating in the Eliza first and contracting the Levirate marriage afterwards and Thus placing himself under the prohibition of that doth not build up the all merciful having said since he had not built he must never again build Rabba said if he gave a letter of divorce in respect of his mom her rival is permitted but she herself is forbidden because she might be mistaken for one who is the holder of a letter of divorce others say that Rabba said if he gave a letter of divorce in respect of his mom even she herself becomes permitted what is the reason because what he has done to her he has taken back Mishnah if two brothers were married to two sisters and one of the brothers died and afterwards the wife of the second brother died behold she is forbidden to him forever since she was forbidden to him for one moment Gemara is not this obvious if there where she was not entirely excluded from that house it has been said no how much more so here where the widow is completely excluded from that house the Tana had taught first this while the other was regarded by him as a permissible case and so he permitted it later however he came to regard it as a case that was to be forbidden and as it was dear to him he placed it first while our Mishnah was allowed to remain in its original form our rabbis learned if he had intercourse with her he is guilty on account of both his brother's wife and his wife's sister so our Jose our Simeon said he is guilty on account of his brother's wife on why but surely it was taught that our Simeon said he is guilty on account of his wife's sister only this is no difficulty there it is a case where the surviving brother had married first and the deceased had married afterwards here it is a case where the deceased had married first and the surviving brother afterwards as to our Simeon in the case where the deceased had married first and the surviving brother married afterwards let her since the prohibition of wife's sister cannot take effect be permitted even to contract the Levirate marriage Arashi replied it. Prohibition of wife's sister remains suspended and as soon as the prohibition of brother's wife is removed the prohibition of wife's sister comes into force hence it cannot be treated as non-existent does then our Jose hold the view that one prohibition may be imposed upon another surely it was taught a man who committed a transgression which involves two death penalties is punished by the severer one our Jose said he is to be dealt with in accordance with that prohibition which came into force. First and it was taught how is one to understand our Jose's statement that sentence must be in accordance with the prohibition which came into force first if the woman was first his mother-in-law and then became also a married woman he is to be sentenced for an offense against his mother-in-law if she was first a married woman and then became his mother-in-law he is to be sentenced for an offense against a married woman Talmud. Mas Yabamath B. Arabad replied our Jose admits worth it. Latter prohibition is of a wider range. This is satisfactory in the case where the surviving brother had married first and the deceased had married afterwards. Since the prohibition having been extended in the case of the brothers had also been extended in his own case, what extension of the prohibition is there, however, where the deceased had married first and the surviving brother had married afterwards? And were you to reply because thereby he is forbidden to marry all the sisters, it may be retorted that such is only a comprehensive prohibition. The fact is said, Rabbi, he is deemed to have committed two offenses but is liable for one only. Similarly, when Rabin came, he stated in the name of our Yohan, and the offender is deemed to have committed two offenses but he is only liable for one. What practical difference does this will make that he must be buried among confirmed sinners? This is a question on which opinions differ, for it was stated a common man who performed some temple service on it. Sabbath is Arhai said liable for two offenses Barkapur said he is only liable for one Arhai jumped up and took an oath by the temple he exclaimed so have I heard from Rabbi two Barkapur jumped up and took an oath by the temple thus have I heard from Rabbi one Arhai began to argue the point thus work on the Sabbath was forbidden to all Israelites and when it was permitted in the sanctuary it was permitted to the priests hence it was permitted to the priests only but not to common men here therefore is involved the offense of temple service by a common man and that of the desecration of the Sabbath Barkapur began to argue his point thus work on the Sabbath was forbidden to all Israelites but when it was permitted in the sanctuary it was permitted to all hence only the offense of temple service by a common man is here involved a priest having a blemish who performed some temple services while unclean is Arhai said guilty of two offenses Barkapur said he is guilty of one offense only Arhai jumped up and took an oath by the temple thus have I heard from Rabbi two Barkapur jumped up and took an oath by the temple thus have I heard from Rabbi one Arhai began to reason temple service during one's uncleanness was forbidden to all and when it was permitted in the sanctuary it was permitted to priests who had no blemish hence it must have been permitted only to priests who had no blemish but not to those who had consequently both it. Offense of service being done by one with a blemish and that of service during one's uncleanness are here involved Barkapur began to reason thus temple service during uncleanness was forbidden to all when it was permitted at the sanctuary was universally permitted consequently only one offense that of service by one who had a blemish is involved a common man who ate Melika is Arhai said guilty of two offenses Barkapur said he is guilty only of one Arhai jumped up and took an oath. By the temple, so I heard from Rabbi two Barkapur jumped up and took an oath by the temple, so I heard from Rabbi one Arhai began to reason thus Nibla was forbidden to all, and when it was permitted in the sanctuary, it was permitted in the case of the priests, hence it must be permitted to priests only and not to common men. Consequently, both the offense of consumption by a common man and that of Melika are here involved.
Forbidden to eat of sacrificial meat, so he was also forbidden to perform the temple service. Murah, however, is only an illustration of prohibitions that set in simultaneously, but not of a comprehensive prohibition. Rather, the point at issue between them is that of simultaneous prohibitions and Arhose's view regarding them are high is of the opinion that in the case of simultaneous prohibitions, Arhose deems the transgressor guilty of two offenses, while Barkabra is of the opinion that he deems him guilty of one offense only. But how are your simultaneous prohibitions possible in the case of a common man who performed the temple service on the Sabbath when, for instance, he grew two hairs on the Sabbath so that the prohibitions of temple service by a common man and of work on the Sabbath have simultaneously arisen in the case of a priest who had a blemish also when, for instance, he grew two hairs while he was unclean so that his disability as a man with a blemish and his uncleanness have simultaneously arisen or else if a man cut his finger with an unclean knife now according to the statement of Arhai it is quite possible to explain that he was taught in accordance with the view of Arhose and that Barkapra was taught in accordance with the view of Arsimian according to the statement of Barkapra however did Arhai swear falsely rather the question at issue between them is that of simultaneous prohibitions and the view of Arsimian on the subject one can well understand why Arhai took an oath he did it in order to weaken the force of Arsimian's view what need however was there for Barkapra to take an oath this is a difficulty now according to the statement of Barkapra it is possible to explain that when Rabbi taught him he was enunciating the opinion of Arsimian and that when he taught Arhai he was enunciating the opinion of Arhose according to the statement of Arhai however did Barkapra tell a lie Arhai can answer you when Rabbi taught him he taught him two instances only where the transgressor is exempt Talmud, Mas Yavamat B and thereby he in fact taught him the law of comprehensive prohibition in accordance with the view of our Simeon Barkapra however considered the case of a common man who ate Melika and as it seemed to be similar to the others he treated it like the others when later he examined it and found it to be possible only as a case of simultaneity of prohibitions he imagined that as this one is a case of simultaneity so are also the others cases of simultaneity and as the others are cases where the transgressor is exempt so he assumed is this also one in which the transgressor is exempt an objection was raised if a common man performed some temple service on the Sabbath or if a priest having a blemish performed temple service while he was levitically unclean the offenses of service by a common man and the desecration of the Sabbath or those of service by a man with a blemish and Levitical uncleanness are here respectively involved. These are the words of Arhose Arsimian who said only the offense of service by a common man or that of service by a man with a blemish respectively is here involved. The case of Melika, however, is here omitted now on account of whom was it omitted if it be suggested on account of Arhose it may be retorted if Arhose subjects one to two penalties where the prohibition is comprehensive how much more so when it is simultaneous consequently it must have been on account of Arsimian who thus grants exemption only where the prohibition is comprehensive but imposes both penalties when the prohibitions are simultaneous this then is a refutation against Barkaper this is indeed a refutation if a common man performs some temple service on the Sabbath of what nature if slaughtering slaughtering is permitted by a common man if reception or carriage this involves only a mere movement if burning surely Arhose said the prohibition of Kindling a fire on the Sabbath was mentioned separately in order to indicate that its transgression is a prohibition only Arahabi Jacob replied the slaughtering of the bullock of the high priest and in accordance with the view of him who stated that the slaughtering of the bullock of the high priest on the day of atonement by a common man is invalid if so what reason is there for mentioning a common man even a common priest would have been equally forbidden what was meant was one who is a common man as far as it is concerned Arashi demurred was any mention made of sin offerings or of negative precepts surely only forbidden acts were spoken of the point at issue is whether he is to be buried among confirmed sinners mission if two men betrothed two women and as these were entering into the bridal chamber they exchanged the one for the other behold they are guilty of an offense against a married woman if they were brothers they are guilty also of an offense against the brothers Wife, if the betrothed women were sisters, they are guilty also on account of the prohibition, and thou shalt not take a woman to her sluster. If these were menstruants, they are guilty also on account of the law of the menstruant. They must be kept apart for three months, since it is possible that they are pregnant. If they were minors incapable of bearing children, they may be restored at once. If they were priestly women, they are disqualified from the priesthood. Gemara, they exchanged, are we? Discussing wicked men, furthermore, there is a difficulty of the statement made by our high that sixteen sin offerings are here involved. Is any sacrifice brought where the act was willful? Rabbi Judah replied, Red, they were exchanged. This may also be proved by logical reasoning, for in the latter clause it was stated, if they were minors incapable of bearing children, they may be restored at once. Now, if the act had been willful, would this have been permitted? This is no difficulty. The seduction. Of a minor is deemed to be an outrage and an outraged woman is permitted to an Israelite but then what of that which is stated that they must be kept apart for three months since it is possible that they are pregnant implying that if they were not pregnant they would be permitted now if the act had been willful would she be permitted consequently the reading must have been they were exchanged this may be taken as proof Talmud, Mas Yav and who is this Tana that admits the force of a comprehensive prohibition a prohibition of a wider range and simultaneous prohibitions Rab Judah replied in the name of Rabbit is Armadir for we learned a man may sometimes consume one piece of food and incur thereby the penalty of four sin offerings and one guilt offering if eg a man levitically unclean ate suit that remained over from holy sacrifices on the day of atonement Armadir said if this happened on the Sabbath and the consumer carried out the suit in his mouth liability is incurred for this act also they said to him this is an offense of a different character whose view however is our mayor following if he follows our Joshua surely the latter had said that he who made a mistake in respect of a commandment is exonerated rather he follows the view of our Eliezer if you prefer I might say he may in fact follow the view of our Joshua for our Joshua statement that he who made a mistake in respect of a commandment is exonerated may only be applicable to the case of the children where one is pressed for time but not in such a case as this where time is not pressing what about Teramah where one is not pressed for time and he nevertheless exonerates for we learned in the case of a priest who was in the habit of eating Teramah and it then transpired that he was the son of a divorced woman or of a Halis our Eliezer imposes payment of the principal and of a fifth and our Joshua exonerates surely in relation to this it was stated that our BBB Abbe said we are here speaking of Teramah on the eve of Passover when time is pressing if you prefer I might say our mission speaks of simultaneous prohibitions and may represent even the view of our Simeon all these it may well be conceded may occur simultaneously where the brothers appointed an agent and the sisters also appointed an agent and one agent met the other but how could such simultaneity occur with menstruation Aram Rum in the name of Rab replied when the women's menstrual discharge continued from the men's 13th until after their 13th birthday when these become subject to legal punishments and from their own 12th until after their 12th birthday when they themselves become subject to punishments they must be kept apart surely no woman conceives from the first contact Aram Rum replied in the name of Rabbi Abu where contact was repeated why then did our highest state behold 16 offerings are here involved when in fact there should be 32 and according to your Line of reasoning following the opinion of our Eliezer who deems they are guilty for every sexual effort are there not more but your own answer would be that he only takes into consideration the first effort while here also only the first contact is taken into consideration said Rabbi to Arnam and Talmud, Mas Yavamath be surely Tamar conceived from the first contact the other answered him Tamar exercised friction with her finger for our Isaac said all women of the house of Rabbi who exercise friction are designated Tamar and why are they designated Tamar because Tamar exercised friction with her finger but were there not ER and Onan ER and Onan indulged in unnatural intercourse an objection was raised during all the 24 months one may thresh within and winnow without these are the words of our Eliezer the other said to him such actions are only like the practice of ER and Onan like the practice of ER and Onan and yet not exactly like the practice of ER and Onan like the practice of er and onan for it is written in scripture and it came to pass when he went in unto his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground and not exactly like the practice of er and onan for whereas there it was an unnatural act here it is done in the natural way the
husband and then remarried would bear children no more said Arnaman this was stated only in respect of one who had no intention of remarrying if however one's intention was to marry again she may concede Rabba said to Arhista's daughter the rabbis are talking about you she answered him I had my mind on you a woman once appeared before our Joseph and said to him master I remained unmarried after the death of my husband for ten years and now I gave birth to a child he said to her my daughter do not discredit the words of the sages she thereupon confessed I had intercourse with a heathen Samuel said all these women with the exception of a proselyte and an emancipated slave who were minors must wait three months an Israelite minor however must wait three months but how was she separated if by a declaration of refusal surely Samuel said that she need not wait and if by a letter of divorce surely Samuel has already stated this once for Samuel said if she formally refused him she need not wait three months if he gave her a letter of divorce she must wait three months dash it was rather in respect of unlawful intercourse Talmud, Masya Bamatha Talmud, Masya Bamatha the rabbis having made the provision in the case of a minor as a precaution against one who is of age but is provision made in the case of a minor as a precaution against one who is of age surely we learned if they were minors incapable of bearing children they may be restored at once Arhidal replied this was a Special ruling does this imply that such a case had actually occurred rather this is the meaning it was like a special ruling since the exchange of brides is an unusual occurrence others adopt a different reading Samuel said all these women with the exception of a proselyte and an emancipated slave who were of age must wait three months an Israelite minor however need not wait three months but how was she separated if by a declaration of refusal surely Samuel has already stated this. One and if by a letter of divorce Samuel surely stated that she must wait for Samuel said if she exercised her right of refusal against him she need not wait three months if he gave her a letter of divorce she must wait three months it was rather in respect of harlotry and harlotry with a minor an unusual occurrence let however a preventive measure be made in respect of a proselyte and an emancipated slave with whom harlotry is not unusual he holds the same view as our Jose for it was taught. Proselytes kept a vessel or slaves who were redeemed or embraced the Jewish faith or were emancipated must wait three months so our Jude our Jose permits immediate betrothal and marriage. Rabbi said what is our Jose's reason he is of the opinion that a woman who plays the harlot makes use of an absorbent in order to prevent conception said Abbe to him this is intelligible in the case of a proselyte as her intention is to embrace the Jewish faith she is careful in order to know the distinction between the seed that was sown in holiness and the seed that was sown in unholiness it is also intelligible in the case of a captive and a slave since on hearing from their masters they exercise care how is this to be applied however in the case of one who is liberated through the loss of a tooth or an eye and were you to suggest that wherever something unexpected happens our Jose admits surely it was taught a woman who had been outraged or seduced must wait three months so our Jude our Jose permits Immediate betrothal and marriage rather said of a woman playing the harlot turns over in order to prevent conception and the other there is the apprehension that she might not have turned over properly if they were priestly women etc. Only priestly women but not an Israelitish woman read if they were the wives of priests only priests wives but not Israelites wives surely Aram Rome said the following statement was made to us by our she's hate who threw light on the subject from our mission. Israelites wife who was outraged though she is permitted to her husband is disqualified from the priesthood Robert replied it is this that was meant if they were priestly women married to Israelites they are disqualified from eating terima at their parents home Talmud. Masya Bamath B.C.H.A.P.T.E.R.I.V. Mishnah if a lover participated in Elizabeth with his deceased brother's wife who was subsequently found to be pregnant and she gave birth he is wherever the child is viable permitted to marry. Her relatives and she is permitted to marry his relatives and he does not render her unfit for the priesthood but wherever the child is not viable the lover is forbidden to marry her relatives and she is forbidden to marry his relatives and he renders her unfit to marry a priest if a lover married his deceased brother's wife who is found to have been pregnant and she gave birth he wherever the child is viable must divorce her and both are under the obligation of bringing an offering but if it child is not viable he may retain her if it is doubtful whether it is a nine-month child of the first husband or a seven-month child of the second husband she must be divorced and the child is legitimate but they are under the obligation of an ashamtali it was stated in the case of a lover who participated in Eliza with a pregnant woman who subsequently miscarried Aryohan and said she need not perform the Eliza with the brothers and Reshlegish said she must perform Eliza. With the brothers, Aryohan said she need not perform Eliza with the brothers because the Eliza of a pregnant woman is deemed to be proper Eliza and marital contact with a pregnant woman is deemed to be proper marriage. Reshlegish said she must perform Eliza with the brothers because the Eliza with a pregnant woman is not deemed to be a proper Eliza nor is marital contact with a pregnant woman deemed to be a proper marriage. On what principle do they differ? If you wish, I might say. In the interpretation of a scriptural text, and if you prefer, I might say on a logical point. If you wish, I might say in the interpretation of a scriptural text, Aryohan is of the opinion that the all-merciful said and have no child, and this man surely has none. While Reshlegish is of the opinion that and have no and low child implies hold an inquiry concerning him. And if you prefer, I might say on a logical point, Aryohan argues had Elijah appeared and announced that the woman would miscarry. Would she not have been subject to Elizabeth or Levi right marriage now also the fact is established retrospectively and Reshlakish maintains that a fact cannot be said to have been established retrospectively are Yohanan raised an objection against Reshlakish wherever the child is not viable the lover is forbidden to marry her relatives and she is forbidden to marry his relatives and he renders her unfit to marry a priest this is quite correct according to my view since I maintain that the Eliza of a pregnant woman is a proper Eliza he consequently renders her unfit according to you however who maintain that the Eliza of a pregnant woman is not proper Eliza why does he render her unfit to marry a priest the other answered him it is only rabbinical and it is a mere restriction others say Reshlakish raised an objection against Aryohan and wherever the child is not viable the lover is forbidden to marry her relatives and she is forbidden to marry his relatives and he renders her Unfit to marry a priest this is quite correct according to my view since I maintain that the Eliza of a pregnant woman is not a proper Eliza it was justly stated as a restriction that he renders her unfit to marry a priest but not that she requires no Eliza from the brothers according to you however it should have been stated that she requires no Eliza from the brothers the other replied it should have been indeed only because in the first clause it was stated he does not render her unfit it was also stated in the latter clause he renders her unfit are Yohanan raised an objection against Reshlakish if the child is not viable he may retain her this is quite correct according to my view since I maintain that the Eliza of a pregnant woman is a proper Eliza and marital contact with a pregnant woman is a proper marriage it was rightly stated he may retain her according to you however who maintain that the Eliza of a pregnant woman is not a valid Eliza and the marital Contact with a pregnant woman is not a valid marriage it should have been stated he must repeat contact and only then he may retain her the meaning of he may retain her is that he must repeat contact and then he may retain her but not otherwise others say Reshlakish raised an objection against Aryohan and if the child is not viable he may retain her this is quite correct according to my view since I maintain that the Eliza of a pregnant woman is not a valid Eliza and marital contact with a pregnant woman is not a valid marriage it was rightly stated he may retain her meaning that he must repeat contact and then he may retain her since otherwise this would not have been permitted according to you however it should have been stated if he wishes he may divorce her and if he prefers he may continue to live with her it should have been indeed only because in the earlier clause it was stated he must divorce her it was also stated in the latter clause he may retain her an objection was raised where a lover married his Yebama who was found to be pregnant her rival may not be married since it is possible that the child would be viable on the contrary if the child were viable her rival would be exempt but read since it is possible that the child would not be viable now if it could be imagined that marital contact with a pregnant woman is to be regarded as a valid marriage why may not her rival be married she should be exempted through the marital contact of her associate. Abbe replied both agree that by marital contact she does not exempt her rival they differ only on the question of Eliza are Yohanan is of the opinion that the Eliza of a pregnant woman is a valid Eliza though marital contact with a
is possible that the child would be viable and neither marital contact nor Elizabeth but only the child brings exemption and the child brings exemption only after he is born the reason and is because it is possible that the child might be viable but where the child is not viable her rival is exempt does this imply an objection against Reshlakish Reshlakish can answer you that the Beretha is thus to be interpreted where a lover married his Yebama who was found to be pregnant her rival may not be married since it is possible that the child may not be viable and Elizabeth a pregnant woman is no valid Elizabeth nor is a marital contact with a pregnant woman a proper marriage and were you to suggest that one should be guided by the majority of women and the majority of women bear healthy children it could be retorted that a child brings no exemption until he is actually born said Aurelia is it possible that there should exist such a ruling as that of Reshlakish and that we should not have learned it in a mission when he went out he carefully considered the matter and found one for we learned if people came to a woman whose husband and rival had gone to a country beyond the sea and told her your husband is dead she may neither be married nor be taken in leave right marriage until she has ascertained whether her rival is pregnant one can well understand why she may not be taken in leave right marriage since it is possible that the child may be viable and the lover would thus infringe the Pentateuchal prohibition against marrying a brother's wife but why should she not perform the Eliza it is possible to understand the reason why she must not perform the Eliza within the nine months and also contract a marriage within nine months since such procedure would naturally be forbidden on account of the doubt but let her perform the Eliza within the nine months and be married after the nine months but even in accordance with your view let her perform the Eliza and be married after the nine months the fact however is that nothing may be inferred from this for both Abbe Bavin and Arhina Abbe Bavin stated it is possible that the child might be viable and you would then subject her to the necessity of an announcement in respect of the priesthood well let her be subjected it may happen that someone would be present at the Eliza and not at the announcement and would form the opinion that Haliza was permitted to a priest said Abbe to him was it stated she shall neither perform Eliza nor be taken in leave right marriage the statement surely was she shall neither be married nor be taken in leave right marriage without Eliza if Eliza however had been performed she would indeed have been permitted it was taught in agreement with Reshlakish where a lover participated in the Eliza with a pregnant woman who subsequently miscarried she is required to perform Eliza with the brothers Rabba said the law is in accordance with the views of Reshif on the other hand a viable child had been born exemption took effect at his birth and subsequent marriage would consequently be lawful as the mission however forbids Eliza and marriage even after the nine months unless definite information about the rival had been received it must be assumed to represent the view of Reshlakish who deems Eliza invalid wherever the child is not viable and the ceremony took place during pregnancy Lakish in the following three rulings one is the Ruling just spoken of another is his ruling in connection with the following mission if a man distributed his property verbally and gave to one son more and to another less or if he assigned to the firstborn a share equal to that of his brothers his arrangements are valid if however he said as an inheritance his instructions are disregarded if he wrote either at the beginning or the end or the middle as a gift his instructions are valid Talmud, Mas Yabam B and in connection with this. Reshlakish stated no possession is ever acquired unless the testator had said let X and Y inherit this and that particular field which I have assigned to them as a gift so that they may inherit them and the third is his ruling in connection with the following mission if a man assigned all his estate in writing to his son to be his after his death the father may not sell it because it is assigned to the son and the son may not sell it because it is in the possession of the father if it Father sold the estate the sale is valid until his death if the son sold it the buyer has no claim whatsoever upon it until the father's death and it was stated if the son sold the estate during the lifetime of his father and died while his father was still alive Aryohan and said the buyer does not acquire ownership and Reshlakish said the buyer does acquire ownership Aryohan and said that the buyer does not acquire ownership because possession of usufruct is like possession of the capital and Reshlakish said that the buyer does acquire ownership because possession of usufruct is not like possession of the capital but if the child is not viable etc. Atana taught it has been said in the name of Arlizer that he must put her out by means of a letter of divorce said Rabbi Armeir and Arlizer taught the same law Arlizer in the ruling just mentioned Armeir in the following Beretha wherein it was taught a man shall not marry the pregnant or nursing wife of another and if he married he must put her out and never remarry her so Armeir but the sages said he shall let her go and at the proper time he may marry her again Abbe said to him how do you arrive at such a conclusion which may possibly be wrong Arlizer's ruling might extend to the present case only because the lover is encroaching upon the prohibition of brother's wife which is pentacle but there where the prohibition is only rabbinical he may hold the same view as the rabbis alternatively it is possible that R. Meir's ruling extends only to that case because the prohibition is rabbinical and the sages have given more force to their provisions than to those which are pentacle but not to the case here where the prohibition is pentacle and people as a rule keep away from it Rabbi said even according to the ruling of the rabbis he must let her go from him by means of a letter of divorce said Marzitra this may also be deduced since the expression used was he shall put her out and not he shall let her part this proves it or as she said to our Hashai son of Aridi elsewhere it was taught our Simeon B. Gamaliel said any human child that survived for 30 days cannot be regarded as a miscarriage had he not lived so long however he would have been a doubtful case but it was also stated where he died within 30 days and she was subsequently betrothed Rabbi said in the name of Rabbi that if she was the wife of an Israelite she must perform the Halizah and if she was the wife of a priest she must not perform the Halizah our Meshashi said in the name of Rabbi the one as well as the other must perform the Halizah said Rabbi to our Meshashi Talmud Mas Yabam the Rabbi said so in the evening but on the following morning he retracted the other exclaimed so you have permitted with that you permitted also abdominal fat now what is the law here in respect of the pregnant or nursing wife of another man who was married to a priest did the rabbis make any provision for a priest or not? Other replied what a comparison the distinction is well justified there since the rabbis differ from our Simeon B. Gamaliel in maintaining that the child is deemed to be sound even though he did not live long enough we may in the case of a priest's wife where no other course is open act in accordance with the view of the rabbis here however in accordance with whose view could we act if in accordance with that of our Meir he surely stated that he must put her out and never remarry her and if in accordance with the view of the rabbis they surely stated that she must be sent away by means of a letter of divorce it was stated the case of the man who betrothed the woman within the three months and fled is one concerning which Araha and Raphram are at variance one holds that the man is to be placed under the ban but the other holds that his flight is sufficient such an incident once happened and Raphram ruled his flight is sufficient if it is doubtful whether it is a nine-month child Etc. said Rabbi to Arnaman, let the ruling be that one is to go by the majority of women and the majority of women bear at nine months. The other replied, Are women bear at seven months? Are your women the first retorted the majority of the world? What I mean, the other replied, Is this most women bear at nine months and a minority at seven? And the embryo in the case of every woman who bears at nine is recognizable after a third of the period of her pregnancy. And in the case of this woman, since her embryo was not recognized after a third of the period of her pregnancy, her presumption to belong to the majority is impaired. If in the case of every woman, however, who bears at nine, the embryo is recognizable after a third of the period of her pregnancy, it is obvious that with this woman, since her embryo had not been recognized after a third of the period of her pregnancy, it must be a seven months child of the second husband, but say rather when a woman bears at nine months, her embryo in. Most cases is recognizable after a third of her pregnancy and with this woman since her embryo was not recognized after a third of the period of her pregnancy her presumption to belong to the majority is impaired our rabbis taught the first child is fit to be a high priest and the second is deemed a bastard owing to his doubtful origin our Elizabeth B. Jacob said he is not of doubtful bastardy what does he mean Abbe replied it is this that he meant the first child is fit to be a high priest while the second is one of doubtful bastardy and is consequently forbidden to marry a bastard our Elizabeth B. Jacob said he is not one of doubtful bastardy but an assured bastard and is consequently permitted to marry a bastard Robert replied it is this that was meant the first is fit to be a high priest and the second on account of his doubtful
and a Sufi and all these may intermarry and you state that the Halajah is in accordance with the ruling of our Eliezer now Abay upholds the opinion of Samuel who stated that the Halajah is in agreement with the ruling of Hillel and consequently brings the ruling of our Eliezer B. Jacob into harmony with the Halajah so that there may be no contradiction between the one Halajah and the other Rabbah on the other hand upholds the opinion of Rab who stated that the Halajah is in agreement with the ruling of our Eliezer and so he brings the ruling of our Eliezer B. Jacob into harmony with the Halajah in order that there may be no contradiction Talmud, Masya Bamat B between one Halajah and the other said Abay once do I infer that our Eliezer B. Jacob treats any doubtful case as a certainty from what was taught our Eliezer B. Jacob said behold when a man has intercourse with many women and does not know with which particular woman he had intercourse and similarly when a woman with whom many Men had intercourse does not know to which particular man her conception is due the consequences are that a father will be marrying his daughter and a brother his sister and the whole world will be filled with bastards and concerning this it was said and the land became full of lewdness and Rabbah he can answer you it is this that was meant what might be the result more than that was said by our Eliezer B. Jacob a man shall not marry a wife in one country and then proceed to marry one in another country since their children might marry one another and the result might be that a brother would marry his sister but surely this could not be the accepted ruling for Rab whenever he happened to visit Dardashir used to announce who would be mine for the day so also our Naman whenever he happened to visit Shekins abuse to announce who would be mine for the day the rabbis came under a special category since they are well known but did not Rabbah say a woman who had an offer of marriage and Accepted must allow a period of seven ritually clean days to pass the rabbis sent their representatives and these presented the announcements to the women and if you prefer I might say the rabbis only had them in their private rooms for the master said he who has bread in his basket cannot be compared to him who has no bread in his basket attended taught our Eliezer B. Jacob said a man must not marry a woman if it is his intention to divorce her for it is written devise not evil against thy neighbor seeing he dwelleth securely by thee if the doubtful son and the lover came to claim a share in the estate of the deceased the doubtful son pleading I am the son of the deceased and the estate is mine while the lover pleads you are my son and you have no claim whatsoever upon the estate it is a case of money of doubtful ownership and money the ownership of which is doubtful must be divided where the doubtful son and the sons of the lover came to claim their share in the estate of it. Deceased the doubtful son pleading I am the son of the deceased and the estate is mine while the sons of the lover plead you are our brother and you have only a share equal to ours it was the intention of the rabbis to submit to our measure that this was a case identical with that of a mission wherein we learned he does not inherit from them but they inherit from him since here the case is just the reverse there they tell him produce proof and take your share while here he tells them produce proof and take your share our measure however said to them are the two cases equal there their claim is a certainty while his is doubtful while here both are doubtful if however a case is to be compared to a mission it is to the following that of a doubtful son and the sons of the lover who came to claim shares in the estate of the lover himself where they can say to him produce proof that you are our brother and take your share if a doubtful son and the sons of the lover came to Claim their shares in the estate of the lover after the lover had received his share in the estate of the deceased the sons of the lover pleading produce proof that you are our brother and you will receive your share the doubtful son can tell them whatever you wish if I am your brother give me a share among you and if I am the son of the deceased return to me the half which your father received when he shared the estate with me said our Abba in the name of Rab the judgment must stand our Jeremiah said the judgment is to be reversed may it be suggested that they differ on the same principle as that which underlies the dispute between Edmund and the rabbis for we learned if a man went to a country beyond the sea and in his absence the path to his field was lost he shall Edmund said use the shortest cut but the sages said he must purchase a path even though it will cost him a hundred or else fly in the air and in discussing this mission it was pointed out against the rabbis that Edmund was perfectly right and Rab Judah replied in the name of Rab that here it is a case where the fields of four persons surrounded it on its four sides but it was asked what is Edmund's reason and Rab replied where four persons derive their rights of possession from four persons or where four persons derive it from one all agree that these can refuse him the dispute only concerns one person who derived his rights from four Edmund is of the opinion that he can tell him at all events my path is in your fields while the rabbis hold that the other can answer him if you will keep quiet well and good and if not I will return the deeds to their original owners whom you will have no chance to call to law may it then be suggested that our Abba holds a view of the rabbis and our Jeremiah that of Edmund our Abba can tell you I may even hold the view of Edmund he made his ruling there only because he can say to him whatever you wish to plead Talmud, Masya Bamatha, my only path lies in your Fields, but could such a plea be advanced here? And our Jeremiah can tell you, I may uphold even the view of the rabbis, for the rabbis made their ruling there only because he can tell him if you keep silence well and good, and if not, I will return the deeds to their original owners, and you will have no chance to call them to law. But could such a plea be advanced here, where a doubtful son and a lover came to claim their shares in the estate of the grandfather, the former pleading, I am the son of it. Deceased and half of the estate belongs therefore to me, while the lover pleads, you are my own son, and you have therefore no share whatsoever. The lover's claim being a certainty, and that of a doubtful son, a doubtful one doubt may not supersede a certainty, where the doubtful son and the sons of the lover came to claim their shares in the estate of their grandfather, the former pleading, I am the son of the deceased, and half of the estate is therefore mine, while the sons of the lover plead, you are. Our brother and you have a share like one of us they receive a half which he concedes to them while he receives the third which they concede to him and thus a sixth remains which being property of uncertain ownership is to be equally divided where the grandfather and the lover claim their shares in the estate of the doubtful son or where the grandfather and the doubtful son claim their shares in the estate of the lover the estate is to be regarded as money of uncertain ownership and is to be equally divided mission if a woman awaiting the decision of the lover came into the possession of property Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel agree that she may sell it or give it away and that her act is legally valid if she died what shall be done with her ketubah and with property that comes in and goes out with her Beth Shammai said the heirs of her husband are to share it with the heirs of her father and Beth Hillel said the property is to remain with those in whose possession it is hence. The Ketubah is to remain in the possession of the heirs of the husband while the property which comes in and goes out with her remains in the possession of the heirs of her father where he married her she is deemed to be his wife in every respect save that her Ketubah remains a charge on her first husband's estate tomorrow wherein does the first clause in which there is no dispute between them differ from the final clause in which they do dispute or reply the first clause deals with a woman who became subject to the Levirate marriage while betrothed and the final clause with one who became subject to the Levirate marriage while married Enola is of the opinion that the Levirate bond of a betrothed woman renders her doubtfully betrothed Talmud, Masya Bamath B Talmud, Masya Bamath B and the Levirate bond of a married woman renders her doubtfully married the Levirate bond of a betrothed woman renders her doubtfully betrothed for were we to assume that she is regarded as Definitely betrothed, how could both Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel agree that she may sell it or give it away and that her act is legally valid when we learned if she came into the possession of property while she was betrothed? Beth Shammai said she may sell it and Beth Hillel said she may not sell it, but both agree that if she had sold or had given it away, her act is legally valid. Consequently, it must be inferred that the Levi bond of a betrothed woman renders her doubtfully betrothed. The Levi bond of a married woman renders her doubtfully married, for had it been possible to assume that she is regarded as definitely married, how could Beth Shammai state that the heirs of her husband are to share it with the heirs of her father when we learned if she came into the possession of property while she was married? Both agree that if she had sold or given it away, her husband may seize it from the hand of the buyers. Consequently, it must be inferred that the Levi bond of a Married woman renders her doubtfully married said Rabbah to him why then do they dispute on the question of the estate itself after the death of the widow let them rather dispute on the question of the usufruct while she is alive no said Rabbah both clauses deal with property which came into her possession while she was married and the Levi bond of a married woman stamps her as doubtfully married in the
not there consequently the meaning must be that as they do not drink they are not to receive their ketha both now here surely it is a matter of doubt it being uncertain whether she did play the harlot or not and yet the doubt overrides a certainty consequently it must be inferred that a bond of indebtedness which is due for repayment is regarded as already repaid Abbe then should have raised his objection from this the law of a wife's ketha might be different owing to considerations of courtesy then let him raise his objection from the law of the Ketubah in our mission. They do not dispute this point, but do they not? Surely we learned if she died, what shall be done with her Ketubah and with property that comes in and goes out with her Beth Shammai said the ears of her husband are to share it with the ears of her father. Beth Hillel said the property is to remain with those in whose possession it is. It is this that was meant if she died, what shall be done with her Ketubah? And then the inquiry was abandoned as to property that comes in and goes out with her Beth Shammai said the ears of her husband are to share with the ears of her father. And Beth Hillel said the property is to remain with those in whose possession it is. Said our Ashi, the inference from the expressions in our mission leads to the same conclusion, for it was stated the ears of her husband are to share with the ears of her father, and it was not stated the ears of the father are to. Share it with the ears of the husband. This proves it. Reverting to the previous question, Abbe replied, The first clause deals with property that came into her possession while she was awaiting the decision of the lover, and the latter clause with such as came into her possession while she was still with her husband Talmud. Masi Abbe and Abbe maintains that a husband's rights have the same force as his wife said Robert to him if she came into possession of property while she was still with her husband. No one would dispute the view that his rights are superior to hers. Both clauses of our mission, however, deal with property which came into her possession while she was awaiting the decision of the lover. The first clause speaking of one to whom Amangmar had not been addressed, and the final clause of one to whom Amangmar had been addressed, and Robert is of the opinion that Amangmar, according to Beth Shammai, renders the widow definitely betrothed and doubtfully. Married, she is deemed to be definitely betrothed in respect of excluding her rival, and she is deemed to be doubtfully married in respect of taking a share in the property. A statement was made in the name of our Eliezer in agreement with Rabbah, and a statement was made in the name of our Jose, son of our Hannah, in agreement with Abbe. Could our Eliezer, however, have made such a statement? Surely our Eliezer said, Among our according to Beth Shammai, constitutes a Kenyan in so far only as to keep out the rival. Reverse the statements if you prefer, I might say there is really no need to reverse them, for our Eliezer can tell you what I said amounted to this that a letter of divorce alone is not enough, but that she requires also Eliza. Did I state, however, that the Mangmar constitutes no Kenyan even in respect of taking a share in her property? Said our Papa, the inference from our mission is in agreement with the opinion of Abbe, although if she died presents a difficulty seeing that it was stated. Property that comes in and goes out with her what is meant by comes in and what by goes out obviously comes into the possession of her husband and goes out from the possession of her husband into the possession of her father although if she died presents a difficulty why should they dispute on the question of the property itself which can arise only in the event of the woman's death let them rather dispute on the question of the usufruct which arises even when the woman is still alive it fact is that no further objection can be raised where he married her she is deemed etc for what practical law was the statement needed our Jose B had in a reply to indicate that he may divorce her by means of a letter of divorce and that he may remarry her he may divorce her by means of a letter of divorce is not this obvious it might have been assumed that since the all merciful set and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her she retains the obligation of the first Levi Relationship and so may be set free only through Elizabeth, but not through a letter of divorce. Hence, it was necessary to teach us that the law is not so he may remarry her. Is not this obvious? It might have been assumed that since he has already performed the commandment which the All Merciful has imposed upon him, she shall now be forbidden to him as the wife of his brother. Hence, it was necessary to teach us that he may nevertheless remarry her. Might it not be suggested that the law is so? Indeed, Scripture stated, and take her to him to wife as soon as he has taken her. She is deemed to be his wife in every respect, save that her kethub, etc. What is the reason a wife has been given to him from heaven? If, however, she is unable, nothing more. The inference from our mission is undoubtedly in agreement with the view of Abbe. The only difficulty being the one mentioned to obtain her kethub from her first husband provision was made that she is to receive it from the second in order. That it may not be easy for him to divorce her mission. The duty of the Levirate marriage is incumbent upon the eldest of the surviving brothers. If he declines, all the other brothers are approached. In turn, if they all decline, the eldest is again approached, and he is told the duty is incumbent upon you either submit to Elizabeth or perform the Levirate marriage. If he wish to suspend action until a minor becomes of age, or until the eldest returns from a country beyond the sea, or until a brother who was deaf or an imbecile should recover, he is not to be listened to, but is told the duty is incumbent upon you either submit to Elizabeth or perform the Levirate marriage. Tomorrow it was stated on the relative importance of the intercourse of a younger and the Elizabeth of an elder brother. There is a difference of opinion between our Yohanan and our Joshua B. Levi. One holds that the intercourse of the younger is preferable, and the other holds that the Elizabeth of the elder is preferable. One holds. That the intercourse of the younger is preferable because the commandment surely is to perform the Levirate marriage, and the other holds that the Elizabeth of the elder is preferable because in the presence of an elder brother the intercourse of the younger is valueless. We learned if he declined, all the other brothers are approached in turn. Does not this mean that he declined to contract the Levirate marriage but was willing to submit to the Elizabeth? And yet it was stated all the other brothers are approached in turn, which proves that the intercourse of the younger brother is preferred. No, he wished neither to submit to Elizabeth nor to perform the Levirate marriage. Similarly, then in the case of the other brothers, the meaning is that they declined both Elizabeth and Levirate marriage. Why then is the eldest again approached with the object of bringing pressure upon him? Let pressure be brought to bear upon them as the duty is incumbent upon him. Pressure also must be used against him. We Learned if he wished to suspend action until a minor becomes of age, he is not to be listened to. But if the intercourse of a minor is to be preferred, why is he not to be listened to? Let us rather wait since on becoming of age he might contract the Levirate marriage. Following your view, it might similarly be objected. Why, if he wished to wait until the eldest returns from a country beyond the sea, he is not to be listened to. Let us rather wait since on his return he might contract it. Levirate marriage. The fact is that the performance of a commandment must not be delayed. Talmud, Masiyah, Amit, some say as regards intercourse, all agree that the intercourse of a younger brother is preferred. They only differ on the Halizah of a younger brother, and the statement ran thus on the relative importance of the Halizah of a younger and the Halizah of an elder brother. There is a difference of opinion between our Yohanan and our Joshua B. Levi. One holds that the Halizah of the elder is. Preferable and the other holds that both are of equal importance. One holds that the Halizah of the elder is preferable because the commandment surely is incumbent upon the elder, and the other maintains that the statement the commandment is incumbent upon the elder was made in respect of the Levirate marriage. In respect of the Halizah, however, they are both of equal importance. We learned if they also decline, the eldest is again approached. Does not this mean that they decline to contract it? Levirate marriage, but were willing to submit to Halizah, and yet it was stated the eldest is again approached, which proves that the Halizah of the elder is preferred. No, they declined the Halizah as well as the Levirate marriage. Similarly, in the case of the eldest brother, he declined the Halizah as well as the Levirate marriage. Why then is the eldest again approached with the object of coercing him? Let coercion be used against them as the duty is incumbent upon him. Coercion also must be used. Against him come in here if he wishes to suspend action until the eldest returns from a country beyond the sea he is not to be listened to but if the Halizah of the eldest is preferable why is he not to be listened to let us rather wait since it is possible that when he returns he will submit to Halizah following your view it might similarly be objected why if he wishes to postpone action until a minor becomes of age he is not to be listened to let us rather wait since on becoming of age he might contract the Levirate marriage the fact is that the performance of a commandment must not be delayed we learned elsewhere at first when the object was the fulfillment of the commandment the precept of the Levirate marriage was preferable to that of Halizah now however when the object is not the fulfillment of the commandment the precept of Halizah it was laid down is preferable to
When the object is not the fulfillment of the commandment, the precept of Elizabeth was laid down is preferable to that of Elibai Rate Marriage said Rami Bihama in the name of our Isaac. It was reenacted that the precept of Elibai Rate Marriage is preferable to that of Elizabeth said Arnam and B. Isaac to him have the generations improved in their morals. At first they held the opinion of Abbasal and finally they adopted that of the rabbis, for it was taught Abbasal said if a lover marries his sister in law on account of her beauty or in order to gratify his sexual desires or with any other ulterior motive, it is as if he has infringed the law of incest, and I am even inclined to think that the child of such a union is a bastard, but the sages said her husband's brother shall go in unto her, whatever the motive who is the tana of the following statement which our rabbis taught her husband's brother shall go in unto her is a commandment, for originally she stood in relation to him in. The status of permissibility then she was forbidden to him and then again permitted consequently it might have been assumed that she reverts to her original status of permissibility hence it was specifically stated her husband's brother shall go in unto her it is a commandment who now is the tanar Isaac B of Dimi replied it is the statement of Abbasal and it is this that he meant her husband's brother shall go in unto her is a commandment for originally she stood in relation to him in the status of permissibility he could have married her if he wished on account of her beauty and he could have married her if he wished in order to gratify his sexual desires then she was forbidden to him and then again permitted consequently it might have been assumed that she reverts to her original status of permissibility hence it was specifically stated her husband's brother shall go in unto her only with the intention of performing the commandment Rabbi said you may even say that the Authorship is that of the rabbis, and it is this that was meant her husband's brother shall go in unto her as a commandment, for originally she was in the status of permissibility, he could have married her if he wished, and if he preferred, he could have abstained from marrying her, then she was forbidden to him, and then again permitted. Consequently, it might have been assumed that she was to revert to her original status of permissibility, so that if he wished, he might marry her, and if he preferred, he could abstain from marrying her. You say, if he preferred, he could abstain from marrying her, surely she is tied to him, can she be set free by no act, whatever say, rather, it might have been assumed that if he wished, he might marry her, and if he preferred, he might submit to Eliza Hansen, was specifically stated her husband's brother shall go in unto her, it is a commandment, read, then the first closet shall be eaten without leaven in a holy place is a commandment, Talmud, Mas for originally its status in relation to him was one of permissibility then it was forbidden and again permitted consequently one might assume that it reverts to its first status of permissibility hence it was specifically stated it shall be eaten without leaven in a holy place it is a commandment now according to Rabbah who said that it represents the view of the rabbis one could well explain that what is meant here is this it shall be eaten without leaven in a holy place is a commandment for at first its status in relation to him was one of permissibility since if he desired he could eat it and if he preferred he could abstain from eating it then it was forbidden and again permitted consequently it might be assumed that it reverts to its first status of permissibility so that if he wished he could eat it and if he preferred he could abstain from eating it you say if he preferred he could abstain from eating it surely it is written in the scriptures and they shall eat those things Wherewith atonement was made which teaches that the priests must eat them and that the owner attains thereby atonement say rather it might be assumed that if he wished he may eat it himself and if he preferred another priest may eat it hence it was specifically stated it shall be eaten without leaven in a holy place it is a commandment according to our Isaac B of Dimi however who said that it represents the view of Abbasal what two alternatives exist here and were you to suggest that if he wished he could eat it to appease his appetite and if he preferred he could devour it gluttonously can eating gluttonous why it may be retorted be described as proper eating surely Rush Lakish said he who eats gluttonously on the day of atonement is exempt from Kareth since scripture has stated shall not be afflicted were you to suggest however that if he wished he could eat it unleavened and if he preferred he could eat it leavened surely it might be retorted it is written in scripture it shall not be baked with leaven their portion from which Rush Lakish inferred that even their portion must not be baked with leaven again were you to suggest that if he wished he could eat it unleavened and if he preferred he could eat it as a dumpling how it could be retorted is one to imagine such a dumpling if it is unleavened well then it is unleavened and if it is not unleavened the all merciful surely has said without leaven no it may indeed be assumed to be unleavened but the object of the exposition of the scriptural text was to forbid it in respect of what practical issue then has it been stated that a dumpling may be regarded as unleavened bread the statement was made to indicate that a man may perform with it his duty on the Passover though he made it first into a dumpling it is nevertheless designated the bread of affliction since he subsequently baked it in an oven consequently a man may perform with it his duty on the Passover mission if a lover Participated in Elizabeth with his deceased brother's wife, he is regarded as one of the other brothers in respect of inheritance. If, however, the father was living, the estate belongs to the father. He who marries his deceased brother's wife gains possession of his brother's estate. Arjuna said, In either case, if the father was living, the estate belongs to the father. Himara is not this obvious. It might have been presumed that Elizabeth takes the place of the Levi marriage and he receives, therefore, all the estate. Hence, it was taught that he does not. If so, why was it stated that he is regarded as one of the other brothers when it should have been stated he is to be regarded only as one of the brothers? In truth, this is the purpose of our mission. It might have been assumed that because he deprived her of Levi marriage, he shall be penalized. Hence, we were taught that he does receive a share. If, however, the father was living, the estate belongs to him, for a master said that a Father takes precedence over all his lineal descendants, he who marries his deceased brother's wife, etc. What is the reason the all merciful said shall succeed in the name of his brother? And behold, he has succeeded, Arjuna said, etc. Said, Ola the Halachah is in agreement with Arjuna, and our Isaac Napaha likewise said, The Halachah is in agreement with Arjuna. Ola furthermore, others say, Our Isaac Napaha said, What is Arjuna's reason? Because it is written in scripture, and it shall be that the firstborn that he beareth, he is like the firstborn, as the firstborn has nothing while his father is alive, so has this one also nothing while his father is alive. If one were to suggest that as the firstborn receives a double portion after his father's death, so shall this one also receive a double portion after his father's death, it might be retorted, Is it written, shall succeed in the name of his father, it is written, surely shall succeed in the name of his brother, not in the name of his. Father might it be suggested that where the father is not alive to receive the inheritance the law of the Levirate marriage should be carried out but where the father is alive and the lover does not receive the inheritance the law of the Levirate marriage shall not be carried out as the all merciful in any way made the Levirate marriage dependent on the inheritance the lover must contract the Levirate marriage in any case and if any inheritance is available he receives it if not he does not receive it the Bible teacher Arhanaba once sat before Arjuna and as he sat there he stated the Halachah is in agreement with Arjuna the other called out to him go out read biblical verses outside the Halachah is not in agreement with Arjuna Tana recited in the presence of Arnam and the Halachah is not in agreement with Arjuna the other said to him in agreement with whom then in agreement with the rabbis this is surely obvious since in a dispute between one individual and a majority the Halachah is in agreement with the majority shall I the first ask him rejected no the other replied you were taught that the Halachah is in agreement with Arjuna which presenting to you a difficulty you reversed and insofar as you reversed it your wording is well justified Mishnah if a lover participated in Elizabeth with his deceased brother's wife he is forbidden to marry her relatives and she is forbidden to marry his relatives Talmud, Masya Bamath he is forbidden to marry her mother her mother's mother and her father as mother her daughter her daughter's daughter and her son's daughter and also her sister while she is alive the other brothers however are permitted she is forbidden to marry his father and his father's father his son and his son's son his brother and his brother's son a man is permitted to marry the relative of the rival of his Haliza but is forbidden to marry the rival of the relative of his Haliza Gemara the question was raised were relatives of the second degree forbidden in the case of Ahaliza as a preventive measure or not did the rabbis forbid marriage with relatives of the second degree as a preventive measure only in respect of a relative who is Pentateuch Ali forbidden but in respect of Ahaliza the rabbis did not forbid relatives of the second degree as a preventive measure or is there perhaps no difference come and here he is forbidden to
Son, his brother, and his brother's son are Pentateuch Ally forbidden. His father's father and his mother's father, his son's son and his daughter's son are forbidden rabbinically. His father's father at any rate is mentioned here is not this due to the lover who participated in the halitha through whom she is his son's daughter in law. No, it is due to the deceased whose son's daughter in law she is come and here his mother's father is not this due to the lover who participated in the halitha through whom she is his daughter's daughter in law. No, it is due to the deceased through whom she is his daughter's daughter in law come and here and his son's son is not this due to the lover who participated in the halitha through whom she is his father's father's wife. No, it is due to the deceased through whom she is his father's father's brother's wife. But surely Amimar permitted the marriage of one's father's father's brother's wife. Amimar explains that to be due to the lover who participated in. The Halizabad is of the opinion that relatives of the second degree were forbidden as a preventive measure even in respect of the Halizabad come and here and the son of his daughter is not this due to the lover who participated in the Halizabad through whom she is his mother's father's wife no it is due to the deceased through whom she is his mother's father's brother's wife but surely no prohibition as a preventive measure was made in respect of the second degrees of incest consequently it must be due to the lover who participated in the Halizabad and thus it may be inferred that relatives of the second degree were forbidden as a preventive measure even in the case of the Halizabad this proves that a man is permitted etc. Our Toki Bikis has said in the name of Samuel where a man had intercourse with the rival of his Halizabad the child born from such a union is a bastard what is the reason because she remains under her original prohibition said our Joseph we also have learned to the same effect. Eh? Man is permitted to marry the relative of the rival of his Halia's and now if you grant that the rival is excluded one can well understand why the man is permitted to marry her sister if it be maintained however that the rival has the same status as the Halia's why should her sister be permitted to him may it be suggested that this furnishes an objection against our Yohanan who stated neither he nor the other brothers are subject to Kareth either for the betrothal of Halia's or for the betrothal of her rival our Yohanan can answer you do you understand it is the sister of Halia's of Pentateuch Ally forbidden surely Rush Lakish said here it was taught by Rabbi that the prohibition to marry the sister of a divorced wife is Pentateuchal and that that of the sister of Halia's is rabbinical why is there a difference in the law between the one and the other Talmud Mas Yabamath the rabbis have enacted a preventive measure in respect of her who accompanies the Halia's into court. In the case, however, of her who does not accompany her to court, the rabbis enacted no preventive measure mission where he participated in Halizah with his deceased brother's wife and his brother married her sister and died. The widow must perform Halizah but may not be taken in leave. Irate marriage similarly where a man divorced his wife and his brother married her sister and died. The widow is exempt if a brother of the lover had betrothed the sister of the widow who was awaiting the lover s. Decision he is told so it has been stated in the name of our Judah be but there wait until your brother has acted if his brother has participated with the widow in the Halizah or contracted with her the Levirate marriage he may marry his betrothed wife if the sister-in-law died he may also marry his betrothed wife but if the lover died he must release his betrothed wife by a letter of divorce and his brother's wife by Halizah Gamara what is meant by similarly read but where a man divorced. Rush Lakish said here it was taught by Rabbi that the prohibition to marry the sister of a divorced wife is pentatical and that of the sister of Ahaliza is rabbinical had betrothed the sister of the widow who was awaiting the lover's decision etc. Samuel said the Halacha is in agreement with the view of our Judah B. But there the question was raised if his wife died may he marry his sister-in-law both Rab and Arhanan stated if his wife died he is permitted to marry his sister-in-law but both Samuel and R.C. stated if his wife died he is forbidden to marry his sister-in-law said Rabbi what is Rab's reason because she is a deceased brother's wife who was permitted and forbidden and then again permitted and who consequently reverts to her first state of permissibility Arham Hanna raised an objection if two of three brothers were married to two sisters and the third was unmarried and when one of the sisters husbands died the unmarried brother addressed to the widow among our end. Then the second brother died and after him his wife also died that sister-in-law must perform Halizah but may not be taken in leave irate marriage but why let her be regarded as a deceased brother's wife who was permitted and forbidden and then again permitted who reverts to her former state of permissibility he remained silent after the other went out he said I should have told him that it represents the view of our Eliezer who maintains that once she has been forbidden to him for one moment she is forbidden to him forever subsequently he remarked it might be contended that our Eliezer held that view only where she was not fit at the time she became subject to the leave irate marriage did he express such an opinion however in the case where she was fit at the time she became subject to the leave irate marriage subsequently however he said yes for surely it was taught our Eliezer said if his Yebama died his wife is permitted to him if his wife died that Yebama must perform Halizah but may not be taken in leave irate marriage must it then be assumed that Samuel and R.C. are of the same opinion as R. Eliezer that may be said to be in agreement even with the rabbis for the rabbis differed from R. Eliezer only because from the time she became subject to the leave irate marriage and onward she was no longer forbidden to him here however where she was so forbidden even the rabbis agree mission the deceased brother's wife shall neither perform the halizah nor contract leave irate marriage before three months have passed similarly all other women shall be neither betrothed nor married before three months have passed whether they were virgins or non-virgins whether divorcees or widows whether married or betrothed our Judah said those who were married may be betrothed forthwith and those who were betrothed may even be married forthwith with the exception of the betrothed women in Judea because there the bridegroom was too intl made with his bride our Jose said all married women may be Betrothed forthwith accepting the widow Talmud, Mas Yabamath be owing to her mourning Gemara it is quite reasonable that she shall not be taken forthwith in Levirate marriage since the child whom she might bear may be viable and the lover would thus infringe the prohibition of marrying a brother's wife which is pentatical but why should she not forthwith perform the Halizah does this then present an objection against our Yohanan who said that the Halizah of a pregnant woman is deemed to be a valid Halizah but has not an objection against our Yohanan once been raised the question is whether it may be assumed that an objection arises from here also know here the reason is this the child might be viable and you would in consequence subject her to the need for an announcement in respect of the priesthood well let her be subjected it may happen that some people would be present at the Halizah but would not be present at the announcement and they would consider her ineligible to Mary a priest this quite satisfactorily explains the case of a widow what can be said however in respect of a divorced woman because she would thereby lose her maintenance this provides a quite satisfactory explanation in the case of a married woman what can be said however in respect of a betrothed divorcee the reason is rather the ruling of our Jose for it was taught a man once appeared before our Jose and said to him may Halizah be performed within three months the master replied she must not perform the Halizah let her perform the Halizah what would she lose thereupon he recited for him this scriptural text if the man like not implying that if he likes he may contract the Levirate marriage whosoever may go up to contract the Levirate marriage may also go up to perform the Halizah etc our Hina raised an objection in doubtful cases Halizah is performed and no Levirate marriage may be contracted now what is meant by doubtful cases if it be assumed to mean doubtful betrothal what? Indeed, should no leave irate marriage be contracted, let the widow be taken in leave irate marriage, since no objection could possibly be raised. Consequently, the doubt must consist in the betrothal of two sisters when the man is uncertain which of them he betrothed, and yet it was stated that Eliza was to be performed. How now, there, if Elijah were to come and point out the sister that was betrothed, she would be eligible for both Eliza and leave irate marriage. Here, however, were Elijah to come and declare that the widow was not pregnant, would anyone heed him and allow her to contract the leave irate marriage? Surely, even a minor who is incapable of pregnancy must wait three months. Our rabbis taught a Yebamah is maintained during the first three months out of the estate of her husband. Subsequently, she is not to be maintained either out of the estate of her husband or out of that of the lover. If, however, the lover appeared in court and then absconded, she is maintained out of the estate of it. Lover, if she became subject to a lover who was a minor, she receives nothing from the lover. Does she, however, receive her maintenance from her husband's estate? On this question, Araha and Rabban are in dispute. One holds that she receives, and the other
Seed of the second robber raised an objection hence must a male proselyte and a female proselyte wait three months now what distinction is there to be made here here also there is a distinction to be made between seed that was sown in holiness and seed that was not sown in holiness Rabbah said this is a preventive measure against the possibility of his marrying his paternal sister contracting Levi rate marriage with the wife of his maternal brother setting his mother free to marry anybody and releasing his sister-in-law to all the world are Hanani raised an objection in all these I read a provision against incest but here it is a provision in favor of the child now if this is tenable all would be due to a provision against incest the meaning of a provision in favor of the child is that the child might not infringe a prohibition of incest it is easy to understand why a divorcee or widow shall not marry after waiting a period of just two months because that would create a doubt as to whether the child is a nine months one of the first or a seven months one of the second let her wait however one month only and then marry so that should she give birth at seven months the child would be a seven months one of the last husband and should she give birth at eight months the child would obviously be a nine months one of the first even if she gave birth at eight months it might still be assumed to be the child of the last husband since it may be that her conception was delayed one month let her then wait two months and a half and marry so that were she to give birth at seven months the child would obviously be a seven months one of the last and were she to give birth at six months and a half the child would naturally be a nine months one of the first for had even the son of the last he would not be viable as a six and a half months child even if she gave birth at six and a half months it is still possible to assume the child to be that of the last husband for Mar. Sutra stated even according to him who said that a woman who bears at nine months does not give birth before the full number of months had been completed a woman who bears at seven months does give birth before the full number of months has been completed for it is stated in scripture and it came to pass after the cycles of days the minimum of cycles is two and the minimum of days is two let her then wait a little and marry and when the three months will have been fulfilled she might be Examined our Safa replied married women are not examined in order that they may not become repulsive to their husbands and let her be examined by her Wahrami Bimam replied a woman conceals the fact in order that her child may inherit his share in her second husband's estate where however it has been ascertained that she was pregnant let her be permitted to marry why then was it taught a man shall not marry the pregnant or nursing wife of another and if he married he must divorce her and never again remarry her this is a preventive measure against the possibility of turning the photos into a sandal if so this should apply in the case of one's own wife also if according to him who said with an absorbent she uses an absorbent and if according to him who said mercy will be shown from heaven mercy will be shown from heaven here also it could be argued if according to him who said with an absorbent she uses an absorbent if according to him who said mercy will be shown from Heaven mercy will be shown from heaven the prohibition is due rather to the danger of abdominal pressure if so this applies in the case of one's own wife also a man has consideration for his own here also one would have consideration for the child the reason is rather because a pregnant woman is usually expected to breastfeed her child and were she to marry during pregnancy she talmud mas yevamoth be might conceive again her milk would become turbid and she might thereby cause the death of the child if so this applies in the case of the man's own child also his own child she would sustain with eggs and milk would she not sustain her own child also with eggs and with milk her husband would not give her the means let her claim it from the ears have a reply a woman would shrink from going to court and would rather let her child die whether they were virgins or non-virgins who are the virgins and who are the betrothed who are non-virgins and who are married women Rab Judah replied it is this that was meant whether virgins or non-virgins who became widows or were divorced either after betrothal or after marriage our Eliezer did not go one day to the Beth Hamid Rash on meeting RC he asked him what did the rabbi's discourse at the Beth Hamid Rash the other replied thus said are Yohanan the Halacha is in agreement with our Jose does this then imply that only individual opinion is against him yes and so it was taught a married woman who was always anxious to spend her time at her paternal home or who had some angry quarrel at her husband's home or whose husband was in prison or was old or infirm or who was herself infirm or had miscarried after the death of her husband or was barren old a minor incapable of conception or in any other way incapacitated from procreation must wait three months these are the words of our Meir Arjuda permits immediate betrothal and marriage our high Abba said our Yohanan retracted said our Joseph if he retracted he did so on account of what has been taught at the vineyard, for it was taught our Ishmael son of our Yohanan B. Baraka said, I heard from the mouth of the sages in the vineyard of Jabna that all women must wait three months, said our Jeremiah to our Zerika. When you visit our Rabbah, point out to him the following contradiction. Could our Yohanan have said the Halachah is in agreement with our Jose, seeing that he stated elsewhere the Halachah is in agreement with the anonymous mission, and we learned all other women shall be neither married nor betrothed before three months have passed, whether they were virgins or non-virgins. The other replied, the one who pointed out to you this contradiction did not care much for the quality of flower. This is an anonymous mission that was followed by a dispute where the Halachah does not agree with the anonymous mission for our Papa, or some say our Yohanan stated when a disputed ruling is followed by an anonymous one, the Halachah is in agreement with the anonymous ruling when. However, an anonymous ruling is followed by a dispute. The Halachah is not in agreement with the anonymous ruling. Arabah once walked leaning upon the shoulder of his attendant Arnaham whilst gathering from him information as to traditional rulings. He inquired of him what is the Halachah where a dispute is followed by an anonymous statement. The other replied the Halachah is in agreement with the anonymous statement. What is the Halachah? The first inquired when an anonymous statement is followed by a dispute. The other replied the Halachah is not in agreement with the anonymous statement. What if the anonymous statement occurs in a mission and the dispute in a barrier? The other replied the Halachah is in agreement with the anonymous statement. What if the dispute is in the mission and the anonymous statement in the barrier? The other replied Talmud, Masi of Amathev Rabbi is not taught it. Once would our high know it. The first said to him, Surely we learned to hackle for flax. Whose teeth were broken off and two remained is susceptible to levitical uncleanness, but if only one tooth remained, it is levitically clean. All the teeth, however, if they were removed one by one, are individually susceptible to levitical uncleanness. A wool comb whose alternate teeth are broken off is levitically clean. If three consecutive teeth, however, remained, it is susceptible to levitical uncleanness. If one of these was a side tooth, the comb is levitically clean. If two teeth were removed and someone used them as pincers, they are susceptible to levitical uncleanness. One tooth also that was adopted for snuffing the light or as a spool is susceptible to levitical uncleanness, and we have it as a traditional ruling that the Halachah is not in agreement with this mission. The other replied with the exception of this for both our Yohanan and Reshlakish stated this is not an authoritative mission. What is the reason our Hunabi Mano replied in the name of our son of our Ika? Because the first clause is in contradiction to the second one for at first it was stated that a wool comb whose alternate teeth are missing is levitically clean from which it follows that if two consecutive teeth did remain it would be susceptible to uncleanness while immediately afterwards it was stated if three consecutive teeth however remained it is susceptible to levitical uncleanness from which it follows that only three but not two what difficulty is this it is possible that one refers to the internal and the other the external teeth the contradiction however arises from the following it was taught first all the teeth however if they were removed one by one are individually susceptible to levitical uncleanness implying even though each tooth was not adapted for the purpose now read the final clause one tooth that was adapted for snuffing the light or as a spool is susceptible to levitical uncleanness implying only when he adapted it but not when he did not adapt it Abbe replied what is the difficulty it is possible that the one refers to a tooth with a handle and the other to a tooth without a handle our papa replied what is the difficulty it is possible that the one refers to small and the other to thick teeth the reason is rather because accurate scholars add this conclusion these are the words of our Simeon our high Bob and sent the following message betrothal may take place within the three months and the practice of the sages is also in accordance with this ruling and our Eliezer too taught us the same law in the name of our hand of the great the greater part of the first month the greater part of the third one and the full middle month Amimar permitted betrothal on the 90th day said our Ashi to Amimar but surely both Rab and Samuel stated that the widow must wait three months exclusive of the day on which her husband died and excl
This is permitted in honor of the Sabbath and in connection with this mission it was taught before this time the public must restrict their activities in commerce building and plantings but it is permissible to betroth though not to marry nor may any betrothal feast be held that was taught in respect of the period before that time said Rabbah even in respect of the period before that time the law might be arrived at by inference from major to minor if where it is forbidden to trade it is permitted to betroth how much more should betrothal be permitted where trade also is permitted do not read our Jose said all married women may be betrothed but read all married women may be married Talmud Masya Bamath does not our Jose then hold the view that it is necessary to make a distinction if you wish I might say that he does not and if you prefer I might say that he does in fact hold this view but read our Jose said all betrothed women who were divorced may be married if so it is it. Same view as that of Arjuna. The point at issue between them is the question of the betrothal of a married woman. Arjuna maintains that a married woman may be betrothed, while our Jose maintains that a married woman may not be betrothed. But is our Jose of the opinion that a married woman is forbidden betrothal? Surely it was taught our Jose said all women may be betrothed, excepting a widow owing to her mourning. And how long does her mourning continue? Thirty days, and all these must not marry before. Three months have passed. What an objection is this? If it be argued because it was stated our Jose said all women may be betrothed, is this it may be retorted of greater force than our mission as that was interpreted to mean that betrothed women who were divorced may be married. So here also it might be interpreted to mean all betrothed women who were divorced may be married. The objection, however, arises from the final clause where it was stated and all these must not marry before three. Months have passed implying that only marriage is forbidden to them but they may well be betrothed. Robert replied explained and reconstructed as follows. Our Jose said betrothed women who were divorced may be married accepting a widow owing to her mourning and how long does her mourning continue? Thirty days and married women may not be betrothed before three months have passed but is any mourning to be observed by an heiress and widow? Surely our high BMI taught in the case of a betrothed wife. Husband is neither subject to the laws of Onan nor may he defile himself for her and she in his case is likewise not subject to the laws of Onan nor may she defile herself for him if she dies he does not inherit from her though if he dies she collects her kethub the fact however is that this is a question in dispute between Tanaim for it was taught from the first day of the month until the fast the public must restrict their activities in trade building and planting and no betrothals or Marriages may take place during the week in which the ninth of occurs it is forbidden to cut the hair to wash clothes and others say that this is forbidden during the entire month are ashi demurred whence is it proved that betrothal means actual betrothal is it not possible that it is only forbidden to give a betrothal feast but that betrothal itself is permitted if so does no marriage may take place also mean that the giving of a wedding feast is forbidden but marriage itself is permitted. How now in the case of a marriage without a feast there is still sufficient rejoicing in the case of betrothal however is there any rejoicing when no feast is held the fact is said are ashi that recent mourning is different from ancient mourning and public mourning is different from private mourning mission where four brothers who were married to four women died the eldest may if he desires contract leave marriage with all of them where a man who was married to two women died cohabitation or Eliza with one of them exempts her rival Talmud, Masya Bamath if one of these however was eligible and the other ineligible then if he submits to Eliza it must be from her who is ineligible and if he contracts Levi right marriage it may be even with her who is eligible Gemara four brothers is this conceivable read four of the brothers may and is he allowed surely it was taught and the elders of his city shall call him they but not their representative and speak unto him teaches that he is given suitable advice if he for instance was young and she old or if he was old and she was young he is told what would you with a young woman or what would you with an old woman go to one who is of the same age as yourself and create no strife in your house this is applicable to that case only where he can afford it if so even more wives also sound advice was given only for but no more so that each may receive one marital visit a month where a man who was married etc let him contract. Levi right marriage with both our high Abba replied in the name of our Yohan and scripture stated that doth not build up his brother's house he builds one house but does not build two houses and let him submit to Elizabeth from both of them Marzitra Toby replied scripture stated the house of him who had his shoe drawn off he submits to the drawing off of the shoe in respect of one house but must not submit to the drawing off of the shoe in respect of two houses and let him submit to Elizabeth from one and contract Levi right marriage with the other scripture stated that doth not build as he has not built he must never again build and let him contract Levi right marriage with one and submit to Elizabeth from the other scripture states if he like not if however he like he may contract Levi right marriage whosoever may go up to contract Levi right marriage may also go up to perform Elizabeth and whosoever may not go up to contract Levi right marriage may not go up to perform Elizabeth furthermore in order that it be not said that the same house is partially built and partially drawn off but let them say if he had first contracted Levi right marriage and then submitted to Eliza this would have been so indeed it is possible however that he may submit to Eliza and subsequently contract Levi right marriage and thus place himself under the prohibition of that doth not build might it be suggested that where there is only one the law of the Levi right marriage shall be observed but that where there are two the law of Levi right marriage shall not be observed if so what need was there for the all merciful to prohibit marriage with the rival of a forbidden relative if any two rival seed has been said are not both subject to Eliza and the Levi right marriage was there any need to mention the exemption of a rival of a forbidden relative why not it is certainly needed for it might have been assumed that the forbidden relative stands excluded and her rival may therefore be taken in Levi right marriage hence it was taught that she also was forbidden but in fact this is the proper explanation the repetition of his brother's wife widened the scope if one of them however was eligible said our Joseph here it was taught by rabbi that a man should not pour the water out of his sister and while others may require admission a man who remarried his divorced wife or married his halyza or married the relative of his halyza must divorce her and the child is a bastard these are the words of our Akiba, but the sages said the child is not a bastard they agree however that where a man married the relative of his divorcee the child is a bastard Gemara does our Akiba hold the view that the child of a man who married the relative of his halyza is a bastard surely Rush Lakish stated here it was taught by rabbi that the prohibition to marry the sister of a divorced wife is pentacle and that that of the sister of a halyza is rabbinical read the relative of his divorcee this View may also logically be supported for it was stated in the final clause they agree however that when a man married the relative of his divorcee the child is a bastard now if you grant that her case was under discussion one can well see the reason why the expression of the agree had been used if you contend however that her case was not under discussion what is the purport of the agree is it not possible that we were informed that the offspring of a union of those who are subject to the penalty of Kareth is a bastard this surely is taught below who is a bastard the offspring of a union with any consanguineous relative with whom cohabitation is forbidden so are Akiba Simeon the Temanite said the offspring of any union the penalty for which is Kareth at the hands of heaven and the Halachah is in agreement with his view but is it not possible that the Tana intended to indicate by his anonymous statement that the Halachah is according to Simeon the Temanite if so he should have stated others who are subject to the penalty of Karath why then specify the relative of his divorcee consequently it must be inferred that this case was under discussion but is it not indeed possible to maintain that it was not under discussion but because the man who remarried his divorced wife or married his halyza or the relative of his halyza was spoken of he also introduced the relative of his divorcee would consequently the offspring of a union with the relative of his halyza according to our Akiba be a bastard our high be Abba replied in the name of our Yohan and this is our Akiba's reason because scripture stated the house of him that had his shoe drawn off scripture thus called it his house our Joseph stated in the name of our Simeon be rabbi all agree that where a man remarried his divorced wife Talmud Masya Bamath be Talmud Masya Bamath be the child is tainted in respect of the priesthood who is meant by all agree Simeon the Temanite for although Simeon the Temanite Stated that the offspring of a union forbidden under the penalty of flogging is not a bastard, he agrees that though he is not a bastard, he is nevertheless tainted. This is deduced a minority ad mages from the case of a widow. If in the case of a widow married to a high priest, the prohibition of whom is not applicable to all her son is tainted. How much more should the son of a divorcee
Untainted in respect of the priesthood her child also must be untainted in respect of the priesthood is this an argument the same term may bear different interpretations in harmony with its respective subjects this is also logically sound for in the first clause it was stated she is disqualified and her child is disqualified now in respect of what is she disqualified if it be suggested in respect of entry into the congregation does she it may be retorted become disqualified for entry into the congregation because she played the harlot consequently it must mean in respect of the priesthood now again in respect of what is her child disqualified if it be suggested in respect of the priesthood thus implying that he is permitted to enter the congregation surely it may be objected our activist stated that the child is a bastard obviously then in respect of entry into the congregation and as in the first clause the same term bears different interpretations in harmony with its respective Subjects so may the same term in the final clause bear different interpretations in agreement with its respective subjects also as to the expression this is an abomination it may be interpreted she is an abomination but her rival is no abomination her children however are an abomination the objection however from the widow still remains thus a widow's case may well be different because she herself becomes profane but the fact is that if any statement was made it was as follows our Joseph stated in the name of our Simeon be rabbi all agree that where a man cohabited with any of those who are subject to the penalty of correct the child is tainted who is referred to by all agree our Joshua for although our Joshua stated that the offspring of a union forbidden under the penalty of correct is not a bastard he agrees that though he is no bastard he is nevertheless tainted this is deduced to memory mages from the case of a widow if in the case of a widow married to a high priest it Prohibition of whom is not applicable to all her son is tainted. How much more should the son of this woman be tainted whose prohibition is equally applicable to all? And were you to object, the widow's case may be different because she herself becomes profaned. It may be retorted that here also, as soon as the man had any connubial relations with her, he stamped her as a harlot. Rabbi Barhanna said in the name of our Yohanan, all agree that where a slave or an idolater had intercourse with the daughter of an Israelite, the child is a bastard who is meant by all agree. Simeon the Temanite, for although Simeon the Temanite stated that the offspring of a union forbidden under the penalty of flogging is not a bastard, his statement applies only Talmud, Masi of Amathe to the offspring of a union forbidden under the penalty of flogging since the betrothal in such a case is valid. But here in the case of an idolater and a slave, since betrothal in their case is invalid, they are like those whose union is. Subject to the penalty of Koreth, an objection was raised if a slave or an idolater had intercourse with the daughter of an Israelite, the child born from such a union is a bastard. Our Simeon B. Judah said a bastard is only he who is the offspring of a union which is forbidden as incest and is punishable by Koreth. No said our Joseph who is referred to by all cable only according to the view of our Akiva who regards a as a forbidden relative while he himself does not share the same view he agrees in the case of an idolater and a slave for when our Dimi came he stated in the name of our Isaac Beabudimi in the name of our master if an idolater or a slave had intercourse with the daughter of an Israelite, the child born from such a union is a bastard. Araha the governor of the castle and our tandem son of our high of Faraka once redeemed some captives who were brought from Armin to Tiberias among these was one who had become pregnant from an idolater when they came before our MIE. Told them it was our Yohanan and our Eliezer and our Hannah who stated that if an idolater or a slave had intercourse with the daughter of an Israelite, the child born is a bastard, said our Joseph, is it a great thing to enumerate persons? Surely it was Rab and Samuel in Babylon and our Joshua be Levi and Barkapra in the land of Israel. Others say Barkapra is to be altered to the elders of the south who stated that if an idolater or a slave had intercourse with the daughter of an Israelite, the child born is untainted. No, said our Joseph, it is the opinion of Rabbi for when our Dimi came, he stated in the name of our Isaac Beabudimi that it was reported in the name of our masters that if an idolater or a slave had intercourse with the daughter of an Israelite, the child born from such a union is a bastard. Our Joshua be Levi said the child is tainted in respect of what if it be suggested in respect of entry into the congregation, surely it may be retorted. Our Joshua be Levi stated that the child was. Fit it must be then in respect of the priesthood for all Amram who declare the child fit admit that he is ineligible for the priesthood this is inferred by deduction from the case of a widow Menori ad mages if in the case of a widow who was married to a high priest whose prohibition is not equally applicable to all her son is tainted how much more should the son of this woman be tainted whose prohibition is equally applicable to all the case of a widow who was married to a high priest may be different since she herself becomes profaned here also as soon as cohabitation occurred the woman is disqualified for our Yohanan stated in the name of our Simeon once is it inferred that if an idolater or a slave had intercourse with the daughter of a priest of a Levite or of an Israelite he disqualified her it was stated but if a priest's daughter be a widow or divorce a only in the case of a man in relation to whom widowhood or divorce is applicable an idolater and a slave are consequently Excluded since in relation to them no widowhood or divorce is applicable said Abbe to him what reason do you see for relying upon our Dimi rely rather on Rabin for when Rabin came he reported that our Nathan and our Judah the prince ruled that such a child is legitimate and our Judah the prince is of course Rabbi and Rab also ruled that the child is legitimate for once a man appeared before Rab and asked him what is the legal position of the child where an idolater or a slave had intercourse with the daughter of an Israelite the child is legitimate the master replied give me then your daughter said the man I will not give her to you was the master's reply said Shimei behind to Rab people say that in media a camel can dance on a cab here is the cab here is the camel and here is media but there is no dancing had he been equal to Joshua the son of Nun I would not have given him my daughter the master replied had he been like Joshua the son of Nun the other retorted others would have Given him their daughters if the master had not given him his but with this man if the master will not give him others also will not give him as the man refused to go away he fixed his eye upon him and he died. Our Matina also ruled that the child is legitimate. Rab Judah also ruled that the child is legitimate for when one came before Rab Judah the latter told him go and conceal your identity or marry one of your own kind when such a man appeared before Rabbi he told him either go abroad or marry. One of your own kind the man of Bimak sent the following inquiry to Rabbi what is the law in respect of the legitimacy of the child of one who is a half slave and half freed man who cohabited with the daughter of an Israelite he replied if the child of one who is fully a slave has been declared legitimate is there any need to question the case of the child of one who is only a half slave our Joseph said the author of this traditional ruling Talmud Masi of Amath B is of course Rab. Judah but surely Rab Judah had explicitly stated where one who is a half slave and half freed man cohabited with the daughter of an Israelite the child born from such a union can have no redress Rab Judah's ruling was made only in the case where he betrothed the daughter of an Israelite in consequence of which his partial slavery cohabits with a married woman but did not the Nehardian state in the name of our Jacob that according to him who regards the offspring as illegitimate the child is so regarded even where cohabitation had taken place with an unmarried woman and according to him who regards the child as legitimate the child is so regarded even if the cohabitation had taken place with a married woman and the deduction by both was made from none other than the wife of one's father he who regards the child as illegitimate is of the opinion that is with the wife of one's father betrothal with whom is invalid the child is a bastard so is the child a bastard in the case of all those betrothal with whom is invalid and he who regards the child as legitimate is of the opinion that the comparison is as with the wife of one's father betrothal with whom is invalid in the case of the son only but is valid in the case of others an idolater and a slave betrothal with whom is in all cases invalid are consequently excluded hence the statement of our Judah must have been made in respect of one who had intercourse with a married woman so that his emancipated side cohabits. With a married woman Rabbanah said Argaza told me our Jose B. Abin happened to be at our place when an incident occurred with an unmarried woman and declared the child to be legitimate and when it occurred with a married woman he declared the child to be illegitimate our she's hate said Argaza told me that it was not our Jose B. Abin but our Jose son of Arziba and that he declared the child to be legitimate both in the case of the married as well as in that of the unmarried woman Araha son of Rabbanah said. To Rabbi Omimar once happened to be in our place and he declared the child to be
View of RC for RC said did she not pay for the purpose of her menstruation in the case of her daughter because when an idolater or a slave has intercourse with the daughter of an Israelite the child born of such a union is legitimate a certain person was once named son of the female heathen said RC did she not pay for the purpose of her menstruation a certain person was once named son of the male heathen said our Joshua B. Levi did he not pay in connection with any mishap of his. Our Hamabi Guria said in the name of Rabbi a man bought a slave from an idolater and that slave forestalled him and performed ritual ablution with the object of acquiring the status of a freed man he acquires thereby his emancipation what is the reason Talmud, Mas Yabamath the idolater has no title to the person of the slave and he can transfer to the Israelite only that which is his and the slave since he forestalled him and performed ritual ablution for the purpose of acquiring the status of a freed man has thereby cancelled the obligations of his servitude in accordance with the ruling of Rabba for Rabba stated consecration love and food and manumission cancel a mortgage are his stories an objection it happened with the proselyte Valeria that her slaves forestalled her and performed ritual ablutions before her and when the matter came before the sages they decided that the slaves had acquired the status of freed men from here it follows that only if they performed Ablution before her but not if after her robber replied before her they acquired their emancipation whether the object of their bathing had or had not been specified after her emancipation is acquired only when the object had been specified but not when it had not been specified R.U.I. said what has been taught applies only to one who buys from an idolater but the idolater himself may well be acquired for it is written in scripture moreover from the children of the strangers that do sojourn among you of them may buy you may buy of them but they may not buy of you nor may they buy of one another but they may not buy of you what can this refer to if it be suggested that it refers to one's manual labor may not an idolater it may be asked by an Israelite to do manual labor surely it is written or to the offshoot of a stranger's family and a master said that by stranger's family an idolater was meant consequently it must refer to his person and the all merciful said you may buy of them even their persons are objected it might be said to refer to acquisition by means of money and ritual ablution this is a difficulty Samuel said he must be firmly held while he is in the water as was done with Manjaman the slave of Arashi who wished to perform ritual ablution and was entrusted to Rubin and Araha son of Rubin note Arashi said to them that I shall claim him from you they put a chain round his neck and loosened it and again tightened it they loosened it in order that there might be no interposition they then tightened it again in order that he might not forestall them and declare I perform the ablution in order to procure thereby the status of a freed man while he was raising his head from the water they placed upon it a bucket full of clay and told him go carry it to your master's house our papa said to Rubin the master must have observed the men of Papa B. Abba's house who advanced sums of money on people's accounts in respect of their capitation taxes and then force them into their service do they when set free require a deed of emancipation or not he replied were I now dead I could not have told you of this ruling thus said Arshis hate the surety for these people is deposited in the king's archive and the king has ordained that whosoever does not pay his capitation tax shall be made the slave of him who pays it for him Arhai B. Abba once came to Gabli where he observed Jewish women who conceived from proselytes who were circumcised but had not performed the required ritual ablution he also noticed that idolaters were serving Jewish wine and Israelites were drinking it and he also saw that idolaters were cooking lupins and Israelites ate them but he did not speak to them on the matter at all he called however upon our Yohanan who instructed him go and announce that their children are bastards that their wine is forbidden as Nizek wine and that their lupins are forbidden as food cooked by idolaters because they are ignorant of it. Torah that their children are bastards are Yohanan ruling in accordance with his view for Arhai B. Abba stated in the name of our Yohanan a man cannot become a proper proselyte unless he has been circumcised and has also performed ritual ablution when therefore no ablution has been performed he is regarded as an idolater and Rabbi B. Barhan has stated in the name of our Yohanan that if an idolater or a slave cohabited with the daughter of an Israelite the child born from such a union is a bastard. That their wine is forbidden as Nizek wine because a Nazi right is told keep away go round about approach not the vineyard that their lupins are forbidden as food cooked by idolaters because they are ignorant of the Torah would their lupins have been permitted if the men had been acquainted with the Torah surely our Samuel B. R. Isaac stated in the name of Rab any food stuff that may be eaten raw does not come under the prohibition of food cooked by idolaters and since lupins cannot be eaten raw. The prohibition of food cooked by idolaters should apply. Our Yohanan holds of you as expressed in a second version for our Samuel B. R. Isaac stated in the name of Rab whatever is not served on a royal table as a dish to be eaten with bread is not subject to the prohibition of food cooked by idolaters. The reason therefore is because they were ignorant of the Torah for had they been acquainted with the Torah their lupins would have been permitted. Our Rabbis taught if a proselyte was circumcised but had not performed the prescribed ritual ablution. Our Eliezer said behold he is a proper proselyte for so we find that our forefathers were circumcised and had not performed ritual ablution if he performed the prescribed ablution but had not been circumcised. Our Joshua said behold he is a proper proselyte for so we find that the mothers had performed ritual ablution but had not been circumcised. The sages however said whether he had performed ritual ablution but had not been circumcised or whether he had been circumcised but had not performed the prescribed ritual ablution he is not a proper proselyte unless he has been circumcised and has also performed the prescribed ritual ablution let our Joshua also infer from the forefathers and let our Eliezer also infer from the mothers and should you reply that a possibility may not be inferred from an impossibility surely it may be retorted it was taught our Eliezer said once is it deduced that the paschal lamb of later generations may be brought from Holland only those in Egypt were commanded to bring a paschal lamb and those of later generations were commanded to bring a paschal lamb as the paschal lamb spoken of in Egypt could be brought from Holland only so may also the paschal lamb which had been commanded to later generations be brought from Holland only said our Akiva to him may a possibility be inferred from an impossibility the other replied although an impossibility it is nevertheless a proof of importance and deduction from it may be made but Talmud, Mas Yav Amath B all agree that ritual ablution without circumcision is effective and they differ only on circumcision without ablution our Eliezer infers from the forefathers while our Joshua maintains that in the case of the forefathers also ritual ablution was performed once does he deduce it if it be suggested from that which is written go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments if where washing of the garments is not required ablution is required how much more should ablution be required where washing of the garments is required it may be retorted that that might have been a mere matter of cleanliness it is rather from here and Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and we have a tradition that there must be no sprinkling without ritual ablution once does our Joshua infer that the mothers performed ritual ablution it is a logical conclusion for otherwise whereby did they enter under the wings of the Sheshanah are high. B. Abba stated in the name of our Yohanan, a man can never become a proselyte unless he has been circumcised and has also performed the prescribed ritual ablution. Is not this obvious in a dispute between an individual and a majority? The Halacha is surely in agreement with the majority. The expression sages is in fact meant for our Jose, for it was taught if a proselyte came and stated, I have been circumcised but have not performed ritual ablution, he is permitted to perform the ablution and the proper performance of the previous circumcision does not matter. So our Judah our Jose said he is not to be allowed ablution, hence it is permissible for a proselyte to perform the prescribed ablution on the Sabbath. So our Judah our Jose, however, said he is not to be allowed to perform the ablution. The master said, hence it is permissible for a proselyte to perform the prescribed ablution on the Sabbath. So our Judah, seeing that our Judah stated that one suffices, is it not? Obvious that if circumcision has been performed in our presence, he is permitted to perform ablution. Why then? Hence, it might have been assumed that in the opinion of our Judah, ablution forms the principal part of the initiation, and that ablution is not to take place on the Sabbath because thereby a man is improved. Hence, we were taught that our Judah requires either the one or the other. Our Jose, however, said he is not to be allowed to perform the ablution. Is not this obvious? Since our Jose said that both are required, ablution must be forbidden, as the improvement of a man may not be effected on the Sabbath. It might have been assumed that
For law has been written in his case our rabbis taught as it might have been assumed that if a man came and said I am proselyte he is to be accepted hence it was specifically stated in the scriptures with the only when he is well known to the whence is it inferred that if he came and had his witnesses with him that his word is accepted it was specifically stated in scripture and if a proselyte sojourn in your land Talmud, Masi of from this I only know that the law is applicable within the land of Israel whence is it inferred that it is also applicable within the countries outside the land it was specifically stated in scripture with the i.e. wherever he is with the if so why was the land of Israel specified in the land of Israel proof must be produced outside the land of Israel no such proof need be produced these are the words of our Judah but the sages said proof must be produced both within the land of Israel and outside the land if he came and had witnesses with him what need is there for a scriptural text Arshis hate replied where they state we heard that he became a proselyte at a certain particular court as it might have been taught that we are not to believe them we were taught that we do believe them in your land from this I only know that the law is applicable within the land of Israel whence is it inferred that it is also applicable within the countries outside the land it was specifically stated in scripture with the i.e. Wherever he is with thee, but this surely had been expounded already. One is derived from with thee, and the other from with you. But the sages said, proof must be produced both within the land of Israel and outside the land. But it is written surely in your land that expression is required for the deduction that proselytes may be accepted even in the land of Israel, as it might have been assumed that there they become proselytes only on account of the prosperity of the land of Israel and at the present time also when there is no prosperity they might still be attracted by the gleanings of the forgotten sheep, the corner and the poor man's tithe. Hence we were taught that they may nevertheless be accepted. Our high be abstained in the name of our Yohan and the Halachahs that proof must be produced both in the land of Israel and outside the land. Is this not obvious in a dispute between an individual and a majority? The Halachahs, of course, in agreement with the majority, it might have been. Suggested that our Judah's view is more acceptable since he is supported by scriptural text. Hence, we were taught that the Halachah is in agreement with the sages. Our rabbis taught and judge righteously between a man and his brother and the proselyte that is with him. From this text, did our Judah deduce that a man who becomes a proselyte in the presence of a Beth is deemed to be a proper proselyte, but he who does so privately is no proselyte. It once happened that a man came before our Judah and told him, I have become a proselyte privately. Have you witnesses? Our Judah asked, No, the man replied, Have you children? Yes, the man replied, You are trusted. The master said to him, As far as your own disqualification is concerned, but you cannot be relied upon to disqualify your children. Did our Judah, however, state that a proselyte is not trusted in respect of his children? Surely it was taught he shall acknowledge implies he shall be entitled to acknowledge him before others from this. Did our Judah? Deduce that a man is believed when he declares the son of mine is firstborn, and as a man is believed when he declares the son of mine is firstborn, so is he believed when he declares the son of mine is the son of a divorced woman or the son of Haliza. But the sages say he is not believed. Our and B. Isaac replied, It is this that he really told him. According to your own statement, you are an idolater, and no idolater is eligible to tender evidence. Rabbanah said, It is this that he really told him. Have you children? And when the other replied, Yes, he asked, Have you grandchildren? The reply being again, Yes, he told him, You are trusted so far as to disqualify your own children, but you cannot be trusted so far as to disqualify your grandchildren. Thus it was also taught elsewhere. Our Judah said a man is trusted in respect of the status of his young son, but not in respect of that of his grown-up son. And our high B. Abba explained in the name of our Yohan, and that young does not mean actually a Minor and grown-up does not mean one who is actually of age, but any young son who has children is regarded as of age, while any grown-up son who has no children is deemed to be a minor, and the law is in agreement with our and B. Isaac, but surely a very though was taught in agreement with Rabbanah that statement was made with reference to the law of acknowledgement. Our rabbis taught if at the present time a man desires to become a proselyte, he is to be addressed as follows. What reason have you for desiring to become a proselyte? Do you not know that Israel at the present time are persecuted and oppressed, despised, harassed, and overcome by afflictions? If he replies, I know and yet am unworthy, he is accepted forthwith and is given instruction in some of the minor and some of the major commandments. He is informed of the sin of the neglect of the commandments of gleanings, the forgotten sheep, the corner, and the poor man's tithe. He is also told of the punishment for the transgression of it. Commandments furthermore he is addressed thus be it known to you that before you came to this condition if you had eaten suet you would not have been punishable with karath if you had profaned the sabbath you would not have been punishable with stoning but now were you to eat suet you would be punished with karath were you to profane the sabbath you would be punished with stoning and as he is informed of the punishment for the transgression of the commandments so is he informed of the reward granted for their fulfillment he is told be it known to you that the world to come was made only for the righteous and that Israel at the present time are unable to bear Talmud Masya Bamath be either too much prosperity or too much suffering he is not however to be persuaded or dissuaded too much if he accepted he is circumcised forthwith should any shreds which render the circumcision invalid remain he is to be circumcised a second time as soon as he is healed arrangements are made for his Immediate ablution when two learned men must stand by his side and acquaint him with some of the minor commandments and with some of the major ones when he comes up after his ablution he is deemed to be an Israelite in all respects in the case of a woman proselyte women make her sit in the water up to her neck while two learned men stand outside and give her instruction in some of the minor commandments and some of the major ones the same law applies to a proselyte and to an emancipated slave. And only where a man's truant may perform her ablution may a proselyte and an emancipated slave perform this ablution and whatever is deemed an interception in ritual bathing is also deemed to be an interception in the ablutions of a proselyte and emancipated slave and a man's truant the master said if a man desires to become a proselyte he is to be addressed as follows what reason have you for desiring to become a proselyte and he is made acquainted with some of the minor and with some of the major commandments what is the reason in order that if he desire to withdraw let him do so for our helbo said proselytes are as hard for Israel to endure as a sore because it is written in scripture and the proselyte shall join himself with them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob he is informed of the sin of the neglect of the commandment of gleanings the forgotten sheep the corner and the poor man's tithe what is the reason our high be replied in the name of our Yohanan because a Nohide would rather be killed than spend so much as a parata which is not returnable he is not however to be persuaded or dissuaded too much our Eliezer said what is the scriptural proof it is written and when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her she left off speaking unto her we are forbidden she told her to move on the Sabbath beyond the Sabbath boundaries whither thou goest the other replied I will go we are forbidden private meeting between man and woman where thou lodgest I will lodge we have been commanded six hundred and thirteen commandments that people shall be my people we are forbidden idolatry and thy god my god four modes of death were entrusted to Beth Din where thou east will I die two graveyards were placed at the disposal of the Beth Din and there will I be buried presently she saw that she was steadfastly minded etc if he accepted he is circumcised forthwith what is the reason the performance of a commandment must not in any way be delayed should any shreds which render the circumcision invalid remain etc as we learned these are the shreds which render the circumcision invalid flesh which covers the greater part of the corona priest having been so circumcised is not permitted to eat Terah and our Jeremiah B. Abba explained in the name of Rab flesh which covers the greater part of the height of the corona as soon as he is healed arrangements are made for his immediate ablution only after he is healed but not before what is the reason because the water might irritate the wound when two learned men must stand by his side did not our high however state in the name of our Yohanan that the initiation of a proselyte requires the presence of three but surely our Yohanan told the Tanner read three when he comes up after his ablution he is deemed to be an Israelite in all respects in respect of what practical issue and that if he retracted and then betrothed the daughter of an Israelite he is regarded as a non-conforming Israelite and his betrothal is valid the same law applies to a proselyte and to an emancipated slave assuming this to apply to the acceptance of the yoke of the commandments the following contradiction may be pointed out this applies only to a proselyte but an emancipated slave need not accept our she's hate replied this is no contradiction one statement is that of our Simeon the other that of the rabbis
Slave acquires thereby his freedom and requires no deed of emancipation for it is stated in scripture every man slave that is bought for money could it mean the slave of a man and not the slave of a woman but the meaning is that a slave who is under his master's control is a proper slave but he who is not under his master's control is not a proper slave or papa demurred it might be suggested that the rabbis were heard in respect of a woman of goodly form only because she is under no obligation to observe the commandments but that in respect of a slave who is under the obligation of observing commandments even the rabbis agree for it was indeed taught both a proselyte and a slave bought from an idolater must make a declaration of acceptance thus it follows that a slave bought from an Israelite need not make a declaration of acceptance now whose view is this if that of our Simeon B. Eliezer he surely had stated that even a slave bought from an idolater need make no declaration of acceptance consequently it must be the view of the rabbis and so it may be inferred that only a slave bought from an idolater is required to make a declaration of acceptance but a slave bought from an Israelite is not required to make a declaration of acceptance but then the contradiction from the statement the same law applies to a proselyte and to an emancipated slave remains that was taught only with reference to the ablution or rabbis taught and she shall shave her head and do her Nails or Eliezer said she shall cut them or Akiva said she shall let them grow or Eliezer said an act was mentioned in respect of the head and an act was mentioned in respect of the nails as the former signifies removal so does the latter also signify removal or Akiva said an act was mentioned in respect of the head and an act was mentioned in respect of the nails as disfigurement is the purpose of the former so is disfigurement the purpose of the latter the following however supports the view of R. Eliezer and Mephibosheth the son of Saul came down to meet the king and he had neither dressed his feet nor had he done his beard by doing removal was meant our rabbis taught and bewail her father ate her mother Talmud. Masiyah Bamath B. R. Eliezer said her father means her actual father her mother her actual mother or Akiva said her father and her mother refer to idolatry for so scripture says who say to a stock tower my father etc. A full month month means thirty days our Simeon B. Eliezer said. Ninety days for month means thirty days full thirty days and after that thirty days rubbed it might it not be suggested that month means thirty days full thirty days and after that as many again this is a difficulty our rabbis taught uncircumcised slaves may be retained this is the opinion of our Ishmael our Akiva said they may not be retained said our Ishmael to him behold it is written and the son of thy handmaid may be refreshed this text the other replied speaks of a slave that has been bought at twilight when there was not time enough to circumcise him all at any rate agree that and the son of thy handmaid may be refreshed was written in respect of an uncircumcised slave whence may this be inferred from what has been taught and the son of thy handmaid may be refreshed scripture speaks of an uncircumcised slave you say of an uncircumcised slave perhaps it is not so but of a circumcised slave since it has been stated that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou the circumcised slave has already been spoken of to what then is one to apply and the son of thy handmaid may be refreshed obviously to an uncircumcised slave and the stranger refers to a domiciled proselyte you say it refers to a domiciled proselyte perhaps it is not so but to a true proselyte since it was stated no thy strange that is with its thy gates the true proselyte has already been mentioned to what then is one to apply and the stranger obviously to the domiciled proselyte are Joshua B. Levi said if a man bought a slave from an idolater and the slave refused to be circumcised he may bear with him for twelve months if by that time he had not been circumcised he must resell him to idolaters the following was said by the rabbis in the presence of our papa in accordance with whose view obviously not in accordance with that of our Akiva since he stated that uncircumcised slaves may not be retained our papa answered them it may be said to be the view even of our Akiva for this applies when no definite consent has ever been given but where definite consent had once been given his original decision is taken into consideration our Kahana stated I mentioned this reported discussion in the presence of our Zebit of Nihartia and he said to me if so instead of our Akiva replying that the text speaks of a slave that has been bought at twilight he should rather have given this reply he gave him one of the two available solutions Rabin sent a message in the name of our Ilai adding all my masters have so reported in his name who is an uncircumcised slave that may be retained he who was bought by his master with the intention of not having him circumcised the rabbis argued the following in the presence of our papa in accordance with whose view obviously not in accordance with that of our Akiva since he stated that uncircumcised slaves may not be retained our papa answered it may be said to be the view even of our Akiva for this applies where he had made no stipulation with him but where a stipulation was made that stipulation must be taken into consideration our Kahana said when I mentioned the reported discussion in the presence of our Zebit of Nihardia he said to me if so instead of our Akiva having recourse to the answer that the text speaks of a slave who has been bought at twilight when there was not time enough to circumcise him he should rather have given this reply but even if your argument is admitted he should rather have given that reply but the fact is he Mentioned one of two or three solutions are Hanabi Papi RMI and our Isaac Napaha once sat in the antechamber of our Isaac Napaha and while there they related there was a certain town in the land of Israel where slaves refused to be circumcised and after bearing with them for twelve months they resold them to idolaters in accordance with whose view in accordance with that of the following Tanifor it was taught if one bought a slave from an idolater and the slave refused to be circumcised. He bears with him for twelve months if by that time he has not been circumcised he resells him to idolaters our Simeon B. Eliezer said in the land of Israel he must not be kept owing to possible damage to levitically clean footstuffs and in a town which is near the frontier he must not be kept at all since he might overhear some secret and proceed to report it to a fellow idolater it was taught our Hanania son of our Simeon B. Gamaliel said why are proselytes at the present time oppressed and Visited with afflictions because they had not observed the seven no high commandments. Our Jose said, One who has become a proselyte is like a child newly born. Why then are proselytes oppressed because they are not so well acquainted with the details of the commandments as the Israelites Abahan and said in the name of our Eliezer because they do not do it out of love but out of fear. Others said because they delayed their entry under the wings of the Shechinah said, Are a bad word, it might be said, Are. Hannah, what is the scriptural proof? The Lord recompense thy work and be thy reward complete from the Lord the God of Israel under whose etc. Thou art come to take refuge. Talmud, Masiyah Bamatha Mishnah, who is deemed to be a bastard, the offspring of a union with any consanguineous relative with whom cohabitation is forbidden. This is the ruling of our Akiva Simeon the Temanite said, The offspring of any union, the penalty for which is Kareth at the hands of heaven and the Halashah is in agreement. With his view and our Joshua said the offspring of any union the penalty for which is death at the hands of Beth Din said our Simeon B.A.I. found a roll of genealogical records in Jerusalem and therein was written so and so is a bastard having been born from a forbidden union with a married woman which confirms the view of our Joshua if a man's wife died he is permitted to marry her sister if he divorced her and then she died he is permitted to marry her sister if she was married to another man and died he is permitted to marry her sister if a man's sister-in-law died he may marry her sister if he submitted to her Eliza and then she died he is permitted to marry her sister if she was married to another man and then died he is permitted to marry her sister tomorrow what is our Akiva's reason because it is written a man shall not take his father's wife and shall not uncover his father's skirt he shall not uncover the skirt which his father saw and he holds the same opinion as our Judah. Who said that the scriptural text speaks of a woman whom his father had outraged and who is classed among those forbidden to him under the penalty for a negative precept? And since close to this text occurs the commandment, a bastard shall not enter the assembly of the Lord. It is obvious that the offspring of any such union is deemed to be a bastard, according to our Semi also who includes the offspring of any other union that is forbidden by a negative precept, even though the offenders are not consanguineous relatives. And according to our Yeshiva, who includes even the offspring of a union forbidden under a positive commandment, the deduction is made from and not. And Simeon the Temanite he holds the same opinion as the rabbis who stated that the text speaks of a woman awaiting the Levi right decision of his father. The union with such a woman being forbidden under the penalty of Karath. And since close to this text appears a bastard shall not enter, it proves that the offspring of a Union forbidden under the penalty of Kareth is deemed to be a bastard and our Joshua the
Manasseh Elias Arab said he brought him to trial and then slew him. He said to him, Your teacher Moses said, For men shall not see me and live. And you said, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne high and lifted up. Your teacher Moses said, For what great nation is there that hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is whensoever we call upon him? And you said, Seek ye the Lord when he may be found. Your teacher Moses said, The number of thy days I will fulfill, but you said, And I will add on. To your days fifteen years I know thought Isaiah that whatever I may tell him he will not accept and should I reply at all I would only cause him to be a willful homicide he thereupon pronounced the divine name and was swallowed up by a cedar the cedar however was brought and sawn asunder when the so reached his month he died and this was his penalty for having said and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips do not the contradictions between the scriptural text however still remain I saw the Lord is to be understood in accordance with what was taught all the prophets looked into a dim glass but Moses looked through a clear glass as to seek the Lord when he may be found etc one verse applies to an individual the other to a congregation when is the time for an individual are and replied in the name of Rabbi Abba the ten days between the new year and the day of atonement concerning the number of the days I will fulfill ten are in disagreement for. It was taught the number of the days I will fulfill Talmud, Masya Bamatha refers to the years of the generations if one is worthy one is allowed to complete the full period if unworthy the number is reduced so are Akibah but the sages said if one is worthy years are added to one's life if unworthy the years of his life are reduced they said to our Akibah behold scripture says and I will add unto your days fifteen years he replied the addition was made of his own you may know that this is so since. The prophet stood up and prophesied behold a son shall be born to the house of David Josiah by name while Manasseh had not yet been born and the rabbis is it written from Hezekiah it is surely written to the house of David he might be born either from Hezekiah or from any other person if a man's wife died etc if a man's sister-in-law died etc our Joseph said your rabbi taught an unnecessary mission C H A P T E R V mission our Gamaliel said there is no validity in a letter of divorce after. Another letter of divorce nor in a mamar after another mamar nor in an act of cohabitation after another act of cohabitation nor in a haliza after another haliza the sages however said a letter of divorce has validity after another letter of divorce and a mamar after another mamar but there is no validity in any act after cohabitation or haliza how is the release from a levi rape on defective if a lover addressed a mamar to his sister-in-law and subsequently gave her a letter of divorce it is necessary for her to perform the haliza with him if he addressed to her a mamar and participated in the haliza it is necessary for her to obtain from him a letter of divorce if he addressed to her a mamar and then cohabited with her behold this is in accordance with the prescribed precept if the lover gave her a letter of divorce and then addressed to her a mamar it is necessary for her to obtain a second letter of divorce and to perform the haliza if he gave her a Letter of divorce and then cohabited with her. It is necessary for her to obtain a letter of divorce and to perform the haliza. If he gave her a letter of divorce and then submitted to haliza, there is no validity in any act after haliza had been performed. If the lover submitted to haliza and then addressed to her, Mamar gave her a letter of divorce or cohabited with her. Or if he cohabited with her and then addressed to her, Mamar gave her a letter of divorce or submitted to her haliza. No act is valid after haliza Talmud. Masya Bamatbi and the law is the same whether there is one sister in law to one lover or two sisters in law to one lover. How if the lover addressed a Mamar to the one and a Mamar to the other, two letters of divorce and one haliza are required. If he addressed a Mamar to one and gave a letter of divorce to the other, the one requires a letter of divorce and the other must perform the haliza. If he addressed a Mamar to one and cohabited with it. Other both require letters of divorce and one must perform the haliza if he addressed a mamar to one and submitted to haliza from the other it is necessary for the first to obtain a letter of divorce if the lover gave a letter of divorce to one as well as to the other haliza is necessary for both if he gave a letter of divorce to one and cohabited with the other the second requires a letter of divorce and must also perform the haliza if he gave a letter of divorce to one and addressed a mamar to the other the second requires a letter of divorce and one of them must perform the haliza if he gave a letter of divorce to one and submitted to haliza from the other there is no validity in any act that follows the haliza if the lover submitted to haliza from the one and from the other or submitted to haliza from one and addressed to the other a mamar gave her a letter of divorce or cohabited with her or if he cohabited with the one and with the other or Cohabited with the one and addressed to the other, Mamar gave her a letter of divorce or submitted to her haliza. No act is valid after the haliza. There is no difference in the law whether there was one lover to two sisters in law or two lovers to one sister in law. If the lover submitted to haliza and then addressed to her, Mamar gave her a letter of divorce or cohabited with her, or if he cohabited with her and then addressed to her, Mamar gave her a letter of divorce or submitted to haliza. No act is valid after the haliza whether it was performed in the beginning, in the middle, or at the end. In the case of cohabitation, if it took place first, no act that follows it has any validity. If it occurred, however, in the middle or at the end, something valid still remains. Arnim, I said with cohabitation as with haliza, whether it took place in the beginning, in the middle, or at the end, there is no validity in any act that follows it. Mar, their difference concerns. Only a letter of divorce after another letter of divorce and a mamar after another mamar but one letter of divorce to one sister-in-law or one mamar to one sister-in-law is valid. Why did the rabbi say that a letter of divorce to one sister-in-law is valid because it is also valid elsewhere for should you suggest that it is not valid it might be argued that since a letter of divorce serves to release a woman and haliza serves to release a woman as a letter of divorce is of no effect. So is the haliza also of no effect and thus one would come to consummate marriage after haliza and why did the rabbi say that a mamar with one sister-in-law is valid because it is valid elsewhere for should you say that it is not valid it might be argued that since a mamar serves the purpose of acquisition and cohabitation serves the purpose of acquisition as a mamar is of no effect so is cohabitation also of no effect and one would thus consummate marriage after an act of Cohabitation and why did the rabbi say that after an invalid cohabitation something lingers it might be replied that if it is a cohabitation after a letter of divorce a preventive measure was made against cohabitation after haliza and if it is a cohabitation after a mamar a preventive measure had to be made against cohabitation after cohabitation and why did the rabbi say that after the invalid haliza nothing lingers it may be replied what kind of preventive measure could have been enacted should haliza after a letter of divorce be forbidden as a preventive measure against haliza after haliza under such circumstances surely haliza might well be indefinitely continued and should haliza after a mamar be forbidden as a preventive measure against haliza after cohabitation surely it may be replied is not in the case of haliza after a mamar a letter of divorce required in respect of one's mamar so also in the case of haliza after cohabitation a letter of divorce is required in respect of one's cohabitation. Rabbi said Talmud, Masya Bamatha, what is our Gamaliel's reason? Because he was in doubt whether a letter of divorce does or does not set aside the Levi Rapond and whether a mamar does or does not affect the Kanyan, whether a letter of divorce does or does not set aside the Levi Rapond. If the first does set aside the Levi Rapond, what purpose could the latter serve? If the first does not set aside the Levi Rapond, the latter also does not set it aside whether a mamar does or does not affect the Kanyan. If the first does affect the Kanyan, what purpose could the latter serve? And if the first affects no Kanyan, the latter also does not have a raised the following objection against him. Our Gamaliel, however, admits that there is validity in a letter of divorce after a mamar and a mamar after a letter of divorce in a letter of divorce after cohabitation and a mamar and in a mamar after cohabitation and a letter of divorce. Now, if our Gamaliel was in doubt the cohabitation should be regarded as if it had taken place at the beginning and thus constitute a kanyan for surely we have learned in the case of cohabitation if it took place first no act that follows it has any validity but said Abbe though obvious to our Gamaliel that a letter of divorce does set aside the Levi Rapon and that a mamar does affect a kanyan the rabbis have nevertheless ruled that with the sister-in-law a letter of divorce is partially valid and a mamar is partially valid consequently a letter of divorce after another letter of divorce does not set aside the
Forbidden to marry her relatives, though the relatives of the second one are permitted to him, but the sages said if he gave a letter of divorce to one and to the other, he is forbidden to marry the relatives of both, and he submits to Eliza from either of them, and the same law applies where there are two Ebers and one sister in law. What did Argamaliel mean by his statement that there is no validity in a Mammar after another Mammar if two sisters in law have fallen to the lot of one lover? And he addressed a Mammar to the one as well as to the other, he gives according to Argamaliel a letter of divorce to the first, submits also to her Eliza, and is in consequence forbidden to marry her relatives, though the relatives of the second are permitted to him. The sages, however, said he gives letters of divorce to both, and the relatives of both are forbidden to him while he submits to Eliza from one of them, and the same law is to be applied where there are two lovers and one sister in. Law the master said if he gave a letter of divorce to one as well as to the other he submits according to Argamaliel's statement to Eliza from the first and is forbidden to marry her relatives though the relatives of the second are permitted to him must this be assumed to present an objection against the ruling of Samuel since Samuel stated if he submitted to Eliza from the one who had been divorced her rival is not thereby exempt Samuel can answer you what I said was in agreement with him. Who maintains that a Levi Rapon exists while Argamaliel holds the opinion that no Levi Rapon exists since Argamaliel however is of the opinion that no Levi Rapon exists Talmud, Mas Yavamath be the rabbis are presumably of the opinion that a Levi Rapon does exist and yet it was stated in the final clause and the same law applies where there are two lovers and one sister in law must it then be said that this represents an objection to a statement made by Rabbi son of Arhunah in the Name of Rab for Rabbi son of Arhunah stated in the name of Rabbi Eliza of an impure character must go the round of all the brothers Rabbi son of Arhunah can answer you both according to the view of Argamaliel and that of the rabbis no Levi Rapon exists and their difference here extends only to the question of a divorce that followed another divorce and a mammar that followed another mammar the master said if he addressed a mammar to the one as well as to the other he gives according to Argamaliel a letter of divorce to the first submits also to her Eliza and is in consequence forbidden to marry her relatives though the relatives of the second are permitted to him now consider since Argamaliel holds that there is no validity in a mammar that follows another mammar the first sister-in-law should even be permitted to contract the Levi marriage a preventive ordinance had to be made against the possibility of the lovers marrying the second are Yohanan said R. Gamaliel Beth Shammai are Simeon Bizei and Ar Nehemiah are all of the opinion that a Mammar constitutes a fairly perfect Kenyan as to Argamaliel there is a statement already mentioned Beth Shammai for we learned if two of three brothers were married to two sisters and the third was unmarried and when one of the sisters' husbands died the unmarried brother addressed to her a Mammar and then his second brother died Beth Shammai say his wife remains with him while the other is exempt as being his wife's sister cannot have any validity if however the cohabitation of the first has no validity then that of the second also has no validity now the cohabitation of one who is nine years of age has been given by the rabbis the same force as that of a Mammar and yet Ar Simeon stated that such cohabitation has no validity Ben Ezei for it was taught Ben Ezei stated a Mammar is valid after another Mammar where it concerns two lovers and one sister-in-law but no Mammar is valid after a Mammar where it concerns two sisters-in-law and one lover Arniamai for we learned Arniamai said with cohabitation as with Eliza whether it took place at the beginning in the middle or at the end there is no validity in any act that follows it now an invalid cohabitation has been given by the rabbis the same force as a Mammar and yet it was stated there is no validity in any act that follows it how if a lover addressed a Mammar etc. Talmud, Mas Yabamath is this an illustration of a letter of divorce after a letter of divorce Rab Judah replied it is this that was meant the illustration of a letter of divorce after another letter of divorce and of a Mammar after another Mammar is as stated but how is the release from the Levi Rapon defected where there is one lover and one sister-in-law if a lover addressed a Mammar to his sister-in-law and subsequently gave her a letter of divorce it is necessary for her to perform the Eliza with him if he addressed to her Mammar and then cohabited with her. Behold, this is in accordance with the prescribed precept. Might it be suggested that this provides support for Arhunah? For Arhunah stated the precept of marriage with a sister in law is properly performed when the lover first betrothes and then cohabits with her. One might read this is also in accordance with the prescribed precept. Is not this obvious? It might have been presumed that since a master stated if the lover addressed a Mammar to his sister in law, the Levi Rapon disappears and he comes under the bond of betrothal and marriage. He is not performing the commandment. Hence, we were taught that he does to turn to the main text. Arhunah said the precept of marriage with a sister in law is properly performed when the lover first betrothes and then cohabits with her. If he cohabited with her and then addressed to her, Mammar Kanyan is nevertheless constituted if he cohabited with her and then addressed to her, Mammar is so obvious. Since he had acquired her by the cohabitation read rather if he cohabited with her without previously addressing to her among Markanyan is nevertheless constituted but was it not taught that the penalty of flogging is inflicted upon him chastisement was meant which is a rabbinical penalty for rab ordered the chastisement of any person who betrothed by cohabitation who betrothed in the open street or who betrothed without previous negotiation who annulled a letter of divorce or who made a declaration against a letter of divorce who was insolent towards the representative of the rabbis or who allowed a rabbinical ban upon him to remain for 30 days and did not come to the Beth Din to request the removal of that ban and of a son-in-law who lives in his father-in-law's house you say only if he lives but not if he only passes by surely a man once passed by the door of his father-in-law's house and Arshis hate ordered his chastisement that man was suspected of immoral relations. With his mother-in-law the Nihardian stated Rab ordered the chastisement of none of these except him who betrothed by cohabitation without preliminary negotiation others say even with preliminary negotiation because such a practice is sheer licentiousness our rabbis taught how is betrothal affected with a mammar if he gave her some money or anything of value and how is it affected by a deed how is it affected by a deed surely as has been stated if he wrote for her on a piece of paper or on a shirt although it was not worth even a paratop behold thou art betrothed unto me Abbe replied it is this that was meant how is a deed of a kethuba in a Levi marriage to be drawn up he writes for her I so and so son of so and so undertake to feed and maintain in a suitable manner my sister-in-law so and so provided that her kethuba remains a charge upon the estate of her first husband if however she is unable to obtain it from her first husband provision was made by the rabbis that she is to receive it from the second in order that it may not be easy for him to divorce her Abbe inquired of Rabbi what is the law if he gave her a letter of divorce and said behold thou art divorced from me but thou art not permitted to any other man the divorce of a sister-in-law being rabbinically valid shall I say that only a divorce which is valid in the case of a married woman is valid in the case of a sister-in-law but a divorce which is invalid in the case of a married woman is also invalid in the case of a sister-in-law or had provision to be made here against the possibility of mistaking it for an unqualified divorce the other replied provision has to be made against the possibility of mistaking it for an unqualified divorce Rabbi behind and now then had he given her a mere scrap of paper would he also have disqualified her the other replied there the scrap of paper does not cause a woman to be unfit for a priest here however the qualified divorce does cause a woman to become unfit for a priest for it was taught neither shall they take a woman put away from her husband even if she was only divorced from her husband they may not take her and that is what was meant by the scent of the divorce that causes a woman's unfitness for a priest Rami Bihama said it has been definitely stated that if a man said to ascribe write a letter of divorce for my betrothed so that when I have married her I may divorce her the letter of divorce is valid because it was in his power to divorce her Talmud, Mas Yavamath B. If for any other woman the letter of divorce has no validity because it was not in his power to divorce her Rami Bihama inquired however what is the law if for one sister-in-law is she because she is bound to him regarded as his betrothed or perhaps since he addressed no Mammar to her she is not so regarded this is undecided Our Hanania inquired what is the law if he wrote a letter of divorce in respect of his Levi Rapon but not in respect of his Mammar or in respect of his Mammar and not in respect of his Levi Rapon is the Mammar imposed upon the
because it was stated her former husband who sent her away may not take her again to be his wife i.e. immediately after sending her away or as she replied a divorce given by lovers is only rabbinically valid and the scriptural text is a mere prop likewise it was also taught rabbi said the statement was made only in accordance with the view of our Akiva who treated Ahaliza as a forbidden relative the sages however maintained that there is some validity in acts after Ahaliza and I say when is Betrothal after Haliza valid only when he betrothed her as in ordinary matrimony but if he betrothed her for Levi union there is no validity in any such act after the Haliza it was taught elsewhere if a man submitted to Haliza from his sister-in-law and then betrothed her rabbi said if he betrothed her as in ordinary matrimony it is necessary for her to obtain from him a letter of divorce but if as for a Levi union there is no need for her to obtain from him a letter of divorce the sages however said whether he betrothed her as in ordinary matrimony or as for the Levi union it is necessary for her to obtain from him a letter of divorce said our Joseph what is rabbi's reason it was given the same legal force as that of the action of a person digging in the estate of a proselyte believing it to be his own which constitutes no kanyan said Abbe to him are the two cases alike there he had no intention at all of acquiring possession but here his intention surely was to Acquire possession as indeed could only be compared to the case of a person who digs in the estate of one proselyte and believes it to be that of another where he does acquire possession. No explained Abbe here we are dealing with a case where the lover said to her be thou betrothed to me by the Mammar of the Levirate Union Rabbi is of the opinion that the Mammar can only be imposed upon the Levirate bond but here the Haliza had already previously removed the Levirate bond the Rabbis. However are of the opinion that the one is independent of the other if then the lover had said to her at first be thou betrothed unto me by this Mammar of the Levirate Union would not his kanyan have been valid consequently it is now also valid Rabbi said had he said to her by the Mammar of the Levirate Union there would be no disagreement among the authorities that it is valid but here we are dealing with a case where the lover said be thou betrothed unto me by the bond of the Levirate. Rabbi is of the opinion Talmud, Masi of Amitha that a Levi Rapon does exist but the Haliza had previously removed that Levi Rapon the rabbis however hold that no Levi Rapon exists if then he had said to her at first be thou betrothed unto me by the bond of the Levi Rate would not his word have been valid consequently it is now also valid Arsh Arabia said had a proper Haliza been performed all would agree that if he said to her be thou betrothed unto me by the bond of the Levi Rate. There is no validity in his betrothal here however the dispute relates to a Haliza of an impure character one master holds that a Haliza of an impure character provides all the necessary exemption and the masters hold that a Haliza of an impure character provides no exemption Arsh said no all agree that a Haliza of an impure character provides no exemption here however the dispute centers around the question whether a condition may affect the validity of Haliza the masters. Hold that a condition does affect the validity of a Haliza and the master holds that no condition may affect the validity of a Haliza. Rabbanah said no all agree that a condition does affect a Haliza here however the dispute is dependent on the question of the double condition. The master holds that a double condition is essential and the masters hold the opinion that a double condition is unnecessary if the lover submitted to Haliza and then addressed to her. Mammar gave her a letter of divorce or cohabited with her etc. It should also have been stated no act is valid after cohabitation. Both Abbe and Rabba replied read no act is valid after cohabitation but Artana the statement regarding the permissibility of the sister-in-law to marry anyone was preferred by him. The law is the same whether there is one sister-in-law or two sisters-in-law or Mishnah is not in agreement with the ruling of Benazay for it was taught Benazay stated a Mammar is valid after another. Mammar where it concerns two lovers and one sister-in-law but no Mammar is valid after a Mammar where it concerns two sisters-in-law and one lover how a Mammar to the one etc. May it be suggested that this provides support to a ruling of Samuel Samuel having stated that if the lover had participated in the Haliza with her to whom he addressed a Mammar her rival was not thereby exempt and an objection to the ruling of our Joseph does it state he may participate in the Haliza would it states his had participated implying a fait accompli a letter of divorce to the one as well as to the other etc. May it be suggested that this provides support to Rabbi son of Arhuna for Rabbi son of Arhuna stated a Haliza of an impure character must go the round of all the brothers by it is necessary for both widows generally were meant if he gave a letter of divorce to one and submitted to Haliza from the other may it be suggested that this provides support to the ruling of Samuel and Presents an objection against the ruling of our Joseph does it state he may participate in the Haliza what it states is had participated implying a fait accompli if the lover submitted to Haliza from the one and from the other or submitted to Haliza etc. It should also have been stated no act is valid after cohabitation both Abbe and Rob replied read no act is valid after cohabitation but Artana the statement on the permissibility of the sister-in-law marrying anyone was preferred by him there is no difference in the law whether there was one lover to two sisters-in-law etc. According to our Yohanan who ruled that the whole house stands under the prohibition of a negative precept it is intelligible why it was necessary to inform us that betrothal with those whose intercourse involves the penalties of a negative precept is invalid according to Rush Lakish however who ruled that all the house is subject to the penalty of Karath was there any need to inform us that betrothal with those whose intercourse involves Karath is invalid Rush Lakish can answer you and even according to your conception was it necessary to tell us in the final clause which speaks of the case where the lover cohabited with her and then addressed to her Mammar that there was no validity in a betrothal with a married woman but the fact is that as he taught concerning the permissibility of one lover and one sister-in-law he also taught concerning two sisters-in-law and one lover and since he taught concerning two sisters-in-law and one lover he also taught concerning two lovers and one sister-in-law Talmud, Mas Yavam if the lover submitted to Haliz and then addressed to her Mammar and gave etc. one can well understand why it was necessary to lay down a rule where the lover submitted to Haliz and then addressed to her Mammar since it might have been assumed that provision was to be made for a Mammar that followed Haliz as a preventive measure against a Mammar. That preceded Haliza, it was consequently necessary to tell us that no such preventive measure was to be made. What need, however, was there for the ruling where the lover submitted to Haliza and then gave her a letter of divorce? Read then according to your own view, the final clause if he cohabited with her and then addressed to her Mammar, or if he cohabited with her and then gave her a letter of divorce, one can well understand it might be argued here also why it was necessary to lay down a ruling where the lover cohabited with her and then gave her a letter of divorce, since it might have been assumed that provision was to be made for a divorce that followed cohabitation as a preventive measure against a divorce that preceded cohabitation. It was consequently necessary to tell us that no such preventive measure was required, but what need was there for the ruling where he cohabited with her and then addressed to her Mammar, but the fact is that as he taught if the lover Submitted to Haliz and then addressed to her Mammar. He also taught if he cohabited with her and then addressed to her Mammar. And since he desired to teach the rule where he cohabited with her and then gave her a letter of divorce, he also taught if the lover submitted to Haliz and then gave her a letter of divorce. If it took place, etc. Our mission cannot be reconciled with the opinion of the following tenet. For it was taught Abba Jose B. Yohanan of Jerusalem reported in the name of R. Medir alike in the case of cohabitation or of Haliz. If it took place first, no act that follows has any validity. But if it occurred in the middle or at the end, something valid still remains on this question. In fact, three different views have been expressed. The first tenet is of the opinion that in the case of cohabitation, where a preventive measure is required, a preventive measure was made. But in the case of Haliz, where no preventive measure is called for, no preventive measure was made. R. Nehemiah on the other hand is of the opinion that in the case of cohabitation also no preventive measure is called for and as to your possible objection that provision should be made where cohabitation followed a letter of divorce as a preventive measure against cohabitation that followed a Haliza it may be replied that as Haliza is a Pentateuch law it is well known and as to your objection that provision should be made where cohabitation followed a Mammar as a preventive measure against cohabitation that followed another cohabitation it may also be replied that as Kanyan by cohabitation is a Pentateuch law it is certainly well known and Abba Jose B. Hain again holds the same
her intention was the performance of the commandment or where he acted in presumption and her intention was the performance of the commandment but even if he acted in error and she in presumption or he in presumption and she in error so that the intention of neither of them was the fulfillment of the commandment the is nevertheless affected our high taught even if both acted in error both in presumption or both under compulsion how is one to understand the action under compulsion in our Mishnah, if it be suggested that idolaters compelled him to cohabit with her, surely it may be pointed out. Rabbah stated there can be no compulsion in sexual intercourse since erection depends entirely on the will. But when he slept, surely Rabbah Judah ruled Talmud, Mas Yabbatha, that one in sleep cannot acquire his sister in law. But when accidental insertion occurred, surely Rabbah stated one who fell from a roof and his fall resulted in accidental insertion is liable to pay an indemnity for four things. And if the woman was his sister in law, no kanyan is thereby constituted. It is when, for instance, his intention was intercourse with his wife and his sister in law seized him and he cohabited with her. How is one to understand both under compulsion taught at the school of our high when, for instance, his intention was intercourse with his wife and idolater seized him, brought him and her into close contact and he cohabited with her once these words from what our rabbis taught her. Husband's brother shall go in unto her is a commandment. Another interpretation: Her husband's brother shall go in unto her, whether in error or in presumption, whether under compulsion or of his own free will. But surely deduction has already been made from this text that it is a commandment. That it is a commandment may be inferred from, and if the man like not, which implies that if he likes, he contracts a levirate marriage, so that the other text may serve the purpose of deducing whether in error or in presumption, whether under compulsion or of his own free will. Another very the taught her husband's brother shall go in unto her in the natural way and take her, even though in an unnatural way, and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her. Only the cohabitation consummates her marriage, but neither money nor deed can consummate her marriage and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her, even against her will. The master said another interpretation: Her husband's brother shall go. In unto her whether in error etc. But surely deduction has been made from this text that it must be in the natural way this may be deduced from to raise up unto his brother a name i.e. only where a name is raised up so that the other text may be employed for the deduction whether in error or in presumption whether under compulsion or of his own free will to turn to the main text Rab Judah ruled that one in sleep cannot acquire his sister in law for scripture stated her husband's brother shall go in unto her only when the cohabitation was intentional but surely it was taught whether he was awake or asleep read whether she was awake or asleep but surely it was taught whether he was awake or asleep or whether she was awake or asleep the statement refers to one who was in a state of drowsiness what state of drowsiness is hereby to be understood or as she replied when a man is half asleep and half awake as for instance when he answers on being addressed but is unable to give any sensible Reply and when he is reminded of anything he can recall it to turn to the main text Rabbah stated one who fell from a roof and his fall resulted in accidental insertion is liable to pay an indemnity for four things and if the woman was his sister in law no kanyan is thereby constituted he must pay her for bodily injury for pain inflicted for enforced unemployment and for medical expenses but he is not liable to indemnify her for indignity for a master said one is not liable to pay any indemnity for indignity unless it was intentionally caused Rabbah said if a lover's intention was to shoot against the wall and he accidentally shot at his sister in law no kanyan is thereby constituted if he intended however to shoot at a beast and he accidentally shot at his sister in law kanyan is thereby constituted since some sort of intercourse had been intended whether he passed only the first stage or stated once is it proved that the first stage of contact is pentateukala Forbidden it is said, and if a man shall lie with a menstruant woman and shall uncover her nakedness, he hath made naked her fountain. It is deduced from this text that the first stage of contact is pentateuch ally forbidden. Thus the case of a menstruant has been arrived at once that of other forbidden unions, and were you to suggest that their case might be inferred from that of the menstruant, it might be retorted the menstruant is different since she causes the defilement of the man who cohabited with her. Rather, the deduction is made from a brother's wife concerning whom it is written, and if a man shall take his brother's wife, she is a menstruant, now is a brother's wife always menstruant, but the meaning is like a menstruant, as with a menstruant, the first stage constitutes the offense, so does the first stage constitute an offense with a brother's wife, but a brother's wife it may be objected is different since it is in his power to increase the number for should he wish he. Could go on betrothing as many as a thousand. The deduction is rather made from the father's sister and the mother's sister, for it is written in scriptures, and thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister nor of thy father's sister, for he hath made naked his near kin. But it may be objected that a father's sister and a mother's sister come under a different category, since the prohibition in their case is natural. If it cannot be deduced from one category, then let it be deduced from the two categories from which, however, shall deduction be made. Were it made from a brother's wife and a father's sister and a mother's sister, it might be objected that those stand in a different category, since the prohibition of these is due to relationship. Deduction is rather made from the menstruant and a father's sister and a mother's sister. Those, however, it may be objected are in a different category, since the prohibition is natural. The deduction is rather made from the menstruant. And a brother's wife, since no objection can be raised against the two, are a Hassan of our Ikea demur to menstruant and a brother's wife are different since marriage with them cannot be permitted during the lifetime of the man who caused their prohibition. Would you then apply their restrictions to a married woman who might be permitted to marry even during the lifetime of the man who caused her prohibition? Said Kaha of Dipti to Rubin, are a menstruant and a brother's wife forbidden to marry only during the lifetime of the man who caused their prohibition but permitted after that with a menstruant? Surely Talmud, Masyabamath be the prohibition depends on the number of days and with a brother's wife the all merciful made her prohibition dependent on the birth of children but the objection may be raised thus a menstruant and a brother's wife are different since the man who caused them to be forbidden cannot cause them to be permitted. Would you then apply their restrictions to it? Married woman whose permissibility is brought about by the man who caused her to be forbidden, but said are Yohanan, or as some say are who not son of our Joshua scripture stated, for whosoever shall do any of these abominations, even the souls that do them shall be cut off. All forbidden unions were compared to the menstruant as the first stage constitutes the offense with the menstruant, so does the first stage constitute the offense with all the others. What need then was there to mention the menstruant in the context of brother's wife for an inference like that of Arhuna for Arhuna stated once in the Torah may an allusion to the sister in law be traced. You ask when surely it is written in scripture her husband's brother shall go in unto her. The query is rather once the illusion that a sister in law is forbidden during the lifetime of her husband, but surely this is a logical inference since the all merciful said that she is permitted to marry after the death of her husband, it may be. Inferred that during the lifetime of her husband she is forbidden no for is it not possible to maintain that after the death of her husband it is a commandment and during the lifetime of her husband it is only optional or else though indeed only after the death of the husband and not during the lifetime of her husband yet being a negative commandment that is derived from a positive one it has only the force of a positive commandment scripture stated and if a man shall take his brothers why she is a menstruant now is a brother's wife always a menstruant but the meaning is like a menstruant as a menstruant although permitted afterwards is forbidden under the penalty of correct during the period of her prohibition so also a brother's wife though permitted afterwards is forbidden under the penalty of correct during the lifetime of her husband what need however was there to mention the first stage in connection with a father's sister or a mother's sister for an inference like that Mentioned in the following question, which Robin addressed to Rabba, what is the law if a man passed the first stage in Peterasti? You ask, what is the law in Peterasti? Surely it is written as with womankind, but the query is, what is the law when one passed the first stage with a beast? The other replied, no purpose is served by the text in forbidding the first stage in the case of a father's sister and a mother's sister, since in their case the prohibition is arrived at by the comparison of R. Jonah apply the text to the first stage with a beast. Observe intercourse with a beast is among the offenses subject to the death penalties of Beth Din. Why then was the first stage in relation to it enumerated among offenses that are subject to the penalty of Karath? It should rather have been written among those which are subject to the death penalty of the Beth Din,
Prohibition which is natural ought to be inferred from a prohibition which is also natural but let no proof be adduced from an aunt whose prohibition is not natural but might it not be argued thus the relatives of a father should be inferred from the relatives of a father but let no proof be adduced from a sister who is one's own relative hence it was stated thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's sister implying whether paternal or maternal and thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister implying also whether paternal or maternal what need was there to write it in respect of a father's sister and also in respect of a mother's sister are about replied both are required for had the all merciful written it in respect of a father's sister it might have been assumed to apply to her alone because her relationship is legally recognized but not to a mother's sister and had the all merciful written it in respect of a mother's sister it might have been assumed to apply to her alone because her relationship is certain but not to her father's sister hence both were required as to one's aunt concerning whom the tana had no doubt that she must be paternal and not maternal whence does he derive it robber replied it is arrived at by a comparison between the words his uncle in two passages here it is written he hath uncovered his uncle's nakedness and there it is written or his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him as there he must be paternal and not necessarily maternal so here also he must be paternal and not necessarily maternal and whence is it proved their scripture stated of his family may redeem him and only a father's family may be called the proper family but the mother's family cannot be called the proper family but surely we learned if a man was told your wife is dead and he married her paternal sister and when he was told she also is dead he married her maternal sister she too is dead and he married her paternal sister she also is dead and he married her maternal sister he is permitted to live with the first third and fifth who also exempt their rivals but he is forbidden to live with the second and the fourth and cohabitation with one of these does not exempt her rival if however he cohabited with the second after the death of the first he is permitted to live with the second and with the fourth who also exempt their rivals but he is forbidden to live with the third and with the fifth Talmud, Masyab Abate. From this it clearly follows that a wife's sister whether she is paternal or maternal is forbidden once however is this derived deduction is made from one sister as a sister is forbidden whether she is paternal or maternal so here also whether she is paternal or maternal but let the deduction be made from one's aunt as one's aunt is forbidden only when she is paternal and not when maternal so here also the prohibition should apply when she is paternal and not when maternal it stands. To reason that the deduction should be made from one sister since laws concerning his own relatives should be inferred from laws concerning others of his own relatives on the contrary deduction should have been made from one's aunt since a relationship affected through betrothal should be inferred from one affected through betrothal the deduction is rather made from a brother's wife since her relationship is through betrothal and she is of his own relatives whence however is the law. Concerning a brother's wife herself derived from what was taught thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy brother's wife whether he is paternal or maternal you say whether he is paternal or maternal perhaps it is not so but only when paternal and not when maternal this is a matter of logical argument he is subject to a penalty here and he is also subject to penalty for intercourse with his sister as the prohibition of his sister applies whether she is paternal or maternal so here also. The prohibition applies whether he was paternal or maternal but might it not be argued thus he is subject to a penalty here and he is also subject to penalty for intercourse with his aunt as therefore the prohibition of his aunt applies only when she is paternal and not when only maternal so here also the prohibition applies only when he is paternal and not when only maternal let us observe whom the case more closely resembles deduction concerning one's own relatives should be made from one's own relatives and let no proof be adduced from one's aunt whose relationship is due to his father but might it not be argued as follows deduction should be made concerning a relationship which is due to betrothal from a relationship that is due to betrothal but let no proof be adduced from a sister the prohibition of whom is natural for this reason it was specifically stated in scriptures it is thy brother's nakedness implying whether he is paternal or only maternal might it not be Suggested that the one as well as the other speaks of the wife of a paternal brother, the one referring to a brother's wife who had children during the lifetime of her husband, while the other refers to a brother's wife who had no children during the lifetime of her husband. The case of one who had no children during the lifetime of her husband may be deduced from the statement of our might not both still speak of the wife of a paternal brother, the one referring to a brother's wife who had children during the lifetime of her husband, and the other to one who had children after the death of her husband. The case of one who had children after the death of her husband requires no scriptural text, for since the All Merciful said that she who had no children was permitted, it is obvious that if she had children, she is forbidden. Is it not possible that she who has no children is forbidden to all men, but permitted to the lover, while she who has children is permitted both to all men and to the lover or else if she has no children it is a commandment but if she has children it is optional or else though indeed the lover may marry her if she has no children but he may not if she has children yet as the prohibition is a negative commandment that is derived from a positive one it has only the force of a positive commandment for this reason scripture wrote another text he hath uncovered his brother's nakedness but might it be said that the wife of a maternal brother is like the wife of a paternal brother and that as the wife of a paternal brother is permitted after the death of her husband so is also the wife of a maternal brother permitted after the death of her husband scripture said she as she retains her status what need was there to specify the penalty of correct for intercourse with one sister to infer a ruling like that of our Yohanan for our Yohanan stated if one committed all these offenses in one state of unawareness he is liable for every one of them According to our Isaac, however, who stated all those who are subject to the penalty of Kareth were included in the general rule, and why was the penalty of Kareth for intercourse with a sister stated separately in order to indicate that his penalty is Kareth and not flogging? Whence is the division deduced? It is deduced from and unto a woman as long as she is impure by her uncleanness that guilt is incurred for every single woman. For what purpose did the all merciful right they shall be child? Less in the case of one's aunt, it is required for an exposition like that of Rabba. For Rabba pointed out the following contradiction: it is written they shall be childless, and it is also written they shall die childless. How are these two versions to be reconciled? If he has children, he will bury them. If he has no children, he will be childless. And it was necessary to write they shall be childless, and it was also necessary to write they shall die childless. For had the all merciful written only. They shall be childless it might have been assumed to refer to children born before the offense but not to those born subsequent to the offense hence the all merciful wrote they shall die childless and had the all merciful written they shall die childless it might have been assumed to refer to those born subsequent to the offense but not to those who were born previously hence both texts were required whence is the prohibition of the first stage among those who are subject to the penalty of negative commandments to be inferred as the all merciful specified carnally in the case of a designated bondmate it may be inferred that among all the others who are subject to the penalty of negative commandments the first stage by itself constitutes the offense on the contrary as the all merciful specified the first stage in the case of those who are subject to the penalty of Kareth, it may be inferred that among those who are subject to the penalty of negative commandments consummation only Constitutes the offense are as she replied if so scripture should have omitted the reference in the case of the designated handmaid whence is the prohibition of the first stage inferred in the case of offenses for which priests alone are subject to the penalty of negative commandments this is arrived at by an analogy between the expressions of taking whence is the prohibition in respect of those who are subject to the penalty of the positive commandment inferred Talmud, Mas Yabam, B it is. Arrived at by an analogy between the two expressions of coming whence the prohibition of Yabamah to a stranger if one follows him who holds that it is a negative precept it would be subject to the same restrictions as any other negative precept if one follows him who holds that it is a positive precept it would be subject to the same restrictions as any other positive precept whence however its force in respect of the Yabamah and the lover it is arrived at by the analogy between the two expressions of coming whence its force in respect of the kanyan between husband and wife it is arrived at by comparison between the expressions of taking rabbis said for what purpose did the all merciful write carnally in connection with the designated bondmaid a married woman and a soda that in connection with the designated bondmaid is required as has just been explained that in connection with a married woman excludes intercourse with a relaxed member this is a satisfactory interpretation in accordance with the view of him who maintains that if one cohabited with forbidden relatives with relaxed
All merciful forbidden a wife to her husband because of obscenity rather said obey the exclusion is the case where the husband's warning was concerning superficial contact this is a satisfactory explanation according to him who maintains that the first stage of contact is the insertion of the corona what can be said however according to him who maintains that it is a superficial contact the exclusion is rather the case where he warned her concerning lecherous contact of her limbs but it was necessary to state it because it might have been assumed that as the all-merciful has made the prohibition dependent on the objection of the husband the woman should here be forbidden since he objected hence we were taught that such a case is excluded Samuel stated the first stage is constituted by superficial contact this may be compared to a man who puts his finger to his mouth it is impossible for him not to press down the flesh when Rabbi Barhanda came he stated in the name of Aryohan and consummation in the case of a designated bondmaid is constituted by the insertion of the corona Arshis hate raised an objection carnally implies that guilt is incurred only when intercourse was accompanied by friction does not this refer to friction of the member no friction of the corona when Ardimi came he stated in the name of Aryohan and the first stage is constituted by the insertion of the corona they said to him but surely Rabbi Barhanda did not say so he replied then either he is the storyteller or I when Rabin came he stated in the name of Aryohan and the first stage is constituted by the insertion of the corona he is certainly in disagreement with the report of Rabbi Barhanda must it be said however that he differs also from Samuel know the entire process from the superficial contact until the insertion of the corona is described as the first stage when our Samuel B. Judah came he stated in the name of Aryohan and the first stage is constituted by the insertion of the corona and the final stage by actual consummation Talmud, Masya Bamatha beyond this the act is no more than superficial contact and one is exonerated in regard to it he thus differs from Samuel whether he passed only the first or also the final stage of contact he constitutes thereby Kanyan in what respect is Kanyan constituted Rab reply Kanyan is constituted in all respects and Samuel replied Kanyan is constituted only in respect of the things specified in the section Bistu. Inherit the estate of his brother and to exempt her from the Levirate marriage if she became subject to the lover after her marriage she may according to the view of all Eterima since she has been eating it before they differ only where she became subject to the lover after betrothal Rab maintains that she may eat since the All Merciful has included cohabitation in error giving it the same validity as when done presumptuously but Samuel maintains that the All Merciful has included it in so far only as to put him in the same position as the husband but not to confer upon him more power than upon the husband and in giving this ruling Samuel is consistent with his own view for Arnavan stated in the name of Samuel wherever the husband entitles her to eat the lover also entitles her to eat and wherever the husband does not entitle her to eat the lover also does not entitle her to eat an objection was raised if the daughter of an Israelite capable of bearing was betrothed to a priest capable of hearing who became deaf before he had time to marry her she may not eat terimah if he died and she became subject to a deaf lover she may eat and in this respect the power of the lover is superior to that of the husband now according to Rab this statement is perfectly satisfactory according to Samuel however a difficulty arises Samuel can answer you read thus who became deaf before he had time to marry her she may not eat terimah if however he married her and then Became deaf she may eat it if he died and she became subject to a deaf lover she may eat it then what is meant by in this respect while if the husband had been deaf before she would not have been entitled to eat if the lover had been deaf before she may eat others say if she became subject to the lover after her betrothal all agree that she may not eat terima since she was not allowed to eat it during the lifetime of her husband they differ only when she became subject to the lover. After her marriage Rab maintains that she may eat since she has been eating before but Samuel maintains that she may not eat because the all merciful has included cohabitation in error giving it the same force as cohabitation in presumption only in respect of the things that were enumerated in the section but not in all other respects but surely are not stated in the name of Samuel wherever the husband entitles her to eat the lover also entitles her to eat read every cohabitation whereby Husband entitles her to eat also entitles her to eat if performed by the lover and every cohabitation whereby the husband does not entitle her to eat does not entitle her to eat if performed by the lover an objection was raised if the daughter of an Israelite capable of hearing was betrothed to a priest capable of hearing who became deaf before he had time to marry her she may not eat terima if he died and she became subject to a deaf lover she may eat and in this respect the power of it. Lover is superior to that of the husband now according to Rab this might well be explained as was explained above according to Samuel however a difficulty arises this is indeed a difficulty our rabbis taught if the daughter of an Israelite capable of hearing was betrothed to a priest capable of hearing who became deaf before he had time to marry her she may not eat terima if a son was born to her she may eat if the son died our Nathan said she may eat but the sages said she may not eat what? Is our Nathan's reason Rabbi replied because she was eating before said Abbe to him what now would the daughter of an Israelite who was married to a priest who subsequently died be entitled to eat terima because she was eating it before but the fact is that as soon as her husband died his sanctity is withdrawn from her so here also as soon as the son died his sanctity is withdrawn from her rather said our Joseph our Nathan holds that marriage with a deaf priest does entitle the woman to eat terima and that no prohibition is to be made in respect of the marriage of a deaf priest as a preventive measure against the betrothal of a deaf priest said Abbe to him if so what need was there to state if a son was born to her because of the rabbis then our Nathan should have expressed his disagreement with the rabbis in the first clause he allowed the rabbis to finish their statement and then expressed his disagreement with them if so the statement should have read if the son died. She may not eat. Our Nathan said she may eat. This is a difficulty. Similarly, if a man had intercourse with any of the forbidden relatives, our Amram said the following statement was made to us by our Shishay Talmud, Masya Bamatbi, who enlightened us on the subject from our Mishnah and Israelite's wife who was outraged, though she is permitted to her husband, is disqualified from the priesthood, and so it was taught by our Tana. Similarly, if a man had intercourse with any of the forbidden relatives, enumerated in the Torah, or with any of those who are ineligible to marry him, now what is the purport of similarly? Does it not mean whether in error or in presumption, whether under compulsion or of his own free will? And yet it was stated he has thereby rendered her ineligible. No, similarly, might refer to the first stage to the first stage with whom, if it be suggested with one of the forbidden relatives, does this then imply it might be retorted that the case of the forbidden relatives is derived from that of the sister-in-law on the contrary the case of the sister-in-law was derived from the forbidden relatives since the original prohibition of the first stage was written in connection with the forbidden relatives rather similarly refers to unnatural intercourse with forbidden relatives on the contrary the original prohibition of the various forms of intercourse with a woman was written in connection with the forbidden relatives rather similarly refers to unnatural intercourse with those cohabitation with whom is subject to the penalty of negative precepts rather stated if the wife of a priest had been outraged her husband suffers the penalty of flogging on her account for cohabiting with a harlot only for cohabiting with a harlot but not for defilement read also for cohabitation with a harlot Arzera raised an objection and she be not seized she is forbidden if however she was seized she is permitted but there is another woman who is forbidden even though she was seized and who is that the wife of a priest now a negative precept that is derived from a positive one has only the force of a positive precept rabbi replied all were included in the category of harlot when therefore scripture specified in the case of the wife of an Israelite that only if she be not seized she is forbidden but if she was seized she is permitted it may be inferred that the wife of a priest retains her forbidden status others say rabbi stated if the wife of a priest had been outraged her husband suffers for her the penalty of flogging on account of defilement only on account of defilement but not for connubial relationship with a harlot thus it is obvious that when a woman acted under compulsion she is not to be regarded as a harlot Arzera raised an objection and she be not seized she is forbidden if however she was seized she is permitted but there is another woman who is forbidden even though she was seized and who is that the wife of a Priest now a negative precept that is derived from a positive one has only the force of a positive precept rabbi replied all were included in the prohibition to live with her after that she is defiled when therefore scripture specified in the case of the wife of an Israelite that only when she be not seized she is forbidden but if she was seized
Pentateuch ally forbidden cohabitation may not eat terramoth. This woman also may not eat, but according to our Eliezer and our Simeon who maintain that a woman awaiting a Pentateuch ally forbidden cohabitation may eat Talmud, Mas Yabamath. This woman also may eat whence is this proof? Is it not possible that our Eliezer and our Simeon maintain their opinion only there because in other circumstances he is entitled to confer the right of eating, but not here where he is never entitled to confer the right of eating? And were you to reply that here also he is entitled to confer upon the daughter of proselytes the right of eating, surely it may be retorted. This very question was addressed by our Yohanan to our Ashai who gave him no answer. It was stated Abbe said because he is entitled to confer upon his wife the right to eat terramoth so long as he does not cohabit with her. Rabbi said because he may confer the right of eating terramoth upon his Canaanitish bondmen and bondwomen. Abbe did not give. The same explanation as Rabba because matrimonial kanyan may be inferred from matrimonial kanyan but matrimonial kanyan may not be inferred from the kanyan of slaves and Rabba does not give the same explanation as Abbe because there it is different since she has already been eating it previously and Abbe the argument since she has already been eating cannot be upheld for should you not admit this a daughter of an Israelite who was married to a priest who subsequently died should also be allowed to eat terima since she has already been eating it and Rabba there his kanyan had completely ceased here however his kanyan did not cease to turn to the main text Aryohan and inquired of Arashai if a priest who was wounded in the stones married the daughter of proselytes does he confer upon her the right of eating terima the other remained silent and made no reply at all later another great man came and asked him a different question which he answered and who was that man Reshlakish? Said Arjuna the prince to Arashai is not Aryohanan a great man the other replied no reply could be given since he submitted a problem which has no solution in accordance with whose view if according to Arjuna she is not entitled to eat terima whether he does or does not retain his holiness for if he retains his holiness she may not eat since the master said the daughter of a male proselyte is like the daughter of a male who is unfit for the priesthood and if he does not retain his holiness she may not eat either since it has been said that the assembly of proselytes is called an assembly if however according to our Jose she is entitled to eat terima whether he does or does not retain his holiness for if he retains his holiness she may eat since he stated that even when a proselyte married a proselyte his daughter is eligible to marry a priest and if he does not retain his holiness she may also eat since he said that the assembly of proselytes is not called an assembly it must rather be in accordance with the view of the following Tanifer we learned our Eliezer B. Jacob said a woman who is the daughter of a proselyte must not be married to a priest unless her mother was of Israel and it is this that his question amounts to has only her eligibility increased and consequently she is entitled to eat terima or has perhaps her sanctity also increased and consequently she is not permitted to eat come and here when Araha Behinan arrived from the south he came and brought a bury with him once is it deduced that if a priest who is wounded in the stones married the daughter of proselytes he confers upon her the right to eat terima for it was stated but if a priest by any soul the purchase of his money etc he may eat of it now in accordance with whose view if it be suggested according to our Judah surely it may be retorted he stated that whether he does or does not retain his holiness she is not permitted to eat and if in accordance with the view of our Jose what needed may be asked was there for a scriptural text surely he stated that whether he does or does not retain his holiness she is permitted to eat must it not consequently be assumed that it is in accordance with the view of our Eliezer B. Jacob and so it may be inferred that only her eligibility had been increased and that she is consequently permitted to eat this proves that it was stated Rab said Talmud, Mas Yabamoth be the bridal chamber constitutes Kanyan with ineligible women. And Samuel said the bridal chamber does not constitute Kanyan with ineligible women said Samuel Abba agrees with me in the case of a girl who is under three years of age and one day since cohabitation with her constitutes no Kanyan the bridal chamber also constitutes no Kanyan Rabba said we also learned a similar that a girl who is three years of age and one day may be betrothed by cohabitation if a lover cohabited with her he has thereby acquired her one incurs through her the guilt of Intercourse with a married woman she defiles her cohabitor in respect of his imparting defilement to the Lord as well as to the upper couch if she was married to a priest she may eat terima and anyone ineligible who cohabited with her causes her ineligibility thus only a girl of the age of three years and one day who is rendered ineligible by cohabitation is also rendered ineligible through the bridal chamber but a girl younger than three years and one day who is not rendered ineligible by cohabitation is not rendered ineligible through the bridal chamber either this proves that Rami Bihama stated in regard to the question whether the bridal chamber constitutes Kanyan with ineligible women we arrive at a difference of opinion between our Meir and our Eliezer and our Simeon Talmud, Mas Yabamath according to our Meir who holds that the betrothal causes ineligibility the bridal chamber also causes ineligibility while according to our Eliezer and our Simeon who maintain that betrothal causes no ineligibility the bridal chamber also causes no ineligibility but once is this proved is it not possible that our mayor advanced his view only there in respect of betrothal whereby Kanyan is affected but not in respect of the bridal chamber whereby no Kanyan is affected or else our Eliezer and our Simeon may have advanced their view there only in respect of betrothal since it is not close to the act of intercourse but the bridal chamber which is close to the act of intercourse may well cause ineligibility but if anything can be said it is that the question depends on the dispute between the following Tanaim for it was taught this class or that is eligible or ineligible women who were married to a priest or who only entered with him into the bridal chamber without any intercourse having taken place are entitled to sustenance from his estate and are also permitted to eat terima who only entered etc implies that were married means that they were actually married must it not consequently be concluded that the meaning is as for instance when they entered the bridal chamber without any intercourse having taken place and yet it was stated that they are entitled to sustenance from his estate and are also permitted to eat terima or Ishmael son of Aryohan and Bibarakah said any woman whose cohabitation entitles her to the eating of terima is also entitled to the eating of it through her entry into the bridal chamber and any woman upon whom cohabitation does not confer the right to eat terima is not entitled through her entry into the bridal chamber also to the eating of it once however the proof is it not possible that our Ishmael son of Aryohan and Bibarakah is of the same opinion as our mayor who maintains that through betrothal alone a woman is not entitled to eat instead then of the statement any woman upon whom cohabitation does not confer the right to eat terima is not entitled through her entry into the bridal chamber also to the eating of it the statement should have run any woman upon whom cohabitation does not confer the right to eat terima is not entitled through her money also to the eating of terima but is it not possible that as the first tana spoke of the bridal chamber he also spoke of the bridal chamber Aram Rome stated the following ruling was given to us by Arshis hate and he threw light on the subject from a mission of the bridal chamber constitutes Kanyan with ineligible women and the following tana taught the same thing. Amen that I have not gone aside as a betrothed as a married woman as one awaiting the decision of the lover or as one taken by the lover now how is one to imagine the case of the betrothed if it be suggested that she was one who was warned while she was betrothed and then she secluded herself and is now made to drink while she is still only betrothed as a betrothed it may be asked subject to the drinking surely we learned a betrothed or one awaiting the decision of a lover neither drinks. Nor receives a kathubish should it however be suggested that she is one who was warned while she was betrothed and then she secluded herself and is now made to drink when she is already married do the waters it may be asked test her surely it was taught and the man shall be clear from iniquity only when the man is clear from iniquity do the waters test his wife when however the man is not clear from iniquity the waters do not test his wife consequently she must be one who was warned while she was betrothed and then she secluded herself and subsequently entered the bridal chamber but there was no cohabitation thus it may be inferred that the bridal chamber alone constitutes Kanyan with ineligible women said Rabbi do you think that this is an authenticated statement surely when Araha Bihanan arrived from the south he came and brought a burial with him besides thy husband only when the cohabitation of the husband preceded that of the adulterer but not when the cohabitation of the Adulterer preceded that of the husband Rami Bihama replied this is possible where for instance he cohabited
Taught it is not permissible to warn a betrothed woman in order that she may be made to drink while she is betrothed. She may, however, be warned in order that she may be made to drink when she is already married. Our Naman B. Isaac explained by implication our Hanan sent an instruction in the name of our Yohan and a lover who addressed a Mahamar to his Yebama while he has a living brother causes her disqualification from the eating of Terima even if he is a priest and she the daughter of a priest. According to whom, if it be suggested according to our Mayor, it is possible it might be objected that our Mayor said that one that is subject to an illegitimate cohabitation is not permitted to eat Terima only when the cohabitation is Pentateuch Ally forbidden. Did he, however, say that the same law holds when the prohibition is only rabbinical? Is it, however, suggested that it was made according to our Eliezer and our Simeon? It may be objected if the eating of Terima is permitted to one who is. Subject to a cohabitation which is Pentateuch Ally forbidden, is there any need to speak of one which is only rabbinically forbidden? When Rabin, however, came, he stated where a lover addressed a Mahamar to his Yebama, all agree that she is permitted to eat Terima. If he has a profane brother, all agree that she is not permitted to eat. They only differ where he gave her a letter of divorce. Our Yohan and maintains that she may eat, and Rush Lakish maintains that she may not eat. Our Yohan and maintains that she may eat, for even the statement of our Mayor who holds that she may not eat applies only to one subject of a Pentateuch Ally forbidden cohabitation, where, however, it is only rabbinically forbidden, she may eat, and Rush Lakish maintains that she may not eat, for even the statement of our Eliezer and our Simeon who hold that she may eat applies only to one who has elsewhere the right to confer the privilege of eating, but not in this case, since he has no right to confer the privilege elsewhere and should. You suggest that here also he has the right to confer the privilege of eating in the case where she returns it may be retorted that one who returns severs her connection with him and resumes her relationship with her father's house but this woman remains bound to him if they became widows or were divorced etc. Our high B. Joseph inquired of Samuel if the high priest betrothed the minor who became adolescent during her betrothal with him Talmud, Mas Yavamatha what is the law are we guided by the marriage or by the betrothal the other replied to him you have learned it if they became widows or were divorced after marriage they remain ineligible if after betrothal they become eligible the first said to him with reference to rendering her a halal I have no doubt that it is the forbidden cohabitation that causes her to be a halal my question is only what is implied by and he shall take a wife in her virginity is the taking of betrothal required or is it the taking of marriage that is Required the other replied you have learned this also a priest who betrothed the widow and was subsequently appointed to be a high priest may consummate the marriage there it is different because it is written shall he take to wife here also it is written wife only one but not two and what is the reason in the case of the one her body has undergone a change and that of the other her body underwent no change mission a high priest shall not marry a widow whether she became a widow after a betrothal or after a marriage he shall not marry one who is adolescent our Eliezer and our Simeon permit him to marry one who is adolescent but he may not marry one who is wounded tomorrow our rabbis taught a widow shall he not take whether she became a widow after a betrothal or after a marriage is not this obvious it might have been assumed that the meaning of widow is to be inferred from widow in the case of Tamar as there it was one after marriage so here also it is one after marriage hence we were taught that any widow was meant but might it not be suggested that it is indeed so it is compared to a divorced woman as divorced woman includes any divorcee whether after betrothal or after marriage so also widow includes any widow whether after betrothal or after marriage he shall not marry one who is adolescent or rabbis taught and he shall take a wife in her virginity excludes one who is adolescent whose virginity is ended so our mayor our Eliezer, and our Simeon permit the marriage of one who is adolescent on what principle do they differ our mayor is of the opinion that virgin implies even one who retains some of her virginity her virginity implies only one who retains all her virginity and her virginity implies only when previous intercourse with her took place in the natural manner but not when in an unnatural manner our Eliezer, and our Simeon, however are of the opinion that virgin would have implied a perfect virgin her virginity implies even one who retains only part of her virginity and her virginity implies only one whose entire virginity is intact irrespective of whether previous intercourse with her was of a natural or unnatural character Rab Judah stated in the name of Rab a woman who was subjected to unnatural intercourse is disqualified from marrying a priest Rab raised an objection and she shall be his wife applies to a woman eligible to marry him this excludes the marriage of a widow to a high priest of a divorced woman and a haliza. To a common priest now how is one to understand the outrage if it be suggested that it was one of natural intercourse what it may be asked was the object of pointing to her widowhood when her prohibition could be inferred from the fact that she had had carnal intercourse with a man must it not consequently be assumed to be a case of unnatural intercourse and the only reason why the woman is forbidden is because she is a widow and not because she had had carnal intercourse Talmud, Mas. Yavamathi this represents the view of our Mayor while Rab holds the same view as our Eliezer if Rab holds the same view as our Eliezer what was the object of pointing to her previous carnal intercourse when her prohibition could have been inferred from the fact that she was a harlot our Eliezer having stated that an unmarried man who cohabited with an unmarried woman with no matrimonial intention renders her thereby harlot our Joseph replied when for instance the woman was subjected to intercourse with a beast where the reason of previous carnal intercourse may be applied but not that a harlot said Abbe to him whatever you prefer your reply cannot be upheld if she is a beulah she must also be a harlot and if she is not a harlot she cannot be a beulah either and were you to reply this case is similar to that of a wounded woman it may be pointed out that if the disqualification should be extended to unnatural intercourse also you will find no woman eligible to marry a High priest, since there is not one who has not been in some way wounded by a splinter, no said Arzara in respect of a minor who made a declaration of refusal, Arshai might be high stated a woman who had intercourse with a beast is eligible to marry a priest. Likewise, it was taught a woman who had intercourse with that which is no human being, though she is in consequence subject to the penalty of stoning, is nevertheless permitted to marry a priest. When Ardini came, he related it once happened at Hadalu that while a young woman was sweeping the floor, a village dog covered her from the rear, and Rabbi permitted her to marry a priest. Samuel said, Even a high priest, but was there a high priest in the days of Rabbi? Rather, Samuel meant fit for a high priest. Rabbi of Barzakai said to Arashi, whence is derived the following statement, which the rabbis made harlotry is not applicable to bestial intercourse. It is written, Thou shalt not bring the hire of a harlot or the price of a dog, and yet we Learn that the hire of a dog and the price of a harlot are permitted because it is said even both these two only but not for our rabbis taught a high priest shall not marry the woman he himself has outraged or seduced if however he married her the marriage is valid he shall not marry a woman whom another man has outraged or seduced if he did marry her the child said our Eliezer B. Jacob is profane but the sages said the child is legitimate if however he married her the marriage is valid said are not in the name of Rab but he must put her aside by a letter of divorce what then is the explanation of the statement if however he married her the marriage is valid our Ahabi Jacob replied it was meant to imply Talmud Mas Yabamatha that he pays no fine in the case of a seduced woman our Gabi came and repeated the reported ruling in the presence of Arashi whereupon the other said to him surely both Rab and Aryohan and stated a high priest must not marry a woman who is Adolescent or wounded, but if he married her, the marriage is valid, which clearly proves that he may continue to live with the woman because, in any case, she would ultimately have become adolescent and would ultimately have been wounded by living with him. Here also, she should be permitted to live with him because ultimately she would have become a beulah by living with him. This is a difficulty. He shall not marry a woman whom another man has outraged or seduced if he did marry her. The child said, Our Eliezer Jacob is profaned, but the sages said, The child is fit. Said, Our Hunah in the name of Rab the Halachah is in agreement with Our Eliezer B. Jacob, and so said, Our Gidal in the name of Rab the Halachah is in agreement with Our Eliezer B. Jacob. Others say, Our Hunah stated in the name of Rab what is Our Eliezer B. Jacob's reason. He is of the same opinion as Our Eliezer, but is the former of the same opinion as the latter. Surely we have an established tradition that the teaching of Our Eliezer B. Jacob is. Small in quantity
outraged or seduced all agree that he may not defile himself as to one wounded Arsimian says he may not defile himself for her for Arsimian maintains that he may defile himself for one who is fit for a high priest but he may not defile himself for one who is not fit for a high priest for one who is adolescent all agree that he may defile himself what is Armeyer's and Arjuna's reason they make the following exposition and for his sister a virgin excludes one who had been outraged or seduced it might be assumed that one who was wounded is also to be excluded hence it was specifically stated that hath had no husband only she whose condition is due to a man is excluded but not one whose condition is not due to a man that is near includes a betrothed sister unto him includes a sister who is adolescent what need was there for a scriptural text in this case surely Armeyer's stated virgin implies even one who retains some of her virginity it was required because it might have been Assume that the expression of virgin shall be deduced from virgin elsewhere as there it refers to NAR only so here also it refers to NAR only hence we were taught that the case here is different and what are the reasons of our Jose and our Simeon they make the following exposition and for his sister a virgin excludes one who has been outraged seduced or wounded that hath had no excludes one who is betrothed that is near includes a betrothed who had been divorced unto him includes one who is adolescent that is near includes a betrothed who had been divorced Talmud, Mas Yabamath but surely our Simeon said he may defile himself for one who is fit for a high priest but may not defile himself for one who is not fit for a high priest there it is different because the all merciful has included her by the expression near if so the wounded also should be included near implies one and not two and what reason for this do you see to the body of the one something had been Done while to that of the other nothing had been done as to our Jose since his colleague had left him it may be inferred that in respect of the wounded he himself is of the same opinion as our mayor whence however does he derive it from that hath had no man but deduction surely had already been made from this text one is deduced from that hath had no and the other from man unto him includes one who is adolescent but surely our Simeon stated that virgin implied a perfect virgin his reason there is also derived from here because he makes the following exposition since the scriptural text unto him was required to include one who is adolescent it is to be inferred that virgin implies a perfect virgin it was taught our Simeon B.O. he stated a proselyte who is under the age of three years and one day is permitted to marry a priest for it is said but all the women children that have not known man by lying with him keep alive for yourselves and Phineas surely was with them and the rabbis these were kept alive as bondmen and bondwomen if so a proselyte whose age is three years and one day should also be permitted the prohibition is to be explained in accordance with Arunah for Arunah pointed out a contradiction it is written kill every woman that hath known man by lying with him but if she hath not known save her alive from this it may be inferred that children are to be kept alive whether they have known or have not known a man and on the other hand it is also written but all the women children that have not known man by lying with him keep alive for yourselves but do not spare them if they have known consequently it must be said that scripture speaks of one who is fit for cohabitation it was also taught likewise and every woman that hath known man scripture speaks of one who is fit for cohabitation you say of one who is fit for cohabitation perhaps it is not so but of one who had actual intercourse as scripture stated but all women children that have not known Man by lying with him it must be concluded that scripture speaks of one who is fit for cohabitation whence did they know our Hannah Bebizna replied in the name of Arsimian the pious they were made to pass before the front plate if the face of anyone turned pale it was known that she was fit for cohabitation if it did not turn pale it was known that she was unfit for cohabitation Arnam and said dropsy is a manifestation of lewdness similarly it is said and they found among the inhabitants of Jabesh. Gilead 400 young virgins that had not known man by lying with him whence did they know it our Kahana replied they made them sit upon the mouth of a one cast through anyone who had had previous intercourse the odor penetrated through a virgin its odor did not penetrate they should have been made to pass before the front plate our Kahana son of our Nathan replied it is written for acceptance for acceptance but not for punishment if so the same should have applied at Midian also our Ashi. Replied it is written unto them implying unto them for acceptance but not for punishment unto idolaters however even for punishment our Jacob B. E. D. stated in the name of our Joshua B. Levi the Halachah is in agreement with our Simeon B.O. He said our Zerah to our Jacob B. E. D. Did you hear this explicitly or did you learn it by a deduction what could be the deduction as our Joshua B. Levi related there was a certain town in the land of Israel the legitimacy of whose inhabitants was disputed and Rabbi sent our Romanos who conducted an inquiry and found in it the daughter of a proselyte who was under the age of three years and one day and Rabbi declared her eligible to live with a priest the other replied I heard it explicitly and what matters it if it was learned by deduction it is possible that there it was different since the marriage had already taken place he sanctioned it for indeed both Rab and our Yohanan stated a priest may not marry one who is adolescent or wounded but if already married he may continue to live with her how now there it is quite correct to sanction the marriage since in any case she would ultimately become adolescent while she will be with him and she would also ultimately become a beulo while with him but here would she ultimately become a harlot while with him our Safra taught that he arrived at it by deduction and having raised the difficulty answered it in the same way a certain priest married a proselyte who was under the age of three years and one day said Arnam and B. Isaac to him what do you mean by this the other replied because our Jacob B. E. D. stated in the name of our Joshua B. Levi that the Halachah is in agreement with our Simeon B. O. He go the first set and arrange for her release or else I will pull our Jacob B. E. D. out of your ear it was taught and so did our Simeon B. O. He stayed Talmud, Mas Yabamath that the graves of idolaters do not impart levitical uncleanness by an oil for it is said and yeah, my sheep the sheep of my pasture are men. You are called men but the idolaters are not called men an objection was raised and the persons were 16,000 this is due to the mention of cattle wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right and their left hand this is due to the mention of cattle whosoever hath killed any person and whosoever hath touched any slain purify yourselves one of the Israelites might have been slain and the rabbi scripture states there like it not one man of us and our Simeon B.O.H. there like it not one man of us through indulgence in sin Robin replied granted that scripture excluded them from imparting uncleanness through an oval because of the written text when a man dieth in the tent did scripture also exclude them from imparting uncleanness by touch and carriage mission a priest who betrothed a widow and was subsequently appointed high priest may consummate the marriage it once happened with Joshua B. Gamala that he betrothed Martha. The daughter of Boethus and the king appointed him high priest and he nevertheless consummated the marriage if one awaiting the decision of the lover became subject to a common priest who was subsequently appointed high priest the latter though he already addressed to her among must not consummate the marriage Yamara our rabbis taught once is it deduced that a priest who betrothed a widow and was afterwards appointed high priest may consummate the marriage it is specifically stated in scripture shall he take to wife if so the same law should apply to a Yebamah awaiting the decision of the lover also a wife but not a Yebamah it once happened to Joshua etc he appointed him but he was not elected said our Joseph I see here a conspiracy for RC in fact related that Martha the daughter of Boethus brought to King Janay a Tarkab of Denarii before he gave an appointment to Joshua B. Gamal among the high priest mission a high priest whose brother died must submit to Elizabeth may not contract the Levi-rate marriage Gemara he lays down a general rule implying that there is no difference whether the Yebamah became a widow after betrothal or after marriage one can well understand the case of the widow after marriage since marriage with her is forbidden by a positive as well as by a negative commandment and no positive commandment may override a negative and a positive commandment but in the case of a widow after betrothal the positive should override the negative commandment the first act of cohabitation was forbidden as a preventive measure against the second act of cohabitation mission a common priest shall not marry a woman incapable of procreation unless he had already a wife or children our Judah said even though he has had a wife and children he shall not marry a woman incapable of procreation since such is included in the term of harlot mentioned in the Torah but the sages said the term harlot implies only a female pros life read Bondmate and one who has been subjected to meretricious intercourse Gemara said the eggs large to Arunah what is the reason obviously because of the duty of the propagation of the race are then only priests commanded concerning the propagation of the race while Israelites are not commanded
Meir surely it was taught a matter whether male or female may neither perform nor submit to Eliza nor contract leave irate marriage so our Meir they said to our Meir you spoke well when you ruled may neither perform nor submit to Eliza since in the Pentateuchal section man was written and we also draw a comparison between woman and man what however is the reason why they may not contract leave irate marriage he replied because a minor male might be found to be a sorry as a minor female might be found to be incapable of procreation and thus the law of incest would be violated and it was also taught a minor female may contract the Levirate marriage but may not perform Eliza so our Eliza and does he hold the same opinion as our Judah surely it was taught Zona implies as her name indicates a faithless wife so our Eliza our Akiva said Zona implies one who is a prostitute our Mafia Behar said even a woman whose husband while going to arrange for her drinking cohabited with her on the way is rendered to Zona our Judah said Zona implies one who is incapable of procreation and the sages said Zona is none other than a female proselyte a free bond woman and one who has been subjected to any meretricious intercourse our Eliezer said an unmarried man who had intercourse with an unmarried woman with no matrimonial intent renders her thereby Zona no said our Abiyah but the reference here is to a high priest for when does he acquire her as his lawful wife only when she grows up but then she is already a Beulah said Rabba with thoughtlessness if her father had arranged her betrothal then the high priest would have acquired her from that very moment and if she herself had accepted the betrothal is this then the view of our Eliza only and not that of the rabbis no explained Rabba it refers indeed to a common priest but the prohibition to marry the minor is a precaution against the possibility of her seduction while living with him if so the same should apply to an Israelite. Also the seduction of a minor is regarded as an outrage and an outraged woman is permitted in the case of an Israelite our Papa replied it speaks of a high priest and it represents the opinion of the following tenor for it was taught a virgin as one might assume it to mean a minor it was explicitly stated wife if only wife had been written it might have been assumed to mean one who is adolescent hence it was explicitly stated a virgin how then is the text to be understood one who has Emerged from her minority but has not yet attained adolescence. Our nomin B. Isaac explained it is the opinion of the following tenor for it was taught a virgin. The only meaning of virgin is damsel, and so it is said in scripture, and the damsel was very fair to look upon a virgin. Our Eliezer said an unmarried man who had intercourse with an unmarried woman with no matrimonial intent renders her thereby zone. Our Amram said the Halachah is not in agreement with the opinion of our Eliezer Mishnah man. Shall not abstain from the performance of the duty of the propagation of the race unless he already has children as to the number Beth Shammai ruled two males and Beth Hillel ruled male and a female for it is stated in scripture male and female created he the Gemara this implies if he has children he may abstain from performing the duty of propagation but not from that of living with a wife. This provides support for a statement our made in the name of Samuel who ruled that although a Man may have many children he must not remain without a wife for it is said in the scriptures it is not good that the man should be alone others read this implies if he has children he may abstain from performing the duty of propagation and also from that of living with a wife may it then be said that this presents an objection against the statement are not made in the name of Samuel no if he has no children he must marry a woman capable of procreation and if he has children he may marry a woman who is incapable of procreation what is the practical difference in respect of selling a scroll of the law for the sake of children Beth Shammai ruled two males what is Beth Shammai's reason we make an inference from Moses in connection with whom it is written the sons of Moses Gershom and Eliezer and Beth Hillel we infer from the creation of the world let Beth Shammai also infer from the creation of the world the possible cannot be inferred Talmud Mas from the impossible let Beth Hillel then make the inference from Moses they can answer you Moses did it with his consent for it was taught Moses did three things on his own initiative and his opinion coincided with that of the omnipresent he separated himself from his wife broke the tables of testimony and added one day he separated himself from his wife what exposition did he make he said if to the Israelites with whom the Shechinah spoke only for a while and for whom a definite time was fixed the Torah. Nevertheless said come not near a woman how much more so to me who am liable to be spoken to at any moment and for whom no definite time has been fixed and his view coincided with that of the omnipresent for it is said go say to them return yet to your tents but as for thee stand thou here by me he broke the tables of testimony what exposition did he make he said if of the Paschal Lamb which is only one of the 613 commandments the Torah said there shall no alien eat thereof. How much more should this apply to the entire Torah when all Israel are apostates and his view coincided with that of the omnipresent for it is written which thou didst break and Reshlehish explained the Holy One blessed be he said to Moses I thank you for breaking them he added one day on his own initiative what exposition did he make as it is written and sanctify them today and tomorrow it implies that today shall be the same as tomorrow as tomorrow includes the previous night so too. Day must include the previous night as however today's previous night has already passed away it must be inferred that two days exclusive of today must be observed and his view coincided with that of the omnipresent for the revelation did not take place before the Sabbath it was taught our Nathan stated Beth ruled two males and two females and Beth ruled a male and a female said Arhuna what is the reason which our Nathan assigns for the opinion of Beth because it is written. And again she bore his brother Abel which implies Abel and his sister Cain and his sister and it is also written for God hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel for Cain slew him and the rabbis she was merely expressing her gratitude elsewhere it was taught our Nathan stated that Beth Shammai ruled a male and a female and Beth Hillel ruled either a male or a female said Rabbah what is the reason which our Nathan assigns for the view of Beth Hillel because it is said he created it not a waste he formed it to be inhabited and he has obviously helped it to be inhabited it was stated if a man had children while he was an idolater and then he became a proselyte he has fulfilled our Yohan and said the duty of propagation of the race and Reshlehish said he has not fulfilled the duty of propagation of the race our Yohan and said he has fulfilled the duty of propagation since he had children and Reshlehish said he has not fulfilled the duty of propagation because one who became a proselyte is like a child newly born and they follow their views for it was stated if a man had children while he was an idolater and then he became a proselyte he has our Yohan and said no firstborn in respect of inheritance since he already had the first fruits of his strength Resh Lakish however said he has a firstborn son in respect of inheritance for a man who became a proselyte is like a child newly born and both statements were necessary for it the first only had been stated it might have been assumed that only in that statement did our Yohan and maintain his view since formerly he was also subject to the obligation of propagation but in respect of inheritance since the proselyte's former children are not entitled to airship it might have been presumed that he agrees with Resh Lakish and were only the second stated it might have been assumed that only in that did Resh Lakish maintain his view but that in the former he agrees with our Yohan and hence both were necessary our Yohan and Raised an objection against Reshlakish at that time, Baradash Baladon, the son of Baladon, king of Babylon, etc. The other replied, While they are idolaters, they have legally recognized ancestry, but when they become proselytes, they have no longer any legally recognized ancestry. Rab said, All agree that a slave has no legally recognized relative, since it is written about Yahir with the ass people who are like the ass. An objection was raised, Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants are Abubi. Jacob replied, Like a young bullock, if so, the same reply could be given there. Also, there it is different, since scripture mentioned his own name as well as his father's name. While here the sons' names were not specified, if you prefer, I might say they were elsewhere ascribed to their father and their father's father, as it is written, and King Asa sent them to Ben Hadid, the son of Tabrim, the son of Hezi, and the king of Aram that dwelt at Damascus, saying it was stated if a man had children and they died he has fulfilled said Arhuna the duty of propagation Arhuna and said he has not fulfilled it Arhuna said he fulfilled because he follows the tradition of R.C. for R.C. stated the son of David will not come before all the souls in God will have been disposed of since it is said for the spirit that unwrapped itself is from me etc. and Arhuna and said he has not fulfilled the duty of propagation because we require the fulfillment of the text he formed it to be inhabited which is not the case here an objection was raised Talmud, Mas Yavamat be grandchildren are like children this was taught only in respect of supplementing an objection was raised grandchildren
Following and afterwards Ezrin went to the daughter of Machir the father of Gilead and she bore him Sekib and it is also written out of Machir came down lawgivers and furthermore it is written Judah is my lawgiver our mission cannot represent the opinion of our Joshua for it was taught our Joshua said if a man married in his youth he should marry again in his old age if he had children in his youth he should also have children in his old age for it said in the morning so thy seat and in the evening withhold not thine hand for thou knowest not which shall prosper whether this or that or whether they shall both be alike good our Akiva said if a man studied Torah in his youth he should also study it in his old age if he had disciples in his youth he should also have disciples in his old age for it is said in the morning so thy seat etc it was said that our Akiva had twelve thousand peers of disciples from Gabe the two antipatries and all of them died at the same time because they did not Treat each other with respect the world remained desolate until our Akiva came to our masters in the south and taught the Torah to them. These were our Meir, our Judah, our Jose, our Simeon, and our Eliezer, Bishamu, and it was they who revived the Torah at that time. Atana taught all of them died between Passover and Pentecost. Our Hamabi Abba, or it might be said, our Habib Abba, said all of them died a cruel death. What was it? Our Naman replied, Krupp, our Matina stated the Halashah is in agreement with our Joshua. Our Tantum stated in the name of our Hanalai, any man who has no wife lives without joy, without blessing, and without goodness, without joy, for it is written, and thou shalt rejoice thou and thy house without blessing, for it is written to cause a blessing to rest on thy house without goodness, for it is written, it is not good that the man should be alone in the west. It was stated without Torah and without a protecting wall, without Torah, for it is written, is it that I have no help in me and that sound? Wisdom is driven quite from me without a protecting wall, for it is written, A woman shall encompass a man. Rabbi Beulah said, Without peace, for it is written, And thou shalt know that thy tent is in peace, and thou shalt visit thy habitation, and shalt miss nothing. Our Joshua B. Levi said, Whosoever knows his wife to be a God fearing woman and does not duly visit her is called a sinner, for it is said, And thou shalt know that thy tent is in peace, etc. Our Joshua B. Levi further stated, It is a man's duty to pay a visit to his wife when he starts on a journey, for it is said, And thou shalt know that thy tent is in peace, etc. Is this deduced from here? Surely it is deduced from the following, and thy desire shall be to thy husband teaches that a woman yearns for her husband when he sets out on a journey. Our Joseph replied, This was required only in the case where her menstruation period was near, and how near Rabbi replied, Twelve hours, and this applies only when the journey is for a secular purpose, but when for a religious purpose it does not apply since then people are in a state of anxiety or rabbis talk concerning a man who loves his wife as himself who honors her more than himself who guides his sons and daughters in the right path and arranges for them to be married near the period of their puberty scripture says and thou shalt know that thy tent is in peace concerning him who loves his neighbors who befriends his relatives marries his sister's daughter Talmud, Mas Yabamathay and lends a seller to a poor man in the hour of his need scripture says and shalt thou call and the Lord will answer thou shalt cry and he will say here I am mnemonic woman and land help this two shoots tradesman inferior our Eliezer said any man who has no wife is no proper man for it is said male and female created he them and called their name Adam our Eliezer further stated any man who owns no land is not a proper man for it is said the heavens are the heavens of the Lord but the earth hath he given. To the children of men, our Eliezer further stated what is the meaning of the scriptural text. I will make him a help me for him. If he was worthy, she is a help to him. If he was not worthy, she is against him. Others say our Eliezer pointed out a contradiction. It is written, Kanejito, but we read Kanejito. If he was worthy, she is me for him. If he was not worthy, she chastises him. Our Jose met Elijah and asked him, It is written, I will make him a help. How does a woman help a man? The other replied, If a man brings wheat, does he chew the wheat? If flax, does he put on the flax? Does she not then bring light to his eyes and put him on his feet? Our Eliezer further stated what is meant by the scriptural text. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This teaches that Adam had intercourse with every beast and animal but found no satisfaction until he cohabited with the Our Eliezer further stated what is meant by the text and in thee shall the families of the earth be blessed, the Holy One blessed be. He said to Abraham, I have two goodly shoots to engraft on you, Ruth the Moabites and Nam of the Ammonites. All the families of the earth, even the other families who live on the earth, are blessed only for Israel's sake. All the nations of the earth, even the ships that go from Gaul to Spain, are blessed only for Israel's sake. Our Eliezer further stated, There will be a time when all craftsmen will take up agriculture, for it is said, and all that handle the or the mariners, and all the pilots of the sea shall come down from their ships, they shall stand upon the land. Our Eliezer further stated, No occupation is inferior to that of agricultural labor, for it is said, and they shall come down. Our Eliezer once saw a plot of land that was plowed across its width, worked out to be plowed along thy length. Also, he remarked, Engaging in business would still be more profitable. Rab once entered among growing ears of corn, seeing that they were swaying, he called out to them, Swing as you will engaging in. Business brings more profit than you can do. Rabbi said a hundred zoos in business means meat and wine every day. A hundred zoos in land only salt and vegetables. Furthermore, it causes him to sleep on the ground and embroils him in strife. Our Papa said so, but do not buy even if the cost is the same. There is a blessing in the former sellout to avoid disgrace, but only mattress is not however a cloak since one might not always again obtain a suitable one stop up and you will need no repair repair. And you will not need to rebuild for whosoever engages in building grows poor. Be quick in buying land. Be deliberate in taking a wife. Come down a step in choosing your wife. Go up a step in selecting your shoshpin. Our Eliezer B. Abana said punishment comes into the world only on Israel's account for it is said I have cut off nations. Their corners are desolate. I have made their streets waste. And this is followed by the text. I said surely thou will fear me. Thou will receive correction. Rab was once. Taking leave of our high, the latter said to him, May the All-Merciful deliver you from that which is worse than death. But is there Rab wondered anything that is worse than death? When he went out, he considered the matter and found the following text, and I find more bitter than death. The woman, etc. Rab was constantly tormented by his wife. If he told her, Prepare me lentils, she would prepare him small peas. And if he asked for small peas, she prepared him lentils. When his son high grew up, he gave her his father's instruction in the reverse order. Your mother, Rab, once remarked to him, has improved it. Was I the other replied who reversed your orders to her? This is what people say. The first said to him, Thy own offspring teaches the reason you, however, must not continue to do so, for it is said they have taught their tongue to speak lies, they weary themselves, etc. Our high was constantly tormented by his wife. He nevertheless, whenever he obtained anything suitable, wrapped it up in his scarf. And brought it to her, said Rab to him, but surely she is tormenting the master. It is sufficient for us. The other replied that they rear up our children and deliver us Talmud. Masya Bamath be from sin. Rab Judah was reading with his son Ar Isaac the scriptural text, and I find more bitter than death the woman when the latter asked him who, for instance, for instance, your mother, but surely Rab Judah taught his son Ar Isaac a man finds happiness only with his first wife, for it is said, Let thy fountain be blessed and have joy of the wife of thy youth. And when the latter asked him who, for instance, he answered, For instance, your mother, she was indeed irascible, but could be easily appeased with a kindly word. How is one to understand the term of bad wife? Abbe said, One who prepares for him a tray and has her tongue also ready for him. Rabbi said, One who prepares for him a tray and turns her back upon him. Our Hamabi Hanan stated, As soon as a man takes a wife, his sins are buried, for it is said. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a great good and obtaineth favor of the Lord in the West. They used to ask a man who married findeth or find findeth because it is written. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a great good find because it is written. And I find more bitter than death. The woman Rabbah said, If one has a bad wife, it is a meritorious act to divorce her. For it is said, Cast out the scoffer and contention will go out. Yes, strife and shame will cease. Rabbah further stated, A bad wife the amount of whose kethuba is large should be given a rival at her side, as people say by her partner rather than by a thorn. Rabbah further stated, A bad wife is as troublesome as a very rainy day. For it is said, A continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious wo
In the streets Aryohanan said this refers to the Parses when Aryohanan was informed that the Parses had come to Babylon he reeled and fell when however he was told that they accepted bribes he recovered and sat down again they issued three decrees as a punishment for three transgressions they decreed against ritually prepared meat because the priestly gifts were neglected they decreed against the use of baths because ritual bathing was not observed they exhumed the dead because rejoicings were held on the days of their festivals as it is said then shall the hand of the Lord be against you and against your fathers and Rabbi Samuel said that that referred to the exhumation of the dead for the master said for the sins of the living the dead are exhumed said Rabbi to Rabbi Mari it is written they shall not be gathered nor be buried they shall be for upon the face of the earth but it is also written and death shall be chosen rather than life the other replied. Death shall be chosen for the wicked in order that they may not live in this world and thus sin and fall into Gehenna. It is written in the book of Benzer, a good wife is a precious gift. She will be put in the bosom of the God-fearing man. A bad wife is a plague to her husband. What remedy has he let him give her a letter of divorce and be healed of his plague? A beautiful wife is a joy to her husband. The number of his days shall be double. Turn away thy eyes from thy neighbor's charming wife. Lest thou be caught in her net, do not turn into her husband to mingle with him wine and strong drink. For through the form of a beautiful woman many were destroyed, and a mighty host are all her slain. Many were the wounds of the spice peddler which lead him onto lewdness like a spark that lights the coal as a cage is full of birds. So are the harlots' houses full of deceit. Do not worry about tomorrow's trouble, for thou knowest not what the day may be. Yet tomorrow may come and thou wilt be no. More and so thou hast worried about a world which is not thine. Keep away many from thy house and do not bring everyone into thy house. Many be they that seek thy welfare. Reveal thy secret only to one of a thousand. R.C. stated the son of David will not come before all the souls in God are disposed of. Since it is said for the spirit that enwrapped itself is from me and the souls which I have made it was taught. Arliser stated he who does not engage in propagation of the races as though he sheds blood for it is said who so shed of man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. And this is immediately followed by the text and you be a fruitful and multiply. Our Jacob said as though he has diminished the divine image since it is said for in the image of God made he man. And this is immediately followed by and you be a fruitful etc. Ben Aze said as though he sheds blood and diminishes the divine image since it is said and you be a fruitful and multiply. They said to Ben Aze some. Preach well and act well others act well but do not preach well you however preach well but do not act well Ben Aze replied but what shall I do seeing that my soul is in love with the Torah the world can be carried on by others another bury the taught our Eliezer said anyone who does not engage in the propagation of the races as though he sheds blood for it is said who so shed of man's blood and clothes upon it follows and you be a fruitful etc our Eliezer be as I said as though he diminished the divine image Ben Aze said etc they said to Ben Aze some preach well etc our rabbis taught and when it rested he said return O Lord unto the ten thousands and thousands of Israel Talmud Mas Yavamatha teaches that the divine presence does not rest on less than two thousand and two myriads of Israelites should the number of Israelites happen to be two thousand and two myriads less one and any particular person has not engaged in the propagation of the race does he not thereby Cause the divine presence to depart from Israel. Abahanan said in the name of our Eliezer, he deserves the penalty of death, for it is said, and they had no children, but if they had children, they would not have died. Others say he causes the divine presence to depart from Israel, for it is said to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, where there exists seed after thee, the divine presence dwells among them, but where no seed after thee exists among whom should it dwell among the trees or among the stones. Mishnah, if a man took a wife and lived with her for ten years and she bore no child, he may not abstain any longer from the duty of propagation. If he divorced her, she is permitted to marry another, and the second husband may also live with her no more than ten years. If she miscarried, the period of ten years is reckoned from the time of her miscarriage. Tomorrow, our rabbis taught if a man took a wife and lived with her for ten years and she bore no child, he shall divorce her. And give her her kethuba since it is possible that it was he who was unworthy to have children from her. Although there is no definite proof for the statement, there is nevertheless a scriptural allusion to it. After Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, this teaches you that the years of his stay outside the land were not included in the number. Hence, if the man or the woman was ill, or if both were in prison, these years are not included in the number. Said Rabbi to Arnam and let deduction be made from Isaac concerning whom it is written. And Isaac was forty years old when he took Rebekah, etc. And it is also written, and Isaac was threescore years old when she bore them. The other replied, Isaac was barren. If so, Abraham also was barren. The text is required for a deduction in accordance with the statement of Arhi B. Abba for Arhi B. Abba stated in the name of Aryohan. And why were the years of Ishmael counted in order to determine thereby the years of Jacob? Are Isaac stated. Our father Isaac was barren for it is said and Isaac entreated the Lord opposite his wife it does not say for his wife but opposite this teaches that both were barren if so and the Lord let himself be entreated of him should have read and the Lord let himself be entreated of them because the prayer of a righteous man the son of a righteous man is not like the prayer of a righteous man the son of a wicked man our Isaac stated why were our ancestors barren because the Holy One blessed be he longs to hear the prayer of the righteous our Isaac further stated why is the prayer of the righteous compared to a pitchfork as a pitchfork turns the sheaves of grain from one position to another so does the prayer of the righteous turn the dispensations of the Holy One blessed be he from the attribute of anger to the attribute of mercy our MI stated Abraham and Sarah were originally of doubtful sex for it is said look unto to the rock Talmud Masi of Amethi whence you were hewn and to the hole of the pit whence you were digged, and this is followed by the text. Look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that bore you are nominated in the name of Rabbi Abba. Our mother Sarah was incapable of procreation, for it is said, and Sarai was barren; she had no child; she had not even a womb. Rab Judah, son of our Samuel, be shalat, stated in the name of Rab that was taught only in respect of the early generations who lived many years, in respect of the later generations, however, whose years of life are few, only two years and a half, corresponding to three periods of pregnancy, are allowed. Rabbi stated in the name of our nomin. Three years must elapse, corresponding to three remembrances for a master. Said Sarah, Rachel, and Hannah were remembered on New Year's Day. Rabbi ruled these general principles are to be disregarded. For consider who compiled our mission, Rabbi. Of course, but the years of life were already reduced in the days of David. For it is written, the days of our years are. Three score years and ten with regard to the assumption that it is possible that it was he who was unworthy to have children from her is it not possible that it was she who was unworthy since she is not commanded to fulfill the duty of propagation she is not so punished but surely it is not so for the rabbis once said to our Abba to take a wife and beget children and he answered them had I been worthy I would have had them from my first wife there he was merely evading the rabbis for in fact our Abba Bizabda became impotent through the long discourses of Arhuna Argital became impotent through the discourses of Arhuna our Helbo became impotent through the discourses of Arhuna and Arshis Hay also became impotent through the discourses of Arnaar Ahabi Jacob was once attacked by Dishiria and when he was supported on the college cedar tree a discharge issued like a green palm shoot our Ahabi Jacob stated we were a group of sixty scholars and all became impotent through the long discourses of Arhuna, with the exception of myself, who followed the principle wisdom, preserveth the life of him that hath it. If he divorced her, she is permitted, etc. Only a second husband, but not a third, whose view then is represented by our Mishnah. It is that of Rabbi, for it was taught if she circumcised her first child and he died, and a second one who also died, she must not circumcise her third child. So Rabbi, our Simeon B. Gamaliel, however, said she circumcises the third, but must not circumcise the fourth child. But surely the reverse was taught now. Which of these is the latter? Come and hear what our high B. Abba stated in the name of Aryohan. And it once happened with four sisters at Sephoris that when the first had circumcised her child, he died. When the second circumcised her child, he also died. And when the third circumcised her child, he also died. The fourth came before our Simeon B. Gamaliel, who told her, You must not circumcise the child, but is it not possible that if the third sister had come, he would also have told her the same if so what could have been the
With any such changes furthermore it might be said that their dispute extended only to the case of circumcision do they however differ also in the case of marriage yes for so it was taught if a woman was married to one husband who died and to a second one who also died she must not be married to a third so Rabbi Arsimian B. Gamaliel said she may be married to a third but she may not be married to a fourth in the case of circumcision one can well understand why the operation is dangerous with some children and not with others since the members of one family may bleed profusely while those of another family may bleed little what however is the reason in the case of marriage our Mordecai answered Arashi thus said Abami from Hadronia in the name of Arhuna the source is the cause but Arashi stated the woman's ill luck is the cause what practical difference is there between them the difference between them is the case where the man only betrothed her and died or also when he fell off a palm tree and died said our Joseph son of Rabbi to Rabbi I inquired of our Joseph whether the Halachah is in agreement with Rabbi and he replied in the affirmative I asked whether the Halachah is in agreement with our Simeon B. Gamaliel and he again replied in the affirmative was either by merely ridiculing me the other replied no there are several anonymous statements in the mission and he informed you that in the matter of marriage and flogging the anonymous mission agrees with Rabbi and that in the matter of menstrual periods and the ox whose owner has been forewarned the anonymous mission agrees with our Simeon B. Gamaliel as to marriage there is a statement just discussed flogging as we learned a man upon whom the penalty of flogging had been repeatedly inflicted is to be placed under confinement and fed on barley until his stomach bursts the menstrual periods as we learned the woman may not Talmud, Masyabamath regard her menstrual periods as regular unless the Recurrence had been regular three times nor is she released from the restrictions of an established regular period unless it has varied three times and the ox whose owner has been forewarned as we learned an ox is not deemed a mu'ad unless its owner has been forewarned three times our rabbis taught a woman who had been married to one husband and had no children and to a second husband and again had no children may marry a third man only if he has children if she married one who has had no children she must be divorced without receiving her ketubah the question was raised where she married a third husband and bore no children may her first two husbands reclaim the respective amounts of her ketubah can they plead it has now been proved that you were the cause or can she retort it is only now that I have deteriorated it stands to reason that she may plead it is only now that I have deteriorated the question was raised if she married a fourth husband and gave birth to children. May she claim her kefugal from her third husband we advise her your silence is better than your speech for he could tell her I would not have divorced you in such circumstances our papa demurred even if she keeps silence should we remain silent the divorce surely is annulled and her children are bastards in truth the fact is that it is assumed that she has now been restored to health if the husband pleads the fault is hers and the wife pleads the fault is his rmi ruled in private matrimonial affairs the wife is believed and what is the reason she is in a position to know whether emission is forceful but he is not in a position to know it if the husband states that he intends taking another wife to test his potency rmi ruled he must in this case also divorce his present wife and pay her the amount of her kefugal for I maintain that whosoever takes in addition to his present wife another one must divorce the former and pay her the amount of her kefugal said a man may Mary wives in addition to his first wife provided only that he possesses the means to maintain them Talmud, Masya Bamath B. If the husband pleads that his wife had miscarriage within the ten years and she states I had no miscarriage RMI rule she is believed in this case also for if she had really miscarriage she would not herself have sought to acquire the reputation of a barren woman a woman who miscarried and then miscarried a second and a third time eyes confirmed as one subject to abortions if he said she miscarried two and she said three R. Isaac B. Eliezer stated such a case was dealt with at the college and it was ruled that she was to be believed for if she had not miscarried she would not herself have sought to acquire the reputation of producing only miscarriages mission a man is commanded concerning the duty of propagation but not a woman or Yohanan B. Baraka however said concerning both of them it is said and God bless them and God said unto them be fruitful and Multiply tomorrow whence is this deduced? Our Ali replied in the name of our Eliezer, son of our Simeon, scripture stated and replenish the earth and subdue it. It is the nature of a man to subdue, but it is not the nature of a woman to subdue. On the contrary, and subdue it implies to our nom and be Isaac replied, it is written, and thou subdue it. Our Joseph said, deduction is made from the following I am God Almighty, be thou fruitful and multiply, and it is not stated, be a fruitful and multiply. Our Ali further stated in the name of our Eliezer, son of our Simeon, as one is commanded to say that which will be obeyed, so is one commanded not to say that which will not be obeyed. Our Abba stated, it is a duty, for it is said in scripture, reprove not a scorn, unless he hate thee, reprove a wise man, and he will love thee. Our Ali further stated in the name of our Eliezer, son of our Simeon, one may modify a statement in the interest of peace, for it is said in scripture, thy father did command, etc. So shall ye say unto Joseph. Forgive I pray thee now etc. Our Nathan said it is a commandment for it is stated in scripture and Samuel said how can I go if Saul hear it he will kill me etc. At the school of our Ishmael it was taught great is the cause of peace seeing that for its sake even the Holy One blessed be he modified a statement for at first it is written my Lord being old while afterwards it is written and I am old our Yohanan B. Baraka however said it was stated our Yohanan and our Joshua B. Levi are at variance one stated that the Halachah is in agreement with our Yohanan B. Baraka and the other stated that the Halachah is not in agreement with our Yohanan B. Baraka it may be proved that it was our Yohanan who stated that the Halachah is not in agreement etc. For our Abba was once sitting at the college and reported in the name of our Yohanan that the Halachah was in agreement etc. And our Mi and RC turned away their faces others say our Hi B. Abba made the report and our Mi and RC turned away their faces said our Papa according to him who maintains that our Abba made the statement it is easy to understand that it was out of respect for the royal house that they said nothing to him according to him however who maintains that our Havi Abba made the statement they should have told him that our Yohanan did not say so now what is the decision come and hear what our Ahabi Hanan stated in the name of our Abba in the name of our Asi such a case once came before our Yohanan at the synagogue of Caesarea and he decided that the husband must divorce her and also pay her the amount of her ketubah now if it be suggested that a woman is not subject to the commandment how could she have any claim to a ketubah it is possible that this was a case where she submitted a special plea as was the case with a certain woman who once came to our Mi and asked him to order the payment of her ketubah when he replied go away the commandment does not apply to you she exclaimed what shall become of a woman like Myself in her old age in such a case the master said we certainly compel the husband a woman once came with a similar plea before our nom and when he told her the commandment does not apply to you she replied does not a woman like myself require a staff in her hand and a hoe for digging her grave in such a case the master said we certainly compel the husband Judah and Hezekiah were twins the features of the one were developed at the end of nine months and those of the other were developed. At the beginning of the seventh month Judith the wife of Arhai having suffered in consequence agonizing pains of childbirth changed her clothes on recovery and appeared before Arhai as a woman she asked commanded to propagate the race no he replied and relying on this decision she drank a sterilizing potion when her action finally became known he exclaimed with that you bore unto me only one more issue of the womb for a master stated Judah and Hezekiah were twin brothers and Vizy and Ta'i Talmud, Masya Bamath the twin sisters but does not the commandment apply to women surely our Ahabi Arkatan related in the name of our Isaac it once happened in the case of a woman who was half slave and half free that her master was compelled to emancipate her Arnam and B. Isaac replied people were taking liberties with her C-H-A-P-T-E-R-B-I-I mission if a widow who married a high priest or if a divorced woman or a Haliza who married a common priest brought into her husband Melik slaves and Zonbarzal slaves the Melik slaves may not eat Terimah but the Zonbarzal slaves may eat of it the following are Melik slaves those who if they die are the wife's loss and if their value increases are her profit though it is the husband's duty to maintain them they may not eat Terimah the following are Zonbarzal slaves if they die they are the loss of the husband and if their value increases are a profit to him since he is responsible for them they are permitted to eat Terimah if it Daughter of an Israelite was married to a priest and she brought him in slaves they are permitted
confer the right of eating it upon others. Rabbin replied, he speaks of an acquisition that is permitted to eat. Any acquisition that may eat may confer the right of eating upon others, and any acquisition that may not eat may not confer the right upon others. Rabbi, however, stated that Pentateuch Ali may in fact eat Terabah, but it is the rabbis who instituted the prohibition in order that the woman might complain, I am not allowed to eat, my slaves are not allowed to eat, I am only his mistress in. Consequence of which he would be likely to divorce her. As she stated, the prohibition is a preventive measure against the possibility of her feeding them with terima after the death of her husband. Now, then, a daughter of an Israelite who was married to a priest should also be forbidden to feed her male slaves with terima as a preventive measure against her feeding them after her husband's death. But said Arashi, our mission refers to a priestly widow who might draw the following conclusion. At first, they ate terima at my paternal home, and when I married this man, they ate of the terima of my husband. They should now therefore revert to their former condition, and she would not know that at first she had not made of herself a profane woman. While now she has made herself a profane woman, this explanation is quite satisfactory in the case of a priestly widow. What explanations, however, is there in the case of a widow who is the daughter of an Israelite? The rabbis made no. Distinction between one widow and another, it was stated if a wife who brought to her husband the praise goods demands, I will accept only my own goods, and he replies, I am only paying their value in whose favor is judgment to be given. Rab Judah said, Talmud, Mas Yavamath, the judgment is to be given in her favor, and Rami said, judgment is to be given in his favor. Rab Judah said, judgment is to be given in her favor because they represent assets of her paternal property which belong to her. Rami said, judgment is to be given in his favor, for as the master said, the following are Zanbarzal slaves, if they die, they are the loss of the husband, and if their value increases, are a profit to him, and since he is responsible for them, they are permitted to eat terima, they are therefore obviously regarded as his own. Our Safra said, was it stated, and they belong to him, the statement surely only reads, since he is responsible for them, in fact, then they may not belong to him at all, but is. In fact that those for whom he is responsible invariably eat terima surely we learned an Israelite who hired a cow from a priest may feed her on veggies of terima a priest however who hired a cow from an Israelite though it is his duty to supply her with food must not feed her on veggies of terima how could you understand it thus granted that he is liable for theft or losses he also liable for accidents emaciation or reduction in value the case in our mission surely can only be compared to that in the final clause an Israelite who hired a cow from a priest guaranteeing him its appraised value may not feed it on veggies of terima a priest however who hired a cow from an Israelite guaranteeing him its appraised value may feed it on veggies of terima Rabbi and our Joseph were sitting at their studies at the conclusion of our Naman school session and in the course of their sitting they made the following statement the was taught in agreement with Rab Judah and Another Beritha was taught in agreement with Rami. A Beritha was taught in agreement with Rabbi. On Barzil slaves procure their freedom when the man, but not when the woman, struck out a tooth. Or an I. A Beritha was taught in agreement with Rab Judah. If a wife brought into her husband the praised goods, the husband may not sell them, even if it is his desire to do so. Furthermore, even if he brought into her appraised goods of his own, he may not sell them, even if he desired to do so. If either of them sold any of the appraised goods for their maintenance, such an incident was once dealt with by our Simeon Gamaliel, who ruled that the husband may seize them from the buyers. Rabbi stated in the name of Arnaman, the law is in agreement with Rab Judah. Said Rabbi to Arnaman, but surely a Beritha was taught in agreement with Rami. Although Beritha was taught in agreement with Rami, Rab Judah's view is more logical, since any asset of a woman's paternal property should rightly. Belong to her a woman once brought into her husband a robe of fine wool which was appraised and included in her cathedral but when the man died it was taken by the orphans and spread over the corpse. Rabbi ruled that the corpse had acquired it said Nana son of our Joseph son of Rabbi to Arkahana but surely Rabbi stated in the name of Arnaman that the law is in agreement with Rab Judah. The other replied does not Rab Judah admit that the robe had still to be collected by the wife since it had still to be collected it remained in the husband's possession in this ruling Rabbi acted in accordance with his view elsewhere expressed for Rabbi stated consecration leaven food and Talmud. Masya Bama the Manu mission cancel a mortgage Rab Judah stated if a wife brought to her husband two articles worth a thousand sous and their value increased to two thousand she receives one in settlement of her cathedral and for the other she pays its price and receives it since it represents assets of her. Paternal property, what are we taught by the statement that assets of her paternal property belong to her? This surely has already been stated by Rab Judah. It might have been assumed that that statement applied only where she came to claim paternal property as part of her cathedral, but not where she desired to take it in return for payment of its value. Hence, we were taught that she may also pay its price and receive admission. If the daughter of an Israelite was married to a priest who died and left her pregnant, her slaves may not eat terimah in virtue of the share of the embryo, since an embryo may deprive its mother of the privilege of eating terimah, but has no power to bestow it upon her. So, our Jose, they said to him, Since you have testified to us in respect of the daughter of an Israelite who was married to a priest, the slaves of the daughter of a priest who were married to a priest who died and left her with child should also be forbidden to eat terimah on account of the share. Of the embryo Gemara, a question was raised is our Jose's reason because he is of the opinion that an embryo in the womb of a lay woman is regarded as a non-priest, or is his reason because only the born may bestow the right of eating, but the unborn may not. In what respect could this difference matter in respect of an embryo in the womb of a priest's daughter? Now, what is the reason? Rabbi replied, Our Jose's reason is this: he is of the opinion that an embryo in the womb of a lay woman is regarded as a non-priest. Our Joseph replied, The born may bestow the privilege of eating, while the unborn may not. An objection was raised. They said to our Jose, Since you have testified to us in respect of the daughter of an Israelite who was married to a priest, what is the law in respect of the daughter of a priest who was married to a priest? The first he replied, I heard, but the other I have not heard. Now, if you agree that our Jose's reason is because an embryo in the womb of a lay woman is regarded as a non Priest, it was correct for him to say the first I heard, but the other I did not. If you maintain, however, that our Jose's reason is because the born may bestow the right of eating and the unborn may not, what could he have meant by the first I have heard, but the other I have not heard? When the principle is the same, this is indeed a difficulty, said Rab Judah in the name of Samuel. This is the opinion of our Jose, but the sages said, if he has children, they may eat terima by virtue of his children. If he has no children, they may eat by virtue of his brothers, and if he has no brothers, they may eat by virtue of the entire family. This would imply that he himself does not share the view, but surely Samuel said to our Hannah of Baghdad, Go bring me a group of ten men that I may tell you in their presence that if title is conferred upon an embryo through the agency of a third party, it does acquire ownership. The fact is that this here denotes that he also holds the same opinion. What then does he? Teach us that the rabbis disagree with our Jose, but do they in fact disagree? Surely our Zakai stated this evidence was submitted by our Jose in the name of Shimei and Abtalion, and they agreed with him. Our Ashi replied, Does it read? And they accepted it was only said, and they agreed, which may only mean that his view is logical. Our rabbis taught if he left children, both these and the others may eat. Terima, if he left his widow with child, neither these nor the others may eat it if he left children. And also left his widow with child, the Melech slaves may eat, as she may eat, but the Zanbarzal slaves may not eat on account of the share of the embryo which may deprive its mother of the privilege of eating Terima, but has no power to bestow it. So our Jose, our Ishmael, son of our Jose, stated in the name of his father, a daughter may bestow the right of eating a son, may not our Simeon Bio, he said, If the children are males, all the slaves may eat, if however they are females, the slaves are not. Permitted to eat since it is possible that the embryo might be a male and daughters where there is a son have no share at all. What need was there to point to the possibility that the embryo might be a male when this might be equally deduced from the fact that even when the embryo is a female it deprives them of the privilege. He meant to say there is one reason and also an additional one. There is the one reason that a female embryo also deprives the slaves of the privilege. And furthermore, it is possible that the embryo might be a male and daughters where there is a son have no
of the embryo a daughter also should not be entitled to bestow the right of eating on account of the share of the embryo Abe replied here we are dealing with a small estate and in a case where there is a son as well as a daughter so that the slaves may eat the terima whatever be the assumption as to the sex of the embryo if the embryo is a son then he is not better than the one who is already born and if it is a daughter then why does a daughter eat at all surely by virtue of it ordinance of the rabbis but so long as she has not seen the light no provision for her has been made by the rabbis if you take it to refer to a small estate how will you explain the final clause since it is possible that the embryo might be a male and daughters where there is a son have no share at all on the contrary a small estate belongs to the daughters the final clause refers to a large estate but does a small estate belong to the daughters surely rc stated in the name of Aryohanan. where male orphans forestalled the ruling of beth din and sold a small estate their sale is valid but the fact is that by the mention of daughter the mother is to be understood if so this is exactly the same statement as that of our jose the entire statement was made by our ishmael son of our jose mission an embryo lover betrothal a deaf mute and a boy who is nine years and one day old deprive a woman of the right of eating terima but cannot bestow the privilege upon her even when it is a matter of doubt whether the boy is nine years and one day old or not or whether he has produced two hairs or not if a house collapsed upon a man and upon his brother's daughter and it is not known which of them died first her rival must perform Eliza but may not contract Levi right marriage Gemara an embryo for if his mother is the daughter of a priest who was married to an Israelite the embryo deprives her of the privilege for it is written as in her youth which excludes one who is with child and if she is the daughter of an Israelite who was married to a priest the embryo does not bestow the privilege upon her because the living child does bestow the privilege but not the unborn lover for if his Yebamah is the daughter of a priest who was married to an Israelite the Eber deprives her of the privilege for it is written and is returned unto her father's house which excludes one who is awaiting the decision of the lover and if she is the daughter of an Israelite who was married to a priest the lover does not bestow the privilege upon her because the all merciful said the purchase of his money while she is the purchase of his brother betrothal for if the woman is the daughter of a priest who was betrothed to an Israelite betrothal deprives her of the privilege Talmud, Mas Yabamatha since he acquires her by the betrothal and if she is the daughter of an Israelite who was betrothed to a priest the betrothal cannot bestow the privilege upon her owing to the ruling of Oled Mute for if the woman is the daughter of a priest who was married to him who is an Israelite he deprives her of the privilege since he acquired her by virtue of a rabbinical enactment and if she is the daughter of an Israelite who was married to him who is a priest he cannot bestow the privilege upon her because the all merciful said the purchase of his money while he is not eligible to execute any kanyan and a boy who is nine. Years, etc. This was assumed to refer to the case of a Yebamah who was awaiting the decision of a lover who was nine years and one day old. Now, in what respect, if in respect of depriving her of the privilege, a younger child would also equally deprive her of the privilege, and if in respect of bestowing the privilege, a grown-up lover also cannot bestow this privilege. Abbe replied, We are dealing here with a lover of the age of nine years and one day who cohabited with his Yebamah, who, according to Pentateuch law, becomes his kanyan, since it might have been assumed that as Pentateuch Kalai she becomes his kanyan and his cohabitation also is legal, he should be entitled to bestow the privilege upon her. Hence, we were taught that the cohabitation of a boy who is nine years and one day old has been given the same validity only as that of a mamar by an adult said Robert to him. If so, why is it stated in the final clause, even when it is a matter of doubt whether the boy is nine years and one? Day old or not, if a boy who is certainly of the age of nine cannot bestow the privilege, is there any need to speak of a boy whose age is in doubt? No, said Rabbi. The Mishnah deals with a boy of the age of nine years and one day belonging to one of the classes of disqualified persons who, by their cohabitation, deprive a woman of the privilege of eating terima. As it was taught in Ammonite, a Moabite, an Egyptian, or an Edomian, proselyte, a Kuti, and a Nathan, a Halal, or a bastard of the age of nine years and one day who cohabits with the daughter of a priest of a Levite or of an Israelite disqualifies her. But since it is stated in the final clause, if they are not fit to enter the assembly of Israel, they render a woman unfit. He may be inferred that the first clause does not deal with such disqualified persons. The first clause speaks of those who are disqualified to enter the assembly, while the latter clause speaks of those who are disqualified to marry the daughter of a priest to turn. To the main text in Ammonite, a Moabite, an Egyptian, or an Edomian, proselyte, a Kuti, and a Nathan, a Halal, or a bastard of the age of nine years and one day who cohabits with the daughter of a priest of a Levite or of an Israelite disqualifies her. Our Jose said, Anyone whose children are disqualified causes disqualification. He whose children are not disqualified does not cause disqualification. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel said, Whenever you may marry his daughter, you may marry his widow, and whenever you may not marry his daughter, you may not marry his widow. Whence are these rulings deduced? Rab Judah replied in the name of Rab Scripture stated, And if a priest's daughter be married unto to a strange man as soon as she has had connubial relations with a disqualified person, the latter disqualified her, but the text cited is surely required for another purpose, is that the All Merciful ordained that the daughter of a priest who was married to a layman may not eat terima that may be deduced from it. Text and is returned unto her father's house as in her youth she may eat of her father's bread since the all merciful ordained and is returned unto her father's house she may eat it follows that prior to that she was not permitted to eat but if deduction were to be made from that text it may be objected one might have assumed that as a negative precept which is derived from a positive one it has only the force of a positive precept hence did the all merciful write the other text to indicate that it is a negative precept that it is a negative precept may be deduced from there shall no strange man eat of the holy things Talmud Mas Yabamat be but the text is required for its own purpose the expression there shall no strange man is written twice but still is not this required for the exposition of our Jose Bihanna for our Jose Bihanna has stated there shall no strange man implies I have imposed upon you a prohibition concerning non priests only but not concerning Onan R. Jose B. Hanna's exposition may be deduced from the scriptural use of the longer expression and there shall no strange man instead of strange man but still is not this required for the following which was taught when she returns she returns only to the privilege of eating terima but does not return to the privilege of eating the breast and shoulder and are his stated in the name of Rabbin B. R. Sheila what scriptural text proves this it is written but if a priest's daughter be married unto a strange man she shall not eat of the terima of the holy things she must not eat of that which is set apart from the holy things if so scripture should have written she shall not eat of the holy things why then the longer expression of the terima of the holy things two deductions may consequently be made we have now deduced the law relating to a priest's daughter whence however is this deduced in respect of the daughter of a Levite or an Israelite as our Abba stated in the name of Rab. That deduction is made from the scriptural use of but a daughter where only daughter could have been used so here also deduction is made from the use of and a daughter where only daughter could have been used in accordance with whose view is it only in accordance with that of our Akiva who bases expositions on superfluous view when it may be said to have been made even according to the view of the rabbis because the entire scriptural expression and a daughter is superfluous thus the disqualification in respect of terima has been proved once however is it deduced that the disqualification extends also to the prohibition of marrying a priest has not the daughter of a Levite or of an Israelite been included in respect of priestly marriage only for as regards terima neither of them is ever eligible to eat or are they never eligible such eligibility surely occurs when a mother eats terima by virtue of the rights of her son the case of a mother who eats terima by Virtue of the rights of her son may be deduced by inference of minority ad majus if the daughter of a priest who eats the terima by virtue of her own sanctity becomes disqualified how much more so the daughter of a Levite or of an Israelite who eats it only by virtue of the rights of her son on the contrary this very point provides the reason a priest's daughter whose body is sacred is rightly disqualified this woman however whose own body is not sacred might not become disqualified the fact is rather that the prohibition to marry a priest may be deduced a minority ad majus from a divorced woman if a divorced woman who is permitted to eat terima is nevertheless forbidden to marry a priest how much more reason is there that such a woman who is forbidden to eat terima should be disqualified from marrying a priest may a prohibition
An Israelite to be inferred as Arab is stated in the name of Rav that deduction is made from the scriptural use of and a daughter where only daughter could have been used. So here also deduction is made from the use of and a daughter where only daughter could have been used in accordance with whose view is it only in accordance with that of our Akiva who bases expositions on superfluous view and it may be said to have been made even according to the view of the rabbis because the entire scriptural expression and a daughter is a superfluous text but might it be suggested that in the case of a man in relation to whom widowhood and divorce is possible the woman may eat teramah if she has no children and may not eat if she has children but in the case of a man in relation to whom widowhood and divorce are not possible she may eat teramah even if she has children if so what need was there to include the daughter of a Levite and of an Israelite according to our Akiva however who Stated that betrothal with those whose intercourse involves the penalty of a negative commandment has no validity and that the meaning of it be married to a strange man is if she cohabits what need was therefore widow or divorce the widow was stated in order to restrict her privilege and the divorced woman in order to relax her restrictions and both were required for had only the widow been mentioned it might have been assumed that only a widow may eat teramah if she has no children. Because she is eligible to marry a priest but a divorced woman who is ineligible to marry a priest may not eat it even if she has no children and had the divorced woman only been mentioned it might have been suggested that only a divorced woman may not eat teramah if she has children because she is ineligible to marry a priest but a widow who is eligible to marry a priest may eat it even if she has children hence both were necessary might it not be suggested that the statement she had. Connubial relations with a disqualified person refers also to one who remarried his divorced wife. The All Merciful said to a strange man, only one who was formerly a stranger to her, her former husband is excluded since he was not formerly a stranger to her. If so, a halal who is not a stranger to her should not cause her disqualification. Scripture stated, He shall not profane his seed among his people. His seed is compared to himself as he disqualifies, so does his seed disqualify. Might it be suggested that the disqualification is effected from the moment of betrothal? His case must be similar to that of a high priest with a widow as a high priest in the case of a widow causes her disqualification by cohabitation only, so does this person cause disqualification by cohabitation only? Might it be suggested that disqualification is effected only where there was betrothal as well as cohabitation? His case must be similar to that of a high priest with a widow as a high priest. When he marries a widow causes her disqualification by cohabitation alone so does this person cause disqualification by cohabitation alone. Our Jose however said anyone whose children are disqualified causes disqualification but he whose children are not disqualified does not cause disqualification. What is the practical difference between the first ten and our Jose or Yohan and replied the difference between them is the case of an Egyptian proselyte of the second generation and an Edomian. Proselyte of the second generation and both of them deduce their respective views from none other than the disqualification of a widow by a high priest. The first ten reasons as a high priest whose cohabitation with a widow is forbidden causes her disqualification. So does this person also cause disqualification. Our Jose however reasons thus like a high priest as a high priest whose seed is disqualified causes disqualification. So does any other person cause disqualification only when his seed is disqualified an Egyptian proselyte of the second generation is thus excluded since his children are not disqualified for it is written the children of the third generation that are born unto them may enter into the assembly of the Lord our Simeon Begamaliel said whenever you may marry his daughter you may marry his widow etc what is the practical difference between our Jose and our Simeon Begamaliel will reply the difference between them is the case of an Ammonite and a Moabite proselyte and both of them derive their respective views from none other than the disqualification of a widow by a high priest our Jose reasons thus as with a high priest who married a widow his seed is disqualified and he himself causes disqualification so does any other person cause disqualification only when his seed is disqualified our Simeon Begamaliel however reasons thus as with a high priest who married a widow all his seed is disqualified and he himself causes disqualification so does only such a Person cause disqualification all whose seed is disqualified an Ammonite and a Moabite are therefore excluded since not all their seed are disqualified for a master said an Ammonite but not an Ammonite a Moabite but not a Moabite test mission the violator the seducer and the imbecile can neither deprive a woman of the right of eating teramah nor can they bestow the right upon her if they are however unfit to enter into the assembly of Israel they do deprive a woman of her right to the eating of teramah how if an Israelite had intercourse with the daughter of a priest she may still continue to eat teramah Talmud Masyavamath if she becomes pregnant she may no longer eat teramah if the embryo was cut in her womb she may eat if a priest had intercourse with the daughter of an Israelite she may not eat teramah even if she becomes pregnant she may not eat if however she gave birth to a child she may eat the power of the son is thus greater than that of the father a slave by his Cohabitation deprives a woman of the privilege of eating teramah but not as her offspring how if the daughter of an Israelite was married to a priest or the daughter of a priest was married to an Israelite and she bore a son by him and the son went and violated a bond woman who bore a son by him such a son is a slave and if his father's mother was an Israelite's daughter who was married to a priest she may not eat teramah but if she was a priest's daughter and married to an Israelite she may eat teramah bastard deprives a woman of the privilege of eating teramah and also bestows the privilege upon her how if an Israelite's daughter was married to a priest or a priest's daughter was married to an Israelite and she bore a daughter by him and the daughter went and married a slave or an idolater and bore a son by him such a son is a bastard and if his mother's mother was an Israelite's daughter who was married to a priest she may eat teramah but if she was a priest's daughter who was Married to an Israelite, she may not eat teramah. High priest sometimes deprives a woman of her right to eat teramah. How if a priest's daughter was married to an Israelite and she bore a daughter by him, and the daughter went and married a priest and bore a son by him, such a son is fit to be a high priest to stand and minister at the altar. He also bestows upon his mother the privilege of eating teramah, but deprives his mother's mother of this privilege. The latter can rightly say, May there not be another like my grandson, the high priest, who deprives me of the privilege of eating teramah. Tomorrow, here we learn what the rabbis taught: If an imbecile or a minor married and died, their wives are exempt from the and from Levi right marriage. If an Israelite had intercourse with the daughter of a priest, she may still continue to eat teramah. If she becomes pregnant, she may no longer eat, since she may not eat when she is definitely with child. Precaution should be taken against it. Possibility that she might be with child did we not learn they must be kept apart for three months since it is possible that they are pregnant Rabbi son of Arhuna replied in respect of genealogy precautions were taken in respect of Teramah no such precautions were considered necessary but was no such precaution considered necessary in respect of Teramah surely it was taught if a priest said here is your letter of divorce which shall become effective one hour before my death she is forbidden to eat Teramah once in fact said Rabbi son of Arhuna precautions were taken in respect of legitimate marriage but in respect of illegitimate intercourse no such precaution was considered necessary but was such precaution taken in respect of legitimate marriage surely it was taught if a priest's daughter was married to an Israelite who died she may perform her ritual immersion and eat Teramah the same evening Arhista replied she performs the immersion but may eat Teramah only until the fortieth day for if she is not found pregnant she never was pregnant and if she is found pregnant the semen until the fortieth day is only a mere fluid said Abbe to him if so read the final clause if the embryo in her womb can be distinguished she is considered to have committed an offense retrospectively the meaning is that she is considered to have committed an offense retrospectively to the fortieth day it was stated where a man cohabited with his betrothed in the house of his future father in law Rab said the child is a bastard and Samuel said the child is a Shedeki Rabbah said Rab's view is reasonable in the case where the betrothed woman was suspected of illicit relations with strangers where however she is not suspected of illicit relations with strangers the child is ascribed to him said Rabbah once do I infer this from the statement if however she gave birth to a child she may eat for how is this to be understood if it be suggested to refer to a woman who is Suspected of illicit relations with strangers, why should she be allowed to eat teramah when she bore a child? Consequently, it must refer to a woman who was suspected of illicit relations with him only, but not with strangers. Now, if there where she is forbidden to the one as well as to the other, the child is regarded as his. How much more so here where she is
She gave birth to a child she may eat for how is this to be understood if it be suggested to refer to a woman who is suspected of illicit relations with him but not with strangers was it at all necessary to state that she may eat terima consequently it must refer to a woman who was suspected of illicit relations with strangers also now if there where she is forbidden to the one as well as to the other the child is regarded as his how much more so here where she is forbidden to any other man and is permitted to him said Abbe to him it may still be maintained that Rab is of the opinion that wherever she is suspected of illicit relations with strangers the child is deemed to be a bastard even if she is also suspected of such relations with him and our mission deals with one who had not been suspected at all a slave by his cohabitation deprives a woman of the privilege of eating terima etc what is the reason scripture stated the wife and her children shall be etc a bastard deprives a woman of the privilege of eating terima and also bestows the privilege upon her are rabbis taught and have no child so far i only know of her own child whence her child's child it was consequently stated and have no child implying any child whatsoever so far i only know of a legitimate child whence the illegitimate child it was stated and have no in-law child which implies hold and inquire concerning her but from this text surely the deduction concerning a child's child was made no Scriptural text is really required for the inclusion of one's child's child since children's children are like children if a text is at all required it is for the inclusion of an illegitimate child said Reshlakish to Aryohanan in accordance with whose view is it only in accordance with that of our Akiba who maintains that the offspring of a union between such whose intercourse involves them in the penalty of a negative precept is regarded as a bastard it may even be said to represent the view of the rabbi since in respect of an idolater and a slave they grieve for when our Dimi came he stated in the name of our Isaac be of Dimi in the name of our master if an idolater or a slave cohabited with the daughter of an Israelite the child born from such a union is deemed a bastard a high priest sometimes deprives a woman of her right our rabbis taught the grandmother might justly say I would willingly be an atonement for my grandson the little cruise who bestows upon me the privilege of eating terima but would not be an atonement for my grandson the big jar who deprives me of the privilege of eating terima. CHAPTERBII mission and uncircumcised priest and all levitically unclean persons may not eat terima their wives and slaves however may eat terima priest who is wounded in his stones and one whose member is cut off as well as their slaves may eat terima but their wives may not if however no cohabitation took place after the man was wounded or had his member cut off the wives are permitted to eat who is termed a pezudaka a man who is wounded either in both his stones or even only in one of them and a a man whose member is cut off if however any part of the corona remained even so much as a hair's breadth the man is regarded as fit the it was taught our Eliezer stated once is it deduced that an uncircumcised priest may not eat terima a sojourner and a hired servant were mentioned in connection with the paschal lamb and a sojourner and a hired servant were also mentioned in respect of terima is the paschal lamb in connection with which a sojourner and a hired servant were mentioned is forbidden to the uncircumcised so is terima in respect of which a sojourner and a hired servant were mentioned forbidden to the uncircumcised our Akiva stated this deduction is unnecessary since it was stated what man so ever the uncircumcised also is included the master said our Eliezer stated a sojourner and a hired servant were mentioned in connection with the paschal lamb and a sojourner and a hired servant were also mentioned in respect of Terima is the paschal lamb in connection with which a sojourner and a hired servant were mentioned is forbidden to the uncircumcised so is terima in respect of which a sojourner and a hired servant were mentioned forbidden to the uncircumcised is it free for deduction for if it is not free the objection might be raised that the paschal lamb may be different since in connection with it one may also incur penalties for people not hard and uncleanness it is certainly free for the deduction which expression is free is it that of terima surely it is required for its own purpose for it was taught a sojourner means one who is acquired for life and a hired servant means one who is acquired for a number of years but let sojourner only be mentioned and a hired servant be omitted and one would infer if one who is acquired for life is not permitted to eat terima how much less one who is acquired only for a number of years if so it might have been assumed that a sojourner means one who is acquired for a number of years and that only he may not eat terima but that one who is acquired for life may eat hence the insertion of the expression a hired servant which explains the meaning of sojourner is that it signifies one who though acquired for life may not eat but in fact the one mentioned in respect of the paschal lamb is free for deduction for what could be the meaning of a sojourner and a hired servant which the all-merciful wrote in connection with the paschal lamb if it be suggested that it means the actual sojourner and hired servant could it have been imagined that an israelite is exempt from the paschal lamb because he is a sojourner or a hired servant surely we have it as an established law in regard to terima that such a person is not permitted to eat a talmud masya bamathi which proves that his master does not acquire his person so that here also his master does not acquire his person the expression must consequently have been written for the purpose of the deduction but is it not free in one direction only while our Eliza was heard to state that an analogy between expressions of which only one is free may be drawn but may also be refuted since the expressions are not required for their own context one of them is allotted to the law in respect of which the inference is made and the other is allotted to the law from which the inference is made so that a word analogy is obtained which is free in both directions might not the deduction be made as the paschal lamb is forbidden to an own and so is terima forbidden to an own and our Jose son of our hand replied scripture stated there shall no common man I commanded you concerning its prohibition to the common man but not concerning that of the own but might it be suggested but not the uncircumcised surely a sojourner and a hired servant was written and what reason do you see it is logical to infer that the case of the uncircumcised is to be included since it Involves the absence of an act and that act is one affecting the man's own body the uncircumcised is punishable by correct the law was enforced before the revelation and the non-circumcision of one's male children and slaves debars one from eating of the paschal lamb on the contrary the case of the onan should have been included since mourning is an ever-present possibility is common to men as well as to women and no man has the power to cure himself of it those are more in number rather said even if those were not more in number you could not suggest that uncircumcision which is actually mentioned in respect of the paschal lamb should be excluded while the mourning of an onan which in the case of the paschal lamb itself was deduced from that of the tithe should be deduced from it might it not be said as the non-circumcision of one's male children and slaves debars one from the eating of the paschal lamb so should the non-circumcision of one's male children and slaves Debar one from the eating of terima scripture stated when thou hast circumcised him and shall he eat thereof the non-circumcision of one's male children and slaves debars one from the eating thereof of the paschal lamb only the non-circumcision of one's male children and slaves does not however debar one from the eating of terima if so why not say but no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof also implies he may not eat thereof only but may eat terima surely it was written a sojourner and a hired servant and what reason do you see it is only logical to include a man's own circumcision since the act is performed on his own person and its neglect is punishable by gareth on the contrary the circumcision of one's male children and slaves should have been excluded because it may occur at any time the former restrictions are more in number and if you prefer i might say that even if those were not more in number your suggestion could not be entertained for is there Anything which is not debarred by his own state of uncircumcision but is debarred by that of the other now that it has been said that the expression thereof was introduced for expository purposes what was the purpose of the text there shall no alien eat of it only with regard to a Talmud, Masya Bamathid does apostasy disqualify but in respect of tithe apostasy does not disqualify what was the purpose of but no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof thereof only may he not eat but he may eat of the unleavened bread and bitter herbs and it was necessary for scripture to specify both uncircumcised and there shall no alien for had the all merciful mentioned the uncircumcised only it might have been assumed that the prohibition applies only to him because he is repulsive but not to an alien who is not repulsive and had the all merciful written only there shall no alien it might have been assumed that only he is subject to the prohibition because his heart is not directed towards heaven but not the uncircumcised whose heart is directed towards heaven hence both were required what was the purpose of repeating the expression of it twice as expounded by rabbi in the name of our isaac the master said our akiba stated this deduction is unnecessary
Pascal M. On the contrary, the case of the Onan should have been included since mourning is an ever present possibility is common to men as well as women, and no man has the power to cure himself of it. Those are more in number, Rabbi said. Even if those were not more in number, you could not make your suggestion for scripture stated what man soever. Now, what disability is it that is applicable to a man and not to a woman? You must, of course, say that it is uncircumcision. What expository used as are. Akiba make of the expression a sojourner and a hired servant are she may reply to include a circumcised Arab and a circumcised Gibeonite are these however regarded as circumcised at all surely we learned if a man said Konam if I benefit from the uncircumcised he may benefit from uncircumcised Israelites but is forbidden to benefit from circumcised idolaters if he said Konam if I benefit from the circumcised he is permitted to benefit from circumcised idolaters but is forbidden to benefit from uncircumcised Israelites but in truth the text referred to includes a proselyte who had been circumcised but did not perform the prescribed ritual immersion and a child who was born circumcised he holding that it is necessary to provide for a few drops of the blood of the covenant to flow while our Eliezer follows his own view he having stated that a proselyte who has been circumcised though he has not performed his ritual immersion is regarded as a proper proselyte and he is also of it. Opinion that it is not necessary to provide for any drops of the blood of the covenant to flow where a child was born circumcised. What expository use, however, does our Eliza make of the expression what man soever the Torah he maintains speaks in the language of ordinary men are Hamabi Akbah inquired may an uncircumcised child be anointed with the oil of Terah does not circumcision in the pre-circumcision period constitute a bar or not our zero reply come and here I only know of the command. Concerning the circumcision of the male children which he has at the time of the preparation of the Paschal Lamb and concerning the slaves which he has at the time of the eating thereof once however is it deduced that the restriction mentioned in respect of this category is to be applied to the other and that of the other to this one then was specifically stated in both categories so that an analogy between the two might be drawn now it is quite possible to imagine a man slaves as being with him at the time of the eating of the paschal lamb but not at the time of its preparation when for instance he bought them in the meantime how is it possible however that a person's male children should be in existence during the eating and not during the preparation obviously only when birth occurred in the interval between the preparation and the eating thus it may be inferred that uncircumcision in the pre-circumcision period constitutes a legal status of uncircumcision said rabbi do you understand this the all merciful said let all his males be circumcised and then let him come near and keep it but such a child is not fit to be circumcised but what are we dealing with here with a child who recovered from a fever then let him be granted a period of convalescence of full seven days for samuel said that a child who recovered from a fever must be allowed a period of convalescence of full seven days where he was already granted the seven days period he should then have been circumcised in the morning we require Talmud, Mas Yavam be a full period of seven days but surely Ludah learned the day of a child's recovery is like the day of his birth does not this mean that as in respect of the day of his birth no full period is required so is no full period required in respect of the day of his recovery no the day of his recovery is superior to the day of his birth for whereas in respect of the day of his birth no full period is required in respect of the day of his recovery a full period is required our Papa replied where for instance the child had a pain in his eye and recovered in the meantime Rabba replied where for instance his father and mother were confined in prison Arkahana son of Arniamai replied where for instance the child was a tumtum who in the meantime was operated upon and was found to be a male Arshirabi replied where for instance the child put forth his head out of the forechamber of the uterus but can such a child survive surely it was taught as soon as the child emerges into the air of the world the closed organ is opened and the opened is closed for otherwise he could not survive even for one hour here we deal with a case where the heat of the fever sustained him whose fever if his own fever be suggested he should if such was the case be allowed a full period of seven days it means where the fever of his mother sustained him and if you prefer I might say that the statement applies only when the child does not cry. When however it cries it undoubtedly survives our Yohan and stated in the name of our Bani, an uncircumcised Israelite is eligible to receive sprinkling for so we find that our ancestors received sprinkling while they were still uncircumcised since it is said and the people came up out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month but on the tenth they were not circumcised owing to the fatigue of the journey when then could the sprinkling have been performed obviously while they were still uncircumcised but is it not possible that they prepared no paschal lamb at all the suggestion cannot be entertained at all since it is written and they kept the passover marzitra demurred it is possible that it was a paschal lamb that was prepared in uncleanness or as she retorted it was explicitly taught they were circumcised they performed their ritual ablutions and they prepared their paschal lambs in a state of cleanness rabbi isaac stated in the name of rabbi the commandment of uncovering the corona at circumcision was not given to abraham for it is said at that time the lord said unto joshua make the knives of flint etc but is it not possible that this applied to those who were not previously circumcised for it is written for all the people that came out were circumcised but all the people that were born etc if so why the expression again consequently it must apply to the uncovering of the corona why then the expression a second time to compare the termination of the circumcision with its commencement as the commencement of the circumcision is essential so is the termination of circumcision essential for we learn these are the shreds which render circumcision invalid flesh which covers the greater part of the corona and a priest whose circumcision was so defective is not permitted to eat terima and rubina or it might be said our jeremiah be abbasted in the name of rab flesh which covers the greater part of the height of the corona why were they not circumcised in the wilderness if you wish i might say because of the fatigue of the journey talmud mas yavam and if you prefer i might say because the north wind did not blow upon them for it was taught in all the forty years during which israel was in the wilderness the north wind did not blow upon them what was the reason if you wish i might say because they were under divine displeasure and if you prefer i might say in order that the clouds of glory might not be scattered our papa Said hence no circumcision may be performed on a cloudy day or on a day when the south wind blows nor may one be bled on such a day at the present time however since many people are in the habit of disregarding these precautions the Lord preserveth the simple our rabbis taught in all the forty years during which Israel was in the wilderness there was not a day on which the north wind did not blow at the midnight hour for it is said and it came to pass at midnight that the Lord smote all the firstborn etc how is the deduction arrived at by this we were taught that an acceptable time is an essential arhuna said a mashik is pentateuch ally permitted to eat terima but has been forbidden to do so by rabbinical ordinance because he appears to be like one uncircumcised an objection was raised the mashik requires to be redash circumcised only by rabbinical ordinance but he who raised the objection on what ground did he raise it when it was definitely stated requires he misunderstood it. Final clause our Judah said he should not be circumcised because such an operation is dangerous in his case they said to him surely many were circumcised in the days of Ben Kozaba and yet gave birth to sons and daughters such circumcision being lawful as in fact it is said in scripture must needs be circumcised even a hundred times and furthermore it is said he hath broken my covenant which includes a magic what need was there for the additional text in case you might argue that must needs be circumcised includes only the shreds which render a circumcision invalid so he added come and here he hath broken my covenant which includes a magic he consequently thought that as the Talmud made use of a scriptural text the law must be pentateuchal but the fact is that it is only rabbinical and the scriptural text is a mere prop objection was raised to tumtum may not eat terima but his women and slaves may eat of it a magic and one born circumcised may eat of it other May eat terima but not holy food while the tumtum may eat neither terima nor holy food at all events it was taught here that the mashik and one born circumcised may eat terima is not this a refutation against our it is indeed a refutation the master said a tumtum may not eat terima but his women and slaves may eat of it by what legal act could a tumtum acquire his wives if it be suggested by betrothing them for it was taught if a tumtum betrothed a woman his betrothal is valid and if he was betrothed by a man his betrothal is also valid it might be retorted that the validity was intended only as a restrictive measure was it however intended also as a relaxation of a law he is possibly a woman and no woman surely may betroth a woman have a replied where his testes can be distinguished externally robber replied what is the meaning of his women his mother but
whose conversion took place while he was already circumcised and a child the proper time of whose circumcision had passed and all other circumcised persons this means to include one who has two foreskins may be circumcised in the daytime only are Eliezer B. Simeon however said at the proper time Talmud, Masi Abamat B. children may be circumcised in the daytime only and if not at the proper time they may be circumcised both by day and by night do they not differ on the following principle while one master is of the opinion that the circumcision of a mashik is a pentateuchal law. The other master is of the opinion that the circumcision of the mashik is only a rabbinical ordinance. And can you understand this? Is there any authority who maintains that the duty to circumcise a child whose proper time of circumcision had passed is only rabbinical? But the fact is that both agree that the circumcision of a mashik is a rabbinical ordinance and that the duty to circumcise a child whose proper time of circumcision had passed is pentateuchal. Here, however, their difference depends on the following principle. One master holds that the conjunctive in the expression and in the day is to be expounded, and the other master is of the opinion that the conjunctive in and in the day is not to be expounded. The exposition here is of the same nature as the following: When Aryohanan was once sitting at his studies and expounding that nahar at its proper time may be burned in the daytime only. And if not at its proper time, it may be burned either in the day or in the night. Our Eliezer raised an objection. I only know that a child whose circumcision takes place on the eighth day must be circumcised in the daytime only once. However, is it deduced that the case of a child whose circumcision takes place on the ninth, tenth, eleventh, or twelfth is also included because it was expressly stated and in the day? And even he who bases no expositions on Abab does base his exposition on the basis of Abab. And he, the other, remained silent after he went out. Our Yohanan said to Reshlakish, I observed that the son of Petath was sitting and making expositions like Moses in the name of the Almighty. Was this his Reshlakish replied? It is really a very though where the first asked was it taught in Torah of Kohanim. He went out and learned it in three days and was engaged in making deductions and drawing conclusions from it for a period of three months. Our Eliezer stated the sprinkling performed by an Uncircumcised person is valid for his status is similar to that of a Tibolyam who though forbidden to eat teramah is permitted to prepare the red heifer the case of a Tibolyam however might be different since he is also permitted to eat tithe are we speaking of eating we speak only of touching if a Tibolyam who is forbidden to touch teramah is permitted to occupy himself with the red heifer how much more so the uncircumcised who is permitted to touch teramah the same law was also taught elsewhere the sprinkling performed by an uncircumcised man is valid and such an incident once happened and the sages declared his sprinkling to be valid an objection was raised if a tumtum performed sanctification his sanctification is invalid because he has the status of the person whose uncircumcision is a matter of doubt and such a person is forbidden to perform sanctification if an hermaphrodite however performed sanctification his sanctification is valid our Judah said even if an Hermaphrodite performed sanctification his act has no validity because his sex might possibly be that of a woman and a woman is ineligible to perform sanctification at all events it was taught here that the uncircumcised or the person whose uncircumcision is a matter of doubt is forbidden to perform sanctification our Joseph replied this Tana is one of the school of our Akiba who include the uncircumcised in the same prohibition as that of the unclean as it was taught our Akiba said what man so ever includes also the uncircumcised robber related I was once sitting before our Joseph when I raised the following difficulty then the Tana should not have omitted to state the uncircumcised and the unclean and one would at once suggest that the author was our Akiba but does he not surely it was taught the uncircumcised and the unclean are exempt from appearing at the festivals there the case is different because he is a repulsive person they follow their own respective views for it was Taught all are permitted to perform sanctification with the exception of the death, the imbecile, and the minor are Judah permits in the case of the minor, but regards a woman and an hermaphrodite as unfit. What is the rabbi's reason? Because it is written, and for the unclean they shall take of the ashes of the burning of the purification from sin. Those who are ineligible for the gathering are also ineligible for the sanctification, but those who are eligible for the gathering are also eligible for the sanctification. And our Judah, he can answer you if so. Scripture should have used the expression, he shall take why then, and they shall take to indicate that even those who are ineligible there are eligible here. If so, a woman also should be eligible, shall he put, but not shall she put, and the rabbis had it been written, he shall take and shall he put. It might have been assumed that only one individual must take and only one must put, hence did the all merciful right, and they shall take and had it. All merciful written and they shall take and also shall be put it might have been assumed that two must take and two must put hence did the all merciful right and they shall take and shall he put to indicate that the rites are duly performed even if two take and one put Talmud, Masi Abamate and the clean person shall sprinkle upon the unclean since clean was mentioned the implication must be that he is somewhat unclean thus it was taught that a Tibol Yom is permitted to prepare the red heifer Arshis hate was asked is an uncircumcised person permitted to eat tithe is tithe deduced from the Paschal Lamb in the case of circumcision as the Paschal Lamb is deduced from tithe in the case of the morning of an onan or may only the major sanctity be deduced from the minor but not the minor from the major sanctity he replied you have learned this in respect of Teramah and the first ripe fruits one may incur the penalties of death and a fifth these furthermore are forbidden to Non-priests they are the undisputed property of the priests they are neutralized in 101 and they require washing of the hands and sunset all these restrictions apply to terima and bikram only but not to tithe now if that were so it should have been stated here the uncircumcised is forbidden to eat of them which prohibition is not applicable to tithe he might have taught some and omitted others what else did he omit that he should have omitted this he omitted the following. In the final clause while it was stated some restrictions apply to tithe and the first ripe fruits but not to terima since tithe and the first ripe fruits must be brought to the appointed place they require confession and are forbidden to an onan and our simian permits a bikram to an onan they are furthermore subject to removal but our simian exempts them the laws that they may not be burned even when levitically unclean Talmud, Masya Bamath B and that the man who eats of them while they themselves are levitically unclean is to be flogged and that these laws do not apply to Terima were not stated this proves clearly that only some were taught and others were omitted the master said and are forbidden to an onan and our simian permits a bikram to an onan whence do they derive their views from the scriptural text thou mayest not eat within thy gates the tithe of thy corn or of thy wine or of thy oil or the firstlings of thy herd etc nor the offering of thy hand and a master said that the offering of thy hand refers to bikram and bikram were compared to tithe as tithe is forbidden to the onan so are bikram also forbidden to the onan and our simian the all merciful called them Terima as Terima is permitted to the onan so are bikram permitted to the onan they are furthermore subject to removal but our simian permits them one master compares bikram to tithe and the other master does not they may not be burned when levitically unclean and the man who Eats of them while they themselves are levitically unclean is to be flogged whence is this derived from what was taught our Simeon said neither have I burned thereof being unclean whether I was unclean and it was clean or I was clean and it was unclean I do not know however where one was forbidden to eat it but surely in relation to it the uncleanness of the body was specifically stated the soul that touches any such shall be unclean until the even and shall not eat of the holy things unless he bathe its flesh in waters this is the question whence the prohibition to eat it where the thing itself is unclean it was expressly stated thou mayest not eat within thy gates the tithe of thy corn but further on it was stated thou shalt eat it within thy gates the unclean and the clean may eat it alike as the gazelle and as the heart and at the school of our Ishmael it was taught that the unclean and the clean may eat together even on the same table and the same plate and no precautions need be Taken thus the all merciful stated that concerning which I told you there thou shalt eat it within thy gates you may not eat here that these laws do not apply to terima whence do we derive this Arabad replied in the name of our Yohan and scripture stated neither have I burnt thereof being unclean you may not burn thereof but you may burn the oil of terima if it has become unclean might it not be suggested you may not burn any thereof but you may burn holy oil that became unclean as surely may be inferred of minori ad majus if in respect of the tithe the sanctity of which is of a minor character the Torah stated neither have I burnt thereof being unclean how much more so in respect of holy food the sanctity of which is of a major character if so terima also might be inferred of minori ad majus
proved to come and hear if shreds which render the circumcision invalid remain he may not eat terabon nor the paschal lamb nor holy food nor tithe does not tithe refer to the tithe of the corn no the tithe of cattle but is not the tithe of cattle the same as holy food even on your view are we not told here of the paschal lamb and yet holy food also is mentioned one can well understand why it was necessary to mention both the paschal lamb and holy food for if the paschal lamb only had been stated it might have been assumed that it only is forbidden because uncircumcision was written in scripture in connection with the paschal lamb but not holy food and if holy food only had been stated it might have been assumed that what was meant by holy food was the paschal lamb what need however was there for the mention here of the tithe of cattle no say rather tithe refers to the first tithe and this teaching is that of our mayor who holds that the first tithe is forbidden to non-priests Come and here since our high rabbi of Dipti has learned and uncircumcised is forbidden to eat of both tithes is not one the tithe of the corn and the other the tithe of the cattle here also the first tithe was meant and the ruling is that of our mayor come and here and onan is forbidden to eat of tithe but is permitted to eat terima and to engage in the preparation of the red heifer a tibolyam is forbidden to eat terima but is permitted to engage in the preparation of the red heifer and to eat tithe and he who was still short of atonement is forbidden to engage in the preparation of the red heifer but is permitted to eat terima and tithe now if it were so it should have been stated the uncircumcised is forbidden to eat terima but is permitted to engage in the preparation of the red heifer and to eat tithe this represents the view of the tana of the school of our Akiba who includes the uncircumcised like the unclean in the prohibition as it was taught any man so ever. Includes the uncircumcised who is the Tana who differs from our Akiba. It is the Tana who is in disagreement with our Joseph the Babylonian, for it was taught the burning by an Onan or by one who is still short of atonement is valid, but our Joseph the Babylonian said that of the Onan is valid, but that of him who is short of atonement is not valid. Our Isaac also is of the opinion that the uncircumcised is forbidden to eat second tithe, for our Isaac stated whence is it deduced that the uncircumcised is forbidden to eat second tithe. Thereof was stated in respect of the tithe, and thereof was also stated in respect of the Paschal lamb, as the Paschal lamb in respect of which thereof was used is forbidden to the uncircumcised, so is the tithe in respect of which thereof was used forbidden to the uncircumcised. Is it free for deduction, for if it is not free, it could be objected. The Paschal lamb is rightly subject to the restriction since one may incur in respect of it the penalties for. Pickle nut and levitical uncleanness it is indeed free for deduction which is free robber replied in the name of our Isaac thereof is written three times in connection with the paschal lamb one is required for the paschal lamb itself one for the analogy and as to the third according to him who maintains that scripture intended a positive precept to follow a negative one thereof was written a second time because nut was written a second time and according to him who maintains that the repetition of until the morning was intended to allow a second morning for its burning thereof was written a second time because until the morning had to be written a second time also in connection with tithe thereof was written three times one is required for its own purpose one is required for the deduction which are about made in the name of our Yohanan and the third is required for the exposition made by Reshlakish for Reshlakish stated in the name of our Semi whence is it deduced. That second tithe which has become levitically unclean may be used for anointing it is said nor have I given thereof for the dead only for a dead man have I not given but I have given for a living man in the same manner as for the dead now what is it that may be equally applied to the living and to the dead you must say that it is anointing marzit or it might be suggested to refer to the purchase for the dead of a coffin and shrouds are not son of our Joshua replied thereof means of it. Tithe itself or Ashi replied nor have I given must be analogous to I have not eaten as there it refers to the tithe itself so here also it must refer to the tithe itself but still it is free however in one direction only the analogy is quite satisfactory according to him who maintains that deduction may be made even in such a case and may not be refuted according to him however who is of the opinion that deduction may be made but also refuted what can be said are about deduction may be. Inferred from the text cited in the statement which Arnaman made in the name of Rabbi Abu Afar Arnaman stated in the name of Rabbi Abu what was meant by the scriptural text and I behold I have given thee the charge of my heave offering scripture speaks of two kinds of terima one clean terima and the other unclean terima and concerning these the all merciful said it shall be thine even for burning under your dish and all levitically unclean persons etc whence is this deduced are. Yohanan replied in the name of our Ishmael scripture stated what mansoever of the seed of Aaron is a leper or hath an issue etc now what is it that is equally Talmud, Mas Yabamoth be applicable to all the seed of Aaron you must say that it is terima but might it not be assumed to refer to the breast and the shoulder these are not permitted to a woman who returns but terima also is not permitted to a halala halala is not regarded as of the seed of Aaron and whence is it inferred. That until he be clean means until sunset perhaps it means until the atonement is brought this cannot be entertained for a tana of the school of our Ishmael taught that scripture speaks of Azab who noticed only two issues and of a leper while under observation both being cases similar to that of one who is unclean by the dead as he who is unclean by the dead is not liable to bring an atonement so are these such as are not liable to bring an atonement let it be said then that this applies only to those who are not liable to bring an atonement but that for those who are liable to an atonement purification is incomplete until the atonement has been brought furthermore in respect of what we learned if he performed the prescribed ablution and came up from his bathing he may eat of the second tithe after sunset he may eat terima and after he has brought his atonement he may also eat of the holy food whence it may also be asked are these laws derived robber replied in the name of our it's not three scriptural texts are recorded it is written and shall not eat of the holy things unless he bathe his flesh in water implying if he bathe however he is clean it is also written and when the sun is down he shall be clean and afterwards he may eat of the holy things and finally it's written and the priest shall make atonement for her and she shall be clean how then are these contradictory conditions to be reconciled the first refers to second tithe the second to terima and it third to holy food might not these be reversed it is reasonable that terima should be subject to the greater restriction since it is also subject to the restrictions of the death penalty the fifth it cannot be redeemed and is also forbidden to the non-priest on the contrary second tithe might be regarded as subject to the greater restriction since it has to be brought to the appointed place requires confession is forbidden to an own and must not be burned even when unclean the penalty of Flogging is incurred for eating it when it is unclean and it is also subject to the law of removal the penalty of death nevertheless is of the greatest severity Rabbi said apart from the fact that the death penalty is of the greatest severity it could not be said so for scripture stated soul now what is it that is equally permitted to every soul you must admit that it is tithe still this might apply only to one who is not liable to bring an atonement but where a man is liable to an atonement. It might be said that purification is not complete until he has brought the atonement of a reply two scriptural texts are recorded in the case of a woman in childbirth it is written until the days of her purification be fulfilled as soon as her days are fulfilled she is clean and it is also written and the priest shall make atonement for her and she shall be clean how then are the two to be reconciled the former applies to terima the latter to holy food but might not these be reversed. It stands to reason that holy food should be subject to the greater restriction since it is also subject to the restrictions of pickle nut har sacrifice me ilakarath and is also forbidden to an onan on the contrary terima should be subject to the greater restriction since it is also subject to the restrictions of the death penalty the fifth it cannot be redeemed and is also forbidden to the non-priest those are more in number rabba said apart from the fact that those are more in number this could not be maintained for scripture stated and the priest shall make atonement for her and she shall be clean which implies that until that moment she was unclean now were it to be assumed that this text speaks of holy food the text and the flesh that touch it any unclean thing shall not be eaten should apply to it it must therefore be concluded that the text speaks of terima or shishis son of our how could it be said that the law of terima was prescribed in this text surely it was taught from the text speak unto the children of Israel one would only learn that these laws are applicable to the children of Israel whence however is one to infer that they also apply to a proselyte or an emancipated slave scripture consequently stated woman now if it were to be assumed that the text speaks of Terimah or a proselyte
maintaining that the text speaks of Azab who had three attacks of Godarui and of a confirmed leper and that the deduction from until he be clean is until he brings his atonement what need was there for two texts in respect of holy food they are both required for had the all merciful written about the woman after childbirth only the law might have been said to apply to her only because her uncleanness is of long duration but not to Azab and had the all merciful written the law in connection with Azab only it might have been assumed to apply to him only since his uncleanness does not automatically cease but not to a woman after childbirth hence both texts were necessary what was the need for the text it must be put into water and it shall be unclean until the even Arzera replied in respect of touch as it was taught and it shall be unclean might have been taken to refer to all cases hence it was stated then shall it be clean and if only then shall it be clean had been Stated it might have been assumed to refer to all cases hence it was stated and it shall be unclean how then are the two to be reconciled the one refers to second tithe and the other to terima but might not the deduction be reversed it stands to reason that as the eating of terima is more restricted than the eating of tithe so shall the touching of terima be more restricted than the touching of tithe if you prefer I might say that the prohibition against the touching of terima is deduced from the following it was taught she shall touch no hallowed thing is a warning against its consumption perhaps it is not so but against touching it it was stated she shall touch no hallowed thing nor come into the sanctuary the hallowed thing is thus compared to the sanctuary as an offense against the sanctuary involves loss of life so must the offense against the hallowed thing be such as involves loss of life while in respect of touch no loss of life is involved and the reason why eating was expressed by a term denoting touches to indicate that touching and eating are equally forbidden. The priest who is wounded in his stones, etc., who is it that taught a woman subject to a pentateuch ally forbidden cohabitation may eat terima. Our Eliezer replied, This question is the subject of a dispute, and the ruling here is that of our Eliezer and our Simeon are Yohanan said, The ruling here may even be that of our Mahir, the circumstances here being different since the woman has already been eating, and our Eliezer, the argument since she has already been eating, cannot be entertained, for should you not admit this, a daughter of an Israelite who was married to a priest and whose husband subsequently died should also be permitted to eat terima since she has already been eating it, and our Yohanan there, his Kenyan had completely lapsed here, however, his Kenyan did not lapse what is termed a Pezuay, our rabbis taught what is termed a Pezuay, a man, both of whose stones were wounded. Or even only one of them, even though they were only punctured, crushed, or simply defective, said our Ishmael son of our Yohanan B. Barak. I heard from the mouth of the sages at the vineyard at Jabna that one having only one stone is a natural born eunuch and is therefore a fit person. How could it be said that such a person is a natural born eunuch? Say rather, he is like a natural born eunuch and is therefore fit as a man whose stones are punctured, incapable of procreation. Surely a man once climbed up a palm tree, Talmud, Mas Yabbath B, and a thorn pierced his stones. His semen issued like a thread of pus, and despite the accident, he begot children. In that case, as a matter of fact, Samuel sent word to Rab telling him institute inquiries respecting the parentage of his children. Rab Judah stated in the name of Samuel, a man whose stones have been injured by a supernatural agency is regarded as a fit person, said Rabba. This is the reason why the scriptural text reads who is wounded and not. The wounded in a very it was taught it was said in scripture he who is wounded shall not enter and it was also said a bastard shall not enter as the latter is the result of human action so is the former the result of human action Rabba stated wounded applies to all crushed applies to all and cut off applies to all wounded applies to all whether the member of the stones or the spermatic cords of the stones were injured crushed applies to all whether the member of the stones or the spermatic cords were crushed cut off applies to all whether the member of the stones or the spermatic cords were cut off a certain rabbi asked Rabba once is it inferred that the expression Pezui Daka refers to an injury in the privy parts might it not be said to refer to the head the other replied as no number of generations is mentioned it may be inferred that the reference is to the privy parts but is it not possible that the reason why no number of generations is given in this case is because only he himself is forbidden while his son and the son of his son are permitted. This must be similar to the case of him whose member is cut off as the latter involves the privy parts, so must the former involve those parts. And whence is it inferred that the injury of the Garut Shafka himself involves his privy parts? Might it not be one involving his lips? Shafka is written implying at the spot where it discharges, but might it not refer to one's nose? It is not written cut at the organ that discharges, but a cut organ that discharges, thus implying that organ which in consequence of a cut discharges and in the absence of a cut does not discharge but flows out. This excludes the nose which in either case emits a discharge in a barrier. It was taught, it was said in scripture, he who is wounded in his stones shall not enter, and it was also said a bastard shall not enter as the latter refers to the privy parts, so does the former refer to the privy parts in a case where a puncture. Beginning below the corona terminated at the other end of it above the corona our high Abba desired to declare the sufferer as fit said RC to him thus ruled our Joshua Bili by a perforation of any size in the corona constitutes a bar against fitness if however any part of the corona remained etc. Rubina while sitting at his studies raised the following question must the hair's breadth of which they spoke extend over the entire circumference thereof or only over its greater part it hair's breadth said Rabbi Tosfayat Rubina must extend over the greater part of it and towards its upper section Arhuna ruled if it is cut away like a reed pen it constitutes no disqualification if like a gutter it causes disqualification for in the latter case the air penetrates in the former it does not are his dot however ruled if the cut was in the shape of a gutter no disqualification is constituted if it had the shape of a reed pen disqualification is constituted for in the first case Friction may be produced in the latter, it cannot rub said it is reasonable to adopt the view of Arhunah that in the latter case the air penetrates while in the former it does not for in regard to friction it is only like a bung in a cask said Rabbanah Demir Martha said Marzitra in the name of our Papa the law is that no disqualification is constituted whether the corona was cut away like a reed pen or like a gutter he raised however the question whether such a cut must be below the corona or may even be above it it is obvious that it may even be above it for were it to be below the corona the man would be regarded as fit even if the entire member there had been cut off Rabbanah however only desired to test Mirmar such an incident once occurred at Matha Mahasha and Arashi arranged for the corona to be cut into the shape of a reed pen and then declared the man to be fit it once happened at Pumadai that a man had his semen duct blocked and the discharge of the semen made its way. Through the urinal duct our BBB Abbe intended to declare the man fit our poppy however said to him because you are yourselves Talmud, Mas Yabam the frail beings you speak frail words through its proper duct it fertilizes but when not passing through its proper duct it does not fertilize Rab Judah stated in the name of Samuel if it had a small perforation which was closed up the man is deemed to be unfit if the wound reopens when semen is emitted but if it does not reopen the man is regarded as fit in respect of this ruling robber raised the question where if the perforation is below the corona the man should remain fit even if it were cut off it means in the corona itself so it was also stated elsewhere our Mari Bimar said in the name of Marakba in the name of Samuel if a hole that has been made in the corona itself is closed the man is disqualified if it reopens when semen is emitted but if it does not reopen the man is deemed to be fit robber the son of Rabbi sent to our Joseph. Will our master instruct us how to proceed? The other replied, Warm barley bread is procured and placed upon the man's anus there by the flow of semen sets in, and the effect can be observed. Said Abay is everybody like our father Jacob concerning whom it is written by might and the first fruits of my strength because he never before experienced the emission of semen. No said Abay colored garments are dangled before him. Said Rabbah is everybody then like Barzilla the Jalidite. In fact, it is obvious that the original answer is to be maintained. Our rabbis taught if it was punctured, the man is regarded as unfit because the flow is sluggish. If it was closed up, he is deemed to be fit because he is then capable of production. And this is a case where the unfit may return to his former state of fitness. What does the expression this exclude? It excludes a case where a membrane was formed on the lungs in consequence of a wound, since such cannot be regarded as a proper membrane or EDB. Abin sent the following question to Abe How are we to proceed? A grain of barley is to be procured wherewith the spot is lacerated, tallow is rubbed in, and a
His state of holiness and is consequently forbidden, or does he not remain in his state of holiness and is consequently permitted? Arshis hate replied, You have learned this law in the following, and Israelite who is wounded in his stones is permitted to marry a nethin, and now were it to be assumed that he retains his holiness, the text neither shall thou make marriages with them should be applicable here, said Rabbah is a law there due at all to sanctity or non sanctity, it is merely due to the possibility that he might beget a child who would proceed to worship idols, this then is applicable only when they are still idol worshippers, when however they are converted, they are undoubtedly permitted, and it was only the rabbis who placed them under a prohibition as a preventive measure, but such a preventive measure was instituted by the rabbis in respect of those only who are capable of procreation, not in respect of those who are incapable of procreation, now then a bastard also since he is. Capable of procreation should also be forbidden while in fact we have learned bastards and Nathanim may intermarry with one another in fact this is the explanation the rabbis instituted a preventive measure only in the case of the fit but not in that of the unfit subsequently rabbis stated what I said is of no consequence for while they are still idolaters their marriages are invalid only when they are converted are their marriages valid are Joseph raised an objection and Solomon became allied to Pharaoh king of Egypt by marriage and took Pharaoh's daughter he caused her to be converted but surely no proselytes were accepted either in the days of David or in the days of Solomon was there any reason for it but that the motive of the proselytes might be the benefits of the royal table Talmud Mas Yavamath be such a woman obviously was in no need of it but let the inference be drawn from the fact that she was an Egyptian of the first generation and were you to reply that those had Already departed, and these are others. Surely it may be pointed out. It was taught our Judah stated Benjamin, an Egyptian proselyte, was one of my colleagues among the disciples of our Akiva, and he told me, I am an Egyptian of the first generation, and married an Egyptian woman of the first generation. I shall arrange for my son to marry an Egyptian of the second generation in order that my grandson may be enabled to enter into the congregation of Israel. Our papa replied, Are we to take our directions from Solomon? Solomon did not marry at all, for it is written of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go among them, neither shall they come among you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their God. Solomon did cleave unto them in love, the expression, and he become allied in marriage, however, presents a difficulty on account of his excessive love for her. Scripture regards him as if he had become allied by marriage to her, said Rabbanu to Arashi. Surely we learned a man who is wounded in his stones and one whose member virally is cut off are permitted to marry a proselyte or an emancipated slave from which it follows that they are forbidden to marry a nethina. The other replied according to your view read the final clause they are only forbidden to enter into the assembly from which it follows that they are permitted to marry a nethina. but the fact is that no inference may be drawn from this mission a mission an Ammonite and a Moabite are forbidden and their prohibition is forever their women however are permitted at once an Egyptian and an Edomite are forbidden only until the third generation whether they are males or females are Simeon however permits their women forthwith said are Simeon this law might be inferred a minority ad mages if where the males are forbidden for all time the females are permitted forthwith how much more should the females be permitted forthwith where the males are forbidden until the third Generation only they replied if this is in halacha we shall accept it but if it is only an inference an objection can be pointed out he replied not so but in fact it is in halacha that I am reporting tomorrow whence are these laws inferred are Yohanan replied scripture stated and when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistine he said into Abner the captain of the host Abner whose son is this youth and Abner said as thy soul liveth O king I cannot tell but did he not know him surely it is written and he loved him greatly and he became his armor bearer he rather made the inquiry concerning his father but did he not know his father surely it is written and the man was an old man in the days of Saul stricken in years among them and Rab or it might be said Arab stated that this referred to the father of David Jesse who came in with an army and went out with an army it is this that Saul meant whether he descended from Perez or from Zira if he descended from Perez he would be King for a king breaks for himself away and no one can hinder him if however he is descended from Zira he would only be an important man what is the reason why he gave instructions that inquire be made concerning him because it is written and Saul clad David with his apparel being of the same size as his and about Saul it is written from his shoulders and upward he was higher than any of the people Dog the Edomite then said to him instead of inquiring whether he is fit to be king or not inquire rather whether he is permitted to enter the assembly or not what is the reason because he is descended from Ruth the Moabites said Abner to him we learned an Ammonite but not an Ammonite a Moabite but not a Moabite but in that case a bastard would imply but not a female bastard it is written Mamzer which implies anyone objectionable does an Egyptian exclude the Egyptian woman here it is different since the reason for the scriptural text is explicitly stated because they met you not with bread and with water it is customary for a man to meet wayfarers it is not however customary for a woman to meet them the men should have met the men and the women the women he remained silent there upon the king said inquire thou whose son the stripling is elsewhere he calls him youth and here he calls him stripling it is this that he implied you have overlooked in Halachago and inquire at the college on inquiry he was told an Ammonite but not an Ammonite a Moabite but not a Moabite Talmud Masi of Amethyst however Doak submitted to them all those objections and they eventually remained silent he desired to make a public announcement against him presently an incident occurred now Amasa was the son of a man whose name was Ithna the Israelite that went into Abigail the daughter of Nahash but elsewhere it is written Jeter the Ishmaelite this teaches Rabbah explained that he girded on his sword like an Ishmaelite and exclaimed whosoever will not obey the Following Halacha will be stabbed with the sword. I have this tradition from the Beth Din of Samuel the Ramadhide an Ammonite, but not an Ammonite, a Moabite, but not a Moabite. Could he, however, be trusted? Surely Arab stated in the name of Rab whenever a learned man gives directions on a point of law and such a point comes up for a practical decision, he is obeyed if his statement was made before the event, but if it was not so made, he is not obeyed here. The case was different since Samuel and his Beth Din were still living. The difficulty, however, still remains. The following interpretation was given All glorious is the king's daughter within in the West. It was explained. Others quoted in the name of our Isaac scripture said, and they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife, etc.? The question is a matter in dispute between Tanaim and Ammonite, but not an Ammonite, a Moabite, but not a Moabite. So our Judah, our Simeon, however, said, Because they met you not with bread and with water, it is. Customary for a man to meet, etc. Rabbah made the following exposition What was meant by thou hast loosed my bonds? David said to the Holy One, Blessed be he, O Master of the world, two bonds were fastened on me, and you loosed them. Ruth the Moabites and Namathumanites. Rabbah made the following exposition What was meant by the scriptural text? Many things hast thou done, O Lord my God, even thy wondrous works and thy thoughts toward us. It is not written toward me, but toward us. This teaches that. Rehoboam sat on the lap of David when the latter said to him, Those two scriptural verses were said concerning me, and you, Rabbah made the following exposition What was meant by the scriptural text? And said, I lo, I am come with the roll of the book which is prescribed for me. David said, I thought I have come only now, but I did not know that in the roll of the book it was already written about me, for there it is written that are found, and here it is written, I have found David my servant with my holy. Oil have I anointed him, Ola said in the name of our Yohanan, the daughter of an Ammonite proselyte is eligible to marry a priest, said Rabbi Ola Tula, in accordance with whose view is your statement made if in accordance with that of our Judah, he surely had stated that the daughter of a male proselyte is like the daughter of a male halal, and if in accordance with the view of our Jose, your statement is self evident, for surely he had stated even where a male proselyte had married a female proselyte. His daughter is eligible to marry a priest, and were you to reply that this applies to such as are fit to enter the assembly, but not to this man who is not fit to enter the assembly, whence it may he ask, is this distinction inferred? It is inferred from the case of a high priest who married a widow, but it may be objected the marriage between a high priest and a widow is different since his cohabitation constitutes a transgression, and the case of the halal proves it, but it may be. Objected that a halal is different since its formation was in sin, and the case of the high priest proves it, and thus the argument will go round though the aspect of the one is unlike that of the other, and the aspect of the other is unlike that
People was written a virgin who descended from two peoples is also included and you mention only a fundamental proselyte and no other now what is meant by two peoples if it be suggested that it refers to the case of an Ammonite who married an Ammonites and that these are described as of two peoples because the males are forbidden and the females are permitted such a case it may be objected is the same as that of a fundamental proselyte consequently it must refer to an Ammonite who married. The daughter of an Israelite other say he said to him I learned since instead of his people of his people was written a virgin who is descended from two peoples and from a people consisting of two groups of people is included and you mention only a fundamental proselyte and no other according to this latter version however once is it inferred that the daughter of an Egyptian of the second generation is eligible to marry a priest and should you suggest that this might be inferred from the case of an Ammonite who married the daughter of an Israelite it may be objected that the case of the Ammonite who married the daughter of an Israelite is different since the Ammonite females are eligible an Egyptian of the second generation who married an Egyptian woman of the second generation might prove it but it may be objected that the case of an Egyptian of the second generation who married an Egyptian woman of the second generation is different since his cohabitation constitutes no Transgression and Ammonite who married the daughter of an Israelite might prove it and thus the argument would go round etc. said our Joseph this then it is that I heard Rab Judah expounding on his people of his people and I did not at the time understand what he meant when our Samuel B. Judah came he stated thus he recited in his presence an Ammonite woman is eligible her son that is born from an Ammonite is ineligible and her daughter that is born from an Ammonite is eligible this however applies only to an Ammonite and an Ammonite who were converted but her daughter that was born from an Ammonite is ineligible on hearing this the other said to him go recite this outside for your statement that an Ammonite woman is eligible is quite acceptable since Ammonite excludes the Ammonites that her son that is born from an Ammonite is ineligible is also correct since he is in fact an Ammonite in what respect however is her daughter that was born from an Ammonite eligible if in Respect of entering the assembly is there now that her mother is eligible any need to mention her the eligibility must consequently be in respect of marrying a priest but then what of the statement this however applies only to an Ammonite and an Ammonite who were converted but her daughter that was born from an Ammonite is ineligible what is meant by her daughter that was born of an Ammonite if it be suggested that it refers to an Ammonite who married an Ammonite then this is the same case as that of a fundamental proselyte consequently it must refer to an Ammonite who married the daughter of an Israelite concerning this he told him go recite this outside an Egyptian and an Edomite are forbidden only etc what is the objection Rabbi Barhan replied in the name of our Yohanan because it may be said that the case of forbidden relatives proves it since in respect of them the prohibition extends to the third generation only and is nevertheless applicable to both males and Females, but can it not be argued that the case of forbidden relatives is different since in their case the penalty of Karath is involved? The case of the bastard proves it, but can it not be suggested that the case of the bastard is different since he is forever ineligible to enter the congregation? The case of forbidden relatives proves it, thus the argument could go round the aspects of one are unlike those of the other, and the aspects of the other are unlike those of the first there. Common characteristic, however, is that both males and females are equally forbidden, so might one also include the Egyptian man and the Egyptian woman, so that in their case also both males and females should be equally forbidden. This common characteristic, however, it may be retorted, is different since in one respect it also involves Karath and the rabbis, they infer it from the halal who is the offspring of a union between those who through it are guilty of transgressing a positive commandment. And in accordance with the view of our Eliezer B. Jacob, then what is meant by not so it is this that he said to them, as far as I am concerned, I do not accept the view of our Eliezer B. Jacob, but according to you, since your view is that of our Eliezer B. Jacob, my reply is that it is in Halacha that I am reporting it was taught. Our Simeon said to them, I am reporting in Halacha, and moreover, a scriptural text supports my view it having been written sons, but not daughters, our rabbis taught sons, but not daughters. So our Simeon, our Judah, however, said, Behold, it is said in Scripture, the sons of the third generation that are born unto them, Scripture has made them dependent on birth. Our Yohanan said, Had not our Judah declared Scripture made them dependent on birth, he would not have found his hands and feet at the house of study, for as a master said that a congregation of proselytes is also called an assembly Talmud. Masia Bamatha, how could an Egyptian of the second generation ever attain purity but is? Not this possible when he transgressed and did marry one scripture would not have written of a case of one behold the case of the bastard which is one of one and yet scripture did write it it wrote of a one leading to a prohibition it would not have written of a one if it led to permissibility behold the case of the man who remarried his divorced wife which involves a one leading to a permitted act and yet did scripture write of it in that case it was written mainly for the purpose of the original prohibition our rabbis taught if the expression of sons was used why was also that of generations used and if that of generations was used why also that of sons if the expression of sons had been used and not that of generations it might have been assumed that only the first and second son is forbidden but that the third is permitted the expression of generations was therefore used and had the expression of generations only been used and not that of sons it might have been assumed that the precept was given only to those who stood at Mount Sinai the expression of sons was therefore used unto them count from them unto them be guided by the status of the ineligible among them it was necessary for scripture to write unto them and it was also necessary for it to write that are born for had the all merciful written only that are born it might have been presumed that the counting must begin from their children hence did the all merciful write unto them and had the all merciful written only unto them it might have been presumed that where a pregnant Egyptian woman became a proselyte she and her child are regarded as one generation hence did the all merciful write that are born it was furthermore necessary to write unto them in this case and unto him in respect of the bastard for had the all merciful used the expression here only the restriction might have been assumed to apply to this case only because the child descended from a tainted origin but not to a bastard since he is descended from an untainted origin and had the all merciful written the expression in respect of the bastard the restriction might have been presumed to apply to him only because he is for all time unfit to enter into the assembly but not in this case both texts were therefore required Rabbi Barhan is stated in the name of our Yohanan if an Egyptian of the second generation married an Egyptian woman of the first generation her son is regarded as belonging to the third generation from this it is obvious that he is of the opinion that the child is ascribed to him or Joseph raised an objection our Tarfan said bastards may attain to purity how if a bastard married a female slave their child is a slave when however he is emancipated he becomes a free man this clearly proves that the child is ascribed to her there it is different because scripture said the wife and her children shall be her masters Rabbi raised an objection our Judah related Benjamin. Egyptian proselyte was one of my colleagues among the disciples of our Akiba and he once told me I am an Egyptian of the first generation and married an Egyptian wife of the first generation and I shall arrange for my son to marry an Egyptian wife of the second generation in order that my grandson shall be eligible to enter the congregation now if it could be assumed that the child is ascribed to his father he could have married a wife even of the first generation the fact is that our Yohanan said to the Tanarid a woman of the first generation when Ardimi came he stated in the name of our Yohanan if an Egyptian of the second generation married an Egyptian wife of the first generation her son is regarded as belonging to the second generation from this it is obvious that a child is ascribed to his mother said Abbe to him what then of the following statement of our Yohanan if a man set aside a pregnant beast as a sin offering and it then gave birth his atonement may be made if he Desires with the beast itself and if he prefers his atonement may be made with her young this law would be intelligible if you admit that an embryo is not regarded as a part of its mother since this case would be similar to that of one who set aside as a security two sin offerings in respect of which our Ashaya had stated that a man who set aside two sin offerings as a security is to be atoned for with either of them while the other goes to the pasture if you maintain however that an embryo is a part of its mother the former is like the young of a sin offering and the young of a sin offering is sent to die the other remains silent is it not possible the first said to him that there it is different since it is written that our born scripture made it dependent on birth clever man the other replied I saw your chief between the pillars when our Yohanan gave the following traditional ruling the reason here is because it was written that our born elsewhere however the child is ascribed to the father would however of the
cohabited with a Canaanitish woman and begot a son that son may be purchased as a slave it is said moreover of the children of the strangers that do sojourn among you of them may abide as it might have been assumed that even if one of the Canaanites had cohabited with one of the women of the other Gentile nations and begot a son you may buy that son as a slave it was explicitly stated that they have begotten in your land only from those who were begotten in your land but not from those who dwell in your land if they are converted follow the more tainted of the two in what case if it be suggested that it refers to an Egyptian who married an Ammonite how could the expression the more tainted of the two be applicable when scripture explicitly said an Ammonite but not an Ammonite rather the reference is to an Ammonite who married an Egyptian wife if the child of such a marriage is a male he is ascribed to the Ammonite if it is a female she is ascribed to the Egyptian Misha. Bastards and Nephitim are ineligible and their ineligibility is for all time whether they be males or females. Gamara Reshlech said a woman bastard is eligible after ten generations. This is derived from an analogy between tenth and tenth mentioned in respect of the Ammonite and the Moabite. As in the latter case the females are permitted so are they permitted in the former case should you suggest that as in the latter case eligibility begins forth with so it does in the former case it may be. Replied that the analogy can only be effective in respect of the generations after the tenth but surely we learn bastards and Nephitim are ineligible and their ineligibility is for all time whether they be males or females. This is no difficulty one statement is in agreement with him who holds that a deduction is carried through in all respects while the other is in agreement with him who maintains that a deduction is restricted by its original basis. Our Eliza was asked what is illegal. Position of a female bastard after ten generations were anyone to present to me he replied a third generation I would declare it pure he is obviously of the opinion that the stock of a bastard does not survive so also did Arhuna state a bastard stock does not survive did we not learn however bastards are ineligible and their ineligibility is for all time our zero replied it was explained to me by Rab Judah that those who are known survive those who are not known do not survive and those who are partly known and partly unknown survive for three generations but no longer a certain man once lived in the neighborhood of RMI and the latter made a public announcement that he was a bastard as the other was bewailing the action the master said to him I have given you life our Hannah be at a stated David issued the decree of prohibition against the Nathanim for it is said and the king called the Gibeonites and said unto them now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel etc why did he issue the decree against them because it is written and there was a famine in the days of David three years year after year in the first year he said to them it is possible that there are idolaters among you for it is written and serve other gods and worship them and he will shut up the heaven so that there shall be no rain etc they instituted inquiries but could not discover any idolaters in the second year he said to them there may be transgressors among you for it is written therefore the showers have been withheld and there hath been no latter rain yet thou hadst the harlots for it etc inquiries were made but none was found in the third year he said to them there might be among you men who announced specified sums for charity in public but do not give them as it is written as vapors and wind without rain so is he that posteth himself of a false gift inquiries were made and none was found the matter he concluded depends entirely upon me immediately he sought it Face of the Lord, what does this mean? Reshlakish explained he inquired of the Urim and Tummim, how is this inferred? Our Eliezer replied, it is arrived at by an analogy between two occurrences of the expression of countenance of for here it is written, and David sought the countenance of the Lord, and elsewhere it is written, who shall inquire for him by the judgment of the Urim before the countenance of the Lord, and the Lord said it is for Saul and his bloody house because he put to death the Gibeonites for Saul because he was not mourned for in a proper manner, and his bloody house because he put to death the Gibeonites, where however do we find that Saul put to death the Gibeonites? The truth is that as he killed the inhabitants of Nob, the city of the priests who were supplying them with water and food, scripture regards it as if he himself had killed them, just as is demanded for Saul because he was not properly mourned for, and just as is demanded because he put to death it. Gibeonites, yes, for Reshlech stated what is meant by the scriptural text, seek the Lord, all ye humble of the earth that have executed his ordinance, where there is his ordinance, there are also his executions, David said, as to Saul, there have already elapsed Talmud, Mas Yavam, the twelve months of the first year, and it would be unusual to arrange for his mourning now as to the Nathanim, however, let them be summoned, and we shall pacify them immediately, the king called the Gibeonites, and said unto them, what shall I do for you, and wherewith should I make atonement, that ye may bless the inheritance of the Lord, and the Gibeonites said to him, it is no matter of silver or gold between us and Saul or his house, neither is it for us to put any man, etc., let seven men of his sons be delivered unto us, and we will hang them up unto the Lord, etc., he tried to pacify them, but they would not be pacified, thereupon he said to them, this nation is distinguished by three characteristics. They are merciful, bashful, and benevolent, merciful, for it is written, and shew thee mercy, and have compassion upon thee, and multiply thee, bashful, for it is written, that his fear may be before you, benevolent, for it is written, that he may command his children and his household, etc. Only he who cultivates these three characteristics is fit to join this nation. But the king took the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Ea, whom she bore into Saul, Armoni, and Mephibosheth, and the five sons of Michael, the daughter of Saul, whom she bore to Adriel, the son of Barzilla, the Meholadite, why just these are whom I replied, they were made to pass before the holy ark, he whom the ark retained was condemned to death, and he whom the ark did not retain was saved alive. Our Hannah B. Katna raised an objection, but the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, he did not allow him to pass, was their favoritism, and in fact he did let him pass, and it retained him, but he invoked on his behalf. Divine mercy and it released him, but here too favoritism is involved. The fact, however, is that he invoked divine mercy that the ark should not retain him, but surely it is written, The fathers shall not be put to death for the children, etc. Our high Abba replied in the name of our Yohanan, It is better that a letter be rooted out of the Torah than that the divine name shall be publicly profaned. And Rizba the daughter of Ea took sackcloth and spread it for her upon the rock from the beginning of harvest until water was poured upon them from heaven, and she suffered neither the birds of the air to rest on them by day nor the beast of the field by night. But surely it is written, His body shall not remain all night upon the tree. Our Yohanan replied in the name of our Simeon B. Jehoshadak, It is proper that a letter be rooted out of the Torah so that thereby the heavenly name shall be publicly hallowed for passers by were inquiring what kind of men are these, these are royal princes and what have. They done they laid their hands upon unattached strangers then they exclaimed there is no nation in existence which one ought to join as much as this one if the punishment of royal princes was so great how much more that of common people and if such was the justice done for unattached proselytes how much more so for Israelites a hundred and fifty thousand men immediately joined Israel as it is said and Solomon had threescore and ten thousand that were burdens and fourscore thousand that were hewers in the mountain might not these have been Israelites this cannot be assumed for it is written but of the children of Israel did Solomon make no bond servants but that might have represented mere public service the deduction however is made from the following and Solomon numbered all the strangers that were in the land of Israel etc and they were found a hundred and fifty thousand etc and he said threescore and ten thousand of them to bear burdens and fourscore thousand to be Hewers in the mountains was it David, however, who issued the decree of prohibition against the Nathanim. Moses surely issued that decree, for it is written from the hewer of thy wood to the drawer of thy water. Moses issued a decree against that generation only, while David issued a decree against all generations. But Joshua, in fact, issued the decree against them, for it is written, and Joshua made them that day hewers of wood and drawers of water for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord. Joshua made his decree for the period during which the sanctuary was in existence, while David made his decree for the time during which the sanctuary was not in existence. Talmud, Mas Yabam, in the days of Rabbi, there was a desire to permit the Nathanim, said Rabbi, to them we could very well surrender our portion, who could surrender the portion of the altar. He is thus in disagreement with our high Abba, for our high Abba stated in the name of our Yohanan, the portion of the congregation is. Forbidden forever, and the portion of the altar is forbidden only when the sanctuary is in existence. But when the sanctuary is not in existence, it is permitted. Mishnah, Joshua stated, I have heard that Asari submits to Eliza, and that Eli
Is sheer prostitution similarly where brothers submitted to Eliza from a woman incapable of procreation they do not thereby cause her to be disqualified if however they cohabited with her they cause her to be disqualified since cohabitation with her is an act of prostitution Gamara observed our Akiba was heard to state that those who are subject to the penalty of negative precepts are on a PAR with those who are subject to the penalties of Kareth but those who are subject to the penalty of Kareth are not eligible for Eliza or Levi right marriage RMI replied what we are dealing with here is with a case for instance where his brother had married a proselyte and our Akiba is of the same opinion as our Jose who stated that an assembly of proselytes is not regarded as an assembly if so he should also be permitted to contract Levi right marriage the law is so indeed only because our Joshua used the expression submits to Eliza here Akiba also used the expression submits to Elizabeth. May also be proved by inference for it was stated our Joshua B. But there testified concerning Ben Megazeth who was a man made Saris living in Jerusalem that his wife was allowed to be married by the lover thus confirming the opinion of our Akiba. This proves that Rab raised an objection he who was wounded in the stones or has his privy member cut off a man made Saris and an old man may either participate in Eliza or contract Levi right marriage how if these died and were survived by wives and brothers. And those brothers addressed a mamar to the wives or gave them letters of divorce or participated with them in Eliza their actions are legally valid if they cohabited with them the widows become their lawful wives if the brothers died and they addressed a mamar to their wives or gave them divorce or participated with them in Eliza their actions are valid and if they cohabited with them the widows become their lawful wives but they may not retain them because it is said in scripture he that is wounded in the stones or hath his privy member cut off shall not enter into the assembly of the Lord. This clearly proves that we are dealing with members of the assembly. The fact is said rather that this is a case where the widow became subject to him first and he was subsequently maimed said Abbe to him let the prohibition against the maimed man override the positive precept of the Levi right marriage. Did we not learn of a similar case? Our Gamaliel said if she made a declaration of refusal well and good and if not let the elder sister wait until the minor grows up and she will then be exempt as his wife's sister. Thus it follows that the prohibition against the wife's sister has the force of overriding that of the Levi right marriage here also then let the prohibition against the maimed man have the force of overriding it. But said our Joseph this tanner represents the view of the tanner of the school of our Akiba who maintains that the issue of a union which is subject to the Penalty of negative precepts owing to consanguinity is regarded as a bastard but the issue of a union that is merely subject to the penalty of negative precepts is not a bastard the text to raise up unto his brother a name should be applicable to this case also but he surely is incapable of raising it robber replied if so there exists no woman who is eligible for the Levi right marriage whose husband was not a Saris by nature for a short time at least prior to his death against our Eliza however. Robber's reply presents a valid objection there it is only a general state of debility that had set in what are we to understand by a Saris by nature our Isaac B. Joseph replied in the name of our Yohan and any man Talmud, Mas Yabamatha who has not experienced a moment of life in a state of fitness how could this be ascertained Abbe replied by observing whether when he urinates no arch is formed what are the causes that the child's mother baked at noon and drank strong beer our Joseph said it. Must have been such a Saris of whom I heard am I saying he who was afflicted from birth and I did not know at the time to whom he was referring but should we not take into consideration the possibility that he might have recovered in the meantime since he suffered from affliction in his early as well as in his later life no possible interval of recovery need be taken into consideration Armari raised an objection Arhanna B. Antigono stated it is to be examined three times in 80 days. Precautions are to be taken in respect of one limb in respect of the entire body no such precautions need be taken our Eliza said not so etc. A contradiction may be pointed out if at the age of 20 he did not produce two hairs they must bring evidence that he is 20 years of age and he being confirmed as a Saris neither submits to Eliza nor performs the Levi right marriage if the woman at the age of 20 did not produce two hairs they must bring evidence that she is 20 years of age. And she being confirmed as a woman who is incapable of procreation neither performs Eliza nor is taken in Levi right marriage so Beth Hillel but Beth Shammai maintained that with the one as well as with the other this takes place at the age of 18 our Eliza said in the case of the male the law is in accordance with Beth Hillel and in the case of the female the law is in accordance with Beth Shammai because a woman matures earlier than a man Rami B. Dickley replied in the name of Samuel R. Eliza changed his view the question was raised from which statement did he withdraw come and hear what was taught our Eliza said a congenital sorry submits to Eliza and Eliza is arranged for his wife because cases of such a nature are cured in Alexandria and Egypt our Eliza said as a matter of fact he did not change his view at all but that statement was taught in respect of the age of punishment it was stated if a person between the age of 12 years and one day and that of 18. Years eight forbidden fat and after the marks of a Saris had appeared he grew two hairs Rab ruled that the person is deemed to be a Saris retrospectively but Samuel ruled that the person is regarded as having been a minor at that time our Joseph demurred against Rab according to our Mayor a woman who is incapable of procreation should be entitled to a fine of a reply she passes from her minority directly into adolescence the other said to him may all such fine sayings be reported in my name. For so it was taught a Saris is not tried as a stubborn and rebellious son because no stubborn and rebellious son is tried unless he bears the mark of the pubic hair nor is a woman who is incapable of procreation tried as a betrothed damsel because from her minority she passes directly into adolescence our above stated on the basis of the marks of a Saris of a woman incapable of procreation and of an eight dash month child no decision is made until they attain the age of twenty is however an 8-month child Bible surely it was taught an 8-month child is like a stone and it is forbidden to move him only his mother may bend over him and nurse him Talmud, Mas Yabamath in order to avert danger here we are dealing with one whose marks have not been developed for it was taught who is an 8-month child he whose months of conception have not been completed Rabbi said the marks his hair and nails which were not developed would indicate it the reason then is because they were not developed but had they been developed it would have been assumed that the child was a 7-month one only his birth was somewhat delayed with reference however to the practical decision which Rabbi Tosfah gave in the case of a woman whose husband had gone to a country beyond the sea and remained there for a full year of 12 months where he declared the child legitimate in accordance with whose view did he act was it in accordance with that of Rabbi who maintains that birth May be delayed since our Simeon B. Gamaliel also maintains that birth may be delayed he acted in agreement with the majority for it was taught our Simeon B. Gamaliel said any human child that lingers for 30 days cannot be regarded as a miscarriage our rabbis taught who is a congenital saris any person who is 20 years of age and has not produced two pubic hairs and even if he produced them afterwards he is deemed to be a saris in all respects and these are his characteristics he has no beard. His hair is lank and his skin is smooth our Simeon B. Gamaliel said in the name of our Judah B. Jair any person whose urine produces no froth some say he who urinates without forming an arch some say he whose semen is watery and some say he whose urine does not ferment others say he whose body does not steam after bathing in the winter season our Simeon B. Eliezer said he whose voice is abnormal so that one cannot distinguish whether it is that of a man or of a woman what woman is deemed to be incapable. A procreation any woman who is 20 years of age and has not produced two pubic hairs and even if she produces them afterwards she is deemed to be a woman incapable of procreation in all respects and these are her characteristics she has no breasts and suffers pain during copulation our Simeon B. Gamaliel said one who has no mons venerous like other women our Simeon B. Eliezer said one whose voice is deep so that one cannot distinguish whether it is that of a man or of a woman it was stated as to. The characteristics of a Saris are who not stated impotency cannot be established unless they are all present are Yohanan however stated even if only one of them is present where two hairs were produced all agree that impotency cannot be established unless all characteristics are displayed they only differ in the case where these were not produced with reference however to what Rabbi Abu'a said to the rabbis examine Arnaman and if his body steams I will allow him to marry my daughter in. Accordance with whose view was he acting was it according to Arhunano Arnaman had some stray
With her they would not in accordance with whose view is this statement made not in accordance with that of Arjuna for should it be suggested that it is in agreement with Arjuna he surely it might be objected stated that a woman incapable of procreation is regarded as a harlot mission if a priest who was a Saris by nature married the daughter of an Israelite he confers upon her the right of eating Terah Mahar Hosea and Arsimian stated if a priest who was an hermaphrodite married the daughter of an Israelite he confers upon her the right to eat Terah Mahar Judah stated if a tumtum -tum was operated upon and he was found to be a male he must not participate in Elizabeth because he has the same status as a Saris the hermaphrodite may marry a wife but may not be married by a man or Eliza stated for copulation within hermaphrodite the penalty of stoning is incurred as if he were a male Gamara is not this obvious it might have been assumed that only one who is capable of Propagation is entitled to bestow the right of eating, and that he who is not capable of propagating is not entitled to bestow the right of eating. Hence, we were taught that even the Saris may bestow the right. Our Jose and our Simeon stated, Hermaphrodite Rush Lakish said he confers upon her the right of eating Terima, but does not confer upon her the right to eat of the breast and the shoulder. Our Yohanan, however, said he also confers upon her the right to eat of the breast and shoulder. According to Rush Lakish, why is the breast and the shoulder different? Obviously, because it was Pentateuch Ali ordained, was not Terima, however, also Pentateuch Ali ordained. We are dealing here with Terima at the present time, which is only a rabbinical ordinance. What is the law, however, when the sanctuary is in existence? Obviously, that Terima may not be eaten. Why then did he state, but does not confer the right of eating the breast and the shoulder? He should rather have drawn it. Distinction in respect of the Terima itself, thus this applies only to rabbinical Terima, but not to Terima that has been Pentateuch Ali ordained. It is this in fact that he meant when he confers upon her the right of eating, he enables her to eat Terima at the present time only when it is a rabbinical ordinance. He is not entitled, however, to confer upon her the right of eating Terima at the time when the law of the breast and the shoulder is in force, even if the Terima is only rabbinical for. She might in consequence also come to eat a Pentateuchal Terima. Our Yohanan, however, said he also confers upon her the right to eat of the breast and the shoulder. Said Our Yohanan to Rush Lakish, do you maintain that Terima at the present time is only a rabbinical ordinance? Yes, the other replied, for I read a cake of figs among cakes of figs is neutralized, but I said the first read a piece among pieces is neutralized. You obviously believe that the reading is whatsoever one is want to count. Pay. Reading in fact is that which one is want to count what mission is it that wherein we learned if a man had bundles of fenugreek of kilayim of the vineyard they must be burned if these were mixed up with others Talmud, Masi of Amathbi they must all be burned so Armeir the sages however stated they are neutralized in a mixture of 201 Armeir in his ruling is of the opinion that whatever might be counted causes forfeiture while the sages are of the opinion that only six things cause forfeiture are Akiba said seven they are the following cracknuts of pomegranates of batten seal jugs of wine young shoots of beet cabbage roots and the Grecian court are Akiba adds also homemade bread those which are subject to the law of Orla impart the prohibition of Orla and those which are subject to the law of kilayim of the vineyard impart that of the kilayim of the vineyard are Yohanan holds a view that the reading was that which one is want to count while Resh. Lakish holds a view that the reading was whatsoever one is want to count what is the very about the piece it was taught a piece of levitically unclean sin offering that was mixed up with a hundred pieces of clean sin offerings and similarly a piece of levitically unclean shoe bread that was mixed up with a hundred pieces of clean shoe bread is neutralized our Judah said it is not neutralized if however a piece of levitically clean sin offering was mixed up with a hundred pieces of clean and unconsecrated meat and similarly if a piece of levitically clean shoe bread was mixed up with a hundred pieces of clean unconsecrated bread all agree that neutralization cannot take place now in the first clause at any rate it was stated that it is neutralized our highest son of Arhuna replied in the case where it was crushed if so what is our Judah's reason Talmud Masya Bamathe our Judah follows his own view for he stated the law of neutralization takes no effect in homogeneous objects had the piece not been crushed, however, what would have been the law, assumingly that it could not be neutralized? Why then was it taught if, however, a piece of a levitically clean sin offering was mixed up with a hundred pieces of clean and unconsecrated meat? Neutralization cannot take place. Let the distinction be drawn in the case of consecrated meat itself. Thus, this applies only where it was crushed, but when it was not crushed, it may not be neutralized. He preferred to speak of a mixture of clean with clean, according to Rush Lakish, wherein lies the difference between the first clause and the final clause. Arshish, the son of Aridi, replied, The first clause deals with uncleanness that was due to liquids, which is only rabbinical, while the final clause deals with a prohibition, which is pentacle. What, however, would be the law in the case of uncleanness through a reptile, assumingly that no neutralization is permitted? Why then did he state in the final clause, if, however, a piece of levitically clean sin offering was mixed up with a hundred pieces of clean and unconsecrated meat. Neutralization cannot take place. Let the distinction rather be drawn in respect of consecrated meat itself. Thus, this applies only to uncleanness due to liquids, but when it is due to a reptile, it may not be neutralized. He preferred to speak of a mixture of clean with clean. Rabbi replied, The first clause deals with a prohibition under a negative precept, while the final clause deals with one that involves a penalty of Karath. But surely was it not Rabbi who stated that in all pentateuchal prohibitions there is no difference between a prohibition that is due to a negative precept and one that involves Karath? This is a difficulty. Our Ashi replied, The law in the final clause is due to the fact that the consecrated food is an object which may be made permissible, and any object which in certain circumstances becomes permitted cannot be neutralized even in a Thousand the statement of Arashi, however, is mere fiction for to whom would the mixture become permitted to the priest? It is permitted all the time to the Israelite. It is forever forbidden. The statement of Arashi must consequently be regarded as mere fiction. But is Aryohanan of the opinion that Terima at the present time is Pentateuchal? Surely it was taught if in front of two baskets, one of which contained unconsecrated fruit and the other that of Terima were two Sea measures, one containing unconsecrated fruit and the other that of Terima and the latter fell into the former. Behold, these are permitted for it is assumed that the Terima fell into the Terima and the unconsecrated fruit fell into the unconsecrated fruit. And in reference to this ruling, Reshlakish stated only if the unconsecrated fruit was more than that of the Terima, while Aryohanan stated even if the unconsecrated fruit were no more than the Terima. Now, according to Reshlakish, the ruling may well be. Justified since he may hold the opinion that with rabbinically forbidden food also it is necessary to have a larger quantity of the permitted food according to our Yohanan however a difficulty arises this our Yohanan may reply is the view of the rabbis Talmud, Masya Bamathbi while I maintain the view of our Jose for it was taught in Seder Olam which thy fathers possessed and thou shalt possess it they had a first and a second possession but they had no third one and our Yohanan stated who is the author of Seder Olam our Jose but is our Yohanan of the opinion that in respect of a rabbinically forbidden object no excess is required surely we learned a ritual bath containing exactly 40 SEO of water to which one SEO was added and from which one SEO was taken off is deemed to be ritually fit and our Judah Bishila stated in the name of RC in the name of our Yohanan as much as its greater part does not this mean that the greater part must remain no that the greater part must not be removed and if you prefer I might say here it is different since it may be said for it is assumed we learned the hermaphrodite may marry a wife read if he married but surely it was stated may marry and even in accordance with your view what is the meaning of but may not be married by a man consequently it must be granted that as may be married implies an act that had already been performed so also may marry implies an act that had already been performed it may still be urged no may marry implies that the act is permissible but may not be married implies not even if the act had already been performed but surely since it was taught in the final clause our Eliza stated for copulation within hermaphrodite the penalty of stoning is incurred as if he were a male it is to be inferred that the first tano was doubtful on the point the law was clear to the one master as well as to the other master the only difference between them was the question of stoning for copulation through either of his two organs one master was of the opinion that the penalty of stoning is incurred by copulation
Or grafted the tree must be uprooted. Our Judah said any grafting which takes no root within three days will never take root. Our Jose and our Simeon stated within two weeks, and in reference to this, our Naman stated in the name of Rabbi Abba that according to him who stated thirty days, thirty and thirty are required, according to him who stated three days, three and thirty are required, and according to him who stated two weeks, two weeks and thirty days are required, and Samuel stated in respect of protracted labor and forfeiture, protracted labor as we learned how long does a period of protracted labor continue. Our Meir said forty or fifty days, our Judah said her ninth month is sufficient. Our Jose and our Simeon said protracted labor cannot extend beyond two weeks forfeiture as we have learned if one causes his vine to overhang above the crops of his neighbor, behold he causes thereby their forfeiture and he is liable to make compensation. So our Meir, our Jose and our Simeon said Talmud, Moss. Yabamit be no man can impose a prohibition upon that which is not as the question was raised. What would Samuel have said with regard to the hermaphrodite? Come and hear what Samuel said to our Ain and the berry that cannot be maintained in the face of our mission. What would Samuel have said in respect of grafting? Come and hear what Samuel said to our Ain and teach in accordance with the view of him who stated three and thirty. What is the opinion of Rab in respect of protracted labor? This is undecided. What is Rab's opinion in respect of forfeiture? Our Joseph replied, Come and hear what Arhuna stated in the name of Rab the Halachad is not in agreement with our Jose said Abay to him. What reason do you see for relying upon this statement? Rely rather on that which our Adamate in the name of Rab the Halachad is in agreement with our Jose who is it that is referred to by the phrase at the school of Rab it was stated Arhuna, of course, and Arhuna it was who stated that the Halachad is not in agreement. With our Jose, our Judah stated a tumtum, etc. Our Am I remarked what would our Judah have done with a case like that of a tumtum of Barry who after having been placed upon the operating table and operated upon begot seven children and our Judah he could tell you an inquiry should be made as to the origin of his children. It was taught our Jose son of our Judah stated that a tumtum must not participate in Halizah since it is possible that on being operated upon he may be found to be a congenital sorry is. Everyone then who is operated upon a male it is this that he meant it is possible that on being operated upon he may be found to be a female and were he found to be a male it is even then possible that he might be found to be a congenital sorry what is the practical difference between them Robert replied the practical difference between them is the question of disqualification where other brothers are in existence and that of Halizah where no other brothers exist our Samuel son of our Judah said in. The name of our Abba, the brother of our Judah, Bizab, the in the name of Rab Judah, in the name of Rab, in respect of the Hermaphrodite, the penalty of stoning is incurred through either of his organs. An objection was raised. Our Eliezer stated, in respect of the Hermaphrodite, the penalty of stoning is incurred, as in the case of a male. This, however, applies only to his male organ, but in respect of his female organ, no penalty is incurred. He holds the same opinion as the following Tanifor. It was taught our Semi stated that in respect of the Hermaphrodite, the penalty of stoning is incurred through either of his organs. What is our Semi's reason? Robert replied, Barhamjuri has explained it to me as follows, and thou shalt not lie with a male as well as with womankind. What male is it that is capable of two manners of lying? Obviously, the Hermaphrodite and the Rabbis, though he is capable of two manners of lying, it is nevertheless written in scripture with a male, whence, however, do the Rabbis derive it? Law concerning an ordinary male from and whence the prohibition in respect of unnatural intercourse with a woman from woman are by stated in the name of Arhistad it is not in all respects that our Eliezer maintains that the hermaphrodite is a proper male since were you to say so such an animal would be fit for consecration and whence is it derived that it may not be consecrated from what the rabbis taught a bird that was covered set aside for idolatrous purposes or worship that was the hire of a harlot or the price of a dog a tumtum or hermaphrodite causes the defilement of one's clothes by contact with one's esophagus our Eliezer said a bird that was a tumtum or hermaphrodite does not impart the defilement of clothes through contact with one's esophagus for our Eliezer maintained that wherever male and female were mentioned the tumtum and hermaphrodite are to be excluded but in the case of the sacrifice of a bird since in respect of it no mention was made of male or Female the tumtum and hermaphrodite are not to be excluded. Our nom and B. Isaac said we also learned a similar very our Eliezer stated Talmud, Mas a hybrid tearful one that was extracted through the abdominal wall. The tumtum and the hermaphrodite can neither become sacred nor can they impart sanctity to others. Is and Samuel explained they neither become sacred by means of exchange nor do they impart sanctity to any other beast by causing it to become an exchange. This proves what has been said. Our Eliezer stated the penalty of stoning is incurred as if he were a male. It was taught Rabbi related when I went to learn Torah at the school of our Eliezer B. Shamuay, his disciples combined against me like the cocks of Beth Bukha and did not let me learn more than a single thing in our mission. Our Eliezer stated for copulation within hermaphrodite the penalty of stoning is incurred as if he were a male. Chapterix mission some women are permitted to there. Husbands and forbidden to their lovers, others are permitted to their lovers and forbidden to their husbands, others are permitted to both the former and the latter, while others are forbidden to the former as well as to the latter. In the following cases, the women are permitted to their husbands and forbidden to their lovers. If a common priest who married a widow had a brother, a high priest, if a halal who married a woman of legitimate status had a brother of legitimate status, if an Israelite who married the daughter of an Israelite had a brother, a bastard, or if a bastard who married a bastard had a brother, an Israelite. In all these cases, the women are permitted to their husbands and forbidden to their lovers. The following are permitted to their lovers and forbidden to their husbands. If a high priest who betrothed a widow had a brother, a common priest, if one of legitimate status who married a halal had a brother, a halal, if an Israelite who married a bastard had a brother, a bastard. Or if a bastard who married the daughter of an Israelite had a brother an Israelite in all these cases the women are permitted to their lovers and forbidden to their husbands the following are forbidden to both the former and the latter if a high priest who married a widow had a brother a high priest or if a common priest of legitimate status who married a halal had a brother of legitimate status or if an Israelite who married a bastard had a brother an Israelite or if a bastard who married the daughter of an Israelite had a brother a bastard in all these cases the women are forbidden both to the former and the latter all other women are permitted to both their husbands and their lovers in respect of relatives of the second grade who are forbidden by the ordinances of the scribes a woman who is within the second grade of kinship to the husband but not within the second grade of kinship to the lover is forbidden to the husband and permitted to the lover a woman who is within the second grade of kinship to the lover but not within the second grade of kinship to the husband is forbidden to the lover and permitted to the husband while one who is within the second grade of kinship to the one and to the other is forbidden to the one as well as to the other she cannot claim either ketubah or usufruct or alimony or her worn clothes should a child be born he is eligible for the priesthood but the husband must be compelled to divorce her a widow however who was married to a high priest a divorcee or halyza who was married to a common priest a bastard or a nethina who was married to an Israelite or the daughter of an Israelite who was married to a nathan or a bastard is entitled to her ketubah gemara what was the point in teaching married he could have taught betrothed and were you to reply that the reason for the prohibition is only because he married since in that case a positive as well as a negative precept is involved but where betrothal only took place the positive precept does override the negative but it could be retorted the whole of our section deals with the positive versus a negative precept and the positive nevertheless does not override the negative as it was desired to state in the final clause a high priest who married a widow who is forbidden only where the high priest married her since in that case he caused her to be a halala but not where he only betrothed her in which case she is permitted to his brother he taught in the first clause also married but why should the expression be determined by the final clause let it be determined by the middle clause if a high priest who betrothed a widow had a brother a common priest the determining factor rather is the case immediately following in the same context as it was desired to teach of a halal who married a woman of legitimate status where the reason for her prohibition is because the halal married her and thus caused her to become a Halala, but where he had only betrothed her, she would have been permitted to him. Married was therefore taught here. Also, what point, however, was
permitted to their lovers and forbidden to their husbands. Proslide women are permitted to the one as well as to the other, and women who are incapable of procreation are forbidden to the one as well as the other. He taught some cases and omitted others. What else did he omit that he should have omitted this? Also, he omitted the case of the man wounded in the stones. If this is all that can be pointed out, the case of the man wounded in the stones cannot be regarded as an instance of an omission. Since those that are subject to the penalty of negative precepts were already mentioned, were not several specific cases mentioned of those that are subject to the penalty of negative precepts. Surely it was stated if a common priest married a widow and then again if a halal married a woman of legitimate status, that case was required for the specific purpose of informing us that the law is in agreement with the ruling Rab Judah reported in the name of Rab for Rab Judah reported in the name of Rab women of legitimate priestly status were not forbidden to be married to men of tainted birth, but surely he taught regarding a halal who married a woman of legitimate status and then again regarding an Israelite who married the daughter of an Israelite and he had a brother of bastard. This also is not a repetition of what was already taught since thereby he taught us first regarding a negative precept which is not applicable to all and then he taught us regarding a negative. Precept which is applicable to all, but did he not teach if an Israelite who married a bastard had a brother an Israelite? Consequently, it must be concluded that he taught some cases while others he omitted. This proves it reverting to the main text. Rab Judah reported in the name of Rab women of legitimate priestly status were not forbidden to be married to men of tainted birth. Might it be suggested that the following provides support for his view? It was stated of Allah who married a woman of legitimate status. Does not this refer to a priestess who was fitting unto him and is not the meaning of legitimate status eligible for priesthood? No, it might refer to the daughter of an Israelite and legitimate status means eligible for the assembly. If so, had a brother of legitimate status would also mean eligible for the assembly from which it would follow that he himself is ineligible for the assembly. Consequently, it must refer to a priest, and since he is a priest, she also must be a Priestess, what an argument each phrase may bear its own peculiar interpretation. Rabin B. Naman raised an objection. They shall not take, they shall not take teaches that the prohibition was addressed to the woman through the man. Rob replied, This is the meaning where the prohibition is applicable to him, it is also applicable to her, but where it is not applicable to him, it is also inapplicable to her. Is this, however, deduced from this text? Surely it was deduced from a text which Rab Judah expounded in the name of Rab, for Rab Judah stated in the name of Rab, and so it was taught at the school of Arishmael when a man or woman shall commit any sin that men commit. Scripture compared the woman to the man in respect of all the punishments in the Torah. If deduction had been made from that text, it might have been assumed to apply only to a prohibition that is equally applicable to all, but not to a prohibition that is not equally applicable to all. Talmud, Masya Bamatha, behold. However, the prohibition against defilement, which is a prohibition that is not equally applicable to all, and yet the sole reason why it is inapplicable to women is because the all merciful wrote the sons of Aaron and not the daughters of Aaron. Had however no such text been available, it would have been assumed that women also come under the same obligation. What is the reason? Obviously, because of the deduction Rab Judah reported in the name of Rab. No, this might have been deduced from they shall not take others. Say the prohibition in regard to marrying had to be specified, since it might have been assumed that it should be inferred from that relating to defilement. Therefore, he taught us that women are subject to the same prohibition as men are Papa and Arhuna, son of Arjashu, once happened to be at Hinsabu, the town of Aredi Abin. When the following question was asked of them, were women of legitimate priestly status forbidden to be married to men of tainted birth or not? Are Papa replied, You have learned it in the following ten different genealogical classes went up from Babylon priests, Levites, Israelites, Halal, and Proselytes, emancipated slaves, bastards, Nathanim, Shedeki, and Asufi priests, Levites, and Israelites may intermarry with one another, Levites, Israelites, Halal, and Proselytes, and emancipated slaves may intermarry with one another, Proselytes, emancipated slaves, bastards, Nathanim, Shedeki, and Asufi are permitted to intermarry with one another, the daughters of priests, however, may be married to a Halal was not mentioned, said Arhuna, son of Arjashua, to him only cases where the women may marry the men and the men may marry the women were enumerated, the case of the priest, however, was not mentioned because a Halal should he even desire to marry one is forbidden to him when they came before Aredi Bab and he said to the most school children, thus said Rab Judah in the name of Rab women of legitimate priestly status were not forbidden to be married to men. Of illegitimate status in respect of relatives of the second grade who are forbidden by the ordinances of the scribes, etc. The men of very inquired of our hate is a woman who is of the second grade of kinship to her husband, but not to her lover, entitled to claim her ketubah from the lover, or not do we say that since a master said that her ketubah is a charge on the estate of her first husband, she has no claim upon the lover, or possibly since the rabbis have ordained that wherever she is unable to obtain it from her first husband, she may collect it from the second, she is entitled to claim it from the lover. Our she's hate replied, You have learned this her ketubah is a charge upon the estate of her first husband, but if she was a relative of the second grade of kinship to her husband, she receives nothing even from the lover. Does the expression, however, imply that some widows do receive their ketubah from the lover? There is a lacuna, and thus it is the correct reading. Her ketubah is a charge upon the estate of her first husband, and if she obtains nothing from the first, the rabbis have ordained that she is to receive it from the second. But if she was a relative of the second grade of kinship to her husband, she receives nothing even from the lover. Our Eliezer inquired of our Yohanan is a widow who was married to a high priest or a divorcee or a Haliza who was married to a common priest entitled to maintenance or not. How is this question to be understood if it is a case where she still lives with him, which she, when it is his duty to divorce her, be entitled to receive maintenance? This question was necessary in the case where he went to a country beyond the sea and she borrowed money wherewith to maintain herself, it being desired to ascertain whether, owing to the fact that maintenance among the conditions of the ketubah, she is entitled to maintenance just as she is entitled to the ketubah, or is she entitled to the ketubah only because she Receives it and goes, but not to maintenance, which might induce her to remain with him. The other replied, She is not entitled to maintenance, but surely it was taught she is entitled to maintenance that was taught in respect of alimony after her husband's death. Another reading he said to him, It was taught she is entitled to maintenance. Surely the other asked it is his duty to divorce her, but then the first retorted, It was taught she is entitled to maintenance that the other replied, Was taught in respect of alimony after his death. Our rabbis taught a widow who was married to a high priest or a divorcee or haliza who was married to a common priest is entitled to her ketubah, use of alimony and worn clothes, but she becomes thereby unfit and her child is unfit and the husband is compelled to divorce her relatives of the second grade of kinship who are forbidden by the ordinances of scribes are entitled neither to ketubah nor to use of nor to alimony nor to Worn clothes, the woman remains fit and her child is fit, but the husband is compelled to divorce her. Our Simeon B. Eliezer said, Why was it ordained that a widow married to a high priest is entitled to her ketubah? Because he becomes unfit and she becomes unfit, and wherever he becomes unfit and she becomes unfit. Talmud, Masya Bamatbi, the rabbis have penalized him by ordering him to pay her ketubah, and why was it ordained that relatives of the second grade of kinship who are forbidden by the ordinances of the rabbis are not to receive their ketubah because the man remains fit and the woman remains fit, and wherever he is well as she remains fit, the rabbis have penalized her by depriving her of her ketubah. Rabbi said, The former are prohibitions of the Torah, and prohibitions of the Torah require no reinforcement, while the latter are prohibitions of the scribes, and the prohibitions of the scribes require reinforcement. Another reason is in the former case, the man induces it. Woman into the marriage in the latter case she induces him who stated the other reason one opinion asserts that it was Arsimian B. Eliezer who stated it and he gave an answer to the question what is the reason what is the reason he said in effect why it was ordained that when the man is unfit and the woman is unfit the man is penalized by having to pay the ketubah because he induces the woman into the marriage and what is the reason why when he remains fit and she remains fit she is penalized by losing her ketubah because she induces him into the marriage another opinion asserts that it was Rabbi who stated it because the case of the Haliza presented to him the following difficulty
induces him, but according to our Akiba who stated that the offspring of a union forbidden under the penalty of a negative precept is deemed to be a bastard, she surely would not induce a man at all. Rather said our people, the practical difference between them is the case of a Beulah who was married to a high priest, according to him who gave as a reason that the prohibitions were pentacle, and this case also is pentacle, but according to him who gave as a reason that the man induces. The woman then here surely it is she that induces him according to our Elizabeth B. Jacob, however, who stated that the offspring of a union that is forbidden under a positive precept is deemed a halal, she surely would not at all induce him. Rather said Arashi, the practical difference between them is the case of the man who cohabits again with his doubtful soda, according to him who stated that the reason is that the prohibition is pentacle, and this case also is pentacle, but according to him. Who stated that the reason is that the man induces the woman here it is she that induces him and according to our Matthew B. Harris who stated that even a woman whose husband while going to arrange for her drinking of the water of bitterness cohabited with her on the way is rendered a harlot she surely would not at all induce him to such a marriage rather said Mar B. R. Ashi the practical difference between them is the case of a confirmed Soda Misha the daughter of an Israelite who was betrothed to a priest was pregnant from a priest or was awaiting the decision of a lover who was a priest and similarly the daughter of a priest who stood in such relationship to an Israelite may not eat Terima the daughter of an Israelite who was betrothed to a Levite was pregnant from a Levite or was awaiting the decision of a lover who was a Levite and similarly the daughter of a Levite who stood in such relationship to an Israelite may not eat the daughter of a Levite who was Betrothed to a priest was pregnant from a priest or was awaiting the decision of a lover who was a priest and similarly the daughter of a priest who stood in such relationship to a Levite may eat neither Terima nor Tithe Mara and granted that she is no more than an ordinary woman is not any ordinary woman permitted to eat Tithe Arnaman replied in the name of Samuel this ruling represents the view of Armeir who stated the first Tithe is forbidden to common people for it was taught Talmud. Masya Bamba the Terima to the priest and the first Tithe to the Levite so Armeir or Eliezer B. Ezra permits it to the priest permits it does this then imply that some authority forbids it read therefore he may give it to the priest also what is Armeir's reason Ara Hassan of Rabba replied on the authority of a traditional statement for the Tithe of the children of Israel which they set apart as Terima to the Lord as Terima is forbidden to common people so is the first Tithe forbidden to Common people may it be assumed that as in the case of Terima the penalties of death and of a fifth are incurred so are the penalties of death and of a fifth incurred in the case of tithe scripture stated and die therein if they profane it then he shall put the fifth part thereof unto it therein but not in the tithe into it but not unto tithe and the rabbis as Terima is a cause of Tebal so is the first tithe a cause of Tebal and this is in agreement with what was taught our Jose said it might have been presumed that guilt is incurred only for Tebal from which nothing whatsoever had been set apart whence is it deduced that guilt is also incurred when Terima idola had been set apart but not the first tithe first tithe but not the second tithe or even if the poor man's tithe only had not been set apart scripture stated thou mayest not eat within the gates and further on it was stated that they may eat within the gates and be satisfied as the gates which was stated below refers to the poor man's tithe so the gates which was stated here refers to the poor man's tithe and concerning it the all merciful has said thou mayest not and if the deduction had been made from that text only it might have been assumed to imply the penalty of a negative precept but not the penalty of death hence we were taught the earlier text also another reading that the first tithe is a cause of evil may surely be deduced from the text cited by our Jose if deduction had been made from that text only it might have been assumed to imply the penalty of a negative precept but not the penalty of death hence we were taught the earlier text also how did you explain it in accordance with the view of our mayor explained and the final clause the daughter of a Levite who was betrothed to a priest and the daughter of a priest to a Levite may eat neither terima nor tithe what bearing has the question of non priestly stock in this case are she's hate replied the meaning of it Expression she may not eat is that she may not give permission to one to set apart the tithe. Does this then imply that a married woman may give such permission? Yes, and so it was taught, and you may eat it in every place. Yeah, and your household teaches that a married daughter of an Israelite may give permission for terima to be set apart. You say permission for terima to be set apart. Perhaps it is not so, but to eat it, it can be replied. If she may eat terima, which is subject to greater restrictions, how much more may she eat tithe, which is subject to lesser restrictions? The text must consequently have taught that a married daughter of an Israelite may give permission for terima to be set apart. Mar the son of Urbanus stated this teaches that she is not given a share in the tithe in the threshing floors. This is a satisfactory explanation according to him who holds that this is due to considerations of privacy governing the sexes. According to him, however, who holds that this is. Due to possible abuse by a divorced woman may not a divorced woman who is the daughter of a Levite tithe and according to your argument may not a divorced woman who is the daughter of a priest eat but the fact is that the ordinance is a preventive measure against abuse by a divorced woman who was the daughter of an Israelite if so what was the point in mentioning betrothed the same rule should be applied even to one who was married as in the first clause betrothed was taught betrothed was also taught in the final clause our rabbis taught terima idola belongs to the priest and the first tithe belongs to the Levite so our Akiva our Eliezer B. Ezra said Talmud, Masya be to the priest to the priest but not to the Levite read to the priest also what is our Akiva's reason because it is written moreover thou shalt speak unto the Levites and say unto them scripture thus refers specifically to the Levites and the other his view follows that of our Joshua B. Levi for our Joshua B. Levi stated in 24 passages where the priests described as Levites and the following is one of them but the priests the Levites the sons of Zadok and our Akiva you cannot say so here for it is written and you may eat it in every place it is to be given to him only who may eat it in every place a priest however is excluded since he may not eat it in a graveyard and the other the meaning is wherever he wishes neither is it required to eat it within the wall nor is a man subject to flogging for eating it while his body is levitically unclean there was a certain garden from which our Eliezer B. Ezra used to receive the first tithe our Akiva went and transferred its gate so that it faced the graveyard Akiva with his bag the other remarked and I have to live it was stated why were the Levites penalized by being deprived of the tithe our Jonathan and Sabia are in dispute on the matter one holds because they did not go up in the days of Ezra and the other holds. In order that the priests might depend upon it during the days of their uncleanness according to him who holds that the Levites were deprived of the tithe because they did not go up one can well understand why they were penalized according to him however who gave as a reason in order that the priests may depend upon it during the days of their uncleanness were the Levites penalized for the sake of the priests rather all agree that the penalization was due to their not going up in the days. Of Ezra they differ however on the following point one is of the opinion that their forfeit belonged to the poor while the other is of the opinion that priests during the days of their uncleanness are also regarded as poor why then did our Akiva transfer the gate so that it faced the graveyard it was this that he said to him if you come to claim it as a forfeit you are entitled to it but if you come to demand it as your share you have no claim upon it once is it deduced that they did not. Go up in the days of Ezra it is written and I gathered them together to the river that runneth to Ahab and there we encamped three days and I viewed the people and the priests and found there none of the sons of Levi are his stated at first officers were appointed from the Levites only for it is said and the officers of the Levites before you but now officers are appointed from the Israelites only for it is said and officers over you shall come from the majority mission the daughter of an Israelite who was married to a priest may eat Terima if he died and she has a son by him she may continue to eat Terima if she was subsequently married to a Levite she may eat of the tithe if the latter died and she had a son by him she may continue to eat of the tithe if she was subsequently married to an Israelite she may eat neither Terima nor tithe if the latter died and she has a son by him she may eat neither Terima nor tithe if her son by the Israelite died she may again eat of the tithe of her son by the Levite died, she may again eat Terima if her son by the priest died, she may eat neither Terima nor tithe Talmud. Masya Bamba, the daughter of a priest who was married to an Israelite, may not eat Terima if he died and she had a son by him, she may not eat Terima if she was
The breast and the shoulder set are his dot in the name of Rabbi Abishila. What scriptural text proves that she shall not eat of the terima of the holy things? She must not eat of that which is set apart from the holy things. Our Naman replied in the name of Rabbi Abba of her father's bread, but not all her father's bread. This excludes the breast and the shoulder. Rami Bihamad demurred, might it not be suggested that this excludes the invalidation of Baal's Rabbi replied Atana of the school of R. Ishmael has long ago settled this difficulty for Atana of the school of R. Ishmael taught what need was there for scripture to state, but the vow of a widow or of her that is divorced shall stand against her. Is she not free from the authority of her father and also from that of her husband? The fact is that where the father had entrusted his daughter to the representatives of the husband, or where the representatives of the father had entrusted her to the representatives of the husband, and on the way she became a widow or was divorced, it would not have been known whether she was to be described as of the house of her father or as of the house of her husband. Hence, the need for the text to tell you that as soon as she had left her father's authority, even if only for a short while, he may no more invalidate her vows. Our Safa replied, she may eat of her father's bread only bread, but no flesh. Our Papa replied, she may eat of her father's bread only the bread which is the property of her father, excluding however the breast and the shoulder which priests obtained from the table of the Most High Rabbah. However, replied, and the breast of the waving and the thigh of eating shall ye eat thou and thy daughters with the only when they are with the Arab of Yahweh stated that a tenant taught when she returns to her father's house, she returns only to the privilege of eating terima, but does not return to the privilege of eating the breast and the shoulders if she returns, however. By virtue of her son, she returns also to the privilege of eating the breast and the shoulder. Our Mordecai went and recited this traditional statement in the presence of Arashi when the latter said to him, Whence has this case been included from? But a daughter should she then be more important than the other? There the excluding texts were written, but here no excluding texts were written. The daughter of a priest who was married to an Israelite, etc. Our rabbis taught and is returned unto her. Father's house excludes one who is awaiting the decision of the lover, as in her youth excludes a pregnant woman, but could not this law, however, be arrived at by logical argument if where a child by a first husband is not regarded as the child by the second husband in respect of exempting the woman from the Levi marriage, the embryo is nevertheless regarded as a born child. How much more should the embryo be regarded as a born child where a child by the first husband is regarded as a child? Of the second in respect of depriving a woman of her right to terima, no, this is no argument if an embryo was regarded as a born child in respect of the Levi rate marriage where the dead were given the same status as a living, should an embryo be regarded as a born child in respect of terima where the dead were not given the same status as a living. Consequently, scripture expressly stated as in her youth to exclude a pregnant woman and it was necessary for scripture to write as in her youth to exclude the pregnant woman and also and have no child to exclude one who has a born child for had the all merciful written only and have no child it might have been assumed that only a woman who has a born child is forbidden to eat terima because at first there was one body and now there are two bodies but that a pregnant woman who formed at first one body and is now also one body on why may eat hence the second text was required and had the all merciful written of the pregnant woman only. It might have been assumed that only she is forbidden to eat terima because at first her body Talmud, Mas Yabamathi was empty and now it is full but not a woman whose child was already born whose body was at first empty and is now also empty hence was the first text also required Nimad he said to him let us not make and make in death let us make and not make in the child of the lover and terima said Rab Judah of discarded to rob the dead should not be given the same status as the living in respect of the Levi rate marriage by inference of Minoriad Majus if where a child by the first husband is regarded as the child of the second husband in respect of disqualifying the woman from the eating of terima the dead were not given the same status as the living how much less should the dead be given the same status as the living where the child of the first husband is not regarded as the son of the second in respect of exempting the woman from the Levi rate marriage it was Expressly stated her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace then let the dead be given the same status as the living in respect of terima by inference of an oriad majus if where a child by the first husband is not regarded as the child of the second in respect of exempting the woman from the Levi rate marriage the dead were given the same status as the living how much more so should the dead be given the same status as the living where a child of the first husband is regarded as the son of the second in respect of disqualifying the woman from terima it was expressly stated and she have no child and she surely has none let the child of the first husband be regarded as the child of the second husband in respect of the Levi rate marriage by inference of an oriad majus if where the dead were not given the same status as the living in respect of terima the child of the first husband is regarded as the son of the second how much more should the child of the first Husband be regarded as the child of the second where the dead were given the status of the living in respect of the Levi rate marriage it was expressly stated and he have no child and this man surely has none then let the child of the first husband not be regarded as the child of the second husband in respect of terima by inference of an oriad majus if where the dead were given the same status as the living in respect of exempting her from the Levi rate marriage the child of the first husband was not regarded as the child of the second how much less should the child of the first husband be regarded as the child of the second where the dead were not regarded as the living in respect of eating terima it was specifically stated and she have none but she surely has one chapter x mission a woman whose husband had gone to a country beyond the sea and on being told your husband is dead married must if her husband subsequently returned leave the one as well as the other and she also requires a letter of divorce from the one as well as from the other. She has no claim to her kethu to use of rock maintenance or worn clothes either against the first husband or against the second. If she has taken anything from the one or from the other, she must return it. The child begotten by the one husband or by the other is a bastard. Neither of them may defile himself for her. Neither of them has a claim to whatever she may find or make with her hands, and neither has the right of invalidating her vows. If she was the daughter of an Israelite, she becomes disqualified from marrying a priest. If the daughter of a Levite from the eating of tithe, and if the daughter of a priest from the eating of terima, neither the ears of the one husband nor the ears of the other are entitled to inherit her kethu. And if the husband die, the brother of the one and the brother of the other must submit to Elizabeth, may not contract the Levite marriage. Our Jose said her kethu remains. A charge upon the estate of her first husband, R. Eliezer said the first husband is entitled to whatever she may find or make with her hands and also has the right of invalidating her vows. R. Simeon said her cohabitation or Elizabeth, the brother of the first husband, exempts her rival and a child begotten by him is not a bastard. If she married without an authorization, she may return to him. If she married with the authorization of the Bethdin, she must leave but is exempt from an offering. If she married, however, without the authorization of the Bethdin, she must leave and is also liable to an offering. The authority of the Bethdin is thus more effective in that it exempts her from the offering. If the Bethdin ruled that she may be married again and she went and disgraced herself, she must bring an offering because the Bethdin permitted her only to marry Gamara since in the final clause it was stated if she marries without permission, she may return to him, which means obviously without. The authorization of the Bethdin, but in reliance on the evidence of witnesses, the first clause it is to be inferred speaks of a woman who married with the permission of the Bethdin and on the evidence of a single witness. Thus, it clearly follows that one witness is trusted. Furthermore, we learn the practice was adopted of allowing a marriage on the evidence of one witness reporting another single witness and of a woman reporting another woman and of a woman reporting a bondman or a bondwoman, from which it is obvious that one witness is trusted. Furthermore, we learn the man to whom one witness said, You have eaten suet, and who replied, I have not eaten, is exempt. Now, the reason for his exemption is because he said, I have not eaten. Had he, however, remained silent, the witness would have been trusted from this. It is clearly evident that one witness is trusted in accordance with Pentateuch allowance is this deduced from what was taught if his sin be known to him, but not. When others have made it known to him as it might have been assumed that even where he does not contradict the evidence he is exempted was expressly stated it be known to him in any manner now how is the statement to be understood if it be suggested that it refers to a case where two witnesses appeared and he does not contradict them what need then was there for a scriptural text must it not then refer to the case of one witness and yet we see that when the accused does not
Accused contradicts them. The rabbis have exempted him. The reason must consequently be because the accused remains silent, and silence is regarded as admission of fact. However, is that this is arrived at by logical inference. This case being analogous to that of a piece of fact concerning which there is doubt as to whether it was of the forbidden or of the permitted kind. If a single witness came and declared, "I am certain that it was permitted," fact he is trusted. Are the two cases similar? There, the prohibition was not established. Here, the prohibition of a married woman is established, and no question of sexual relationship may be decided on the evidence of less than two witnesses. This is rather analogous to the case of a piece that was definitely forbidden. Fat. If a single witness came and declared, "I am certain that it was permitted," fat. he is not believed. But are these cases similar? In that case, should even a hundred witnesses come, they would not be believed. In this case, however, since should two witnesses come, they would be trusted. One witness also should be trusted. This is rather analogous to the cases of Tebal and consecrated and conum objects whose Tebal is here to be understood. If his own, he would naturally be trusted, since it is in his power to make it fit for use. If, however, it is that of another person, the question may still be urged. What view is here adopted? If it is maintained that a man who sets apart priestly dues for his neighbor's produce out of his own. Does not require the owner's consent. It is quite obvious why the witness is here trusted, since it is in his power to make it fit for use. And if it is maintained that the owner's consent is required, and that the witness declares, "I know that he has made it fit for use," whence is this very law derived as regards consecrated objects? Also, if it was a consecration of the value of an object, it is obvious why one witness is trusted, since it is in his power to redeem it. But if an object has been consecrated, the objection may still be raised. If it were his own, he would naturally be trusted, since it is within his right to ask for the disallowance of his vow. If, however, it belonged to another man, and the witness declared, "I know that its owner has asked for the disallowance of his vow," whence is this very law derived with reference to conum objects? Also, if it is maintained that the law of trespass is applicable to conum objects, and that the sanctity of their value descends upon them. It's obvious why one witness is trusted since it is within his power to redeem them and if it is maintained that the law of trespass is not applicable to conum objects and that it is only a mere prohibition with which he is saddled the question may be urged if any such object was his own it is natural that he should be trusted since it is within his power to ask for the disallowance of his vow if however it belonged to another man and the witness declared I know that its owner has asked for the disallowance of his vow once is this very law derived our zero replied owing to the rigidity of the disabilities that were later imposed upon her the law was relaxed in her favor at the beginning let there be however neither rigid disabilities nor a relaxation of the law in order to avoid perpetual desertion the rabbis have relaxed the law in her favor must leave the one as well as the other etc rab stated this was taught only in respect of a woman who married on the evidence of a Single witness, but if she married on the strength of the evidence of two witnesses, she need not leave in the West. They laughed at him. Her husband, they remarked, comes and there he stands, and you say she need not leave. This, it may be replied, was required only in the case when the man was not known. If he is unknown, why is she to leave her second husband, even where she only married on the evidence of a single witness? This is required only in the case where two witnesses came and stated, We were with him from the moment he left until now, but you it is who are unable to recognize him, as it is written, and Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew him not. On which are his star remark, this teaches that he went forth without any marks of a beard, and now he appeared with a full beard. But after all, there are two against two Talmud, Mas Yabamath B, and he who cohabits with her is liable to bring an Ajam to leave. She's hate replied when she was married, for instance, to one of her witnesses, but she. Herself is liable to an Ashamtalibi where she states, I am certain if so, what need was there to state such an obvious ruling when even our Menahem son of our Jose maintained his view only where the witnesses came first and the woman married afterwards, but not where she married first and the witnesses came afterwards, for it was taught if two witnesses state that he was dead and two state that he was not dead, or if two state that the woman was divorced and two state that she was not divorced, the woman must not marry again, but if she married, she need not leave our Menahem son of our Jose, however, ruled that she must leave, said our Menahem son of our Jose, when do I rule that she must leave only when witnesses came first and she married afterwards, but where she married first and the witnesses came afterwards, she need not leave. Rab also spoke of the case where witnesses came first and the woman married afterwards, his object being to exclude the ruling of our Menahem son of our Jose, another reading. The reason then is because she married first and the witnesses came afterwards, but where witnesses came first and the woman married afterwards, she must leave in accordance with whose view is this ruling in accordance with that of our Menahem son of our Jose Robert raised an objection whence is it deduced that if a priest refused he is to be compelled it was expressly stated and thou shalt sanctify him even against his will now how is this to be understood if it be suggested that it is a case where she was not married to one of her witnesses and she does not plead I am certain is there any need to state that he is to be compelled consequently it must refer to a case where she was married to one of her witnesses and she pleads I am certain I and yet it was stated that he was to be compelled from which it clearly follows that she is to be taken away from him a priestly prohibition is different if you prefer I might say what is the meaning of he is to be compelled he is to be Compelled by means of witnesses, and if you prefer, I might say it is a case where witnesses came first and she married afterwards, and this represents the view of our Menahem son of our Jose. Our Ashi replied, What is meant by the expression she need not leave, which Rab used, she is not to depart from her first state of permissibility, but surely Rab has said this once, for we learned if she married without an authorization, she may return to him, and Rab who not stated in the name of Rab, this is the established law. One was stated as an inference from the other. Samuel said this was taught only in the case where she does not contradict him, but where she contradicts him, she need not leave. What are the circumstances spoken of? If it be suggested that there are two witnesses of what avail is her denial, it must then deal with the case of one witness, and the reason is because she contradicts him. Had she, however, remained silent, she would have been obliged to leave, but surely Ola stated that. Wherever the Torah allows credence to one witness, he is regarded as two witnesses, and the evidence of one man against that of two men has no validity. Here it is a case of evidence by ineligible witnesses, and Samuel's statement is in accordance with the view of Arniamai, for it was taught Arniamai stated, Wherever the Torah allows credence to one witness, the majority of opinions is to be followed, and the evidence of two women against that of one man is given the same validity as that of two men against one man. And if you prefer, I might reply, Wherever one eligible witness came first, even a hundred women are regarded as one witness. Here, however, we are dealing with a case where a woman witness came in the first instance, and the statement of Arniamai is to be explained. Thus, Arniamai stated, Wherever the Torah allows credence to one witness, the majority of opinions is to be followed, and the evidence of two women against that of one woman is given the same validity as that of Two men against one man, but that of two women against that of one man is regarded only as that of a half and a half. She also requires a letter of divorce from one as well as from the other. It is quite intelligible that she should require a divorce from the first husband, but why also from the second when their union was a mere act of adultery? Our Huna replied, This is a preventive measure against the possibility of assuming that the first had divorced her and the second had lawfully married her, and that consequently a married woman may leave her husband without a letter of divorce. If so, in the latter clause, also where it was stated, if she was told your husband is dead and she was betrothed, and afterwards her husband came, she is permitted to return to him. Might it not be assumed there also that the first husband had divorced her and the other had lawfully betrothed her, and that consequently a betrothed woman may be released without a letter of divorce as a matter of fact? She does require a letter of divorce if so it might there also be assumed that the first had again married his divorced wife after she had been betrothed the statement is in accordance with our Jose B. Kuiper who stated that remarrying one's divorced wife after a marriage is forbidden but after a betrothal is permitted since however it was stated in the final clause although Talmud, Mas Yabamath the latter gave her a letter of divorce he has not thereby disqualified her from marrying a priest it may be inferred that she requires no divorce for should she require a divorce why does he not disqualify her from marrying a priest rather in the final clause it will be assumed that the betrothal was an erroneous one in the first clause also let it be said that it would be assumed that the marriage was an erroneous one the rabbis have penalized her then let them penalize her in the final clause also in
taken anything from the one or from the other she must return it is this not obvious as it might have been assumed that since she has already seized it it is not to be taken from her hence we were taught that she must return it the child is a bastard elsewhere we learn terima from levitically unclean produce may not be set apart for that which is levitically clean if however such terima has been set apart it is valid if the act was done in error but if it was done willfully it is null and void now what is meant by it is null and void our historic replied the act is absolutely null and void even that driver which has been designated as terima returns to its former state of people our nathan son of our ashai replied it is null and void in respect of making the remainder fit for use but that which has been set apart becomes terima our hist does not give the same explanation as our nathan son of our ashai for should it be said that the portion set apart is lawful terima might sometimes happen that one would willfully neglect to set apart the terima from the remainder but why should this be different from the following case concerning which we learned if a man has set apart as terima a cucumber which was found to be bitter or a melon which turned out to be decayed the fruit becomes terima but from the remainder terima must again be set apart do you raise an objection from a case where one has acted unwittingly against a case where one has acted willfully where one has acted unwittingly no forbidden act has been committed when however one has acted willfully a forbidden act has been committed a contradiction however was pointed out between two acts committed unwittingly here it is stated it is lawful terima if the act was done unwittingly while their sin was stated terima but from the remainder terima must again be set apart there it is an erroneous act amounting almost to a willful one since he should have tasted it a Contradiction was also pointed out between two cases of willful action here it is stated but if it was done willfully it is null and void while elsewhere we learned if a man has set apart as terima the produce of an unperforated plant pot for the produce of a perforated pot the former becomes terima but from the latter terima must again be separated in the case of produce grown in two different vessels a man would obey and that of one vessel he would not obey now according to our Nathan son of our Ashai who explained that the act is null and void in respect of making the remainder fit for use but that that which has been set apart becomes terima Talmud Mas Yabamat B Y is this case different from the following where we learned that if a man has set apart as terima the produce of a perforated plant pot for that of an unperforated one the terima is valid but may not be eaten before terima and tithe from other produce has been set aside for it here it is Different since Pentateuch ally the terima is valid in accordance with the view of Arlay for Arlay stated once is it inferred that if one separates terima from an inferior quality for a superior quality as terima is valid it is written and ye shall bear no sin by reason of it seeing that ye have set apart from it the best thereof now this implies that if you do not set apart from the best but of the worst you shall bear sin if however the inferior quality does not become consecrated. Why should there be any bearing of sin hence it may be inferred that if one sets apart terima from an inferior quality for a superior quality as terima is valid said Rabbi to Arhista according to you who maintain that the act is absolutely null and void so that even that driver which has been designated as terima returns to its former state of people the reason being that this is a preventive measure against the possibility that one might willfully neglect to set apart the terima from. The remainder is there anywhere I may ask a law that terima which is Pentateuch ally valid should owing to the possibility that one might willfully neglect his duty be turned into unconsecrated produce could then have lay down a condition that would cause a law of the Torah to be uprooted the other replied and do you not yourself agree with such a ruling have we not learned the child by the one husband or the other is a bastard now it is reasonable that the child by the second should be deemed a bastard but why should the child by the first be a bastard she is surely his wife and the child is consequently a proper Israelite whom by regarding him as a bastard we permit to marry a bastard the first retorted thus said Samuel he is forbidden to marry a bastard and so said Rabin when he came in the name of Aryohan and he is forbidden to marry a bastard why then is he called a bastard in respect of forbidding him to marry the daughter of an Israelite Arhista sent. To rabbi through our son of Arhuna the following inquire cannot the Beth Din lay down a condition which would cause the abrogation of a law of the Torah surely it was taught at what period of her age is a husband entitled to be the heir of his wife if she dies while still a minor Beth Shammai stated when she attains to womanhood and Beth Hillel said when she enters into the bridal chamber our Eliezer said when connubial intercourse has taken place then he is entitled to be her heir he may defile himself for her and she may eat terima by virtue of his rights Beth Shammai said when she attains to womanhood even though she has not entered the bridal chamber read when she attains to womanhood and enters the bridal chamber and it is this that Beth Shammai said to Beth Hillel in respect of your statement when she enters the bridal chamber it is only when she has attained womanhood that the bridal chamber is effective but otherwise the bridal chamber alone is of no avail our Eliezer. Said when Canubial intercourse has taken place, but surely our Eliezer said that the act of a minor has no legal force read after she has grown up and Canubial intercourse has taken place at all events it was here stated he is entitled to be her heir, but surely by Pentateuch law it is her father who should here be her legal heir, and yet it is the husband who is heir in accordance with the rabbinical ordinance Hefker by Bethdin is legal Hefker for our Isaac stated whence is it deduced that Hefker by Bethdin is legal Hefker it is said whosoever came not within three days according to the counsel of the princes and the elders all his substance should be forfeited and himself separated from the congregation of the captivity our Eliezer stated that the deduction is made from here these are the inheritances which Eliezer the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the fathers houses of the tribes of the children of Israel distributed for inheritance now what relation is there between heads and fathers but this has the purpose of telling you that as fathers may distribute as an inheritance to their children whatever they wish so may the heads distribute as an inheritance to the people whatever they wish he may defile himself for her but surely by Pentateuch law it is her father who may here defile himself for her and yet it is the husband who by rabbinical law was allowed to defile himself for her this was allowed because she is a methmizwa is she however a methmizwa surely it was taught who may he regarded as a methmizwa he who has no relatives to bury him if however he has relatives upon whom he could call and they would answer him he is not regarded as a methmizwa here also since they are not her heirs they would not answer even if she were to call upon them Talmud Mas Yabamate and she may eat terima by virtue of his rights only rabbinical terima come and here if a man ate levitically unclean terima he must pay Compensation in clean unconsecrated produce if he paid unconsecrated produce that was levitically unclean his compensation said Simicus in the name of Armaeur is valid if it was paid in error and invalid if paid willfully the sages however said whether in one case or in the other his compensation is valid but he must again pay compensation in clean unconsecrated produce and when in considering this ruling the objection was raised why should not his compensation be valid if he paid it willfully a blessing should come upon him for he has eaten such of the priest's produce as is not fit for him in the days of his uncleanness and paid him compensation in something that is fit for him in the days of his uncleanness Rob other say cut he replied some words are missing from the text the correct reading being the following if a man ate levitically unclean terima he may pay compensation in any produce if he ate levitically clean terima he must pay compensation in clean unconsecrated produce if however he made compensation in unconsecrated produce that was levitically unclean his compensation said Simicus in the name of Armaeur is valid if it was made in error and his compensation is invalid if it was made willfully but the sages said his compensation is valid whether he has acted in error or willfully but he must again pay compensation in clean unconsecrated produce now here surely the compensation is pentateuch ally valid for were a priest to betroth a wife within her betrothal would be valid and yet the rabbis ruled that his compensation is invalid and thus a married woman is permitted to marry anyone in the world this was meant by the expression his compensation is invalid which Armaeur used that he must pay compensation again in clean unconsecrated produce if so then Simicus holds the same view as the rabbis are son of R.I.K. replied the difference between them is on the question whether one who has acted unwittingly is to be penalized as a preventive measure against one acting willfully come and here if sacrificial blood became levitically unclean and was then sprinkled upon the altar it is accepted if the sprinkling was performed unwittingly but it is not accepted if it was performed willfully now according to Pentateuch law it is here undoubtedly accepted for it was taught in respect of what errors does the high
The uncircumcised sprinkling the knife of circumcision, the linen cloak with sits, the lambs of Pentecost, the shofar, and the lulav. Now, however, that you taught us that abstention from the performance of an act is not regarded as an abrogation of the law, I have nothing to say since all these are also cases of abstention. Come and hear unto him, ye shall hearken, even if he tells you transgress any of all the commandments of the Torah, as in the case, for instance, of Elijah on Mount Carmel, obey him. In every respect, in accordance with the needs of the hour, there it is different, for it is written unto him, shall ye hearken, and let rabbinic law be deduced from it. The safeguarding of the cause is different. Come and hear if he annulled his letter of divorce, it is annulled. So, Rabbi Arsimi and Gamaliel, however, said he may neither annul it nor add a single condition to it, since otherwise, of what avail is the authority of the Beth Din? Now, though here the letter of divorce may be annulled in. Accordance with Pentateuchal law, we allow a married woman owing to the power of Beth Din to marry anyone in the world. Anyone who betrothes a woman does so in implicit compliance with the ordinances of the rabbis, and the rabbis have in this case cancelled the original betrothal. Said Rabbanu to Arashi, this is a quite satisfactory explanation where betrothal was affected by means of money. What, however, can be said in a case where betrothal was affected by cohabitation? The rabbis have assigned to such a cohabitation the character of mere prostitution. Come and hear our Eliezer B. Jacob stated, I heard that even without any Pentateuchal authority for their rulings, Beth Din may administer flogging and death penalties. Not, however, for the purpose of transgressing the words of the Torah, but in order to make offense for the Torah. And it once happened that a man rode on horseback on the Sabbath in the days of the Greeks, and he was brought before Beth Din and was stoned, not because. He deserved this penalty, but because the exigencies of the hour demanded it. And another incident occurred with a man who had intercourse with his wife under a fig tree, and he was brought before Beth Din and flogged, not because he deserved such a penalty, but because the exigencies of the hour demanded it to safeguard a cause is different. Neither of them may defile himself for her. Whence is this derived from what is written in Scripture, except for his kin that is near unto him and a master? Stated that his kin means his wife, while it was also written, the husband shall not defile himself among his people to profile himself, implying that there is a husband and who may, and there is a husband who may not defile himself. How then are these contradictory laws to be reconciled? He may defile himself for his lawful wife, but he may not defile himself for his unlawful wife. Neither of them has a claim upon anything she may find, etc. Because what is the reason why the rabbis ruled that? A wife's finds belong to her husband in order that he may bear no hatred against her, but here let him bear against her ever so much hatred or make with her hands, because for what reason did the rabbis rule that the work of her hands belong to her husband because she receives from him her maintenance, but here since she receives no maintenance, her handiwork does not belong to him or to the right of invalidating her vows, since what is the reason why the All-Merciful said that a husband may annul his wife's vows in order that she may not become repulsive here, however, let her become ever so repulsive if she was the daughter of an Israelite, she becomes disqualified from marrying a priest, etc. Talmud, Mas Yabamath is not this obvious a statement if the daughter of a Levite she becomes disqualified from the eating of tithe was required, does however the daughter of a Levite become disqualified by prostitution from the eating of tithe? Surely it was taught if the daughter of a Levite was taken into captivity or was subjected to an act of prostitution, she may nevertheless be given tithe and she may eat or she's hate replied this is a punitive measure if the daughter of a priest she becomes disqualified from the eating of terimah even rabbinical terimah neither the ears of the one husband nor the ears of the other are entitled to inherit her ketubah etc. How does the question of ketubah arise here? Our papa replied the ketubah of the male children is not this also. Obvious it might have been assumed that the rabbis had penalized only her since she had committed the forbidden act but not her children hence we were informed that they also lose the ketubah the brother of the one and the brother of the other must submit to Elizabeth may not contract the Levirate marriage the brother of the first husband submits to Elizabeth in accordance with the Pentateuchal law and may not contract the Levirate marriage in accordance with rabbinic law the brother of it. Second, however, submits to Elizabeth in accordance with rabbinical law and may not contract the Levirate marriage either in accordance with Pentateuchal or in accordance with rabbinical law. Or Jose said her ketub remains a charge upon the estate of her first husband, etc. Said Arhu, not the latter agree with the former, but the former do not agree with the latter. Our Simeon agrees with our Eliezer since he does not penalize the woman in the case of cohabitation which constitutes the main prohibition. How much less would he do so in respect of what she finds and what she makes with her hands which are only monetary matters? Our Eliezer, however, does not agree with our Simeon since it is only in respect of what the woman finds and what she makes with her hands which are monetary matters that he does not penalize her, but in respect of cohabitation which is a religious prohibition, he does penalize her and both of them agree with our Jose since they do not penalize the woman in respect of those. Matters which are applicable while she continues to live with her husband, how much less would they do so in respect of the ketubah, the purpose of which is for the woman to take it and depart? Our Jose, on the other hand, does not agree with them since it is only in respect of the ketubah, the purpose of which is for the woman to take it and depart, that he does not penalize her, but in respect of those matters which are applicable while she continues to live with her husband, he does penalize her. Our Yohanan stated the former agree with the latter, but the latter do not agree with the former. Our Jose agrees with our Eliezer since he does not penalize the woman in respect of the ketubah, which has to be taken from the husband and given to the wife, how much less would be do so in respect of what she finds and what she makes with her hands, which have to be taken from her and given to him. Our Eliezer, however, does not agree with him since it is only in respect of what she finds and what she Makes with her hands which have to be taken from the woman and given to the husband that he does not penalize her, but in respect of the ketubah which has to be taken from him and given to her, he does penalize her, and both of them agree with our Simeon since they do not penalize her in respect of matters which are applicable while her first husband is alive. How much less would they do so in respect of cohabitation which takes place after his death? Our Simeon, however, does not agree with them. Since it is only in respect of cohabitation which takes place after her husband's death that he does not penalize her, but in respect of those matters which are applicable while he is alive, he does penalize her if she married without an authorization, etc. Said Arhu, not in the name of Rab, this is the accepted law. Arnaman said to him, Why should you indulge in circumlocution if you hold the same view as our Simeon? Say the Halacha is in agreement with our Simeon for indeed your traditional. Statement runs on the same lines as that of Arsimian and should you reply if I were to say the Halachah is in agreement with Arsimian it might be assumed to apply even to his first statement then say the Halachah is in agreement with Arsimian in his latter statement this is a difficulty Arshis hate said it occurs to me that Rab made this reported statement while he was sleepy and about to doze off his statement this is the accepted law implies that the rabbis differ but what could she do? She was but the victim of circumstances furthermore it was taught none of the women in incestuous marriages forbidden in the Torah requires a letter of divorce from the man who married her except a married woman who married again in accordance with the decision of a Bethdin only where she married again in accordance with the decision of a Bethdin does she require a letter of divorce but where the marriage took place in accordance with the evidence of two witnesses she requires no letter of Divorce now whose view is irrepresented if it be suggested that it is a view of our Simeon does she it may be retorted require a letter of divorce even where her marriage took place in accordance with the decision of the Beth Din surely it was taught our Simeon stated if the Beth Din acted on their own judgment the marriage is regarded as a willful act of adultery between a man and a married woman if however they acted in accordance with the evidence of two witnesses the marriage is regarded as intercourse between a man and a woman that was due to error in both cases however no letter of divorce is thus required consequently it must represent the view of the rabbis the fact is that it represents the view of our Simeon and you may interpret it as follows our Simeon stated if the Beth Din acted on their own judgment the marriage is regarded as intentional intercourse between a man and an unmarried woman and the letter consequently requires a letter of divorce if However, they acted in accordance with the evidence of two witnesses. The marriage is regarded as wanton intercourse between a man and an unmarried woman, and the latter consequently requires no letter of divorce. Arashi replied, The statement was mainly
Accordance with the decision of Beth Dinola raised an objection. Do we accept the plea? What could she have done? Surely we learned if a letter of divorce was dated according to an era that was inappropriate, according to the Median era, or according to the Greek era, according to the era of the building of the temple or the destruction of the temple, or if he was in the east and wrote in the west, or he was in the west and wrote in the east, she must leave her first and her second husband and all the disabilities enumerated are applicable to her, but while let it be argued, what could she have done? She should have arranged for the letter of divorce to be read. Arshai might be as she said, come and here if a lover married his sister-in-law and her rival went and married another man and then the former was found to be incapable of procreation. The latter must leave the one and the other and all the disabilities mentioned apply to her, but while let it be argued, what could she have done? She should have waited, said Abbe, come and here if the rivals of any of the forbidden relatives concerning whom it has been said that they exempt their rivals went and married and any such forbidden relatives were found to be incapable of procreation. Every rival must leave the one and the other and all the disabilities mentioned apply to her, but while let it be argued, what could she have done? She should have waited, said Robert, come and here if a scribe wrote a letter of divorce for the husband. And acquittance for the wife, and then made a mistake and handed the letter of divorce to the wife and acquittance to the husband, and they gave them to one another. And after a time, the letter of divorce was discovered in the possession of the husband, and acquittance in the possession of the wife. The latter must leave the one as well as the other, and all the disabilities mentioned apply to her. But why let it be argued? What could she have done? She could have arranged for the letter of divorce to be read. Said Arashi, come and here. If he changed his name or her name, the name of his town or the name of her town, she must depart from the one and from the other. And all the disabilities mentioned apply to her. But why let it be argued? What could she have done? She should have arranged for the letter of divorce to be read. Said Robin, come and here. If a man married a woman on the strength of the bald letter of divorce, she must depart from the one and from the other, etc. She should. Have arranged for the letter of divorce to be read. Our papa desired to decide a case on the principle of what could she have done. Said Arhuna, son of Arjashua, to our papa. But surely all those very thoughts were taught. The other answered him, were they not explained? Shall we then? The former retorted, rely on explanations. Arashi said, no regard need be paid to a rumor. What kind of rumor is here meant? If it be suggested that it means a rumor after marriage, surely it may be objected. Arashi has said this once for Arashi stated Talmud. Mas Yavamatha, no regard need be paid to a rumor that originated after marriage. It might have been assumed that since she was to appear before the Beth Din to obtain the authorization for her marriage, the rumor is regarded as one that arose before marriage, and she should, in consequence, be forbidden. We were therefore taught that even in such circumstances, a rumor is disregarded if she married with the authorization of the Beth Din, she must leave, etc. Zeiri said our mission cannot be authentic owing to a very that was recited at the academy for it was recited at the academy if the Beth Din ruled that the sun had set and later it appeared such a decision is no ruling but a mere error Arnaman however stated such an authorization is to be regarded as a ruling said Arnaman you can have proof that it is to be regarded as a ruling for throughout the Torah a single witness is never believed while in this case he is believed but what? Obviously because such an authorization is regarded as a ruling Rabbah said you can have proof that it is to be regarded as a mere error for were Beth Din to issue a ruling in a case of some forbidden fat or blood that it is permitted and then find a strong reason for forbidding it their subsequent ruling should they retract and rule again that it is permitted would be completely disregarded whereas here it should one witness present himself the woman would be permitted to marry again and should two witnesses afterwards appear, the woman would be forbidden to marry again. But should another witness subsequently appear, the woman would again be permitted to marry. But why? Obviously, because it is regarded as a mere error. Our Eliezer also is of the opinion that it is to be regarded as a mere error, for it was taught. Our Eliezer said, "Let the law pierce through the mountain and let her bring a fat sin offering." Now, if it be granted that it is to be treated as an error, one can well see the reason why she is to bring an offering. If, however, it be contended that it is to be regarded as a ruling, why should she bring an offering? But is it not possible that our Eliezer holds the opinion that an individual who committed a sin in reliance on a ruling of the Beth Din is liable? If so, what could have been meant by "let the law pierce through the mountain"? If the Beth Din decided that she may marry again, etc. What is meant by disgrace herself? Our Eliezer replied, "She played the harlot." Are Yohanan replied, if being a widow she was married to a high priest, or if a divorcee or a halyza she was married to a common priest, he who stated she played the harlot would even more so subject the woman to a sin offering. If as a widow she was married to a high priest, he however who stated if being a widow she was married to a high priest does not subject her to a sin offering. If she played the harlot, what is the reason? Because she might plead it is you who granted me the status of an unmarried woman. It was taught in agreement with the opinion of our Yohanan. If Beth Din directed that she may be married again, and she went and disgraced herself, so that for instance, being a widow she was married to a high priest, or being a divorcee or a halyza she was married to a common priest, she is liable to bring an offering for every single act of cohabitation. So our Eliezer, but the sages said one offering for all the sages. However, agree with our Eliezer that if she was. Married to five men, she is liable to bring an offering for everyone since here it is a case of separate bodies. Mission: If a woman whose husband and son went to country beyond the sea was told your husband died and your son died afterwards and she married again and later she was told it was otherwise she must depart and any child born before or after is a bastard. If she was told your son died and your husband died afterwards and she contracted the Levirate marriage and afterwards she was told it was otherwise she must depart and any child born before or after is a bastard. If she was told your husband is dead and she married and afterwards she was told he was alive but is now dead she must depart and any child born before the death of her first husband is a bastard but one born after it is no bastard. If she was told your husband is dead and she was betrothed and afterwards her husband appeared she is permitted to return to him although the other gave her a letter of divorce he has. Not thereby disqualified her from marrying a priest. This R. Eliezer B. Matthew derived by means of the following exposition. Neither shall they take a woman put away from her husband. Excludes one put away from a man who is not her husband. Tomorrow what is meant by before and what is meant by after. If it be suggested that before means before the second report and that after means after that report it should have been stated the child is a bastard because it was desired to state in the final clause. If she was told your husband is dead and she married and afterwards she was told he was alive but is now dead. Any child born before the death of her first husband is a bastard but one born after it is no bastard. The expressions born before or after is a bastard were used in the first clause. Also our rabbis taught this is a view of our Akiba who stated betrothal with those who are subject on intercourse to the penalties of a negative commandment is invalid. The sages however said that the Child of a sister-in-law is no bastard. Let it be said the child of a union between those who are subject on intercourse to the penalties of a negative precept is no bastard. This tana is the following tana of the school of our Akiba who stated that only a child of a union that is subject to the penalties of a negative precept owing to consanguinity is a bastard but one born from a union that is subject to the penalties of a mere negative precept is no bastard. Rab Judah stated Talmud, Moss. Yavamat in the name of Rab once is it deduced that betrothal with a sister-in-law is of no validity from the scriptural text the wife of the dead shall not be married outside unto one who is not of his kin there shall be no validity in the betrothal of her by a stranger Samuel however stated owing to our intellectual poverty it is necessary that she be given a letter of divorce Samuel having been in doubt as to whether the expression the wife of the dead shall not be served the Purpose of a negative precept, or rather indicated that betrothal with such a woman is invalid. Armari B. Rachel said to Arashi, thus said Amimar, the law is in agreement with Samuel. Said Arashi, now that Amimar has said that the law is in agreement with Samuel, her lover, if he was a priest, submits to her Haliza, and she is permitted to her second husband, he surely benefits thereby, and thus the sinner is at an advantage. Rather, this is the reading if her lover was an Israelite, the other gives her a letter of divorce, and she is permitted to the lover. Argidal stated in the name of Arhai B. Joseph, in the name of Rab, while betrothal with a sister in law is invalid, marriage with her is valid. If betrothal, however, is invalid, marriage also should be invalid. Read both betrothal and marriage with her are
Beneath it, Resh Lakish said to him, Had not a great man praised you, I would have told you that the Mishnah you cited represents the view of our Akiba who maintains that betrothal with those who are subject to the penalties of a negative precept is invalid. If this Mishnah, however, represents the view of our Akiba, betrothal with the sister in law should be valid, where the stranger said to her, After thy brother in law shall have submitted to thy illicit, since our Akiba has been heard to state that. One may transfer possession of that which is not yet in existence, for we learn Talmud. Masya Bamathe, if a woman said to her husband, Kona, my do offer your mouth, he need not annul her vow. Our Akiba, however, said he must annul it since she might do more work than is due to him. Surely, in connection with this, it was stated, Arhuna, son of our Joshua, said this law applies only where she said, My hands shall be consecrated to him who made them, since her hands are in existence. This differs from the opinion of Arnam and B. Isaac, for Arnam and B. Isaac stated, Arhuna holds the same opinion as Rab Rab as our Jane, our Jane as our high, our high as Rabbi Rabbi as our Meir, our Meir as our Eliezer B. Jacob, and our Eliezer B. Jacob as our Akiba, who stated that a man may transfer possession of a thing that is not yet in existence. What statement is it that records the opinion of Arhuna? It was stated, He who sold the fruit of a day tree to another may set Arhuna withdraw from the sale before they come. Into existence, but after they have come into existence, he may no longer withdraw our nomin. However, stated he may withdraw even after they have come into existence. Said our nomin, I admit that if he had already plucked and ate them, compensation is not to be extracted from him as to Rabbin that which Arhuna stated in the name of Rabbi. If a man said to another, Let this field which I am about to buy be yours, as from now the moment I buy it, the latter requires it. Our is of the same opinion. As our high for our had a tenant who used to bring him a basket of fruit every Sabbath. Once as it was growing dark and the tenant did not come, our took tithe from the fruit which he had at home for the redemption of those. When he subsequently came before our high, the latter said to him, You have acted well, for it was taught that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always refers to Sabbaths and festivals now in respect of what law, if in respect of giving tithe. So. That one may be allowed to eat was it necessary it may be asked for a scriptural text to permit moving the prohibition of which is only rabbinical Talmud, Masya Bamath be consequently it must refer to an instance like this one said the first to him but in my dream they read to me a scriptural text on the bruised reed did they not mean to tell me behold thou trustest upon the staff of this bruised reed no the other replied it is this that they meant the bruised reed shall he not break. And the dimly burning which shall he not quench rabbi where it was taught thou shalt not deliver unto his master of bondman rabbi explained that scripture speaks here of a man who bought a slave on the condition that he would set him free how is this to be understood our and b isaac replied in the case where the buyer gave him a written declaration your person shall become yours as from now as soon as i have bought you are where it was taught if a man said to a woman be thou betrothed to me after I shall have become a proselyte, after thou shalt have become a proselyte, after I shall have been emancipated, after thou shalt have been emancipated, after thy husband shall have died, after thy sister shall have died, or after thy brother in law shall have submitted to thy Elizabeth. The betrothal is invalid, but our Meir said that her betrothal is valid. Our Elizabeth B. Jacob, where it was taught more than this, did our Elizabeth B. Jacob say, Even if a man said the plucked fruit of this bed shall be tear him off, or the attached fruit of that other bed, or the attached fruit of this bed shall be tear him off, or the plucked fruit of that other bed, when it shall have grown to a third of its maturity and been plucked, his words are valid. If the fruit has grown to a third of its maturity and has been plucked, our Akiba, where we learned, if a woman said to her husband, Kona, if I do offer your mouth, he need not annul her vow, our Akiba, however, said he must annul it since she might do more work. That is due to him an inquiry was addressed to our she's hate what is the law in respect of one witness in the case of a sister-in-law is the reason why one witness is sometimes believed elsewhere because no one would tell a lie which is likely to be exposed and consequently here also the witness would tell no lie or is the reason why one witness is believed elsewhere because the woman herself makes careful inquiries and only then marries and consequently here since she may sometimes be in love with her brother-in-law she might marry him without proper inquiry our she's hate answered them you have learned that if she was told your son died and your husband died afterwards and she contracted the Levi rate marriage and later she was told it was otherwise she must depart and any child born before or after is a bastard now how is this to be understood if it be suggested that there were two witnesses against two what reason do you see it may be asked for relying on the latter a lot. Rather on the former furthermore how could the child be described as bastard when he is only an uncertain bastard and should you reply that he was not exact in his expression surely it may be pointed out since in the final clause he stated any child born before the death of her first husband is a bastard but one born after it is no bastard it may well be inferred that he was exact in his expressions consequently it must be concluded that the first report was that of one witness and that the reason why he is not believed is because two witnesses came and contradicted his evidence but had this not been the case he would have been believed another reading this question does not arise since even the woman herself is believed for we learned the woman who stated my husband is dead may be married again and she may similarly contract leave by marriage if she stated my husband is dead the question arises only in respect of permitting a sister-in-law to marry a stranger is it? Reason why one witness is elsewhere sometimes believed because no one would tell a lie which is likely to be exposed and consequently here also the witness would tell no lie or is the reason why one witness is elsewhere believed because the woman herself makes careful inquiries and only then marries and consequently here she might marry without proper inquiry since she might fiercely Talmud, Masya Bamatha hate her brother-in-law or she's hate answered them you have learned it if a woman was told your husband died and your son died afterwards and she married again and later she was told it was otherwise she must depart and any child born before or after is a bastard now how is this to be understood if it be suggested that there were two witnesses against two what reason do you see it may be asked for relying on the latter or lie rather on the former furthermore how could the child be described as a bastard when he is only an uncertain bastard and should you reply that he was not exact in his expression surely it may be pointed out since in the final clause he stated any child born before the death of her first husband is a bastard but one born after it is no bastard it may be inferred that he was exact in his expressions consequently it must be concluded that the first report was that of one witness and that the reason why he is not believed is because two witnesses came and contradicted his evidence but had this not been the case he would have been believed no in fact it may be retorted there may have been two witnesses against two and this is the explanation as as our ahabi menumi stated where the witnesses have proved an alibi so here also it is a case where the second pair of witnesses have proved an alibi said our mordecai to our ashi others say our said to our ashi come and here a woman is not believed if she says my brother-in-law is dead and so i may marry again or my sister is dead and so i may enter her house only she is not believed but one witness is believed according to your argument however it may be retorted read the final clause a man is not believed when he says a brother is dead and so I may contract the Levirate marriage with his wife or my own wife is dead and so I may marry her sister is it only he who is not believed but one witness is believed in the case of a woman one can well understand that in order to prevent her perpetual desertion the rabbis have relaxed the law in her favor what however can be said in the case of a man the statement that it must be explained was required in accordance with the view of our Akiva. it might have been assumed that since our Akiva stated that the offspring of a union between those who are subject to the penalty of negative commandments is a bastard she may be presumed to be desirous of avoiding injury and to institute therefore careful inquiries hence we were taught that she is not to be believed Rabbi said that one witness is believed in the case of a sister in law may be inferred a minoriad mages if you have permitted a woman to marry again in face of a prohibition involving Karath, how much more so in face of a mere prohibitory law said one of the rabbis to rob her own case proves the contrary in face of a prohibition involving Karath, you have permitted her to marry again while in face of a mere prohibitory law you have not permitted her the fact however is this why is she not believed because as she may sometimes hate the lover she might marry a stranger without first instituting careful inquiries so also in the case of one witness since she may sometimes hate the lover she might marry a stranger without first instituting the necessary inquiries this did our
Gemara, even though his wife and his brother-in-law went to a country beyond the sea, so that such marriage had the effect of causing the prohibition of the wife of his brother-in-law to his brother-in-law, it is nevertheless the wife of his brother-in-law that is forbidden while his own wife is permitted. And we do not say that since the wife of his brother-in-law is forbidden to his brother-in-law, his own wife also should be forbidden to him, or we to assume that our mission does not represent the view of our Akiva. For if it be in agreement with our Akiva, his wife would be the sister of his divorcee. For it was taught none of the women in incestuous marriages forbidden in the Torah require a letter of divorce except a married woman who remarried in accordance with the decision of the Beth. In our Akiva, however, adds also a brother's wife and a wife's sister. Now, since our Akiva ruled that she requires a letter of divorce, his first wife becomes if so facto forbidden to him because she is. The sister of his divorcee was not, however, the following statement made in connection with this ruling Argidal said in the name of our high Joseph in the name of Rab, how is one to understand this brother's wife where a man's brother, for instance, betrothed a woman and went to a country beyond the sea, and he on hearing that his brother was dead, married his wife, since people might say that the first had attached a certain condition to the betrothal and that the latter had lawfully married her. And how is one to understand the wife's sister where a man, for instance, betrothed a woman and she went to a country beyond the sea, and he on hearing that she died, married her sister, since people might say that he had attached a certain condition to the betrothal of the first and that he therefore legally married the other in respect of marriage, however, can it be said that one had attached a condition to marriage, said Arashi to Arkahana, if our mission represents the view of our Akiva ones. Mother-in-law should also be mentioned since our Akiva was heard to state the marriage of a man's mother-in-law after the death of his wife is not punishable by burning for it was taught they shall be burnt with fire both he and they he and one of them so our Ishmael our Akiva said he and both of them this presents no difficulty according to Abbe who explained that the difference between them lies in the interpretation of the text our Ishmael maintaining that the text mentioned only one while our Akiva maintains that the text spoke of two according to Rabbah however who explained that the difference between them is the case of marriage of a man's mother-in-law after the death of his wife his mother-in-law should also have been mentioned the other reply granted that scripture has excluded her from the penalty of burning has scripture however excluded her from the prohibition letter however be forbidden to her husband through his cohabitation with her sister her case being similar. To that of a woman whose husband went to a country beyond the sea, the two cases are not alike. His wife, who if she had acted presumptuously, is forbidden to him by Pentateuchal law, has been forbidden to him when she acted unwittingly by a preventive measure of the rabbi's Talmud. Masi of with his wife's sister, however, presumptuous marriage with whom does not cause his first wife to be forbidden to him by Pentateuchal law, no preventive measure has been instituted by the rabbis. In her case, where he acted unwittingly, whence, however, is it deduced that she is not forbidden from that which was taught with her only cohabitation with her causes her to be prohibited? Cohabitation with her sister, however, does not cause her to be prohibited. The scriptural text was required, since otherwise it might have been argued as follows if where a man cohabited with a woman forbidden by a lighter prohibition, the person who caused the prohibition itself is forbidden to. Or how much more should the person who caused the prohibition become forbidden in the case of cohabiting with one forbidden by a heavier prohibition? Our Judah stated Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel are agreed that a man who cohabited with his mother in law renders his wife unfit to live with him. They only differ where a man cohabited with his wife's sister, in which case Beth Shammai maintained that thereby he causes his wife to be unfit for him, while Beth Hillel maintained that he does not thereby cause her to be unfit for him. Our Jose stated Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel are agreed that a man who cohabits with his wife's sister does not thereby render his wife unfit for him. They differ only where a man cohabited with his mother in law, in which case Beth Shammai maintained that thereby he causes his wife to be unfit for him, while Beth Hillel maintained that he does not thereby cause her to be unfit for him. Both agree for the following reason originally all the women of the world. Were permitted to him, and all the men of the world were permitted to her. But when he betrothed her, he imposed a prohibition upon her, and she imposed a prohibition upon him. The prohibition, however, which he imposed upon her is greater than the prohibition which she imposes upon him, since he caused all the men of the world to be forbidden to her, while she caused her relatives only to be forbidden to him. This then may be arrived at by an inference if she to whom he caused all the men in the world to be prohibited is if she cohabited unwittingly with one who was forbidden to her, not forbidden to the man who was permitted to her. How much more reason is there why he to whom she caused the prohibition of her relatives only should if he cohabited unwittingly with one who was forbidden to him, not be forbidden to her who was permitted to him? This argument is applicable to one who acted unwittingly, whence is it deduced that the same law is applicable to one who acted willfully? It was expressly. Stated with her cohabitation with her only causes her to be prohibited. Cohabitation with her sister, however, does not cause her to be prohibited. Said RMI in the name of Resh Lakish, what is our Judah's reason? Because it is written, they shall be burnt with fire. Both he and they is the whole household to be burned. If this then is not a case for burning, regard the text as indicating a prohibition. Rab Judah stated in the name of Samuel, the law is not in agreement with our Judah. A man once committed incest with his mother in law, and Rab Judah summoned him and ordered him to receive a flogging. Had Samuel not stated, he said to him that the law is not in agreement with our Judah. I would have forbidden your wife to you for all time. What was meant by a lighter prohibition? Our historian replied, remarrying one's divorced wife after her marriage to another man. When that man cohabited with her, he caused her to be prohibited to the other, and when the other cohabited with her, he caused her to be. Prohibited to the former, but it may be argued remarrying one's divorced wife after her marriage to another man is different since her body was defiled and she is prohibited for all time. Rather said Resh Lakish, it means a Yebama Yebama with whom, if it be suggested with a stranger, the ruling being in accordance with our Hamnana who ruled that a woman awaiting the decision of the lover who played the harlot is forbidden to the lover, it may be objected that a Yebama is different since her body was defiled and she is prohibited to the majority of men. If, however, it be suggested that it refers to a Yebama in relation to her deceased husband's brothers, where one brother, for instance, addressed to her Amamar, he caused her to be prohibited to the other, and when the other cohabited with her, he caused her to be prohibited to the former. But in this case, what point is there? It may be retorted in stating that the second cohabited with her when the same law is applicable. Also, even where he only addressed to her Amamar, this is no difficulty. Amamar could not be postulated in accordance with our Gamaliel who ruled there is no validity in Amamar that was addressed after a previous Amamar, but still the objection is that the same law is applicable even if he gave her a letter of divorce and even if he submitted to her Halizar rather said Aryohan and it means a soda a soda with whom if it be suggested with her husband who if he cohabited with her caused her to be prohibited to her seducer. What point is there? It may be objected in stating that he cohabited with her even if he only gave her a letter of divorce and even if he only said I am not allowing her to drink the same law is applicable if it be suggested however the soda with the seducer is this it may be objected a lighter prohibition it is surely a great prohibition since she is a married woman Talmud. Masi Amamath rather said Rabbah it means a married woman similarly. When Rabin came, he stated in the name of Aryohan and a married woman, but why should this be described as a lighter prohibition? Because her husband who causes her to be prohibited to other men does not cause her to be so prohibited during the whole of his lifetime. It was taught likewise Abahan and stated in the name of Aryohan, it means a married man, and the argument runs thus if where a man cohabits with a woman forbidden by a lighter prohibition, in which case he who caused it. Prohibition of her does not cause her to be prohibited during the whole of his lifetime. It is nevertheless ruled that the very person who causes the prohibition becomes prohibited, and in a case of cohabiting with one forbidden by a graver prohibition, where the person who causes the prohibition of her prohibits her during the whole of her lifetime, how much more should we rule that the very person who causes the prohibition should become prohibited? Hence it was expressly stated with her only. Cohabition with her causes her to be prohibited, but cohabitation with her sister does not cause her to be prohibited. Our Jose stated, Whosoever disqualifies, etc. What does our Jose mean if it be suggested that while the first tana implied that
where the wife of his brother-in-law is permitted or whether it took place in accordance with the decision of the Beth Din where the wife of his brother-in-law is forbidden and to this our Jose replied if the marriage took place in accordance with the decision of the Beth Din where he disqualifies for others he disqualifies for himself if however it took place on the basis of the evidence of two witnesses where he does not disqualify for others he does not disqualify for himself or Isaac. Napaha replied our Jose may in fact refer to the latter clause one of his rulings applying where the persons who had gone were the man's wife and his brother-in-law and the other applying where his betrothed and brother-in-law had gone the first Tana having ruled that irrespective of whether it was his wife and his brother-in-law or whether it was his betrothed and his brother-in-law the wife of his brother-in-law is forbidden while his wife is permitted our Jose said to him in the case of his wife and brother-in-law where no one would assume that he had attached some condition to his marriage and where consequently he does not cause his sister-in-law to be prohibited to the other he does not cause his first wife to be prohibited to him either in the case of his betrothed and his brother-in-law however where someone might assume that he had attached some condition to his betrothal and where in consequence he causes his sister-in-law to be prohibited to the other he causes his first wife also to be prohibited to him Rab Judah stated in the name of Samuel the Halachah is in agreement with our Jose our Joseph the Mer could Samuel have said this surely it was stated Yebam Rab said has the status of a married woman and Samuel said she has not the status of a married woman and Arhuna said where for instance a man's brother betrothed a woman and then went to a country beyond the sea and he on hearing that his brother was dead married his wife it is in such a case that Rab ruled that she has the status of a married woman and is consequently forbidden to the brother-in-law and Samuel ruled that she has not the status of a married woman and is therefore permitted to him said Abay to him once do you infer that when Samuel stated that the Halachah is in agreement with our Jose he was referring to our Isaac Napaha's interpretation is it not possible that he was referring to that of our MI and even if he refers to that of our Isaac Napaha once it Proof that he referred to the ruling disqualified Talmud, Masya Bamath, is it not possible that he referred to the ruling does not disqualify or else it might be argued once is it proved that Arhuna's explanation is tenable is it not possible that Arhuna's explanation is altogether untenable and that they differ on the ruling of Arhamana who stated that a woman awaiting the decision of the lover who played the harlot is forbidden to her lover of maintaining that she has the status of a married woman and is consequently prohibited by reason of her immoral act while Samuel maintains that she has not the status of a married woman and does not therefore become prohibited by reason of her immoral act or else it might be replied that they differ on the question whether betrothal of a sister-in-law is valid Rab maintaining that she has the status of a married woman and betrothal with her is in consequence invalid while Samuel maintains that she has not the status of a married Woman and betrothal with her is therefore valid, but on this question they had already disputed once the one was stated as an inference from the other mission. If a man was told your wife is dead and he married her paternal sister, and when he was told she also is dead, he married her maternal sister, she too is dead, and he married her paternal sister, she also is dead, and he married her maternal sister, and later it was found that they were all alive, he is permitted to live with the first, third, and fifth who also exempt their rivals, but he is forbidden to live with the second or the fourth, and cohabitation with one of these does not exempt her rival. If however he cohabited with the second after the death of the first, he is permitted to live with the second and fourth who also exempt their rivals, but he is forbidden to live with the third and with the fifth, and cohabitation with one of these does not exempt her rival. A boy of the age of nine years and one day renders his sister in law. Unfit for marriage with his brothers and his brothers render her unfit for him but while he renders her unfit from the outset only the brothers render her unfit both from the outset and at the end in what manner a boy of the age of nine years and one day who cohabited with his sister-in-law renders her unfit for marriage with his brothers the brothers however render her unfit for him whether they cohabited with her addressed to her among gave her a letter of divorce or submitted to her. Elizagamara did not all those marriages take place after the death of the first wife or she's hate replied by this was meant after the ascertained death of the first wife a boy of the age of nine years etc does a boy of the age of nine years and one day cause unfitness only where his act took place at the outset but if at the end he causes no unfitness surely Arzibit son of Arashai learned if a brother addressed Amangmar to his sister-in-law his brother of the age of nine years and one day cohabiting with her afterwards causes her to be unfit for marriage with him it may be replied cohabitation causes unfitness even if it took place at the end while Amangmar causes unfitness only if it was addressed at the outset but if at the end it causes no unfitness but does cohabitation cause unfitness even if it took place at the end surely it was taught but while he renders her unfit from the outset only they render her unfit both from the outset and at the end in what manner a boy of the age of nine years and one day who cohabited with his sister-in-law etc something indeed is here missing and this is the proper reading a boy of the age of nine years and one day renders his sister-in-law unfit for marriage with his brothers if his action took place at the outset but they render her unfit for him both at the outset and at the end this is applicable only in the case of Amangmar but cohabitation causes unfitness even if it took place at the end in what Manner a boy of the age of nine years and one day who cohabited with his sister in law renders her unfit for marriage with his brothers is his mamar, however, any validity at all. Surely it was taught a boy of the age of nine years and one day renders his sister in law unfit for his brothers by one kind of act only while the brothers render her unfit for him by four kinds of acts. He renders her unfit for the brothers by cohabitation while the brothers render her unfit for him by cohabitation. By a mamar, by a letter of divorce and by illicit cohabitation which causes unfitness both from the outset and at the end presented to him a definite law. The law of the mamar, however, which causes unfitness from the outset only but not at the end could not be regarded by him as definite. So it was also stated Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel he has the power to give a letter of divorce and so said our Talafa Biabami he has the power to address a mamar. It was taught likewise he has. The right to give a letter of divorce and he has the right to address a mamar so our mayor could our mayor however hold the view that such a boy has the power to give a letter of divorce surely it was taught cohabitation with a boy of the age of nine years and one day was given the same validity as that of a mamar by an adult and our mayor said the halizah of a boy of the age of nine years was given the same validity as that of a letter of divorce by an adult now if that were so it should have been stated as that of his own letter of divorce Arhuna son of our Joshua replied he has the right but his divorce is of a lesser validity for according to our Gamaliel who ruled that there is no validity in a letter of divorce after another letter of divorce his ruling is applicable only in the case of a divorce by an adult after that of an adult or one by a minor after that of a minor but a divorce by an adult after that of a minor is effective while according to the rabbis who Ruled that a letter of divorce given after another letter of divorce is valid. The ruling applies only to a divorce by adult after that of an adult or one by a minor after that of a minor, but a divorce by a minor after that of an adult is not effective. Talmud, Masya Bamath B. Mishnah, a boy of the age of nine years and one day cohabited with his sister in law and then his brother who was of the age of nine years and one day cohabited with her. The latter renders her unfit for the former. Our Simeon said he does not render her unfit if a boy of the age of nine years and one day cohabited with his sister in law and afterwards he cohabited with her rival. He has rendered thereby the first as well as the second unfit for marriage with himself. Our Simeon said he does not render them unfit. Gemara, it was taught. Our Simeon said to the sages if the first cohabitation was a valid act, the second cohabitation cannot have any validity. If the first cohabitation, however, has no validity. The second cohabitation also should have no validity. Our mission cannot represent the view of Ben Aze, for it was taught Ben Aze stated a mamar is valid after another mamar where it concerns two lovers and one sister in law, but no mamar is valid after a mamar where it concerns two sisters in law and one lover. Mission if a boy of the age of nine years and one day cohabited with his sister in law and then died, she must perform Elizabeth may not contract the Levirate marriage if he had married any other woman and subsequently died, she is exempt from both if a boy of the age of nine years and one day cohabited with his sister in law and after he had come of age, he married another woman and subsequently died if he had not carnally known the first woman after he had become of
years, etc. And after he had come of age, etc. Let the cohabitation of the boy of nine be given the same validity as that of a Mangmar by an adult, and so let the rival here be debarred from the Levi rape marriage. Now said Rab, the cohabitation of the boy of nine was not given the same validity as that of a Mangmar by an adult. Samuel, however, said it was certainly given the same validity, and so said Aryohan, and it certainly was given the same validity. Then let the same validity be given here also this. Question is a matter of dispute between Tanaim that Tana whose ruling is contained in the chapter of the four brothers enacted a preventive measure on account of the rival and though he stated the law in respect of an adult the same law is applicable to a minor the reason why he mentioned the adult being only because he was engaged on the question of the adult the Tana here however is of the opinion that they were given the same validity and he enacted no preventive measure on account of the rival and though he spoke of the minor the same law applies to an adult the reason why he spoke of the minor being only because he was dealing with the minor R. Eliezer came and reported the statement at the schoolhouse but did not report it in the name of Aryohan and when Aryohan heard this he was annoyed thereupon RMI and RC came in and said to him did it not happen at the synagogue of Tiberius that R. Eliezer and R. Jose disputed so hotly concerning a door bolt which had a knob at one end that they tore a scroll of the law in their excitement they tore could this be imagined say rather that a scroll of the law was torn in their excitement our Jose Bikisma who was then present exclaimed I shall be surprised if the synagogue is not turned into a house of idolatry and so it happened on hearing this he was annoyed all the more comradeship too he exclaimed thereupon our Jacob B.E.D. came in and said to him as the Lord commanded Moses his servant so did Moses command Joshua and so did Joshua he left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses did Joshua then concerning every word which he said tell them thus did Moses tell me but the fact is that Joshua was sitting and delivering his discourse without mentioning names and all knew that it was the Torah of Moses so did your disciple our Eliezer sit and deliver his discourse without mentioning names and all knew that it was yours why he chided them are you not capable of conciliating like the son of EDR? Friend, why was our Yohanan so annoyed for the following reason? For Rab Judah stated in the name of Rab, what is the meaning of the scriptural text? I will dwell in thy tent forever. Is it possible for a man to dwell in two worlds? But in fact, it is this that David said to the Holy One, Blessed be he, Lord of the universe, may it be thy will, Talmud, Mas Yabab, that a traditional statement may be reported in my name in this world. For our Yohanan stated in the name of our Simeon, Behold, the lips of a deceased scholar in whose name a traditional statement is reported in this world, move gently in the grave, said R. Isaac, Bzeira, or it might be said, Simeon, the Nazi, right? What is the scriptural proof of this? And the roof of thy mouth, like the best wine that glides down smoothly from my beloved, moving gently the lips of those who are asleep, like a heated mass of grapes, as a heated mass of grapes, as soon as a man places his finger upon it, exudes immediately, so with the scholars, as soon as a Traditional statement is made in their name in this world. Their lips move gently in the grave, whether he is of the age of nine years, etc. A contradiction was pointed out if at the age of twenty he did not produce two pubic hairs, they must bring evidence that he is twenty years of age and he is then confirmed as a sorry. He may neither submit to Eliza nor may he perform the Levi rape marriage. If a woman at the age of twenty did not produce two pubic hairs, they must bring evidence that she is twenty years of age and she is then confirmed as a woman who is incapable of procreation. She may neither perform Eliza nor contract Levi rape marriage. Surely, in connection with this mission, it was stated our Samuel B. Isaac said in the name of Rab that this applies only to the case where other symptoms of a sorry's also appeared on him. Said Rabba, this may also be arrived at by deduction, for it was taught and he is confirmed as a sorry's from which this may well be deduced and where no. Symptoms of Asari's developed how long is one regarded as a minor it was taught at the school of Arhai until he has passed middle age whenever people came with such a case before Rabba he used to tell them if the youth was emaciated let him first be fattened and if he was stout he used to tell them let him first be made to lose weight for these symptoms disappear sometimes as a result of emaciation and sometimes they disappear as a result of stoutness C-H-A-P-T-E-R-X I mission a man is permitted to marry the near relative of a woman whom he has outraged or seduced he however who outraged or seduced a relative of his married wife is guilty a man may marry the woman whom his father has outraged or seduced or the woman whom his son has outraged or seduced our Judah forbids marriage with the woman whom one's father has outraged or seduced Amara here we learn what the rabbis taught a man who has outraged a woman is permitted to marry her daughter if however he married the Woman, he is forbidden to marry her daughter. A contradiction, however, may be pointed out. A man who is suspected of intercourse with a woman is forbidden to marry her mother, her daughter, and her sister. This prohibition is only rabbinical. Would it be stated, however, where a rabbinical prohibition exists that a man is permitted to marry even from the outset? Our mission refers only to a marriage after the suspected woman's death. Whence is this ruling deduced from what the rabbis taught in the case of all those illicit relationships? Scripture used the expression of lying, but here it made use of the expression of taking in order to tell you that only when intercourse with a woman was in the matter of taking did the Torah forbid marriage with her relative. Said our Papa to Abay, if that is so, then in respect of one sister concerning whom it is written, and if a man shall take his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, is intercourse here also forbidden only if it is in the manner of taking but permitted if it is in the manner of lying the other replied the word taking is used in the Torah without being defined so that a text to which taking is applicable signifies taking while one to which only lying is applicable signifies lying Rabbah stated that a man who outraged a woman is permitted to marry her daughter is deduced from here it is written the nakedness of thy son's daughter or of thy daughter's daughter thou shalt not uncover from which it follows that the daughter of her son and the daughter of her daughter may be uncovered but it is also written in scripture thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter thou shalt not take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter how then are these to be reconciled the former refers to cases of outrage and the latter to those of marriage might not the application be reversed in respect of forbidden relatives the expression kin is written and kinship exists only by means of marriage, but no kinship exists by means of outrage. Our Judah forbids marriage with the woman whom one's father had outraged, etc. Our Gittle stated in the name of Rab, what is our Judah's reason? Because it is written, a man shall not take his father's wife and shall not uncover his father's skirt. The skirt which his father saw, he shall not uncover. Whence, however, is it inferred that scripture speaks of an outraged woman from the preceding section of the text where it is written, then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver. And the rabbis, if one text had occurred in close proximity to the other, your exposition would have been justified now. However, that it does not occur in close proximity, the text is required for an exposition like that of our and for our and stated in the name of Samuel that the scriptural text speaks of a woman awaiting the Levi right decision of his father, and the meaning of his father's skirt is he shall not uncover. The skirt which is designated for his father this prohibition however might be deduced from the fact that she is his aunt the text was necessary to make him guilty of the transgression of two negative commandments the prohibition however might be inferred from the fact that the widow as a sister-in-law is forbidden to marry any stranger the text was necessary to make him guilty of the transgression of three negative commandments and if you prefer I might say after his father's death Talmud, Mas Yabamath be my paternal but not my maternal brother and he is the husband of my mother and I am the daughter of his wife Romy Bihamath said such a relationship is not legally possible according to the ruling of our Judah and our Mishnah he whom I carry on my shoulder is my brother and my son and I am his sister this is possible when an idolater cohabited with his daughter greetings to you my son I am the daughter of your sister this is possible where an idolater cohabited with his daughter's daughter, yet water drawers, we shall ask you a riddle that defies solution. He whom I carry is my son, and I am the daughter of his brother. This is possible where an idolater cohabited with the daughter of his son. Woe, woe, for my brother who is my father, he is my husband, and the son of my husband, he is the husband of my mother, and I am the daughter of his wife, and he provides no food for his orphan brothers, the children of his daughter. This is possible when an idolater cohabited with his mother and begot from her a daughter, then he cohab
Brothers from the same father and not from the same mother there is no difference of opinion that this is permitted in respect of brothers from the same mother and not from the same father there is no difference of opinion that this is forbidden they differ only in respect of proselytes whose brotherhood is both paternal and maternal he who permits it does so because children are ascribed to their father since they are spoken of as the children of such and such a man are she's hate however holds that they are also spoken of as the children of such and such a woman another reading our Ahabi Jacob disputed the illegality of marriage even in respect of maternal brothers and what is his reason because a man who has become a proselyte is like a child newly born we learn the sons of a female proselyte who became proselytes together with her neither participate in the nor contract the Levirate marriage is not the reason because they are forbidden to marry a brother's wife no it is because the widow is not subject to the law of Eliza and Levirate marriage she is permitted however to strangers and the brothers also are permitted to marry her but surely it was stated even now were you to admit that the brothers are forbidden one could well justify the expression of even even if the one was not conceived in holiness but was born in holiness and the other was both conceived and born in holiness so that the two might well be regarded as the sons of two mothers they are nevertheless forbidden if you maintain however that they are permitted what can be the purport of even even though the birth of both was in holiness and people might mistake them for Israelites the widow is nevertheless permitted to marry a stranger others read logical reasoning also supports the view that they are permitted since the expression even was used for if you grant that they are permitted it is quite correct to say even even though the birth of both was in holiness and people might mistake them for Israelites they are nevertheless permitted if however you maintain that they are forbidden what can be the purport of even even if the one was not conceived in holiness but was born in holiness and the other was both conceived and born in holiness so that they might well be regarded as the sons of two mothers they are nevertheless forbidden come and hear twin brothers who were proselytes and similarly if they were emancipated slaves may neither Participate in Eliza nor contract Levi marriage nor are they guilty of a punishable offense for marrying a brother's wife if however they were not conceived in holiness but were born in holiness they neither participate in Eliza nor contract Levi marriage but are guilty of a punishable offense for marrying a brother's wife if they were both conceived and born in holiness they are regarded as Israelites in all respects at all events it was stated that they are not guilty of a punishable offense for marrying a brother's wife from which it follows that no punishable offense is incurred Talmud, Masya Bamatha but that a rabbinical prohibition is nevertheless involved the law in fact is that even a rabbinical prohibition is not involved only because it was desired to state in the final clause but are guilty of a punishable offense it was stated in the first clause also they are not guilty of a punishable offense Rabbah stated with reference to the Rabbinical statement that legally an Egyptian has no father it must not be imagined that this is due to the Egyptian's excessive indulgence in carnal gratification owing to which it is not known who the father was but that if this were known it is to be taken into consideration but the fact is that even if this is known it is not taken into consideration for surely in respect of twin brothers who originated in one drop that divided itself into two it was nevertheless stated in the final clause that they neither participate in Elizabeth nor perform by right marriage thus it may be inferred that the all merciful declared their children to be legally fatherless for so indeed it is also written whose flesh is as the flesh of asses and whose issue is like the issue of horses come and hear what our Jose related it once happened with the proselyte of fates that he married the wife of his deceased maternal brother and when the case was submitted to the sages their verdict was that the Law of matrimony does not apply to a proselyte, but then should a proselyte betroth a woman would also the betrothal be invalid say then rather the prohibition of a brother's wife does not apply to a proselyte now does not this refer to the case where his brother had married her while he was a proselyte know where he married her while he was still an idolater but if betrothal took place while he was still an idolater what need is there to state it, it might have been assumed that in the case of a brother's betrothal while he is still an idolater a preventive measure should be enacted less erroneous conclusions be drawn in the case where he is a proselyte hence we were taught that no such measure was enacted come and hear what Banyajian related when I went to the coastal towns I came across a certain proselyte who had married the wife of his maternal brother who my son I said to him permitted you this marriage behold he replied the woman and her seven children on this Bench sat Arakiba when he made two statements a proselyte may marry the wife of his maternal brother and he also stated and the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time saying only a second time did the Shechinah speak to him a third time the Shechinah did not speak to him at any rate it was stated here that a proselyte may marry the wife of his maternal brother does not this refer to a case where his brother married her while he was a proselyte know where he married her while he was still an idolater what need then was there to state such an obvious law it might have been assumed that in the case of a brother's betrothal while he is still an idolater a preventive measure should be enacted less erroneous conclusions be drawn in the case where he is a proselyte hence we were taught that no such measure was enacted as he however believed surely our Abba stated in the name of Arhu not in the name of Rab wherever a scholar gives directions on a point of law and such a point comes up for a practical decision he is obeyed if he made the statement before the event but if it was not so made he is not obeyed if you wish I might say the incident occurred after he made his statement if you prefer I might say because he stated behold the woman and her seven children and if you prefer I might say here it is different because with it he related another incident the master said and the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time saying only a second time did the Shechinah speak unto him a third time the Shechinah did not speak to him but surely it is written in scripture he restored the border of Israel from the entrance of Hamath unto the sea of the Arab according to the word of the Lord which he spoke by the hand of his servant Jonah the son of Amittai the prophet Rubin replied he referred to the affairs of Nineveh Arnam and B. Isaac replied it is this that was meant according to the word of the Lord which he spoke by the hand of his servant the Prophet as his intention towards Nineveh was turned from evil to good so was his intention towards Israel in the days of Jeroboam the son of Joash turned from evil to good come and hear a proselyte who was born in holiness but was not conceived in holiness has legally maternal consanguinity but no paternal consanguinity for instance if he married his maternal sister he must divorce her if his paternal one he may retain her his father's maternal sister he must divorce Talmud, Mas Yavamathi. His paternal one he may retain his mother's maternal sister he must divorce as to her paternal sister Armadir said he must divorce her and the sages said he may retain her Armadir maintaining that any woman forbidden on account of maternal consanguinity must be divorced but if on account of paternal consanguinity he may retain her he is also permitted to marry his brother's wife and the wife of his father's brother all other forbidden relatives are also permitted to him including his father's. Wife of a proselyte married a woman and her daughter she may retain one but must release the other in the first instance he may not marry her if his wife died he is permitted to marry his mother-in-law another opinion is that he is forbidden to marry his mother-in-law at all events it was here stated that he is permitted to marry his brother's wife does not this apply to a woman whom his brother had married while he was a proselyte know where he married her while he was still an idolater. What need was there to state it it might have been assumed that in the case of a brother's marriage while he was still an idolater a preventive measure should be enacted to preclude the same thing being done where he is already a proselyte hence were we taught that in such a case a brother's wife was permitted the master stated if a proselyte married a woman and her daughter he may retain one but must release the other in the first instance he may not marry her now if he must even Release her is there any need to speak of a prohibition to marry her from the outset it refers to a previous clause and the meaning is this that woman concerning whom the rabbis ruled that he may retain her may nevertheless not be married by him from the outset if his wife died he is permitted to marry his mother-in-law another opinion is that he is forbidden to marry his mother-in-law one is in agreement with our Ishmael and the other is in agreement with our Akiva he who forbade the marriage agrees with our Ishmael who stated a man's mother-in-law after his wife's death retains the former prohibitions and in respect of a proselyte a preventive measure was enacted he however who permits a marriage follows our Akiva who stated that the prohibition to marry one's mother-in-law is weakened after one's wife's death and consequently no preventive measure has been enacted by the rabbis in respect of a proselyte mission if the male children of five women were mixed up and when these Interchanged children grew up, they took wives and then died for submit to Eliza from one of the widows and one contracts with her the Levi rate
To Elizabeth and those who are non priests may also contract Levi rate marriage if some of them were priests and some eternal brothers, the former as well as the latter, submit to Elizabeth but may not contract Levi rate marriage. Talmud, Masi of Amathar rabbis taught a man must sometimes submit to Elizabeth from his mother owing to an uncertainty, from his sister owing to an uncertainty, and from his daughter owing to an uncertainty. For instance, if his mother and another woman had two male children, and then gave birth to two male children in a hiding place, and a son of the one mother married the mother of the other son, while the son of the other mother married the mother of the first, and both died without issue, the one must submit to Elizabeth from both women, and the other must submit to Elizabeth from both women. Thus it follows that each submits to Elizabeth from his mother owing to an uncertainty, from his sister owing to an uncertainty. For instance, when his mother and another woman gave birth. To two female children in a hiding place and their brothers who were not from the same mother married them and died without issue, he must submit to Elizabeth from both widows. Thus it follows that a man submits to Elizabeth from his sister owing to an uncertainty, from his daughter owing to an uncertainty. For instance, when his wife and another woman gave birth to two female children in a hiding place and their husband's brothers married them and died without issue, the one father submits to Elizabeth from his daughter owing to the uncertainty, and the other father submits to Elizabeth from his daughter owing to the uncertainty. It was taught our Meir said a husband and wife may sometimes produce five different castes. However, an Israelite bought a bondman and a bondwoman in the market, and these had two sons, one of whom became a proselyte. The result is that one is a proselyte and the other is an idolater. If subsequently he made them perform the prescribed immersion for the purpose of slavery and then they cohabited with one another and bore a son. Behold, here we have a proselyte, an idolater, and a slave. If he subsequently emancipated the bondwoman and the slave cohabited with her and had another son, behold, here we have a proselyte, an idolater, a slave, and a bastard. If he then emancipated both of them and made them marry one another, behold, here we have a proselyte, an idolater, a slave, a bastard, and an Israelite. What does this teach us that when an idolater or a slave cohabits with an Israelitish woman, their child is a bastard? Our rabbis taught sometimes a man sells his father to enable his mother to collect her ketuba. How if an Israelite bought in the market a bondman and a bondwoman who had a son and having emancipated the bondwoman, he married her and bequeathed in writing all his estate to her son? The result is that the son sells his father in order to enable his mother to collect her ketuba. What does this teach us that all this very represents the views of our Mahir and that a slave is regarded as movable property, such property being mortgaged for a ketubah, and if you prefer I might say it is this that we were taught a slave is on the same footing as real estate Mishnah. If the child of a woman was interchanged with the child of her daughter-in-law, and when the interchanged children grew up, they took wives and then died, the other sons of the daughter-in-law submit to Elizabeth may not contract Levi rate marriage for in the case of each widow. And brother, it is uncertain whether she is the wife of his brother of the wife of his father's brother, the other sons of the grandmother either submit to Elizabeth or contract Levi rate marriage, since in the case of each widow and brother, the only doubt is whether she is the wife of his brother or the wife of his brother's son. If the untainted sons die, then the interchanged sons submit in respect of the widows of the sons of the grandmother to Elizabeth must not contract the Levi rate. Marriage since in the case of each widow and brother it is uncertain whether she is the wife of his brother or the wife of his father's brother while in respect of the widows of the sons of the daughter-in-law one submits to Elizabeth and the other may also contract the Levi rate marriage if the child of a priest's wife was interchanged with the child of her bondwoman behold both may eat terima and receive one share at the threshing floor Talmud, Masya Amath be they may not defile themselves for the dead nor may they marry any women whether these are eligible for marriage with a priest or ineligible if when they grew up the interchanged children emancipated one another they may marry women who are eligible for marriage with a priest and they may not defile themselves for the dead if however they defile themselves the penalty of forty stripes is not inflicted upon them they may not eat terima but if they did eat they need not pay compensation either for the principal or the additional fifth they are not to receive a share at the threshing floor but they may sell their own terima and the proceeds are theirs they receive no share in the consecrated things of the temple and no consecrated things are given to them but they are not deprived of their own they are exempt from giving to any priest the shoulder the cheeks and the maw while the firstling of either of them must remain in the pasture until it contracts a blemish the restrictions relating to priests and the restrictions relating to israelites are both imposed upon them Gemara, if the untainted sons died etc are then the others because they were mixed up tainted our papa replied right if those whose parentage was certain died in respect however of the widows of the sons of the daughter-in-law one submits to Elizabeth, etc only Elizabeth must take place first and the levirate marriage afterwards the levirate marriage however must not take place first since thereby one might infringe the prohibition against a sister-in-law's marriage with a stranger if the child of a priest's wife was interchanged etc. Obviously only one share read one share together here we learn the thing which is in agreement with him who ruled that no share of terima is given to a slave unless his master is with him for it was taught no share in terima is given to a slave unless his master is with him so Arjuna our Jose however ruled the slave may claim if I am a priest give me for my own sake and if I am a priest slave give me for the sake of my master in the place of Arjuna men of doubtful status were raised to the status of priesthood on the evidence that they received a share of terima in the place of our Jose however no one was raised to the status of priesthood on the evidence of having received a share of terima it was taught our Eliezer Bizotic said during the whole of my lifetime I have given evidence but once and through my statement they raised a slave to the priesthood. They raised to such an error conceivable if through the beast of the righteous the Holy One blessed be he does not cause an offense to be committed how much less through the righteous themselves rather read they desired to raise a slave to the priesthood through my statement he witnessed the occurrence in the place of our Jose but went and tendered his evidence in the place of our Judah our rabbis taught ten classes of people must not be given a share of terima at the threshing floors they are the following the death the imbecile the minor the tumtum the hermaphrodite the slave the woman the uncircumcised the levitically unclean and he who married a woman who is unsuitable for him in the case of all these however terima may be sent to their houses with the exception of the one who is levitically unclean and one who married a woman who is unsuitable for him now one can well understand the prohibition in respect of the death the imbecile and the minor since they lack Intelligence in respect of the tumtum and the hermaphrodite, also Talmud, Masi of Amethyst, since either of them is a peculiar creature, the slave too, because owing to the terima he might be raised to the priesthood, the uncircumcised and the unclean, also owing to their repulsiveness, and the priest who married a woman unsuitable for him as a penalty. But why should not a woman be given a share of terima on this question? Our Papa and Arhuna, son of our Joshua, differ. One explains owing to possible abuse by a divorced woman, and the other explains owing to the necessity of avoiding privacy between the sexes. What is the practical difference between them? The practical difference between them is the case of a threshing floor that is near a town but is unfrequented by people, or one that is distant from a town but frequented by people. In the case of all these, however, terima may be sent to their houses, with the exception of the one who is levitically unclean and one who married a woman. Who is unsuitable for him may terima then be sent to the uncircumcised. What is the reason? Is it because he is a victim of circumstances? A man who is levitically unclean is also a victim of circumstances. The force of circumstances in the former case is great, in the latter the force is not so great. Our rabbis taught neither to a slave nor to a woman may a share in terima be given at the threshing floors in places. However, where a share is given, it is to be given to the woman first, and she is immediately dismissed. What can this mean? It is this that was meant the poor man's tithe, which is distributed at home, is to be given to the woman first. What is the reason that the degradation of the woman may be avoided? Rabbis said formerly when a man and a woman came before me for a legal decision, I used to dispose of the man's lawsuit first because I thought a man is subject to the fulfillment of all the commandments. Since however I heard this, I dispose of a woman's lawsuit first. Why in? Order to save her from degradation if when they grew up the interchanged children etc. It states they emancipated implying only if they wished but if they did not wish they need not emancipate one another but why neither of them could marry either a bondwoman or a free woman robber replied read pressure is brought to bear upon them so that they emancipate one another the restrictions
Rabbis differ from our Eliezer only in respect of a priestly sinner's meal offering which is suitable for offering up but here even the rabbis agree Mishnah if a woman did not wait three months after separation from her husband and married again and gave birth to a son and it is unknown whether it is a nine-month child by the first husband or a seven-month child by the second if she had other sons by the first husband and other sons by the second these must submit to Elizabeth may not contract with her Levi rate marriage and he in respect of their widows likewise submits to Elizabeth may not contract Levi rate marriage Talmud, Masi of if he had brothers by the first and also brothers by the second but not by the same mother he may either submit to Elizabeth or contract the Levi rate marriage but as for them one submits to Elizabeth and the other maid and contract Levi rate marriage if one of the two husbands was an Israelite and the other a priest he may only marry a woman who is eligible to marry a priest he may not defile himself for the dead but if he did defile himself he does not suffer the penalty of forty stripes he may not eat terima but if he did eat he need not pay compensation either for the principal or for the additional fifth he does not receive a share at the threshing floor but he may sell his own terima and the proceeds are his he receives no share in the consecrated things of the temple no consecrated things are given to him but he is not deprived of his own he is exempt from giving to any priest the shoulder the cheeks and the maw while his firstling must remain in the pasture until it contracts a blemish the restrictions relating to priests and the restrictions relating to Israelites are imposed upon him if the two husbands were priests he must mourn as onan for them and they must mourn as one for him but he may not defile himself for them nor may they defile themselves for him he may not inherit from them but they may inherit from him he is exonerated if he strikes or curses the one or the other he goes up to serve in the mishmar of the one as well as of the other but he does not receive a share in the offerings if however both served in the same mishmar he receives a single portion tomorrow only the halizah must take place first and the levirate marriage afterwards the levirate marriage however must not take place first since thereby one might infringe the prohibition against the marriage of a sister-in-law with a stranger Samuel said if ten priests stood together and one of them separated from the company and cohabited with a femme soul the child that may result from the union is a shetaki in what respect is he a shetaki if it be suggested that he is silenced when he claims a share of his father's estate is not this it may be retorted self-evident do we know who is his father rather he is silenced if he claims any of the rights of priesthood what is the reason Scripture stated and it shall be unto him and to his seat after him it is therefore required that his seat shall be traced to him but this is not the case here our Papa demurred if that is so in the case of Abraham where it is written to be a God to thee and to thy seat after thee what does the all merciful exhort him thereby it is this that he said to him marry not an idolatrous or a bond woman so that your seat shall not be ascribed to her an objection was raised the first is fit to be a high priest but surely it is required that a priest's child shall be traced to his father which is not the case here the requirement that a priest's child shall be traced to his father is a rabbinical provision while the scriptural text is a mere prop and it is only in respect of prostitution that the rabbis have made their preventive measure in respect of marriage however no such measure was enacted by them but did the rabbis introduce such a preventive measure in the case of prostitution surely we learned if a woman did not wait three months after separation from her husband and married again and gave birth to a son now what is meant by after separation from her husband if it be suggested after the death of her husband read the final clause he must mourn as onan for them and they must mourn as one for him one can well understand the circumstances in which he mourns as onan for them such mourning being possible even in the case of marriage with the second husband on the occasion of the collecting of the bones of the first but how is it possible that they mourn as one for him when the first husband is dead if however it be suggested that our mission speaks of a divorced woman and that the meaning of after separation from her husband is after the divorce of her husband and read the final clause he may not defile himself for them nor may they defile themselves for him now one can understand that they may not defile themselves for him as a restrictive Measure since in respect of every one of them it may be assumed that he is possibly not his son but why may he not defile himself for them granted that he must not defile himself for the second for the first however he should be allowed to defile himself in any case for if he is his son then he may justly defile himself for him and if he is the son of the second he may legitimately defile himself for him since he is a halal consequently our mission must refer to a case of prostitution and the meaning of after separation from her husband must be after separation from the man who irregularly cohabited with her and yet it was stated in the final clause he may go up to serve in the mishmar of the one as well as of the other this then presents an objection against the ruling of Samuel Arshi may reply our mission refers to a minor who made a declaration of refusal but is a minor capable of propagation surely our recited before our three categories of women may use an absorbent in their marital intercourse a minor an expectant mother and a nursing wife the minor because she might become pregnant and as a result she might die an expectant mother because she might cause her foetus to degenerate into a sandal a nursing wife because she might have to wean her child prematurely and this would result in his death and what is the age of such a minor from the age of 11 years and one day until the age of 12 years and one day one who is under or over this age must carry on her marital intercourse in the usual manner this is the opinion of our mayor the sages however said the one as well as the other carries on her marital intercourse in the usual manner and mercy will be vouchsafed from heaven for it is said in the scriptures the lord preserveth the simple the case of our mission is possible with a mistaken betrothal and on the basis of a ruling of rab judah in the name of samuel for rab judah stated in the name of samuel in the name of our Ishmael and she be not ceased only then is she forbidden if however she was ceased she is permitted there is however another kind of woman who is permitted even if she was not ceased and who is she a woman whose betrothal was a mistaken one who may even if her son sits riding on her shoulder make a declaration of refusal against her husband and go away Talmud, Masya Bamathe if the two husbands were priests etc our rabbis taught if he struck one and then struck the other or if he cursed one and then cursed the other or cursed them both simultaneously or struck them both simultaneously he is guilty our Judah however said if simultaneously he is guilty if successively he is exonerated but surely it was taught our Judah stated that he is exonerated even if his offenses were simultaneous to Tanaim differ as to what was the opinion of our Judah what is the reason of him who exonerated our hand and replied blessing is spoken of in scripture in respect of parents on earth and blessing is spoken of in respect of God above as there is no association above so must there be no association below and striking has been compared to cursing he may go up to serve in the mishmar etc since however he does not receive a share why should he go up you ask why should he go up surely he might say I wish to perform a commandment but this is a difficulty it does not say if he went up but he goes up implying even against his will Arahabi Hanan in the name of Abay in the name of R.C. in the name of our Yohanan replied in order to avert any possible reflection on his family if however both served in the same mishmar etc in what respect do two mishmarot differ from one that in the former case he should not receive a share is it because when he comes to the one mishmar he is driven away and when he comes to the other mishmar he is again driven away then even in the case of one mishmar also when he comes to one beth of he is driven away and when he comes to the other Bethab he is also driven away our Papa replied it is this that was meant if however both served in the same Melshmar and in the same Bethab he receives a single portion C-H-A-P-T-E-R-X-I I mission the commandment of Halizah must be performed in the presence of three judges even though all the three are limited if a woman performed the Halizah with a shoe her Halizah is valid but if with a socket is invalid if with a sandal to which a heel is attached it is valid but if with one that has no heel it is invalid if the shoe was worn below the knee the Halizah is valid but if above the knee it is invalid if the woman performed the Halizah with a sandal that did not belong to him or with a wooden sandal or with the one of the left foot which he was wearing on his right foot the Halizah is valid if she performed the Halizah with a sandal too large for him in which however he is able to walk or with one too small which however covers the greater part of his foot her Halizah is valid Gemara since even three laymen are sufficient what need is there for judges it is this that we were taught that three men are required who are capable of dictating the prescribed text like judges thus we have learned here what the rabbis taught the commandment of Elizabeth is performed in the presence of three men who are able to dictate the prescribed text like judges are Judah said in the presence of five what is the first tenet's reason because it was taught elders
Talmud, Mas Yabamath before it is said in scripture, Thou art all fair, my love, and there is no spot in thee as to the former. However, what deduction does he make from the expression before the eyes of that expression serves the purpose of a deduction like that of Rabba Rabba having stated the judges must see the spittle issuing from the mouth of the sister in law because it is written in scripture before the eyes of the elders and spit, but does not the other also require the text for a deduction like that of Rabba? This is so indeed, whence then does he deduce the eligibility of Laman? He deduces it from an Israel implying any Israelite whatsoever as to the former. However, what deduction does he make from an Israel? He requires it for a deduction like that which our Samuel B. Judah taught in Israel implies that Eliza must be performed at a Beth of Israelites, but not at a Beth of proselytes, and the other in Israel is written a second time, and the former he Requires it for another deduction in accordance with what was taught. Our Judah stated we were once sitting before our Tarfan when a sister in law came to perform Eliza, and he said to us, Exclaim all of you the man that had his shoe drawn off, and the other this is deduced from, and his name shall be called if this is so, and they shall call implies two, and they shall speak also implies two, so that here also one might deduce according to our Judah. Behold, there are your nine, and according to the rabbis, behold, there are your seven. The text is required for a deduction in accordance with what was taught, and they shall call him, but not their representative, and they shall speak unto him, teaches that they give him suitable advice. If he, for instance, was young and she old, or if he was old and she was young, he is told, What would you with a young woman, or what would you with an old woman? Go to one who is of the same age as yourself, and introduce no quarrels into your home, Rabbis stated in. The name of Arnaman the Halachad is that Eliza is to be performed in the presence of three men since the Tana has taught us so anonymously said Rabba to Arnaman if so the same ruling should apply to me on also for we learned me on and Eliza must be witnessed by three men and should you reply that the Halachad is so indeed surely it may be retorted it was taught me on Beth Shammai ruled must be declared before Beth Din of experts and Beth Hillel ruled it may be performed either before Beth Din or not before Beth Din both however agree that a quorum of three is required our Jose son of our Judah and our Eliezer son of our Jose ruled the me on is valid even if it was declared before two and our Joseph B. Menumi reported in the name of Arnaman that the Halachad is in agreement with the spear there only one anonymous teaching is available while here two anonymous teachings are available there also two anonymous teachings are available for we learned if However, a woman made a declaration of refusal or performed Eliza in his presence, he may marry her since he was but one of the Beth Din, but the fact is that while there are only two anonymous teachings are available here, three anonymous teachings are available. Consider the one is an anonymous teaching and the other is an anonymous teaching. What difference does it make to me whether the anonymous teachings are one, two, or three? Rather said Arnam and B. Isaac, the reason is because the anonymity occurs in a passage recording a dispute, for we learn the laying on of hands by the elders and the breaking of the heifer's neck is performed by three elders. So our Jose, while our Judah stated by five elders, Eliza and declarations of Mion, however, are witnessed by three men, and since our Judah does not express disagreement, it may be inferred that our Judah changed his opinion. This proves it. Rabbis stated the judges must appoint a place where it is written, and his brother's wife shall go up. To the gate unto the elders our Papa and our Huna son of our Joshua arranged Eliza in the presence of five in accordance with whose view was it in accordance with that of our Judah he surely had changed his opinion their object was to give the matter due publicity our Ashi once happened to be at Arkahana's when the latter said to him the master has come up to us at an opportune moment to complete a quorum of five Arkahana stated I was once standing in the presence of Rab Judah when he said to me come get onto this bundle of reeds that you may be included in a quorum of five on being asked what need is there for five he replied in order that the matter be given due publicity our Samuel B. Judah once stood before Rab Judah when the latter said to him come get onto this bundle of reeds to be included in a quorum of five in order that the matter be thereby given due publicity we learned the first remark in Israel implies that Eliza must be performed at a Beth of Israelites but not at a Beth Din of proselytes, while I am in fact a proselyte on the word of a man like our Samuel B. Judah Rab Judah said I would withdraw money from its possessor. You say withdraw could this be imagined? Surely the all merciful said at the mouth of two witnesses, rather it is this that he meant I would on his word impair the validity of a note of indebtedness. Rabbis stated Talmud, Mas Yabamath a proselyte may according to Pentateuchal law sit in judgment on a fellow proselyte, for it is said. In the scriptures thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee whom the Lord thy God shall choose one from among thy brethren, shalt thou set king over the only one set over thee is he required to be one from among thy brethren when however he is to judge his fellow proselyte, he may himself be a proselyte if his mother was an Israelitish woman, he may sit in judgment even on an Israelite in respect of Eliza. However, no man is eligible as judge unless both his father and his mother were. Israelites, for it is said, and his name shall be called in Israel. Rabbis stated in the name of Arkahana, in the name of Rabbi Elijah, should come and declare that Eliza may be performed with a foot covering shoe. He would be obeyed. Were he, however, to declare that Eliza may not be performed with a sandal, he would not be obeyed. For the people have long ago adopted the practice of performing it with a sandal. Our Joseph, however, reported in the name of Arkahana, in the name of Rabbi Elijah, should come and declare that Eliza may not be performed with a foot covering shoe. He would be obeyed. Were he, however, to declare that Eliza may not be performed with a sandal, he would not be obeyed. For the people have long ago adopted the practice of performing it with a sandal. What is the practical difference between them? The practical difference between them is the propriety of using a foot covering shoe of initio, according to him, however, who stated that it was proper to use it even a Initio surely it may be objected we learned if a woman performed the Eliza with a foot covering shoe her Eliza is valid which implies validity only after the action had been performed but not of initio the same law is applicable even where the shoe was used of initio as however it was desired to state in the final clause but if with the socket is invalid the law which applies even after the action had been performed a similar expression was also used in the first clause on the question of using a foot covering shoe of initio tanaim differ for it was taught our Jose related I once went to Nisibis where I met an old man whom I asked are you perchance acquainted with our Judah Bibathura and he replied yes and he in fact always sits at my table have you ever seen him arranging a Eliza ceremony for a sister in law asked I saw him arranging Eliza ceremonies many a time he replied with a foot covering shoe I asked or with a sandal may Eliza be Performed, he asked me with a foot covering shoe. I replied, Were that not so, what could have caused our Meir to state that Eliza if performed with a foot covering shoe is valid? While our Jacob reported in his name that it was quite proper to perform even Eliza of Initio with a foot covering shoe, with reference to him who ruled that it was not proper of Initio to perform Eliza with a foot covering shoe, what could be the reason if it be suggested because the loosing of the upper may be described as from off and the loosing of the thong is from off of the from off of performance, which is not in accordance with the Torah, which said from off but not from off of the from off, it could well be retorted that if such were the reason the Eliza should be invalid even when actually performed, this is a preventive measure against the possible use of a flabby shoe or even half a shoe. Said Rab, had I not seen my uncle arranging a Eliza with a sandal that had laces, I would. Have allowed a Eliza only with an Arabian sandal which can be more firmly fastened and in respect of our kind of sandal though it has a knot a strap also should be tied to it so that the Eliza may be properly performed. The monarchy permitted a sister-in-law a sandal. Rab Judah reported in the name of Rab the permissibility of a sister-in-law to marry a stranger takes effect as soon as the greater part of the heel is released an objection was raised if the straps of a foot covering shoe or of a sandal were untied or if the lever slipped it off from the greater part of his foot the Eliza is invalid the reason then is because it was he that slipped it off had she however slipped it off her Eliza would have been valid and furthermore this applies to the greater part of the foot only but not to the greater part of the heel the greater part of the foot has the same meaning as the greater part of the heel and the reason why he calls it the greater part of the foot is because all the weight of the foot rests on it, this provides support for our Jane. For our Jane stated whether the lever untied the straps and she slipped off the sandal, or whether she untied the straps and he slipped off the sandal, her Eliza rem
The sandal from the foot of one of them. The reason then is because we did not actually observe it. Had we, however, observed it, the possibility that her halizah was valid would have had to be taken into consideration. But surely it was taught whether he had the intention of performing the commandment of halizah and she had no such intention, or whether she had such intention and he did not. Halizah is invalid. It being necessary that both shall at the same time have such intention. It is this. That was meant. Although we observed it, there is no need to consider the possibility that they might have intended to give their action the character of a valid halizah. Others read the reason is because we did not see it. Had we, however, seen it, the possibility of a valid halizah would have had to be considered. The statement that intention is necessary applying only to the permissibility of the woman to strangers, but to the brothers she does become forbidden. Rab Judah stated in the name of. Rab no may be performed with a sandal that was sewn with flax for it is said in scripture and I shod thee with tahash might it be suggested that the skill of a tahash is admissible but not any other material the mention of shoe twice indicates the inclusion of all kinds of leather if the repeated mention of shoe indicates the inclusion of all kinds of leather all other materials should also be included if that were so for what purpose was the term tahash used rla is required of rab what is the law where the sandal was made of leather and its straps of animal hair the other replied could we not apply to it and I shod thee with tahash if so a shoe all made of hair should also be admissible such as called a slipper said arkahana to samuel whence is it derived that the verb in wheels his shoe from off his foot signifies taking off because it is written that they shall take out the stones in which the plague is but I might suggest that the meaning is that of Arming for it is written in scripture, arm ye men from among you for the war. There also the underlying meaning is the slipping out from the house to go to war, but surely it is also written in scripture. He girds the afflicted in his affliction. The meaning is that as a reward for his affliction, he will deliver him from the judgment of Gehenna. What, however, is the explanation of the scriptural text? The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him, and he girds them. The meaning is that as a reward for those who fear him, he will deliver them from the judgment of Gehenna. What explanation is there, however, for the scriptural text? And he will make strong thy bones, of which our Eliezer said that this was the best of the blessings. And Rabbah explained that the meaning was the strengthening of the bones. Yes, it may bear the one meaning, and it may also bear the other. But were the meaning here intended to be that of tying on the all merciful should have written wheels his shoe. Upon his foot, but it might be still objected. Had the all merciful written upon his foot, it might have been suggested only upon his foot, but not upon his leg. Hence, the all merciful wrote from off his foot to indicate that Eliza may be performed even on the lover's leg. If so, the all merciful should have written upon what is above his foot. Why then did he use the expression from off his foot? Consequently, it must be inferred that the meaning is to take off a certain man once said to Argamaliel, You are a people with whom its God has performed Eliza, for it is said in scripture, with their flocks and with their herds they shall go to seek the Lord, but they shall not find him. He hath drawn off the shoe from them. The other replied, Fool, is it written, He hath drawn off the shoe for them? It is written, He hath drawn off the shoe from them. Now, in the case of a sister in law from whom the brother drew off the shoe, could there be any validity in the act? But if with a socket, is invalid, etc. This then teaches that a sock is not regarded as a shoe, and so it was also taught the man who removes the monies from the temple treasury must not enter with a border tunic or with a sock, and there is no need to state that he must not enter with a shoe or with a sandal, since no one may enter the temple court with a shoe or a sandal, but elsewhere the contrary was taught one must not walk with a shoe, a sandal, or a sock either from one house to another or even from one bed to another bed. Abbe replied, This refers to a sock which is furnished with pads. The prohibition being due to the pleasure its wearing affords, said Rabbah to him, is all footwear forbidden on the day of atonement because of the pleasure it affords, even though it cannot be regarded as a shoe. Surely Rabbah, son of Arhuna, used to wrap a scarf around his foot and so went out, but in fact, said Rabbah, there is no difficulty. The one bearing the refers to a leather sock, the other to a felt sock. This Explanation is indeed reasonable for were you not to say so a contradiction would arise between one statement dealing with the Day of Atonement and another statement which also deals with the Day of Atonement for it was taught no man may walk about in slippers in his house but he may walk about in his house in socks consequently it must be inferred that one statement refers to a leather sock and the other to a felt sock this proves that it was taught in agreement with Rabbah if a sister-in-law performed Eliza with a torn shoe which covered the greater part of the lover's foot with a broken sandal which contained the greater part of his foot with a sandal of cork or a bast with an artificial foot with a felt sock with the support of the feet or with a leather sock and also where she performed Eliza with an adult Talmud Mas Yabab, whether he was standing sitting or reclining and also if her Eliza was performed with a blind man her Eliza is valid if her Eliza, however was performed with a torn shoe that did not cover the greater part of the lover's foot with a broken sandal which does not hold the greater part of his foot with the support of the hands or with a cloth sock and also where her halizah was performed with a minor her halizah is invalid whose view is represented in the first statement mentioning the artificial foot obviously that of Armaeir for we learned the cripple may go out on the Sabbath with his artificial foot so Armaeir and Arhose forbids it but the latter statement with a cloth sock can only represent the view of the rabbis Abbe replied since the latter statement represents the opinion of the rabbis the first also must represent the opinion of the rabbis the first dealing with an artificial foot that was covered with leather said Rabbah to him what however is the law if it was not covered with leather is it then unfit if so instead of teaching in the latter statement with a cloth sock a distinction should have been drawn in respect of the artificial foot itself, this applies only where it was covered with leather, but if it was not covered with leather, it is unfit. Rather, said Rabbah, since the first statement represents the view of Armaeir, the latter also represents the view of Armaeir, the one affording protection while the other affords no protection. Amimar stated, when a lover submits to Eliza, he must press down his foot to the ground, said Arashi to Amimar, was it not taught that the Eliza was valid whether he was standing, sitting, or reclining, red, and in all these cases only if he pressed his foot to the ground. Amimar further stated, a man who walks on the upper side of his foot must not submit to Eliza, said Arashi to Amimar, but surely it was taught supports of the feet does not this signify that such a cripple may submit to Eliza with a support. No, the meaning is that he may give it to another person who is allowed to submit to Eliza with it, said Arashi, according to. Amimar's ruling neither Baroba nor Barkipov could submit to Eliza if the shoe was worn below the knee, etc. A contradiction was pointed out. Regalim excludes stump legged cripples. Here it is different since it was written in scripture from off his foot. If so, Eliza should be permissible above the knee, also from off, but not from off the from offset or papa from this. It may be inferred that the Estuara reaches down to the ground for were it to be imagined that it is disconnected. It would be situated above the foot while the leg would be above that which is above the foot. Arashi, however, said it may even be said that it is disconnected, but any part adjacent to the foot is legally regarded as the foot itself above the knee. Arkahana raised an objection and against her afterbirth that cometh out from between her feet. Abe replied when a woman kneels down to give birth, she presses her heels against her thighs and thus gives birth. Come and here he had neither dressed. His feet nor trimmed his beard. This is a euphemistic expression. Come in here. And Saul went in to cover his feet. This is a euphemistic expression. Come in here. Surely he is covering his feet in the cabinet of the cool chamber. This is a euphemistic expression between her feet, etc. This is a euphemistic expression. Our Yohanan said that profligate had seven sexual connections on that day. For it is said between her feet he sunk, he fell. He lay at her feet he sunk, he fell. Where he sunk, there he fell. Down dead. But surely she derived gratification from the transgression. Our Yohanan replied in the name of our Simeon. Behold, all the favors of the wicked Talmud. Mas Yabamath be are evil for the righteous. For it is said, take heed to thyself that thou speak not to Jacob either good or evil. Now as regards evil, one can perfectly well understand the meaning. But why not good from here? Then it may be inferred that the favor of the wicked is evil for the righteous. There one can well see the reason. Since he might possibly mention to him the name of his idol, what evil, however, could be involved here that of infusing her with sensual lust for our Yohanan stated when the serpent copulated with Eve, he infused her with lust, the lust of the Israelites who stood at Mount Sinai came to an end, the
That is under observation of Eliza, however, that has been performed with it is valid. No Eliza may be performed with a sandal. The leprous condition of which has been confirmed, and even a Eliza that had already been performed with it is invalid. Our Papa, however, stated in the name of Rabba, no Eliza may be performed either with a sandal under observation or with one. The leprous condition of which had been confirmed, a Eliza, however, that had been performed with either is valid. An objection was raised. A house locked up imparts uncleanness from within, and a house confirmed in its leprous condition imparts uncleanness both within and without the one as well as the other imparts uncleanness to anyone entering. Now, if it is to be assumed that an object doomed to destruction is regarded as already crushed to dust, surely it may be objected. The requirement there is that he goeth into the house, but such a house is not in existence there. It is different because Scripture said. And he shall break down the house even at the time of breaking down it is still called house come and here a leper strip of cloth measuring three finger breadths by three even if in volume it does not amount to the size of an olive causes as soon as the greater part of it has entered a clean house the defilement of that house does not this refer to a strip of cloth the uncleanness of which had been confirmed no it refers to one under observation but if so read the final clause if in volume it constituted the size of many olives as soon as a portion of it of the size of an olive enters a clean house it causes the uncleanness of that house now if you grant that the reference is to a strip of confirmed leprosy one can well understand why it was compared to a corpse if however you maintain that the reference is to a strip under observation why it may be objected was it compared to a corpse there it is different for scripture said and he shall burn the garment even at the time of burning it is still called garment, then let Eliza be deduced from it. A prohibition cannot be deduced from the laws of uncleanness. Rabba stated the law is that a sister in law may not perform Eliza either with a sandal under observation or with a sandal of confirmed leprosy or with a sandal belonging to an idol. If however she has performed Eliza with either of these, her Eliza is valid with a sandal that was offered to an idol Talmud, Masi of Amethyst, or with one that belonged to a condemned city or with one that was made in honor of a dead elder. No Eliza may be performed, and even a Eliza that has been performed with it is invalid. Said Rabbanu to Arashi, in what respect is the sandal that was made in honor of a dead elder different from an ordinary sandal? Is it because it was not made for walking that of the Bethdin also was not made for walking? The other replied, should the attendant of the Bethdin use it for walking with the Bethdin? Object Mishnah If a sister in law performed the Haliza at night, her Haliza is valid. Our Eliezer, however, regards it as invalid if she performed it with the lovers left to her Haliza is invalid, but our Eliezer declares it to be valid. Gamara may it be suggested that they differ on the following principle. The one master holds the opinion that lawsuits are to be compared to plates, while the other master holds the opinion that lawsuits cannot be compared to plates. No, all agree that lawsuits cannot be compared to plates, for should they be compared, even the close of a legal process could not have been allowed at night. Here, however, they differ on the following principle. One's master holds that Haliza is like the commencement of legal proceedings, and the other master holds that Haliza is like the close of the proceedings. Rabbi Bihai of Dizavon carried out a Haliza with a felt sock with no other men present at night, said Samuel. How great is his authority in acting on? The view of one individual would however could be his objection if against the use of the felt sock an anonymous bury the permits it if against his acting at night or anonymous mission permits this his objection however is that Rabbi acted alone how he objected could he act alone when it was only one individual who expressed approval of such a procedure for we learned if a sister in law performed Haliza in the presence of two or three men and one of them was discovered to be a relative or in any other way unfit to act as judge her Haliza is invalid but our Simeon and our Yohanan Hasandler declare it valid furthermore it once happened that a man submitted to Haliza with none present but himself and herself in a prison and when the case came before our Akiba he declared the Haliza valid and if you prefer I might say all these rulings also are the views of an individual for it was taught our Ishmael son of our Jose stated I saw our Ishmael be Alicia carry out a Haliza. With a felt sock with no other men present and this occurred at night with the lovers left to her halizah etc. What is the rabbi's reasonable reply? The meaning of foot here is deduced from that of foot in the context of the leper as there it is the right so here also it must be the right does not our Eliezer then deduce the meaning of foot here from that of foot in the context of the leper surely it was taught our Eliezer stated whence is it deduced that the boring of the ear of a Hebrew slave must be performed on his right ear for the term ear was used here and the term ear was also used elsewhere as there it is the right ear so here also it is the right ear our Isaac P. Joseph replied in the name of our Yohan and the statement is to be reversed Rabbi said there is in fact no need to reverse the statement the reply to the objection being that the terms ear are both free for the deduction the terms of foot however are not free for deduction but even if one of the texts is not free for deduction. What objection can be raised against the deduction? It may be objected. The case of the leper is different since he is also required to bring cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet. Mishnah: If a sister in law drew off the lover's shoe and spat but did not recite the formula, her haliza is valid. If she recited the formula and spat but did not draw off the shoe, her haliza is invalid. If she drew off the shoe and recited the formula but did not spit, her haliza. Our Eliezer stated is invalid and our Akiva stated her haliza is valid. Talmud, Masi of said our Eliezer to him, Scripture stated, so shall be done anything which is a deed is a sign. Quanan, our Akiva, however, said to him from this very text, proof may be this for my view, so shall be done unto the man only that which is to be done unto the man. If a deaf lover submitted to haliza or if a deaf sister in law performed haliza or if haliza was performed on a minor, the haliza is invalid. Sister-in-law who performed Haliza while she was a minor must again perform Haliza when she becomes of age and if she does not again perform it the Haliza is invalid if a sister-in-law performed Haliza in the presence of two or three men and one of them was discovered to be a relative or one in any other way unfit to act as judge her Haliza is invalid but our Simeon and our Yohanan Hasandler declare it valid furthermore it once happened that a man submitted to Haliza privately between himself and herself in a prison and when the case came before our Akiba he declared the Haliza valid Gamara Rabba said now that you have stated that the recital of the formula is not a sign quanan the Haliza of a dumb man and a dumb woman is valid we learned if a deaf were submitted to Haliza or if a deaf sister-in-law performed Haliza or if a Haliza was performed on a minor the Haliza is invalid now what is the reason is it not because these are unable to recite the formula no because they are not in complete possession of their mental faculties if so the same applies also to a dumb man and to a dumb woman Robert replied a dumb man and a dumb woman are in full possession of their mental faculties and it is only their mouth that troubles them but surely at the school of Arjana it was explained that the reason why a deaf mute is unfit for Haliza is because the scriptural instruction he shall say or she shall say is inapplicable to such a case say rather if Robert's statement was ever made it was made in connection with the final clause if a deaf lover submitted to Haliza or if a deaf sister-in-law performed Haliza or if a Haliza was performed on a minor the Haliza is invalid it is in connection with this that Robert said now that you have stated that the recital of the formula is a sign quanan the Haliza of a dumb man or a dumb woman is invalid and our mission is based on the same principle as that propounded by Arzera for Arzera. Stated wherever proper mingling is possible, actual mingling is not essential, but where proper mingling is not possible, the actual mingling is a sign quanan. The following ruling was sent to Samuel's father, a sister-in-law who spat must perform the Haliza. This implies that she is rendered unfit for the brothers, but whose view is this? If it be suggested that it is that of our Akiva, it may be objected if our Akiva said that it was not indispensable even where the actual commandment of Haliza is being performed, in which case it could be argued that it could be given the same force as the burning of the altar portions of the sacrifices, which is not an essential right when the portions are not available, and yet is a sign quanan when they are available, would he regard it as a reason for the woman to become thereby unfit for the brothers? Should it be suggested, however, that the view is that of our Eliza, surely it may be retorted, are two acts which jointly affect. Permissibility and any two acts that jointly affect permissibility are ineffective one without the other rather the view is in agreement with that of rabbi for it was taught the Pentecostal lambs caused the consecration of the bread only by their slaughter in what manner if
Drew up a lover's shoe but did not spit nor recite her Eliza is valid when surely our Eliza said so shall be done anything which is a deed is a sign qua non it is consequently obvious that it is a view of our Akiba and yet it was stated that if she spat but did not draw off the shoe nor recite her Eliza is invalid to whom however does the invalidity cause her to be forbidden if it be suggested to strangers is not this it may be retorted itself evident is it a Eliza like this. That would enable the sister-in-law to become free to marry a stranger it must therefore be admitted that the validity refers to her state of prohibition to the brothers thus you have our contention proved according to our Akiba wherein lies the legal difference between the act of spitting and that of reciting recital that must take place both at the commencement of the Eliza ceremony and at its conclusion cannot be mistaken spitting however which does not take place at the beginning but only at the end might be mistaken for a proper Haliza and thus a proper Haliza also would be permitted to marry the brothers. Others say that the following ruling was sent to him a sister-in-law who spat may afterwards perform Haliza and need not spit a second time. So in fact it once happened that a sister-in-law who came before RMI while Arabu Bimemel was sitting in his presence spat prior to her drawing off the shoe arranged the Haliza for her said RMI to him and dismiss her case but surely said Arabu to him spitting is a requirement she has spat indeed but let her spit again what could be the objection the issue might morally and religiously be disastrous for should you rule that she is to spit again people might assume that her first spitting was ineffective and thus a proper Haliza also would be permitted to marry the brothers but is it not necessary that the various parts of the Haliza should follow in the prescribed order the order of the performances is not essential he thought at the time that the other was merely shaking him off when however he went out he carefully considered the point and discovered that it was taught whether drawing off the shoe preceded the spitting or whether spitting preceded the drawing off the action performed is validly by once went out to visit the country towns when he was asked may a woman whose hand was amputated perform Eliza what is a legal position where a sister-in-law spat blood it is stated in scripture howbeit I will declare unto thee that which is inscribed in the writing of truth does this then imply that there exists a divine writing that is not of truth he was unable to answer when he came and asked these questions at the academy they answered him is it written and she shall draw off with her hand is it written and spit spittle as to the question howbeit I will declare unto thee that which is inscribed in the writing of truth does this then imply that there exists a divine Writing that is not a truth there is really no difficulty for the former refers to a divine decree that was accompanied by an oath while the latter refers to one that was not accompanied by an oath this is in accordance with the statement of our Samuel BMI for our Samuel BMI stated in the name of our Jonathan whence is it deduced that a decree which is accompanied by an oath is never annulled from the scriptural text therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated with sacrifice nor offering forever Rebbe said it will not be expiated with sacrifice nor offering but it will be expiated with the words of the Torah Abbe said it will not be expiated with sacrifice nor offering but it will be expiated with the practice of loving kindness Rabbi and Abbe were both descendants of the house of Eli Rabbi who engaged in the study of the Torah lived 40 years Abbe however who engaged in the study of the Torah and the practice of Loving kindness lived sixty years. Our rabbis taught there was a certain family in Jerusalem whose members used to die when they were about the age of eighteen. When they came and acquainted our Yohanan Bizakai with the fact, he said to them, Perchance you are descendants of the family of Eli, concerning whom it is written in Scripture, and all the increase of thy house shall die. Young men go and engage in the study of the Torah, and you will live. They went and engaged in the study of the Torah and lived longer lives. They were consequently called the family of Yohanan. After him, our Samuel Bionia stated in the name of Rabbi, once is it deduced that a divine dispensation against the congregation is not sealed? You say is not sealed. Surely it is written, for though thou wash thee with nitre and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is marked before me. But this is the question: Whence is it deduced that even if it has been sealed, it is torn up from the scriptural text? What is the Lord? Our God is whensoever we call upon him, but surely it is written, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. This is no contradiction. The latter applies to an individual, the former to a congregation, and when may an individual find him, our Naman replied in the name of Rabbi Abba in the ten days between the new year and the day of atonement. The following ruling was sent to Samuel's father, a sister in law who spat blood shall perform Eliza because it is impossible that blood should not contain. Some diluted particles of spittle and objection was raised. It might have been assumed that blood that issues from his mouth or membrane viral is unclean, hence it was explicitly stated his issue is unclean, but the blood which issues from his mouth or from his membrane viral is not unclean but clean. This is no contradiction. The former is a case where she sucks in the latter where the blood flows gently if a deflever submitted to Eliza, etc. Talmud, Masyabamat, Rab Judah stated in the name. A rab, this is a view of our mayor, but the sages maintain that the Eliza of a minor has no effect at all. A sister-in-law who performed Eliza while she was a minor, etc. Rab Judah stated in the name of Rab, this is a view of our mayor who stated in the Pentateuchal section of Eliza the expression man is used and a woman is to be compared to the man. The sages, however, maintain that in the Pentateuchal section man was written and as to a woman whether she is of age or a minor her Eliza. Is valid who is the Tana here described as the sages, it is our Jose for our high and our Simeon be rabbi once sat together when one of them began as follows a man who offers up his prayers must direct his eyes towards the temple below for it is said and mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually, and the other said the eyes of him who offers up prayers shall be directed towards the heavens above for it is said, let us lift up our heart with our hand in the meanwhile they were joined. By our Ishmael son of our Jose, on what subject are you engaged? He asked them on the subject of prayer. They replied, My father, he said to them, Rule thus a man who offers up his prayers must direct his eyes to the sanctuary below and his heart towards the heavens above, so that these two scriptural texts may be complied with. While this was going on, Rabbi entered the academy. They being nimble got into their places quickly. Our Ishmael son of our Jose, however, owing to his corpulence, could only move to his place with slow steps. Who is this man cried out, Dan out to him who strides over the heads of the holy people? The other replied, I am Ishmael son of our Jose, who have come to learn Torah from Rabbi. Are you first fit? The first said to him to learn Torah from Rabbi was Moses fit. The other retorted to learn Torah from the lips of the omnipotent. Are you Moses indeed? The first exclaimed, Is then your master a God? The other retorted, Our Jose remarked, Rabbi God, what he merited when the one said to the other your master and not my master while this was proceeding a sister-in-law came before rabbi go out said rabbi you have done and have her examined after the latter went out our ishmael said to him thus said my father in the pentateuchal section man is written but as to a woman whether she is of age or a minor her is valid come back he cried after him you need not arrange for any examination the grand old man has already given his decision on the subject of dan now came back picking his steps when our ishmael son of our jose exclaimed he of whom the holy people is in need may well stride over the heads of the holy people but how dare he of whom the holy people has no need stride over the heads of the holy people remain in your place said rabbi you have done it was taught at that instant of became leprous his two sons were drowned and his two daughters-in-law made declarations of refusal blessed be the all merciful said our be isaac who has put Abdan to shame in this world we May learn from the words of this eminent scholar said RMI that a sister in law who is a minor may perform Eliza while she is still in her childhood. Rabbi said she must wait with Eliza until she has reached the age of valid vows. The law, however, is that she must not perform Eliza until she has produced two pubic hairs. If a sister in law performed Eliza in the presence of two, etc., our Joseph B. Menumi stated in the name of Arnaman the Halachah is not in agreement with this pair. But surely Arnaman had once stated this for our Joseph B. Menumi stated in the name of Arnaman the Halachah is that Eliza must be performed in the presence of three judges. Both are required for if the first only had been stated, it might have been assumed that three judges are required of an issue only, but that ex post facto even two judges are enough. Hence, we were taught that the Halachah is not in agreement with this pair, and if we had been taught that the Halachah is not in Agreement with this peer, but in accordance with the ruling of the first tenet, it might have been assumed that this applies only ex post facto, but that of initial
She gives you 200 zoo so it was also taught elsewhere a halizah under a false assumption is valid and what is meant by a halizah under a false assumption one in which the lover is told submit to her halizah on condition that she gives you 200 zoo such an incident in fact occurred with a woman who fell to the lot of an unworthy lover who was told submit to her halizah on condition that she gives you 200 zoo when this case came before our high he ruled that the halizah was valid a woman once came before our high b abba stand up my daughter the rabbi said to her her sitting is her standing replied her mother do you know this man the rabbi asked yes she answered him it is her money that he saw and he would like to it do you not like him then he asked the woman no she replied submit to her halizah the rabbi said to the lover and you will thereby wed her after the latter had submitted to halizah at her hands he said to him now she is ineligible to marry you Submit again to a proper halizah that she may be permitted to marry a stranger, a daughter of our papa's father in law, fell to the lot of a lover who was unworthy of her. When the lover came before Abbe, the latter said to him, Submit to her halizah, and you will thereby wed her. Said our papa to him, Does not the master accept the relevant ruling of our Yohan? And what then could I tell him? The other asked, Tell him the first replied, Submit to her halizah on condition that she gives you two hundred. Zeus, after the lover had submitted to halizah at her hand, Abbe said to her, Go and give him the stipulated sum. She, our papa replied, Was merely fooling him. Was it not in fact taught if a man escaping from prison beheld a ferry boat and said to the ferryman, Take a dinar and lead me across the latter can only claim his ordinary fare from this? Then it is evident that the one can say to the other, I was merely fooling you. So here also the woman may say, I was merely fooling you. Where is your Father Abbe asked him in town the other replied where is your mother in town the other again replied he set his eyes upon them and they died our rabbis taught Halizah under a false assumption is valid a letter of divorce given under a false assumption is invalid Halizah under coercion is invalid a letter of divorce given under compulsion is valid how is this to be understood if it is a case where the man ultimately says I am willing the Halizah also should be valid and if he does not say I am willing a letter of divorce also should not be valid it is this that was meant Halizah under a false assumption is always valid and a letter of divorce given on a false assumption is always invalid but Halizah under coercion and a letter of divorce given under coercion are sometimes valid and sometimes invalid the former when the man ultimately declared I am willing and the latter when he did not declare I am willing for it was taught he shall offer it teaches that the man is coerced it might be assumed that the sacrifice may be offered up against his will it was therefore expressly stated in accordance with his will how then are the two texts to be reconciled he is subjected to pressure until he says I am willing and so you find in the case of letters of divorce for women the man is subjected to pressure until he says I am willing Robert reported in the name of R.C. or in the name of Arhuna Halizah may be arranged even though the parties are unknown a declaration of refusal may be arranged even though the parties are unknown for this reason no certificate of Halizah may be written unless the parties are known and no certificate of Mion may be written unless the parties are known for fear of an erring Beth in Rabbah in his own name however stated Halizah must not be arranged unless the parties are known nor may a declaration of refusal be heard unless the parties are known for this reason it is permissible to write a certificate of Halizah, even though the parties are not known, and it is also permissible to write a certificate of me on, even though the parties are not known, and we are not afraid of an erring Beth in Talmud. Mas Yabamat B. Mishnah, this is the procedure in the performance of the commandment of Halizah. He and his deceased brother's wife come unto the Beth in, and the latter offer him such advice as is suitable to his condition, for it is said in the scriptures, and the elders of his city shall call him. And speak unto him, she then announces, My husband's brother refused to raise up unto his brother a name in Israel, he will not perform the duty of a husband's brother unto me. Then he makes the declaration, I like not to take her. These formulae were always spoken in the holy tongue, then shall his brother's wife draw nigh unto him in the presence of the elders, and draw his shoe from off his foot, and spit before his face such spittle as the judges can see, and she raises her voice and says so. Shall it be done unto the man that doth not build up his brother's house thus far you stay to recite when however our hearken is under the terebinth that far atam once dictated the reading and completed the entire section the practice was established to complete the entire section that his name shall be called in Israel the house of him that had his shoe drawn off is a commandment to be performed by the judges and not by the disciples our Judah however ruled it is a duty incumbent upon all present to cry the man that had his shoe drawn off him our Rab Judah stated this is the procedure in the performance of the commandment of Eliza she recites he recites she draws off his shoe spits and recites what does he teach us by the statement this is our very mission it is this that he teaches us the prescribed procedure is such but if the order was reversed it does not matter so it was also taught whether the drawing off of the shoe preceded the spitting or whether the spitting Preceded the drawing off the act is valid Abbe ruled the man who dictates the Halizah formula shall not read for the woman the word not separately and the clause he will perform the duty of a husband's brother unto me separately since this would convey the meaning he desires to perform the duty of a husband's brother to me but should read without a pause he will not perform the duty of a husband's brother unto me nor shall he read for the lover the word not separately and the clause. I like separately for this would convey the meaning I like to take her but he should read without a pause I like not to take her Rabbah however stated this is only the conclusion of a sentence and in a concluding clause a pause is of no consequence our Ashi found our Kahana making a painful effort to read out for a woman he will not perform the duty of a husband's brother unto me without a pause does not the master he asked him except the ruling of Rabbah Rabbah the other replied admits in the Case of the formula he will not perform the duty of a husband's brother unto me that no pause is permitted Abbe stated the person who writes a certificate of Eliza shall word it as follows we read out for her from my husband's brother refused to will perform the duty of a husband's brother unto me and we read out for him from not to, to take her and we read out for her from so to him that had his shoe drawn off Mars it ruled the paper and copied the full text Mar B E D demurred but surely a section only of the Pentateuch is not permitted to be written the law however is in agreement with the ruling of Mars it Abbe stated if when she spat the wind carried the spittle away her act is invalid what is the reason it is necessary that she shall spit before his face if therefore he was tall and she was short and the wind carried the spittle away her act is deemed to have been before his face if however she was tall and he was short it is necessary that the spittle shall Drop to the level of his face before it disappears. Rabbah stated if she ate garlic and then spat, or if she ate a clot of earth and then spat, her act is invalid. What is the reason? Because it is necessary that she shall spit of her own free will, which is not the case here. Rabbah further stated the judges must see the spittle issuing from the mouth of the sister in law because it is written in scripture before the eyes of the elders and spit that his name shall be called in Israel the house of him that had his shoe drawn off is a commandment to be performed by the judges and not by the disciples. It was taught our Judah stated we were once sitting before our Tarfan when a sister in law came to perform Halizah and he said to us, Exclaim all of you, Halas Hayanael, Halas Hayanael, Halas Hayanael Talmud, Masyab Amath Achapterxii Mishnah Beth Shammai ruled only those who are betrothed may exercise the right of refusal, but Beth Hillel ruled both those who are betrothed and those. Who are married Beth Shammai ruled a declaration of refusal may be made against the husband but not against the lover but Beth Hillel ruled either against the husband or against the lover Beth Shammai ruled the declaration must be made in his presence but Beth Hillel ruled either in his presence or not in his presence Beth Shammai ruled the declaration must be made before Beth Din, but Beth Hillel ruled either before Beth Din or not before Beth Din. Beth Hillel said to Beth Shammai a girl may exercise the right of refusal while she is a minor even four or five times Beth Shammai however answered them the daughters of Israel are not ownerless property but if one makes a declaration of refusal she must wait till she is of age and declare her refusal and marry again Gamar Rab Judah stated in the name of Samuel what is Beth Shammai's reason because no stipulation is attachable to a marriage and were a married minor to be allowed to exercise the right of refusal it would come to be Assume that a stipulation is attachable to a marriage what reason however could be advanced where she only entered the bridal chamber and no cohabitation had taken place because no condition is attachable to an entry into the bridal chamber
Contrary since it is laid down that she may exercise the right of refusal her husband would make every effort to improve her property fearing that if he should not do this her relatives might give her their advice against him and thus take her away from him Rabbah stated the real reason of Beth Shammai is because no man would take the trouble to prepare a meal and then spoil it and Beth Hillel both are pleased to be married to each other in order that they may be known as married. People Beth Shammai ruled against the husband etc. Arashai stated she may make a declaration of refusal in respect of his mamar but she has no right to make a declaration of refusal in respect of his Levi rape on set Arhista what is Arashai's reason she has the power to annul a mamar which is affected with her consent she has no power however to sever the Levi rape on since it is binding on her against her will but surely Levi rape marriage by cohabitation may be affected against her. Will Talmud, Mas Yav and yet she may annul it. This, however, is really the reason she may annul a kanyan by cohabitation or by a mamar because it is the lover who affects it. She cannot, however, annul the Levi rape bond which the All Merciful has imposed upon her. Ola said she may exercise her right of refusal even in respect of his Levi rape bond. What is the reason by her refusal she annuls the marriage of her first husband? Robber raised an objection against Ola the rival of anyone. Entitled to make a declaration of refusal who did not exercise her right must perform the ceremony of Eliza if her husband died childless but may not contract Levi rape marriage. But why let her exercise her right of refusal now and thereby annul the marriage of her first husband and then let her rival contract the Levi rape marriage? The rival of a forbidden relative is different for Rami B. Ezekiel learned if a minor made a declaration of refusal against her husband, she is permitted to marry. His father, but if against the lover she is forbidden to marry his father, it is thus evident that at the time she became subject to the Levi rape marriage, she is looked upon as his daughter in law. Similarly, here also marriage of the rival is forbidden because at the time of her subjection to the Levi rape marriage, she is looked upon as his daughter's rival. Rap stated if she made a declaration of refusal against one of the lovers, she is forbidden to marry the others, also her case being analogous to that of the recipient of a letter of divorce, as the recipient of a letter of divorce is forbidden to all the brothers as soon as she is forbidden to one, so is there no difference here. Also, Samuel, however, stated if she exercised her right of refusal against one of the lovers, she is permitted to marry the others, her case being unlike that of the recipient of a letter of divorce, for with the recipient of a letter of divorce, it is he who took the initiative against her, but here. It is she who took the initiative against him, declaring, I do not like you and I do not want you. It is you whom I dislike, but I do like your fellow RC ruled. If she made a declaration of refusal against one lover, she is permitted to marry even him. May it be assumed that he is of the same opinion as Arashai, who maintains that a minor has no right to make a declaration of refusal in respect of his Levi rape bond. In respect of one lover, she may well be entitled to annul the Levi rape bond. Here, however, we are dealing with two lovers, the reason being that no declaration of refusal is valid against half a Levi rape bond. When Rabin came, he reported in the name of Aryohan, and if she exercised her right of refusal against one of the lovers, she is permitted to marry the other brothers. They, however, did not agree with him. Who are they who did not agree with him? Abbe said, Rabbi said, Arashai, and others said, even RC Beth Shammai ruled in his presence, etc. It was taught. Beth Hillel said to Beth Shammai, did not the wife of Pishin the camel driver make her declaration of refusal in his absence? Pishin the camel driver answered Beth Shammai to Beth Hillel used a reversible measure they therefore used against him also a reversible measure since however he was eating a usufruct it is obvious that the minor was married to him but if this was the case did not Beth Shammai rule it may be asked that a married minor may not exercise the right of refusal they found him with two bonds Beth Shammai ruled before Beth Din etc. Elsewhere we learned Hillel and declarations of Mion must be witnessed by three men who is a tanner rabbi replied this ruling is that of Beth Shammai Abbe said you may even say that it is the ruling of Beth Hillel all that Beth Hillel really stated was that no experts are required three men however are indeed required as it was in fact taught Beth Shammai ruled that Mion must be declared before Beth Din and Beth. Hillel ruled either before Beth Din or not before Beth Din. Both, however, agree that a quorum of three is required. Our Jose, son of Arjuda, and our Eliezer, son of Ar Simeon, ruled Mion is valid even if it was declared before two. Our Joseph B. Menumi reported in the name of Arnaman that the Halachah is in agreement with the spear. Beth Shammai, however, answered and she declares her refusal, etc. But surely she has already made a declaration of refusal. Samuel replied, The meaning is still she is of age and states, I am willing to abide by the first declaration of refusal. Ola replied, Two different statements are here made. Either she declares her refusal and is betrothed after she is of age, or she declares her refusal and is married. Fourth, with according to Ola, one can well understand why the expression till she is of age or declares her refusal and marries again was used according to Samuel. However, it should have been stated till she is of age and states this is a difficulty mission. Which minor must make the declaration of refusal? Any whose mother or brothers have given her in marriage with her consent. If, however, they gave her in marriage without her consent, she need not make any declaration of refusal. Our Hanabi antagonist ruled any child who is unable to take care of her token of betrothal need not make any declaration of refusal. Our Eliza ruled the act of a minor has no validity at all, but she is to be regarded as one seduced if, therefore, she is the daughter of an Israelite and was married to a priest. She may not eat terima, and if she is the daughter of a priest and was married to an Israelite, she may eat terima. Our Eliza B. Jacob ruled in the case of any hindrance in remarrying that was due to the husband, the minor is deemed to have been his wife, but in the case of any hindrance in remarrying that was not due to the husband, she is not deemed to have been his wife. Amara Rab stated, and others say that it was taught in the very th Originally a certificate of Mion was drafted as follows I do not like him and I do not want him and I do not desire to be married to him when however it was observed that the formula was too long and it was feared that Talmud, Masya Bamath the people might mistake it for a letter of divorce the following formula was instituted on the nth day so and so the daughter of so and so made a declaration of refusal in our presence our rabbis taught what is regarded as Mion if she said I do not want so and so my husband or I do not want the betrothal which my mother or my brothers have arranged for me or Judah said even more than this even if while sitting in the bridal litter and being carried from her father's house to the home of her husband she said I do not want so and so my husband her statement is regarded as a declaration of refusal our Judah said more than this even if while the wedding guests were reclining on their dining couches in her husband's house and she was standing and Waiting upon them, she said to them, I do not want my husband, so and so her statement is regarded as a declaration of refusal. Our Jose B. Judah said more than this, even if while her husband sent her to a shopkeeper to bring him something for himself, she said, I do not want so and so my husband, you can have no me on more valid than this one. Our Hannah B. Antigonus ruled any child, etc. Rab Judah reported in the name of Samuel the Halachah is in agreement with our Hannah B. Antigonus attended taught if a minor who did not make a declaration of refusal married herself again. Her marriage it was stated in the name of our Judah B. But there is to be regarded as her declaration of refusal. It was asked what is the law where she was only betrothed. Come and here if a minor who did not make a declaration of refusal betrothed herself to another man, her betrothal it was stated in the name of our Judah B. But there is regarded as her declaration of refusal. The question was raised, do the rabbis differ from our Judah B. But there are or not if you can find some ground for holding that they differ it may be asked whether only in respect of betrothal or even in respect of marriage and should you find some reason for holding that they differ even in respect of marriage the question arises whether the halacha is in agreement with him or not and if you can find some ground for holding that the halacha is in agreement with him it may be asked whether only in respect of marriage or also in respect of betrothal. Come and your Rab Judah stated in the name of Samuel that the halacha is in agreement with our Judah B but there is since it had to be stated that the halacha is so it may be inferred that they differ the question however still remains whether the minor spoken of is one who was married in the first instance or perhaps she is one who was only betrothed come and your Abdan's daughters in law rebelled against their husbands when Rabbi sent a pair of rabbis to interrogate then some women said. To them see your husbands
is consistent throughout in his treatment of the minor while our Joshua makes distinctions what unreasonable distinctions does he make if she is regarded as his wife she should also require a letter of divorce but according to our Eliezer also it may be argued if she is not regarded as his wife she should require no meal either should she then depart without any formality whatever our Eliezer be Jacob ruled etc what is to be understood by a hindrance that was due to the husband and a hindrance that was not due to the husband Rab Judah replied in the name of Samuel if when she was asked to marry she replied I must refuse the offer owing to so and so my husband such a hindrance is one that was due to the husband if however she refused the offer because she said the men who proposed are not suitable for me such a hindrance is one that was not due to the husband both Abbe Bavin and Arhan Abbe Bavin gave the following explanation if he gave her a letter of divorce the hindrance is one that was due to the husband and therefore he is forbidden to marry her relatives and she is forbidden to marry his relatives and he also disqualifies her from marrying a priest if however she exercised her right of refusal against him the hindrance is one that was not due to the husband and therefore he is permitted to marry her relatives and she is permitted to marry his relatives and he does not disqualify her from marrying a priest but surely this was specifically stated below if a minor made a declaration of refusal against a man he is permitted to marry her relatives and she is permitted to marry his relatives and he does not disqualify her from marrying a priest but if he gave her a letter of divorce he is forbidden to marry her relatives and she is forbidden to marry his relatives and he also disqualifies her from marrying a priest the latter is merely an explanation of the former mission if a minor made a declaration of refusal against a man he is permitted to Marry her relatives and she is permitted to marry his relatives and he does not disqualify her from marrying a priest but if he gave her a letter of divorce he is forbidden to marry her relatives and she is forbidden to marry his relatives and he also disqualifies her from marrying a priest if he gave her a letter of divorce and remarried her and after she had exercised her right of refusal against him she was married to another man and became a widow or was divorced she is permitted to return to him if however she exercised her right of refusal against him and he remarried her and subsequently gave her a letter of divorce and then she was married to another man and became a widow or was divorced she is forbidden to return to him Talmud, Masi of this is the general rule if divorce followed Mion she is forbidden to return to him and if Mion followed divorce she is permitted to return to him if a minor exercised her right of refusal against a man and then she was Married to another man who divorced her and afterwards to another man against whom she made a declaration of refusal and then to another man who divorced her she is forbidden to return to the man from whom she was separated by a letter of divorce but is permitted to return to him from whom she was separated by her exercise of the right of Mion Gamara it is thus evident that Mion has the power to cancel divorce but this surely is contradicted by the following if a minor exercised the right of refusal against a man and then was married to another man who divorced her and afterwards to another man against whom she made a declaration of refusal and then to another man who divorced her she is forbidden to return to the man from whom she was separated by a letter of divorce but is permitted to return to him from whom she was separated by her exercise of the right of Mion from which it is evident that Mion against his fellow has no power to cancel his own divorce Rab Judah replied in the name of Samuel there is a break in our mission the one who taught the former did not teach the latter Rabbi said but what contradiction is this it is possible that Mion cancels his own divorce but that the Mion against his fellow does not cancel his own letter of divorce but in what way is the Mion against his fellow different from one against himself that it should not cancel his own divorce obviously for the reason that as she is familiar with his hints and gesticulations he might allure her and marry her again but if this is the case Mion against himself also should not cancel his divorce for the same reason that as she is familiar with his hints and gesticulations he might allure her and marry her again surely he had already tried to allure her but she did not succumb if a contradiction however existed is that between one ruling concerning his fellow against another ruling concerning his fellow if however she exercised her right of refusal against him and he Remarried her and having subsequently given her a letter of divorce she married another man and became a widow or was divorced she is forbidden to return to him the reason then why she is forbidden to return to him is because she became a widow or was divorced but had she exercised her right of refusal she would have been permitted to return to him from which it is evident that the Mion against his fellow has the power to cancel his own divorce but this view is contradictory to the following. If a minor exercised the right of refusal against her husband and then was married to another man who divorced her and afterwards to another man against whom she made a declaration of refusal she is forbidden to return to the man from whom she was separated by a letter of divorce but is permitted to return to him from whom she was separated by her exercise of the right of Mion from this then it is evident that the Mion against his fellow has no power to cancel his own divorce our Replied there is a break in our mission the one who taught the former did not teach the latter or replied the latter statement refers to a case where for instance she was thrice divorced so that she appears like a grown-up who taught the two respective statements of our mission Rab Judah replied in the name of Rab to this may be applied the scriptural text we have drunk our water for money or would come to us for price in the time of prescription the following halajah was inquired. For if a minor left her first husband with a letter of divorce and her second husband through me on may she return to her first husband they hired a man for four hundred zoos and through him they addressed the inquirer to our Akiva in prison and he stated that she was forbidden our Judah be but there also was asked at Nisibus and he too forbade her said our Ishmael son of our Jose there was no need for us to ascertain such an halajah for if in a prohibition involving a penalty of Karef he has been permitted how much more so in one involving only the penalty of a negative commandment but the inquirer was in this matter if a minor was the wife of his mother's brother and consequently forbidden to him as a relative of the second degree and his paternal brother subsequently married her and died may she now exercise her right of meon and thus annul her first marriage and so be permitted to contract the levirate marriage is meon valid after a husband's death where a religious performance is involved or not two men were hired for 400 zoos and when they came and asked our Akiva in prison he ruled that such levirate marriage was forbidden and when our Judah B. Bathera was asked at Nisibis he also decided that it was forbidden our Isaac B. Ashian stated Rab however admits that she is permitted to marry the brother of the man whom she is forbidden to remarry is not this obvious for it is only he with whose hints and gesticulations she is familiar but not his Brother, it might have been assumed that marriage with the one should be forbidden as a preventive measure against the other. Hence, we were taught that his brother may marry her. Another reading, our Isaac B. Ashian stated as she is forbidden to him, so is she forbidden to his brothers. But surely she is not familiar with their hints and gesticulations. His brothers were forbidden marriage with her as a preventive measure against marriage with him. Talmud, Masiyab Abba, the Mishnah of a man. Divorced his wife and remarried her. She is permitted to marry the lover. Our Eliezer, however, forbids similarly if a man divorced an orphan and remarried her. She is permitted to marry the lover. Our Eliezer, however, forbids if a minor was given in marriage by her father and was divorced so that she is regarded as an orphan in her father's lifetime and then her husband remarried her. All agree that she is forbidden to marry the lover. Gamar F. stated what is our Eliezer's reason because there was a Period when she was forbidden to him said the rabbis to Ephah if so Eliza also should not be required and should you reply that the law is so indeed surely it may be pointed out it was taught in the name of our Eliezer it was stated that she does perform Eliza in truth said Ephah the reason of our Eliezer is unknown to me Abbe said this is the reason of our Eliezer he was in doubt whether it was death that subjects the widow to the Levi marriage or whether it was the marriage that preceded it that subjects her to it if it is death that subjects her to it she should be subject to the Levi marriage and if it is a marriage preceding it that subjects her to it then there was a period when she was forbidden to him Rabbi said it was in fact obvious to our Eliezer that it is death that subjects the widow to the Levi marriage but while all well know of the divorce not all are aware of the remarriage on the contrary remarriage gets noise abroad since the woman dwells with him. Do we not however deal here even with such a case as where he remarried her in the evening and died in the morning or as she said this is the reason of our Eliezer he forbade the Levirate marriage of these as a preventive measure against the remarriage of an orphan minor in her father's lifetime this may also be logically supported for in the final clause it was stated if a minor was given in marriage by her father
She was of age and also if he remarried her while she was still a minor and she became of age while she was with him and then he died she may either perform Eliza or contract the Levirate marriage in the name of R. Eliezer however it was stated she must perform Eliza but may not contract the Levirate marriage Rabbah inquired of Arnam and what is the law in respect of her rival the other replied the prohibition against herself is a preventive measure shall we then go so far as to enact a preventive measure against a preventive measure but surely it was taught it was stated in the name of R. Eliezer she and her rival perform Eliza now can it possibly be imagined that she and her rival are to perform Eliza consequently it must mean either she or her rival performs Eliza are you not in any case obliged to offer an explanation explained then as follows she performs Eliza while her rival may either perform Eliza or contract the Levirate marriage mission where to Brothers were married to two sisters who were minors and orphans and the husband of one of them died the widow is free as being a lover's wife sister similarly in the case of two deaf sisters one of whom was of age and the other a minor if the husband of the minor died the minor is free as being a lover's wife sister if the husband of the elder sister died the minor is to be instructed our Eliza stated to exercise her right of me against him or Gamaliel said if she exercised her right of me on well and good but if she did not let her wait until she is of age when the other becomes free as being a lover's wife sister our Joshua said woe to him because of his wife and woe to him because of his brother's wife he must allow his wife to go by giving her a letter of divorce and his brother's wife by submitting to her Eliza Gamara but as this is permitted surely Barkabur taught a man should always cling to three things and keep away from three things a man should cling to the following three things Eliza the making of peace and the annulment of vows and keep away from three things from meon from receiving deposits and from acting as surety meon involving the fulfillment of a commandment is different reverting to our previous text Barkeeper taught a man should always cling to three things Eliza in accordance with the statement of Abbasal for it was taught Abbasal said if a lover married his sister-in-law on account of her beauty or in order to gratify his sexual desires or with any other ulterior motive it is as if he has infringed the law of incest and I am even inclined to think that the child from such a union is a bastard the making of peace for it is written seek peace and pursue a Talmud Masya Bamath B and in connection with this our above stated that deduction is made by a comparison between the two expressions of pursuit here it is written seek peace and pursue it and elsewhere it is written he that pursueth after righteousness and mercy findeth life prosperity and honor the annulment of vows in accordance with the statement of our Nathan for it was taught our Nathan said if a man makes a vow it is as if he has built a high place and if he fulfills it it is as if he has offered up a sacrifice upon it and keep away from three things from me on since it is possible that when she becomes of age she will change her mind from receiving deposits applies to deposits made by his fellow townsman who regards his house as his own house from acting as surety refers to would be sureties in Shulzion for our Isaac said what was meant by the scriptural text he that is surety for a stranger shall smart for it evil after evil comes upon those who receive proselytes and upon the sureties of Shulzion and upon him who rivets himself to the word of the Halacha that those who receive proselytes bring evil upon themselves is deduced in accordance with the statement of our Helbo for our Helbo stated proselytes are hurtful to Israel as a sore on the skin the sureties of Shulzion bring evil upon themselves because in that place they practice pull out and thrust in who rivets himself to the word of the Halacha brings evil upon himself for it was taught our Jose said whosoever says that he has no desire to study the Torah has no reward for the study of the Torah is not this obvious but this must be the meaning whosoever says that he has only an interest in the study of the Torah has only reward for the study of the Torah this however is also obvious but the meaning really is that he has no reward even for the study of the Torah what is the reason our Papa replied scripture said that you may learn them and observe to do them whosoever is engaged in observance is also regarded as engaged in study but whosoever is not engaged in observance is not regarded as engaged in study and if you wish I may say the reading is in fact as was said before Whosoever says that he has only an interest in the study of the Torah has only reward for the study of the Torah yet the statement was necessary in the case where he teaches others and these go and do observe the laws of the Torah since it might have been assumed that he also receives reward hence we were taught that he does not and if you wish I may say that the statement who rivets himself to the word of the Halacha applies to a judge who when a lawsuit is brought before him and he knows of an Halacha relating to a similar case compares one case with the other and though he has a teacher he does not go to him to inquire such a judge brings evil upon himself for our Samuel B. Naman he stated in the name of our Jonathan a judge should always imagine himself as if he had a sword lying between his thighs and Gehenna was open beneath him as it is said in scripture behold it is the catch of Solomon three score mighty men are about it of the mighty men of Israel etc. Because of the dread in the night, because of the dread of Gehenna, which is like the night, our Gamaliel said, if she exercised her right of meon, etc., our Eliezer inquired of Rab, what is our Gamaliel's reason? Is it because he holds the opinion that the betrothal of a minor remains in a suspended condition, and as she grows up, it grows with her, even though no cohabitation has taken place, or is the reason because he is of the opinion that when a man betroths the sister of his sister in law, the latter procures her exemption thereby, but thereby only, and consequently, only if cohabitation has taken place, is the elder sister exempt, but if no cohabitation has taken place, she is not the other reply. This is our Gamaliel's reason because he is of the opinion that when a man betroths the sister of his sister in law, the latter procures her exemption thereby, but thereby only, and consequently, only if cohabitation has taken place, is the elder sister exempt, but if no cohabitation has taken place, she is not said Arshis hate it seems that Rab made the statement while he was sleepy and about to doze off for it was taught if a man betrothed the minor her betrothal remains in a suspended condition now what is meant by a suspended condition obviously that as she grows up it grows up with her even though there was no cohabitation said Rabin the son of Arnaman to him the matter of the betrothal of a minor remains in a suspended condition if cohabitation had taken place it is valid but if no cohabitation had taken place it is not for in the absence of such cohabitation she thinks he has an advantage over me and I have an advantage over him is Rab however of the opinion that only if cohabitation had taken place is the betrothal valid but if there was no cohabitation it is not surely it was stated where a minor did not exercise her right of me and when she became of age actually married another man Rab ruled she requires no letter of divorce from her second husband and Samuel Rule she requires a letter of divorce from her second husband Talmud, Masya Bamatha does not this refer to a case where he did not cohabit with her, no where he did cohabit with her if however he cohabited with her what is Samuel's reason he holds a view that one who performs cohabitation does so in reliance on his first betrothal but surely they once disputed this point for it was stated if a man betrothed a woman conditionally and unconditionally Rab rule she requires from him a letter of divorce and Samuel rule she requires no letter of divorce from him Rab rule she requires from him a letter of divorce because as soon as he marries her he undoubtedly dispenses with his condition and Samuel rule she requires no letter of divorce from him because one who performs cohabitation does so in reliance on his first betrothal both disputes were necessary for if the former only had been stated it might have been assumed that Rab adheres to his opinion there only because no condition was attached to the betrothal but in the latter case where a condition was attached to it agrees with Samuel and if the latter case only had been stated it might have been assumed that there only does Samuel maintain his view but in the former he agrees with Rab hence both were required did Rab however state that only where the husband cohabited with her does she require a letter of divorce but that if he did not cohabit with her none is required surely it once happened at Nourish that a man betrothed the girl while she was a minor and when she attained her majority and he placed her upon the bridal chair another man came and snatched her away from him and the Rab's disciples are Barana and our were present on the occasion they did not require the girl to obtain a letter of divorce from the second man our papa replied at Nourish they married first and then placed the bride upon the bridal chair our Ashi replied he acted improperly they therefore treated him also improperly and deprived him of the right of valid betrothal said Rabbanit to Arashi your explanation is satisfactory where the man betrothed her with money what however can be said where he betrothed her by cohabitation the rabbis have declared his cohabitation to be an act of mere fornication Rab Judah
Woman who was possessed of hearing and became deaf afterwards A woman who was originally deaf leaves as she entered but the woman who was possessed of hearing and became deaf afterwards cannot do so since her inability to recite the prescribed formula acts as an obstacle Abbe raised an objection against him is however one who was originally deaf permitted to perform Halizah surely we learned if two brothers one of whom was in possession of his faculties and the other deaf were respectively married to two strangers one of whom was in the possession of her faculties and the other deaf and the deaf brother who was the husband of the deaf woman died what should his brother who was in possession of his faculties the husband of the woman in possession of her faculties do he marries her and if he wishes to send her away he may do so if the brother who was in possession of his faculties the husband of the woman who was in possession of her faculties died what should the deaf brother the husband of the deaf woman do he marries a widow and may never divorce her does not this apply to a woman who was originally deaf and yet it was stated that he may only marry Talmud, Mas Yabamath B but not submit to Elizabeth. No, this refers to a woman who was capable of hearing and became deaf afterwards come and hear if two brothers of sound senses were married to two strangers one of whom was of sound senses and the other deaf and the brother who was of sound senses the husband of the deaf woman died what should the brother who was of sound senses the husband of the woman who was of sound senses do he marries the deaf widow and if he wishes to divorce her he may do so if the brother who was of sound senses the husband of the woman who was of sound senses died what should the brother who was of sound senses the husband of the woman who was deaf do he may either submit to Elizabeth or contract by right marriage are we not to assume that as the man was originally of sound senses so was she originally deaf and nevertheless it was stated that he may only marry her but may not submit to her Halitza is this an argument each one may bear its own meaning an objection was raised against him if two brothers one of whom was of sound senses and the other deaf were married to two sisters one of whom was of sound senses and the other deaf and the deaf brother the husband of the deaf sister died what should the brother who was of sound senses it? Husband of the sister who was of sound senses do nothing since the widow is released by virtue of her being a lover's wife's sister if the brother who was of sound senses the husband of the sister who was of sound senses died what should the deaf brother the husband of the deaf sister do he releases his wife by means of a letter of divorce while his brother's wife is forever forbidden to marry again and should you reply that here also it is a case of a man who was of sound senses and who became afterwards deaf is such a man it may be retorted in a position to divorce his wife surely we learned if she became deaf he may divorce her if she became insane he may not divorce her if he became deaf or insane he may never divorce her consequently it must be a case of a man who was originally deaf and since the man spoken of is one who was originally deaf the woman spoken of in the same context must also be one who was originally deaf and as the sisters were such as were originally deaf the strangers also must be such as were originally deaf but in the case of the strangers we learned that the lover may only marry but may not submit to Elizabeth the other remained silent when he visited our Joseph the latter said to him why did you raise your objections against him from teachings which he could parry by replying that the sisters spoken of are such as were originally deaf and that the strangers are such as were originally of sound senses who became deaf afterwards you should rather have raised your objection against him from the following if two deaf brothers were married to two sisters who were of sound senses or to two deaf sisters or to two sisters one of whom was of sound senses and the other deaf and so also if two deaf sisters were married to two brothers who were of sound senses or to two deaf brothers or to two brothers one of whom was of sound senses and the other deaf behold these women are exempt from Levi right marriage and from Eliza, if however the women were strangers the respective lovers must marry them and if they wish to divorce them they may do so now how is this ruling to be understood if it be suggested that it refers to brothers who were first of sound senses and who became deaf afterwards could they it may be asked to divorce their wives surely we learned if he became deaf or insane he may never divorce her this ruling must consequently refer to brothers who were originally deaf and since they are such as were originally deaf the women referred to must also be such as were originally deaf and it was nevertheless taught if the women however were strangers the respective lovers must marry them they may thus only marry them but may not submit to their elizabeth and presents a refutation of rabbis is indeed a refutation of minor and a deaf woman etc are nominated related i once found our Adabi Ahab and his son-in-law are had a sitting in the marketplace of Pumadiva and Banding arguments and in the course of these they stated the ruling if a man was married to a minor and to a deaf woman cohabitation with one of them does not exempt her rival applies only to a case where the widows became subject to him through a brother of his who was of sound senses since it is not known to us whether he was more pleased with the minor or whether he was more pleased with the deaf woman whether he was more pleased with the minor because she would in due course reach the age of intelligence or whether he was more pleased with the deaf woman because she was fully grown and in a marriageable condition if the widows however became subject to him through a deaf brother of his there is no doubt that he was more pleased with the deaf woman because she was of matrimonial age and of his kind but I told them even if the widows became subject to him through a deaf brother of his the question of his preference still remains a matter of doubt how do they obtain Redress our histo replied in the name of Rab the lover marries the deaf widow and then releases her by a letter of divorce while the minor waits until she is of age when she performs Eliza from the set our histo it may be inferred that Rab is of the opinion that a deaf wife is partially acquired while concerning a minor it is a matter of doubt whether she is properly acquired or not acquired at all for were it to be suggested that concerning a deaf wife it is uncertain whether she is acquired or not acquired at all and that a minor is partially acquired the question would arise why should the lover marry the deaf widow and release her by a letter of divorce Talmud, Mas Yabam the letter continue to live with him in any case for if a deaf woman is acquired then she is of course acquired and if she is not acquired then she is a mere stranger and should you argue why should the minor wait until she grows up and then performs Eliza letter continue to live with him for the same reason that if she is properly acquired then she is of course acquired and if she is not acquired then she is a mere stranger if so it could be retorted whereby should the deaf widow be released Arshi's hate said logical deduction leads also to the interpretation Arhis died imparted to Rab's ruling for it was taught if two brothers were married to two orphan sisters a minor and a deaf woman and the husband of the minor died the deaf widow is released by means of a letter of divorce while the minor waits until she is of age when she performs Halizah if the husband of the deaf woman dies the minor is released by a letter of divorce while the deaf widow is forever forbidden to marry again if however he cohabited with the deaf widow he must give her a letter of divorce and she becomes permitted to marry any other man now if you grant that a deaf wife is partially acquired and that concerning a minor it is doubtful whether she is fully acquired or not Acquired at all one can well see the reason why when he cohabited with the deaf widow he gives her a letter of divorce and she becomes permitted to marry any other man for you may rightly claim that in any case she becomes permitted if the minor is acquired the deaf widow is rightly released as his wife's sister and if she is not acquired at all he has quite lawfully contracted with her the Levi right marriage if you contend however that concerning a deaf woman it is doubtful whether she is acquired or not acquired at all and that a minor is partially acquired the difficulty arises why should the deaf widow if he cohabited with her and gave her a letter of divorce be permitted to marry again when the cohabitation with her was unlawful and an unlawful cohabitation does not release a woman it is possible that the statement represents the view of our Nehemiah who ruled that an unlawful cohabitation exempts a widow from Elizabeth the statement represents the view of our Nehemiah read the final clause if a man was married to two orphans one of whom was a minor and the other deaf and died and the lover cohabited with the minor and then cohabited with the deaf widow or a brother of his cohabited with the deaf widow both are forbidden to him how do they obtain redress the deaf woman is released by a letter of divorce while the minor waits until she is of age when she performs hell is a no if you grant that a deaf wife is partially acquired and that concerning a minor it is doubtful whether she is fully acquired or not acquired at all and that the opinion in the statement is that of the rabbis one can well understand the reason why the minor waits until she is of age when she performs hell is a since otherwise he might cohabit with the deaf widow first and the subsequent cohabitation with the minor would thereby be rendered an unlawful cohabitation if you contend however that the opinion in the statement is that of our Nehemiah surely he May be objected ruled that an
Then he also cohabited with the minor or a brother of his cohabited with the minor he has rendered the deaf widow ineligible for him if one was of sound senses and the other deaf and the lover cohabited with the former and then he also cohabited with the latter or a brother of his cohabited with the latter he does not render the former ineligible for him if the lover cohabited with the latter and then he also cohabited with the former or a brother of his cohabited with the former he renders the latter ineligible for him if one was of age and the other a minor and the lover cohabited with the widow who was of age and then he also cohabited with the minor or a brother of his cohabited with the minor he does not render the elder ineligible for him if the lover cohabited with the minor and then he also cohabited with the widow who was of age or a brother of his cohabited with the widow who was of age he renders the minor ineligible for him or Eliezer ruled the minor is to be instructed to exercise her right of me against him. Our Rab Judah stated in the name of Samuel the Holocha is in agreement with our Eliezer. So also did our Eliezer state the Holocha is in agreement with our Eliezer and both statements were required for if the statement had been made on the first mission only it might have been assumed that in that case alone did Samuel hold that the Holocha is in agreement with our Eliezer since the lover there had not fulfilled it. Commandment of the Levi rate marriage but in this case where the commandment of the Levi rate marriage has been fulfilled it might have been assumed that both must be released by a letter of divorce and if the information had been given on the letter only it might have been suggested that only in this case is the Holocha in agreement with him because the elder is subject to Levi rate marriage with him but not in the other case hence both statements were required Misha if a lover who was a Minor cohabited with a sister-in-law who was a minor they should be brought up together if he cohabited with a sister-in-law who was of age she should bring him up until he is of age if a sister-in-law declared within 30 days after her Levi marriage he has not cohabited with me the lover is compelled to submit to her Eliza but if her declaration was made after 30 days he is only requested to submit to her Eliza when however he admits her assertion he is compelled even after 12 months to submit to her Eliza if a woman vowed to have no benefit from her brother-in-law the latter is compelled to submit to her Eliza if her vow was made during the lifetime of her husband but if after the death of her husband the lover may only be requested to submit to her Eliza if this however was in her mind even if her vow was made during the lifetime of her husband the lover may only be requested to submit to her Eliza Gamara must it be assumed that our mission is not in agreement with Armair for it was taught a boy minor and a girl minor may neither perform Halizan nor contract Levi marriage so Armair it may even be said to agree with Armair for Armair spoke only of the Levi rate marriage of a sister-in-law who was of age to a minor and of one who was a minor to a lover that was of age since one of these may possibly be performing forbidden cohabitation he did not speak however of a boy minor who cohabited with a girl minor in which case both are in the same position but surely it was stated if he cohabited with a sister-in-law who was of age she should bring him up until he is of age Arhanan of Hosea replied if he had already cohabited the law is different but was it not stated she should bring him up until he is of age though each act of cohabitation is a forbidden one the truth is clearly that our mission cannot be in agreement with Armair should not the text to raise up unto his brother a name be applied here and this Minor surely is not capable of it. Abbe replied, Scripture said her husband's brother shall go in unto her, whoever he may be robbed replied. Without this text, also you could not say that a minor may not contract Levi rate marriage, for is there any act in connection with the Levi rate marriage which is at one time forbidden and after a time permitted? Surely Rab Judah stated in the name of Rab any sister in law to whom the instruction her husband's brother shall go in unto her cannot be applied. At the time when she becomes subject to the Levi rate marriage is indeed like the wife of a brother who has children and is consequently forbidden, but then might it not be suggested that the same principle is applicable here? Also, Scripture said if brethren dwell together, even if one brother is only one day old, if a sister in law declared within thirty days, etc., who is it that taught that up to thirty days a man may restrain himself or Yohan and replied, It is Armair, for it was taught a Complaint in respect of virginity may be brought during the first thirty days. So Armair or Jose said, if the woman was shut up with him, the complaint must be made forth with. If she was not shut up with him, it may be made even after many years. Rabbi stated, it may even be said to represent the opinion of our Jose. For our Jose spoke there only of one's betrothed with whom one is familiar, but not of the wife of one's brother Talmud. Masi of towards whom one is rather reserved. Now, instead of being compelled to submit to Eliza, let the lover be compelled to take his sister-in-law in Levi rate marriage. Rabbi replied, this is a case where her letter of divorce was produced by her, and objection was raised. If within thirty days a sister-in-law declared he has not cohabited with me, he is compelled to submit to Eliza from her, whether he says I have cohabited or whether he admits I have not cohabited. If after thirty days he may only be requested to submit to Eliza from. Her if she declares he cohabited with me and he states I did not cohabit, behold he may release her by a letter of divorce if he declares I have cohabited and she states he has not cohabited with me it is necessary for him even if he withdrew his statement and admitted I have not cohabited to give her a letter of divorce and to submit to her Halizah RMI reply the meaning is that she requires Halizah together with her letter of divorce or as she replied there the letter of divorce was given in respect of his Levi rate bond while here the letter of divorce is required in respect of his cohabitation a couple both of whom admitted that there was no consummation of the Levi rate marriage once came before Rabbah arranged the Halizah for her said Rabbah to his disciples and dismiss her case but surely said Arshur by to Rabbah it was taught she requires both a letter of divorce and Halizah if it was so taught the other replied well then it was taught on son of Arnaman inquired of Arnaman, what is the law in respect of her rival? The other replied, Shall the rival be forbidden to marry again because we compel or request the lover of a woman vowed to have no benefit, etc. We learned elsewhere at first it was held that the following three classes of women must be divorced and they also receive their kethuga, one who declares, I am unclean for you, or heaven is between me and you, or may I be kept away from the Jews. This ruling was afterwards withdrawn in order that a wife might not cast eyes upon another man and thus disgrace her husband, but instead it was ordained that one who declared, I am unclean for you, must bring evidence in support of her statement in respect of a woman who tells her husband, Heaven is between me and you, peace is made between them by way of a request addressed to the husband, and if a woman vowed, may I be kept away from the Jews, the husband invalidates his part of the vow and she may continue conviable intercourse with him. Though she remains removed from other Jews, the question was raised: What is her relation to the lover? If a woman had vowed, may I be kept from the Jews? Is it assumed that it occurred to her that her husband may possibly die and that she might become subject to the lover or not? Rab replied: The lover has not the same status as the husband. And Samuel replied: The lover has the same status as the husband. Said of a logical deduction is in agreement with Rab. For we learned: If a woman vowed to have no benefit from her brother-in-law, the latter is compelled to submit to her halizah. If her vow was made during the lifetime of her husband, now if it is to be assumed that it occurred to her Talmud, Masiyah Amit B, it should have been stated that he is only to be requested. What we are dealing with here is the case of a woman who has children, so that such a remote possibility does not occur to her. What, however, would be the law if she had no children with the lover in that case? Have to be requested instead then of stating if this however was in her mind even if her vow was made during the lifetime of her husband the lover may only be requested to submit to her Halizah a distinction should have been made in the very same case this is applicable only where she has children but where she has no children he may only be requested consequently it must be inferred that whether she has children or not the lover is compelled to submit to Halizah in accordance with the opinion of Rab thus our contention is proved C-H-A-P-T-E-R-X-I-V mission a deaf man who married a woman of sound senses or a man of sound senses who married a deaf woman may if he wishes to release her do so and if he wishes to retain her he may also do so as he marries a woman by gesture so he divorces her by gestures if a man of sound senses married a woman of sound senses and she became deaf he may if he wishes release her and if he wishes he may retain her if she became an imbecile he May not divorce her if he however became deaf or insane he may never divorce her are you had and being asked why may a woman who became deaf be divorced while a man who became deaf may not divorce his wife they answered him a man who gives divorce is not like a woman who is divorced for while a
His wife's sister, if the brother of sound senses, the husband of the sister who was of sound senses died, what should the death brother, the husband of the sister who was of sound senses, do? He must release his wife by a letter of divorce, while his brother's wife is forbidden forever to marry again. If two brothers of sound senses were married to two sisters, one of whom was deaf, and the other of sound senses, and the brother of sound senses, the husband of the deaf sister died, what should the brother of sound senses, the husband of the sister who was of sound senses, do nothing since his sister-in-law is exempt as his wife's sister? If the brother of sound senses, the husband of the sister who was of sound senses, died, what should the brother of sound senses, the husband of the deaf sister, do? He must divorce his wife by a letter of divorce, and he releases his brother's wife by Eliza. If two brothers, one of whom was deaf, and the other of sound senses, were married to two sisters. One of whom was deaf and the other of sound senses and the deaf brother the husband of the deaf sister died what should the brother who was of sound senses the husband of the sister who was of sound senses do nothing since the widow is released by virtue of her being his wife's sister if the brother of sound senses the husband of the sister who was of sound senses died what should the deaf brother the husband of the deaf sister do he releases his wife by a letter of divorce while his brother's wife is forever forbidden to marry again if two brothers one of whom was deaf and the other of sound senses were married to two strangers who were of sound senses and the deaf brother the husband of the woman who was of sound senses died what should the brother of sound senses the husband of the woman of sound senses do he either submits to illicit or contracts leave by marriage if the brother of sound senses the husband of the woman who was of sound senses died what should the Deaf brother the husband of the woman who was of sound senses do he must marry her and he may never divorce her if two brothers of sound senses were married to two strangers one of whom was of sound senses and the other deaf and the brother of sound senses the husband of the deaf woman died what should the brother of sound senses the husband of the woman of sound senses do he marries the widow and if he wishes to divorce her he may do so if the brother of sound senses the husband of the woman of sound senses died what should the brother of sound senses the husband of the deaf woman do he may either submit to illicit or contract leave by right marriage if two brothers one of whom was deaf and the other of sound senses were married to two strangers one of whom was deaf and the other of sound senses and the deaf brother the husband of the deaf woman died what should the brother of sound senses the husband of the woman of sound senses do he must marry the widow but if he wishes to divorce her he may do so if the brother of sound senses the husband of the woman of sound senses died what should the deaf brother the husband of the deaf woman do he must marry the widow and he may never divorce her Gemara Rami B. Hamas stated wherein lies the difference between a deaf man or a deaf woman and an imbecile that the marriage of the former should have been legalized by the rabbis while that of the male imbecile or female imbecile was not legalized by the rabbis for it was taught if an imbecile or a minor married and then died their wives are exempt from Eliza and from the Levi marriage in the case of a deaf man or a deaf woman where the rabbinical ordinance could be carried into practice the marriage was legalized by the rabbis in that of a male or female imbecile where the rabbinical ordinance cannot be carried into practice since no one could live with a serpent in the same basket the marriage was not legalized by the rabbis and wherein lies the difference between a minor and a deaf person that the marriage of the former should not have been legalized by the rabbis while that of a deaf person was legalized by the rabbis the rabbis have legalized the marriage of a deaf person since Pentateuch Ali he would never be able to contract a marriage they did not legalize the marriage of a minor since in due course he would be able to contract a Pentateuch Ali valid marriage but surely in the case of a girl minor who would in due course be able to contract a Pentateuch Ali valid marriage the rabbis did legalize her marriage there it was legalized in order that people might not treat her as ownerless property and why is there a difference between a minor and a deaf woman that the former should be permitted to exercise the right of meon while the deaf woman should not be permitted to exercise the right of meon because if the latter also were allowed to do so Talmud, Masyav Amath, the men would abstain from marrying her and why? Is there a difference between a minor and a deaf woman that the former should be permitted to eat terima while a deaf woman may not? For we learned our Yohan and Bigajada testified concerning a deaf girl whom her father gave in marriage that she may be dismissed by a letter of divorce and concerning a minor the daughter of an Israelite who was married to a priest that she may eat rabbinical terima while the deaf woman may not eat this is a preventive measure against the possibility that a deaf man might feed a deaf woman with such terima while let him feed her since she is only in the same position as a minor who eats nibbla this is a preventive measure against the possibility that a deaf husband might feed a wife of sound senses with it but even a deaf husband might well feed his wife who was of sound senses with rabbinical terima a preventive measure was made against the possibility of his feeding her with pentateuchal terima and why is the minor different from the deaf woman that the former should be entitled to her kethubah while the deaf woman is not entitled to her kethubah because if the latter also were so entitled men would abstain from marrying her once however is it inferred that a minor is entitled to a kethubah from what we learned a minor who exercised the right of me on a forbidden relative of the second degree and a woman who is incapable of procreation are not entitled to a kethubah but it follows that one released by a letter of divorce though a minor is entitled to receive her kethubah and whence is it inferred that a deaf woman is not entitled to her kethubah from what was taught if a man who was deaf or an imbecile married women of sound senses the latter even though the deaf man recovered his faculties or the imbecile regained his intelligence have no claim whatsoever on either of them but if the men wish to retain them the latter are entitled to a kethubah of the value of a mina if however a Man of sound senses married a woman who was deaf or an imbecile her kethuba is valid even if he undertook in writing to give her a hundred mina since he himself had consented to suffer the loss the reason then is because he himself consented had he not consented however she would receive no kethuba since otherwise men would abstain from marrying her if so a kethuba should have been provided for a woman of sound senses who married a deaf man since otherwise women would abstain from marrying deaf men more than a man desires to marry does a woman desire to be taken in marriage a deaf man once lived in the neighborhood of Armakai and the latter allowed him to take a wife to whom he had assigned in writing a sum of four hundred zoos out of his estate robber remarked who is so wise as Armakai who is indeed a great man he held the view had he wished to have a maid to wait upon him would we not have allowed one to be bought for him how much more than should his desire be fulfilled here where there are two reasons for complying with his request are high B. as she stated in the name of Samuel for unwitting intercourse with the wife of a deaf man no sham is incurred it might be suggested that the following provides support to his view there are five who may not set apart terima and if they did so their terima is not valid these are the deaf man and imbecile a minor he who gives terima from that which is not his own and an idolater who gave terima from that which belonged to an Israelite and even if the latter gave it with the consent of the Israelite his terima is invalid he holds the same view as our Eliezer for it was taught our Isaac stated in the name of our Eliezer that the terima of a deaf man must not be treated as profane because its validity is a matter of doubt if he is of the same opinion as our Eliezer and Shamtali we also should be incurred it is necessary that the offense should be similar to that of eating one of two Available pieces of meat, but does our Eliezer require a condition similar to that of eating one of two pieces? Surely it was taught our Eliezer stated for eating the suit of a koi one incurs the obligation of an Ashamfali. We Samuel is of the same opinion as our Eliezer in one case, but differs from him in the other. Others read our high B as she stated in the name of Samuel for unwitting intercourse with the wife of a deaf man. The obligation of an Ashamfali is incurred and objection was raised. There are five who may not set apart terima. He holds the same view as our Eliezer. Our Ashi asked what is our Eliezer's reason? Is he positive that the mind of a deaf man is feeble, but in doubt whether that mind is clear? Talmud, Masya Bamatbi, or not clear though in either case it is always in the same condition, or is it possible that he has no doubt that the deaf man's mind is feeble and that it is not clear, but his doubt here is due to this reason because the deaf man may sometimes be in a Normal state and sometimes in a state of imbecility in what respect would this constitute any practical difference in respect of releasing his wife by a letter of divorce if you grant that his mind is always in the same condition his divorce would have the same validity as his betrothal if however you contend that sometimes he is in a normal state
One is excluded since she is incapable of accepting her divorce and furthermore it was taught at the school of our Ishmael and sendeth her out of his house only one who when he sends her out does not return but this one is excluded since she returns even if he sends her out this was necessary in respect of one who is capable of preserving her letter of divorce but is unable to take proper care of herself hence in accordance with the word of the Torah such an imbecile may well be divorced for. Surely she is capable of preserving her letter of divorce the rabbis however ruled that she shall not be dismissed in order that people might not treat her as a piece of ownerless property of a remark this may also be supported by deduction for in respect of her it was stated if she became an imbecile he may not divorce her while in respect of him a statement was he may never divorce her in what respect it may be asked does he differ from her that the statement concerning him is Never while in respect of her never is not mentioned the inference then must be that the one is pentacle the other rabbinical are Yohanan Binuri asked etc. The question was raised was are Yohanan Binuri certain of the law concerning the man and his question related to that of the woman or is it possible that he was certain concerning that of the woman and his question related to that of the man come and here since they answered him a man who gives a divorce is not like a woman who is divorced for while a woman may be divorced with her consent as well as without it a man can give a divorce only with his full consent it may be inferred that his question related to the man on the contrary since they said to him the other also is in a similar position it may be inferred that his question related to the woman but the fact is that are Yohanan Binuri was addressing them in the light of their own statement according to my view he argued as well as a man is incapable of giving. A divorce so also is a woman incapable of receiving a divorce but according to your view why should there be a difference between a man and a woman to this they replied a man who gives a divorce is not like a woman who is divorced are Yohanan testified etc. Rabba stated from the testimony of our Yohanan Bigajada it may be inferred that if a husband said to witnesses see this letter of divorce which I am giving to my wife and to her he said take this bill of indebtedness she is nevertheless divorced for did not our Yohanan Bigajada imply that the woman's consent was not required here also then her consent is not required is not this obvious it might have been assumed that since he said to her take this bill of indebtedness he has thereby cancelled the letter of divorce hence we were taught that it remains valid for had he in fact cancelled it he would have made his statement to the witnesses since however he did not make the statement to the witnesses he did not cancel it at all and the only reason why he made that statement to her was to conceal his shame. Our Isaac Bibis no once lost the keys of the schoolhouse in a public domain on a Sabbath when he came to our Padath. The latter said to him, Go and Talmud, Masia Bamatha, lead forth some boys and girls to the spot and let them take a walk there. For if they find the keys, they will bring them back from this. It is clearly evident that he is of the opinion that if a minor eats nibble, it is not the duty of it. Beth to take it away from him. May it be suggested that the following provides support for his view. A man must not say to a child, Bring me a key or bring me a seal, but he may allow him to pluck or to throw. Abbe replied to pluck may refer to a non perforated plant pot and to throw may refer to a neutral domain axe, which are no more than prohibitions of the rabbis. Come and here if an idolater came to extinguish a fire, he is not to be told either put it out or do not put it out. Because it is not the duty of the Israelites present to enforce his Sabbath rest. If a minor Israelite, however, came to extinguish the fire, he must be told, Do not put it out, since it is the duty of the Israelites present to enforce his Sabbath rest. Our Yohanan replied, The child is inhibited only where he appears to act with his father's approval. Similarly, then, in respect of the idolater, it is a case where he acts with the approval of an Israelite. Is this, however, permitted an idolater? Acts on his own initiative. Come and here, if the child of paper was in the habit of visiting his mother's father who was an Amharas, there is no need to apprehend that the latter might feed him with levitically unprepared foodstuffs, and if fruit was found in his possession, it is not necessary to take it from him. Our Yohanan replied, The law was relaxed in respect of Dime. The reason then is because the fruit was Dime, but had its prohibition been certain, it would have been necessary to. Tied it, but surely it may be objected. Our Yohanan said that a child is inhibited only where he appears to act with his father's approval. But the fact is that our Yohanan was in doubt when therefore he dealt with the one subject. He rebutted the argument, and when he dealt with the other, he again rebutted the argument. Come and here, if the child of a Haber who was a priest was in the habit of visiting his mother's father who was a priest and an Amharas, there is no need to apprehend that. The latter might feed him with unclean terima, and if fruit was found in his possession, it is not necessary to take it away from him. This refers only to rabbinical terima. Come and here, an Israelite child may be regularly breastfed by an idolatrous or an unclean beast, and there is no need to have scruples about his sucking from a detestable thing, but he must not be directly fed with nibbler, detestable creatures or reptiles from all these, however, he may suck even on it. Sabbath, though this is forbidden to an adult, Abbasal stated it was our practice to suck from a clean beast on a festival. At any rate, it was here stated that there is no need to have scruples about his sucking from a detestable thing. The permissibility there is due to the presence of danger. If so, an adult also should be permitted. Permissibility for an adult is dependent on medical opinion. Permissibility for a child also should be made dependent on medical opinion. Arhuna, son of Ar. Joshua replied, The ordinary child is in danger when deprived of his milk. Abbasal stated it was our practice to suck from a clean beast on a festival. How is one to understand this? If danger was involved, the sucking should be permitted even on the Sabbath also. And if no danger was involved, it should be forbidden even on a festival. This can only be understood as a case where pain was involved. Abbasal being of the opinion that sucking is an act of indirect attaching in respect of it. Sabbath, therefore, where the prohibition is one involving the penalty of stoning, the rabbis have instituted a preventive measure in respect of a festival. However, where the prohibition is only that of a negative precept, the rabbis have not instituted any preventive measure. Come and hear these ye shall not eat, for they are a detestable thing is to be understood as you shall not allow them to eat. This being a warning to the older men concerning the young children does not this imply that minors must be ordered, you shall not eat such things. Know that adults may not give them with their own hands. Come and hear no soul of you shall eat blood implies a warning to the older men concerning the young children. Does not this signify that minors must be told do not eat blood? Know that adults must not give them with their own hands. Come and hear speak and say conveys a warning to the older priests concerning the priests who are minors. Does not this imply that minors must be ordered not to defile themselves, know that adults must not defile them with their own hands, and all the scriptural texts cited are required for if we had been informed concerning detestable things only Talmud, Masya Bamat B, it might have been assumed that the law applies to them because their prohibition applies to even the minutest objectionable creature, but not to blood the minimum quantity of which must be no less than a quarter of a log, and if we had been informed concerning blood only, it might have been assumed that the law applies to this because the eating of it involves the penalty of Kareth, but not to reptiles, and if we had been informed concerning these two, it might have been assumed that the law applies to these because their prohibition applies equally to all but not to uncleanness, and had we been informed concerning uncleanness, it might have been assumed that the law applies only here because priests are different from other people since more. Commandments have been imposed upon them, but not to these. Hence, the three scriptural texts were required. Come and hear if two brothers, one of whom was of sound senses, and the other deaf, were married to two sisters who were of sound senses, and the deaf brother, the husband of the sister who was of sound senses, died. What should the brother of sound senses, the husband of the sister of sound senses, do nothing since his sister in law is exempt as being his wife's sister? If the brother of sound senses, the husband of the sister who was of sound senses, died, what should the deaf brother, the husband of the sister who was of sound senses, do? He must release his wife by a letter of divorce while his brother's wife is forbidden forever to marry again. Now, why should he release his wife by a letter of divorce? Let her continue to live with him since he is only like a minor who eats nibble on account of the prohibition imposed upon her. Come and hear if two brothers of sound senses were. Married to two sisters, one of whom was of sound senses, and the other deaf, and the brother of sound senses, the husband of the deaf sister died. What should the brother of sound senses, the husband of the sister who was of sound senses, do nothing since his sister in law is exempt as his wife's sister? If the brother of sound senses, the husband of the sister who was of sound senses, died. What should the brother of sound senses
contract believe our marriage if however there was peace between him and her but war in the world or if there was discord between him and her but peace in the world and she came back and said my husband is dead she is not believed our Judah said she is never believed unless she comes weeping and her garments are rent they however said to him she may marry in either case Kamara mention was made of peace between him and her because it was desired to speak of discord between him and her and peace in the world was mentioned because it was desired to mention war in the world Rabba stated what is the reason why a wife is not believed in a time of war because she speaks from conjecture could it be imagined she thinks that among all those who were killed he alone escaped and should it be contended that since there was peace between him and her she would wait until she saw what had actually happened to him it may sometimes happen it may be retorted that he was struck by an arrow or spear and she would think that he was certainly dead while in fact someone might have applied an emollient to his wound and he might have recovered Rabba was at first of the opinion that famine is not like war since in the former case she does not speak from conjecture later however Rabba changed his opinion stating that famine is like war for a woman once appeared before Rabba and said to him my husband died during a famine you have acted well he remarked to her and that you saved your own life since it could hardly be imagined that he would survive on the little remnant of flour that you left for him the master then she replied also understands that in such circumstances he could not survive after this Rabba ruled famine is worse than war for whereas in the case of war it is only when the wife states my husband died in the war that she is not believed but if her statement is that he died in his bed she is believed in the case of famine she is not believed unless she states he died and I buried him. Ruin is regarded as war for in this case also she speaks from conjecture a visitation of serpents or scorpions is regarded as war for here also a wife speaks from conjecture as to pestilence some hold that it is like war while others hold that it is not like war some hold that it is like war because a wife they maintain speaks from conjecture while others hold that it is not like war because they maintain a wife relies upon the common saying a pestilence may rage. For seven years but none dies before his time the question was raised what is the law of it was she who established that there was a war in the world do we apply the argument what motive could she have for telling a lie Talmud, Masya Bamatha since if she wished she could have said that there was peace in the world or perhaps since a war was established by her she speaks from conjecture and the argument what motive could she have for telling a lie cannot come and appear and established. Principle come and hear if a woman states they set our house on fire or they filled the cave wherein we sheltered with smoke and he died while I escaped she is not believed there it is different since she can be told as a miracle happened to you so may a miracle have happened to him also come and hear if a woman states idolaters fell upon us or robbers fell upon us and he died while I escaped she is believed there her statement is believed in accordance with the view of our eating for our eating. Stated a woman carries her weapons about her there was once a man whose bridal chamber caught fire at the close of his wedding feast and his wife cried look at my husband look at my husband when they came near they saw a charred body that was prostrate on the ground and the hand of a man lying by it our high Abin intended to give his decision that the law in this case is the same as that where a woman stated they set our house on fire or they filled the cave wherein we sheltered. With smoke Rabba however said are the two cases at all similar there she did not say look at my husband look at my husband while here those present actually saw the charred body that was prostrate on the ground and the hand that was lying by it and our high be as to the charred body that was prostrate on the ground it may be suggested that a stranger came to the rescue of the burning man and was himself burned while the hand which was lying nearby might be that of the bridegroom who having been caught by the fire was mutilated and in order to hide his shame he may have left the place and fled into the wide world the question was raised what is the law in respect of one witness in time of war is the reason why one witness is elsewhere believed because no one would tell a lie which is likely to be exposed and consequently here also the witness would not tell a lie or is it possible that the reason why one witness is believed is because the woman herself makes Careful inquiries and only then marries again here therefore he would not be believed since a woman does not make sufficient inquiries before she marries again Rami Biham replied come and here our Akiva stated when I went down to Nehardia to intercal the year I met Nehemiah of Beth Delhi who said to me I heard that in the land of Israel no one with the exception of our Judah Bibaba permits a married woman to marry again on the evidence of one witness that is so I told him tell them he said to me in my name you know that this country is infested with raiders I have this tradition from our Gamaliel the elder that a married woman may be allowed to marry again on the evidence of one witness now what was meant by this country is infested with raiders obviously that although this country is in a state of confusion I have this tradition that a married woman may be allowed to marry again on the evidence of one witness thus it is evident that one witness is believed said Rabbi if so what should this country be different he should have said wherever raiders exist rather said Rabbi it is this that was meant you know that this country is infested with raiders and it is impossible for me to leave my family and to come before the rabbis I have this tradition from our Gamaliel that a married woman may be allowed to marry again on the evidence of one witness come and here two learned men once traveled with Abba Jose B. Samai on board a ship which sank and on the evidence of women. Rabbi allowed their wives to marry again now evidence of death by water is surely like that of death in war and women even a hundred of them are legally equal to one witness and yet it was stated that Rabbi allowed to marry and do you understand this those were waters without a visible end and when a man is drowned in waters without a visible end his wife is forbidden to marry again how then is this to be understood obviously that they stated the drowned men were cast up. In our presence Talmud, Masya of and we saw them immediately afterwards and they also mentioned his identification marks so that we do not rely upon them but on the marks a man once deposited some sesame with another and when in due course he asked him return to me my sesame the other replied you have already taken it but surely the depositor remonstrated the quantity was such and such and it is in fact still lying intact in your jar years the other replied you have taken back. And this is different our histi first intended to give his decision that the law in this case is the same as that of the two learned men where we do not assume that those have gone elsewhere and these are others Rabbah however said to him are the two cases alike there the identification marks were given but here what identification marks can sesame have and in regard to the depositor's statement that their quantity was such and such it might be said that the similarity of quantities is a Mere coincidence said Markashi Sabi Arhis Dadu Arashi do we ever in such circumstances take into consideration the possibility that the contents of a vessel may have been removed surely we learned if a man found a vessel on which was inscribed the cough it is Corbin if M E M it is Miser if a Dalat it is Dumu A if a Tate it is Tebal and if a Tav it is Teramah or in the period of danger they used to write a Tav or Teramah said Rabbanu to Arashi do we not in such circumstances heed the possibility that the contents of a vessel may have been removed read then the final clause our Jose said even if a man found a jar on which Teramah was inscribed the contents are nevertheless regarded as unconsecrated for it is assumed that though it was in the previous year full of Teramah it has subsequently been emptied but the fact is all agree that the possibility of the contents having been removed must be taken into consideration here however they differ only on the following. Principle one master is of the opinion that had the owner removed the contents from the jar he would undoubtedly have wiped the mark off while the other maintains that it might be assumed that he may have forgotten to remove the mark or he may also intentionally have left it as a safeguard Reshul of Isaac his son of Arbabai's sister once went from Cordoba to Spain and died there a message was sent from there in the following terms Reshul of Isaac his son of Arbabai's sister went from Cordoba to Spain and died there the question thus arose whether the possibility that there might have been two men of the name of Isaac is to be taken into consideration or not Abbe said it is to be taken into consideration but Rabbi said it is not to be taken into consideration said Abbe how do I arrive at my assertion because in a letter of divorce that was once found in Nehardia it was written near the town of Colonia I David son of Nehelaz and and released and divorced my Wife so and so and when Samuel's father sent it to our Judah the latter replied let all Nehardia be searched Rabbah however said if that were so he should have ordered the whole world to be searched the truth is that it was only out of respect for Samuel's father that he sent that message Rabbah said how do I arrive at my assertion because in two notes of indebtedness that were once produced in court at Mahuza the names of the parties were written as Havi son of Nana and Nana son of Havi. And Rabbah Biabu ordered the collection of the debts on these bills but
was written Anand son of Hyavhagra was with them said Abay even according to me who hold that the possibility of the existence of other men of the same name is to be taken into consideration no such possibility need be considered here for even in respect of the only other man known to have that name witnesses declared that he was at Nihartia how then could he on the same day have been at Surarabha said even according to me who hold that the possibility of the existence of other men of the same name is not to be taken into consideration such possibility must be considered here since the man in question may have gone to Surah on a flying camel or got there by miraculously or he may have given verbal instructions for the letter of divorce to be written on his behalf as in fact Rab said to his scribes and Arhuna similarly said to his scribes when you are actually right in any deed actually although the instructions were given to you at Hainai and when you are at Hainai right at Hainai although the instructions were given to you actually what is the decision in respect of the Sesame Aryamar ruled the possibility that it was removed and replaced by another lot is not to be taken into consideration Rabbana ruled it is to be taken into consideration and the law is that it is to be taken into consideration discord between him and her etc what is to be understood by discord between him and her of Judah replied in the name of Samuel when a wife says to her husband divorce me do not all women say this rather this is the meaning when she says to her husband you have divorced me then let her be believed on the strength of Arhamnon is ruling for Arhamnon ruled if a woman said to her husband you have divorced me she is believed for it is an established principle that no woman would dare to make such a false assertion in the presence of her husband here it is a case where she said you have divorced me in the presence of so and so and so and so who when asked stated that this had never happened what is the reason in case of discord Arhamnon explained because she is likely to tell a lie Arshimai be as she explained because she speaks from conjecture what is the practical difference between them Talmud Mas Yabamut be the practical difference between them arises in the case where the husband created the discord the question was raised what is the law in respect of one witness in a case of discord is the reason why one witnesses Elsewhere believed that he would not tell a lie which is likely to be exposed and consequently he would here also tell no lie or is it possible that the reason why one witness is believed elsewhere is that the woman herself makes careful inquiries and only then marries again here therefore his evidence should not be accepted since as there was discord between husband and wife she would not make careful inquiries and yet would marry again this remains undecided Arjuna said she is never etc. It was taught they said to Arjuna according to your statement only a woman of sound senses would be allowed to marry again while an imbecile would never be allowed to marry again but the fact is that the one as well as the other may be allowed to marry again a woman once came to Rabjuda's beth didn't warn they said to her for your husband rend your garments and loosen your hair did they teach her to simulate they themselves held the same view as the rabbis but in order that he also should Allow her to marry they advised her to do so Mishnah Bethilel stated we have heard such a tradition only in respect of a woman who came from the harvest and whose husband died in the same country the circumstances being the same as those of a case that once actually happened said Beth Shammai to them the law is the same whether the woman came from the harvest or from the olive picking or from the vintage or from one country to another for the sages spoke of the harvest only because the incident to which they referred occurred then Bethilel therefore changed their view thence forward to rule in accordance with the opinion of Beth Shammai Gemara it was taught Beth Shammai said to Bethilel according to your view one would only know the law concerning the wheat harvest whence however the law concerning the barley harvest and furthermore one would only know the law in the case where one harvested whence however the law in the case where one held a vintage picked. All its harvested dates or picked figs but you must admit it is only the original incident that occurred at harvest time and that the same law is applicable to all the other seasons so here also we maintain that the incident occurred with a husband who died in the same country and the same law is applicable to all other countries and Bethilel in the case of the same country where people freely move about she is afraid coming however from one country to another since people do not freely move about she is not afraid and Beth Shammai here also caravans frequently move about what was the original incident dash it was that of which Rab Judah spoke in the name of Samuel it was the end of the wheat harvest when ten men went to reap their wheat and a serpent bit one of them and he died of the wound his wife thereupon came and reported the incident to Beth Din who having sent to investigate found her statement to be true at that time it was ordained if a woman stated my husband is dead she may marry again if she said my husband is dead and left no issue she may contract the Levi rate marriage must it be suggested that Arhanania be Akadia and the rabbis differ on the same principle as that on which Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel differ for it was taught no man shall carry water of purification and ashes of purification across the Jordan on board a ship nor may one stand on the bank on one side and throw them across to the other side nor may one float them upon water nor may one carry them while riding on a beast or on the back of another man unless his own feet were touching the riverbed he may however convey them across a bridge these laws are applicable as well to the Jordan as to other rivers Arhanania be Akadia said they spoke only of the Jordan and of transport on board a ship as was the case in the original incident must it then be assumed that the rabbis hold the same view as Beth Shammai while Arhanania be Akadia holds the same View as Beth Hillel, the rabbis can answer you are ruling agrees with the view of Beth Hillel also for Beth Hillel maintain their opinion only there since the woman is believed only because she fears to tell an untruth and it is only in a place that is near that she fears while in a distant one she does not fear here however what matters it whether it is on the Jordan or on other rivers or Hanania Bia can also answer you I may uphold my view even according to Beth Shammai for Beth. Shammai maintain their opinion only there because a woman makes careful inquiries and only then marries again hence what matters it whether the locality was near or far here however the prohibition is due to an actual incident hence it is only against transport on the Jordan and on board a ship where the incident occurred that the rabbis enacted their preventive measure but against other rivers where the incident did not occur the rabbis enacted no preventive measure what was it? Incident it was that which Rab Judah related in the name of Rab a man was once transporting water of purification and ashes of purification across the Jordan on board a ship and a piece of a corpse of the size of an olive was found stuck in the bottom of the ship at that time it was ordained no man shall carry water of purification and ashes of purification across the Jordan on board a ship Mishnah Beth Shammai ruled she is permitted to marry again and she receives her Kethuba Beth Hillel. However ruled she is permitted to marry again but she does not receive her Kethuba said Beth Shammai to them you have permitted what might be the grave offense of illicit intercourse shall we not permit the taking of her husband's money which is of less importance Beth Hillel answered them we find Talmud, Mas Yavamatha that under evidence the brothers may not enter into their inheritance said Beth Shammai to them do we not learn this from her Kethuba scroll wherein her husband Prescribes for her if thou be married to another man thou will receive what is prescribed for thee thereupon Beth Hillel withdrew this opinion thenceforth rule in accordance with the view of Beth Shammai Gemara Arhista stated if she is taken in Levi marriage the lover enters into the inheritance on her evidence if they made an exposition on the Kethuba shall we not make an exposition on the Torah the all merciful said shall succeed in the name of his brother and he has surely succeeded. Arnaman ruled if a woman came before Beth Din and stated my husband is dead permit me to marry again permission must be granted her to marry again and she is given her Kethuba if she demanded give me my Kethuba she must not be permitted even to marry what is the reason because she came with her mind intent on the Kethuba the question was raised what is the ruling where she said permit me to marry and give me my Kethuba has she come with her mind intent on the Kethuba since she Specified her Kethuba or is it assumed that a person naturally lays before the Beth in all the claims he has and should you find a reason for deciding in her favor because a person submits whatever claim he has to the Beth in the question still remains as to what is the law where she stated give me my Kethuba and permit me to marry is it assumed that in this case she has undoubtedly come with her mind bent on the Kethuba or is it possible that she mentioned her Kethuba? Because she did not know by what means she becomes permitted to marry again this is undecided mission all are regarded as trustworthy to give evidence for her accepting her mother-in-law the daughter of her mother-in-law her rival her sister-in-law and her husband's daughter wherein lies the difference between the admissibility of a letter of divorce and that of the evidence of death in that the written document provides the proof tomorrow the question was raised what is the law in regard? To the e
Husband's daughter hates her father's wife since the former believes that she is squandering her mother's savings but why should a father's wife hate her husband's daughter why then does he add the two but this is the true explanation why does a daughter-in-law hate her mother-in-law because the latter reports to her son all that she does similarly a father's wife also hates her husband's daughter because the latter reports to her father all that she does and the rabbis as in water face. Answer right to face of so the heart of man to man and our Judah the text applies to the study of the words of the Torah our Ahabiyah said in the West they asked what is the ruling in respect of a potential mother-in-law does it occur to her that this woman's husband might die without issue and she would thereby be subject to the lover and therefore she hates her or does it not Talmud, Mas Yavamath become and here if a woman stated my husband died first and my father-in-law died after him she may marry again and she also receives her kathibah but her mother-in-law is forbidden now why is her mother-in-law forbidden is it not because it is assumed that neither her husband died nor did her father-in-law die and that by her statement she intended to damage the position of her mother-in-law hoping that as a result she would not in the future come to torment her there it may be different because she has experienced her annoyance mission if one witness stated the husband is dead and Thereupon his wife married again and another came and stated he is not dead she need not be divorced if one witness said he is dead and two witnesses said he is not dead she must even if she married again be divorced if two witnesses stated he is dead and one witness stated he is not dead she may even if she had not yet done so marry again tomorrow the reason then is because the woman married again had she however not married would she not have been permitted to marry but surely Allah stated wherever the Torah declared one witness credible he is regarded as two witnesses and the evidence of one man against that of two men has no validity it is this that was meant if one witness stated the husband is dead and after his wife had been permitted to marry again another came and stated he is not dead she is not to be deprived of her former status of permissibility if one witness said he is dead is this not obvious for the evidence of one man against that of two men has no validity this ruling is required only in the case of ineligible witnesses as being in accordance with the view of Arniyamai for it was taught Arniyamai stated wherever the Torah declares one witness credible the majority of statements is to be followed and the evidence of two women against that of one man is given the same validity as that of two men against one man and if you prefer I might reply wherever one eligible witness came first even a hundred women are regarded as one witness but here it is such a case as for example where a woman witness came in the first instance and the statement of Arniyamai is to be explained thus Arniyamai stated wherever the Torah declares one witness credible the majority of statements is to be followed and the evidence of two women against one woman is given the same validity as that of two men against one man but the evidence of two women against that of one man is regarded as half and half if two witnesses stated he is dead etc what does this teach us a ruling in respect of ineligible witnesses the principle being the same as that of Arniyamai who follows the majority of statements but is not this exactly the same as the previous clause it might have been assumed that the majority is followed only when the law is thereby made more stringent but not where it leads to a relaxation of the law hence we were taught the final clause Mishnah if one wife said her husband is dead and the other wife said he is not dead the one who said he is dead may marry again and she also receives her kefibah while the one who said he is not dead may neither marry again nor is she to receive her kefibah if one wife stated he is dead and the other stated he was killed Armeyer ruled since they contradict one another they may not marry again Arjuna and Arsimian ruled since both admit that he is not alive both may marry again if one witness stated he is dead and another witness stated he is not dead Talmud, Mas. Yavamathi or if one woman stated he is dead and another woman stated he is not dead she may not marry again tomorrow the reason then is because she said he is not dead had she however kept silent she would presumably have been allowed to marry again but it may be objected no rival may give evidence on behalf of her associate it was necessary to teach the case where the other wife said he is not dead since it might have been assumed that their husband was really dead and that by stating he is not dead she evidently intended to inflict injury upon her rival in the spirit of let me die with the Philistines we are informed that she is nevertheless forbidden to marry again if one wife stated he is dead etc our mayor should have expressed his disagreement in the first clause also our Eliezer replied the first clause is a subject in dispute and it represents the opinion of our Judah and our Simeon our Yohanan however stated that it may be said to represent even the view of our mayor for in such a case even Armeyer agrees since in the case of testimony relating to a woman the evidence of the nature of he is not dead is not regarded as a valid contradiction we learned if one witness stated he is dead and another witness stated he is not dead or if one woman stated he is dead and another woman stated he is not dead she may not marry again now according to our Eliezer it may well be explained that the anonymous statement in the final clause is in agreement with Armeyer according to our Yohanan however there is a difficulty this is a difficulty mission if a woman and her husband went to a country beyond the sea and she returned and stated my husband is dead she may be married again and she also receives her kathu but her rival however is forbidden if her rival was the daughter of an Israelite who was married to a priest she is permitted to eat Teramaso or Tarfan or Akiba however said this is not a way that would lead her out of the power of transgression unless it be enacted that she shall be forbidden both to marry and to eat Teramah if she stated my husband died first and my father-in-law died after him she may marry again and she also receives her kathibah but her mother-in-law's is forbidden if the latter was the daughter of an Israelite who was married to a priest she is permitted to eat Teramah so or Tarfan or Akiba however said this is not a way that would lead her out of the power of transgression unless it be enacted that she shall be forbidden both to marry again and to eat Teramah Gemara and both statements were necessary for if the first only had been stated it might have been assumed that only in that did and Tarfan maintain his view since the grievance is personal but that in respect of a mother-in-law the grievance against whom is merely general he agrees with and Akiba and had the latter only been stated it might have been assumed that our Akiba maintained his view there only but that in the former case he agrees with our Tarfan. Hence both statements were necessary. Rab Judah stated in the name of Samuel the Halacha is in agreement with Artarfan said Abbe we also learned the same if a woman states a son was given to me in a country beyond the sea and my son died first while my husband died after him she is believed if however she states my husband died first and my son died after him she is not believed though note must be taken of her statement and she must therefore perform halizah but may not contract it. Levirate marriage from which it follows that note must be taken of her statement but that no note need be taken of the statement of a rival thus our point is proved Talmud. Mas Yabamath Bimishnah if a man betrothed one of five women and he does not know which of them he has betrothed and each states he has betrothed me he gives a letter of divorce to every one of them and leaving the Kathub among them withdraw so Artarfan or Akiba however said this is not a way that would take one out of. The power of transgression unless one gives to each of them both a letter of divorce and her kathibah if a man robbed one of five persons and does not know which of them he has robbed and each one states he has robbed me he leaves the amount of the robbery among them and withdraws so our tarfan or akibah however stated this is not a way that would lead one out of the power of sin unless one pays the full amount of the robbery to every one of the persons involved Gemara since betrothed was stated and not cohabited and since robbed was stated and not bought whose view it may be asked is represented in our mission neither apparently that of the first tana nor that of our simian b Eliezer for it was taught our simian b Eliezer stated that our tarfan and our akibah did not differ on the ruling that where a man betrothed one of five women and he does not know which of them he betrothed he leaves the kathibah among them and withdraws they differ only in the case where cohabitation Occurred our Tarfan ruling that the man leaves the Kathuba among them and withdraws while our Akiba ruled that the man is not exempt from transgression unless he pays every one of them our Tarfan and our Akiba furthermore did not differ on the ruling that where a person bought something from five men and does not know from which of them he bought he may leave the price of the purchase among them and depart they differ only in the case where a person robbed one of five men our Tarfan ruling that the man must deposit the amount of the robbery among them and may then depart while our Akiba ruled that the man is not exonerated unless he pays the amount of the robbery to everyone now since our Simeon B. Eliezer said that they do not differ in the case where a man betrothed or purchased it may be inferred that the first tana is of the opinion that they did differ whose view then is presented in our mission if it is that of the first tana
country beyond the sea and she also asserts my son died and afterwards my husband died she is believed if however she states my husband died and afterwards my son died she is not believed but note is taken of her assertion and she must therefore perform halizah but may not contract leave irate marriage if a woman states a brother-in-law was given to me while I was in a country beyond the sea and she also states my husband died and afterwards my brother-in-law died or my brother-in-law died and afterwards my husband died she is believed if a woman and her husband and her brother-in-law went to a country beyond the sea and she on returning home stated my husband died and afterwards my brother-in-law died or my brother-in-law died and afterwards my husband died she is not believed for a woman is not to be believed when she asserts my brother-in-law is dead in order that she may marry again or when she states that her sister is dead in order that she may enter his house a man also is not believed when he asserts my brother is dead so that he may contract liberate marriage with his wife nor when he asserts that his wife is dead in order that he may marry her sister Gamara inquired of Arnaman what is the legal position if a husband transferred to his wife through an agent the possession of a letter of divorce where a brother-in-law is in existence is a divorce since she usually hates her brother-in-law and advantage to her and consequently valid because a privilege may be conferred upon a person in his absence or is it possible that the divorce since she sometimes loves her brother-in-law is a disadvantage to her and consequently invalid because no disadvantage may be imposed upon a person in his absence the other replied we have learned this note is taken of her assertion and she must therefore perform Elizabeth may not contract the Levirate marriage said Rabbanit Rabba what is the legal decision if a husband transferred to his wife through an agent the possession of a letter of divorce at a time when a quarrel raged between them is the divorce since she has a quarrel with her husband an advantage to her or is it a disadvantage since the gratification of bodily desires is possibly preferred by her come and hear what Rush Lakish said it is preferable to live in grief than to dwell in widowhood Abbe said with a husband of the size of an ant her seat is placed among the great our papa said over Husband be a carter she calls him to the threshold and sits down at his side or as she said if her husband is only a cabbage head she requires no lentils for her pot attended taught all such women play the harlot and attribute the results to their husband's Talmud. Masya Bamatha chapter 16 mission a woman whose husband and rival went to a country beyond the sea and to whom people came and said your husband is dead must neither marry again nor contract leave irate marriage until she has ascertained whether her rival is pregnant if she had a mother-in-law she need not apprehend the possibility of the birth of another son but if she departed while pregnant such possibility must be taken into consideration our Joshua rule she need not apprehend such a possibility tomorrow what is implied by her rival it is this that we are told the possibility of the birth in respect of that rival need be apprehended in respect of another rival however it need not be apprehended must neither Marry again nor contract leave irate marriage etc. It is quite proper that she shall not contract leave irate marriage since it is possible that her rival is pregnant and that she would in consequence cause an infringement of the prohibition against marriage of a brother's wife which is pentacle but why should she not marry a stranger the majority of women should be taken as a criterion and the majority of women conceive and bear children must it then be assumed that the ruling is that of our who takes a minority also into consideration it may even be said to represent the view of the rabbis for the rabbis follow the majority principle only where the majority is actually present as for instance in the case of nine shops and sanhedrin but in respect of a majority that is not actually present the rabbis were not guided by the majority principle behold the case of a minor boy and a minor girl where the majority is one that is not actually present and the rabbis nevertheless Follow the majority principle for it was taught a minor whether male or female may neither perform nor submit to Eliza nor may he contract leave irate marriage so our mayor they said to our mayor you spoke well when you ruled that he may neither perform nor submit to Eliza since in the Pentateuch section man was written and we draw a comparison between woman and man what however is the reason why he may not contract leave irate marriage he replied because a minor male might be found to be a sorry say. Minor female might be found to be incapable of procreation and thus the law of incest would be violated the rabbis however maintain follow the majority of male minors and the majority of male minors are not sars and follow the majority of female minors and the majority of female minors are not incapable of procreation but clearly it must be admitted our mission represents the view of our mayor how have you explained it that it is in agreement with the view of our mayor read in the final clause if she had a mother in law, she need not apprehend the possibility of the birth of another son, but why one should be guided by the majority of women and the majority of women conceive and bear while a minority miscarry, and since all those who bear produce a half of males and a half of females, the minority of those who miscarry should be added to the half of those who bear females, and so the males would constitute a minority which should be taken into consideration. It is possible that since the woman was confirmed in her status of permissibility to strangers, the possibility of the birth of a lover was not taken by him into consideration in the first clause, then where she was confirmed in the status of eligibility for the Levi marriage letter contract, the Levi marriage Arnaman replied in the name of Rabbi Abba in the first clause where a prohibition which is subject to the penalty of Karath is involved, the possibility of the birth of a son had to be provided. Against in the final clause, however, where a prohibitory law only is involved, no such possibility was taken into consideration. Said Rabbi, consider the one prohibition is pentatical and the other also is pentatical. What matters it then whether the prohibition is one involving Karath or whether it is only a mere prohibitory law? Rather, said Rabbi Talmud, Masya Bamath B. In the first clause, the woman's confirmed status would subject her to the Levirate marriage while the majority principle would enable her to marry any stranger. And though confirmed status is not as important a factor as a majority, the minority of women who miscarry must be added to the confirmed status so that the factors on either side are equally balanced. Hence, she must neither marry again nor contract Levirate marriage. In the final clause, however, the woman's confirmed status as well as the majority principle points to the permissibility of marriage with any stranger so that viable males. Constitute a minority of a minority and a minority of a minority is not taken into consideration even by our mayor must neither marry again nor contract leave irate marriage etc. Forever Zeir I replied she waits on account of herself three months and on account of her associate nine and then she may at all events perform Halizah Arhanna said on account of herself she must wait three months but on account of her associate forever but let her perform Halizah at all events both Abbe B. Abin and Arhanna B. Abin replied this is a preventive measure against the possibility that the child might be viable as a result of which you would have to subject her to the necessity of a public announcement in respect of the priesthood well let her be subjected to the necessity it may happen that someone would be present at the Halizah and not at the announcement and he would form the opinion that Halizah was permitted to a priest we learned if a woman states a son was given to me while I was in a country beyond the sea and she also asserts my son died and afterwards my husband died she is believed if she states however my husband died and afterwards my son died she is not believed but note is taken of her assertion and she must therefore perform Eliza but may not contract leave irate marriage let it however be apprehended that witnesses might come and confirm her statement and that as a result you would subject her to the necessity of an announcement in respect of the priesthood. Our papa replied this refers to a woman divorced our high son of our whom I replied it refers to one who stated I and he were hidden in a cave mission in the case of two sisters in law one of whom stated my husband is dead and the other also stated my husband is dead the former is forbidden on account of the husband of the latter and the latter is forbidden on account of the husband of the former if the one had witnesses and the other had no witnesses she who had the witnesses is forbidden while she who had no witnesses is permitted if the one had children and the other had no children she who had children is permitted and she who had no children is forbidden if they contracted leave irate marriages and the lovers died they are forbidden to marry again our Eliezer ruled since they were once permitted to marry the lovers they are permitted to marry any man Gamara attended taught if the one had witnesses and also children and the other had neither witnesses nor children both are permitted to marry again if they contracted leave irate marriages and the lovers died they are forbidden to marry again our Eliezer ruled since they were once permitted to the lovers they are permitted to marry any man Rabba inquired what is our Eliezer's reason is it because he is of the opinion that a rival is eligible to tender evidence in favor of her associate or is it because he holds that she would not cause injury to herself what practical difference is
Consequently, it must be concluded that our Eliezer's reason is because she herself had married again and she would not cause injury to herself. Our Eliezer may have argued on the basis of the view of the rabbis. According to my view, he may have said, in effect, a rival is eligible to tender evidence in favor of her associate, and even if she herself did not remarry, the other may be allowed to marry again. According to your view, however, you must at least agree with me that where she herself remarried, the other also should be allowed to marry again, since she would naturally not injure herself and the rabbis. She might be acting in the spirit of let me die with the Philistines. Come and here, if a woman and her husband went to a country beyond the sea and she returned and stated, my husband is dead, she may be married again and she also receives her kathug of her rival. However, is forbidden. Our Eliezer ruled since she becomes permitted, her rival also becomes permitted. Read since she was permitted. And she married again. Let it, however, be apprehended that she may have returned with a letter of divorce, and that the reason why she made her statement is because it was her intention to injure her rival. If she was married to an Israelite, this would be so indeed. But here we are dealing with one who married a priest. Mission evidence of identity may be legally tendered only on proof afforded by the full face with the nose, though there were also marks on the man's body or clothing. No evidence of a man's death may be tendered before his soul has departed, even though the witnesses have seen him with his arteries cut or crucified or being devoured by a wild beast. Evidence of identification may be tendered by those only who saw the corpse within three days after death. Our Judah Baba, however, said neither all men nor all places nor all seasons are alike. Mara, our rabbis taught evidence of identification may be tendered only on proof afforded by the forehead without the face. Or the face without the forehead, both together with the nose, must be present. Abbe, or it might be said, Arkahana stated, "What is the scriptural proof? The shoe of their countenance doth witness against them." Abu Martha, otherwise Abu Menumi, was being pressed for the payment of some money by the people of the Exilarch's house, taking some wax. He smeared it on a piece of rag and stuck it upon his forehead. He passed before them, and they did not recognize him, though there were also marks, etc. Does this imply that identification marks are not valid? Pentateuch, Ali, a contradiction surely may be pointed out if he found it tied to a bag, a purse, or a seal ring, or if it was found among his furniture. Even after a long time, it is valid. Abbe replied, "This is no difficulty. The one is the view of our Eliezer Bimahiba, while the other is that of the rabbis, for it was taught no evidence of identification by a mole. May he legally tendered our Eliezer Bimahiba ruled such evidence may be legally." Tender do they not differ on the following principle that one master is of the opinion that identification marks are valid Pentateuch ally while the other master is of the opinion that identification marks are only rabbinically valid said Rabbah all agree that identification marks are valid Pentateuch ally but here they differ on the question whether it is common for the same kind of mole to be found on persons of simultaneous birth one master is of the opinion that it is common for the same kind of mole to be found on persons of simultaneous birth and the other master is of the opinion that it is not common for the same kind of mole to be found on persons of simultaneous birth others say their point of difference here is whether a mole usually undergoes a change after one's death one master is of the opinion that it usually undergoes a change after one's death and the other master is of the opinion that it does not usually undergo a change after one's death others maintain that Rabbi said all agree that identification marks are only rabbinically valid but here it is on the question whether a mole Talmud, Mas Yabamut B constitutes a distinct identification mark that they differ one master is of the opinion that it constitutes a distinct identification mark and the other master is of the opinion that it does not constitute a distinct identification mark with reference to the version according to which Rabbi stated that identification marks are valid Pentateuch Allah. The objection might be raised surely it was taught though there were also marks on the man's body or clothing as to the body the marks indicated by the witnesses were only that the corpse was long or short and as to one's clothing no reliability can be placed upon their identification since borrowing might be apprehended if however borrowing is to be apprehended how could we allow the return of an ass on the strength of the identification marks of a saddle people do not borrow a saddle. Because it makes the back of the ass or where one found it tied to a bag of purse or a seal ring how do we allow its return as to a seal ring one is afraid of forgery as to one's bag and purse people are superstitious and do not lend such objects and if you prefer I might say that the identification marks of one's clothing consisted in a statement that they were white or red even though the witnesses have seen him with his arteries cut etc. This then implies that a man whose arteries have been cut may live but this is inconsistent with the following a person does not cause defilement before his soul has departed even though his arteries had been cut and even though he is in a dying condition thus it follows that it is only defilement that he does not cause but that it is impossible for him to live they replied this is no difficulty the one represents the view of our Simeon B. Eliezer the other that of the rabbis for it was taught evidence may be legally tendered on the death. Of a person whose arteries were cut, but no such evidence may be tendered concerning one crucified. Our Simeon B. Eliezer ruled no such evidence may be legally tendered even concerning one whose arteries were cut because the wounds might be cauterized and the man may survive. Can this, however, be reconciled with the views of Our Simeon B. Eliezer? Surely, in the final clause, it was taught it once happened at Asia that a man was lowered into the sea and only his leg was brought up, and the sages ruled. If the recovered leg contained the part above the knee, the man's wife may marry again, but if it contained only the part below the knee, she may not remarry. Waters are different since they irritate the wound, but surely Rabbi B. Barhan related, I myself have seen an Arab merchant who took hold of a sword and cut open the arteries of his camel, but this did not cause it to cease its cry. They replied that camel was a lean animal. Rabbi replied, the operation was performed with a glowing hot. Knife and this is in agreement with the opinion of all were being devoured by wild beasts etc. Rab Judah stated in the name of Samuel this has been taught only in the case where the attack was not on a vital organ but where it was on a vital organ evidence may be legally tendered. Rab Judah further stated in the name of Samuel if a person whose two organs or the greater part of them were cut escaped evidence of his death may be legally tendered but this cannot be for surely Rab Judah stated in the name of Samuel if a man whose two organs or the greater part of them were cut indicated by gestures write a letter of divorce for my wife such document is to be written and delivered to his wife he is alive but will eventually die if this is so one should go into exile on account of him while in fact it was taught if a man cut unwittingly the two or the greater part of the two organs of another man he is not to go into exile surely in connection with this it was stated that R. Hashai explained the possibility must be taken into consideration that the wound might have aggravated the wound or that he himself also made Talmud, Masi of have brought on his death what is the practical difference between these two explanations the case where one cut another man's organs in a house of marble and the latter made some convulsive movements or also where he cut his organs out of doors and the latter made no convulsive movements our Judah said not all etc. The question was raised does our Judah Baba differ from the first Tana in relaxing the law or does he differ from him in imposing a greater restriction come and here a man was once drowned at Karmai and after three days he was hauled up at the Hidaya and Ardimi of Nihardia allowed his wife to remarry and again it happened that a man was drowned in the Tigris and after five days he was hauled up to the Shabistana bridge and on the evidence of the Shishbin Rabba permitted his wife to marry again. Now, if you grant that he differs from the first Tana in relaxing the law, he might well have acted in accordance with the ruling of Arjuna B. Baba. If you should contend, however, that he differed in imposing a greater restriction in accordance with whose view it may be asked, did they act? Waters are different because they cause contraction, but surely you said that waters are different since they irritate the wound that applies only where a wound exists, but where no wound exists, waters cause contraction. This furthermore applies only where the witnesses saw the body as soon as it was brought up, but if it remains some time, it swells mission. If a man fell into the water, whether it had a visible end or not, his wife is forbidden to marry again. Said Armaier, it once happened that a man fell into a large cistern and rose to the surface after three days. Said Arjuna, it once happened that a blind man descended into a cave to perform ritual ablution while his guide went down after him. And after waiting long enough for their souls to depart, permission was given to their wives to marry again. Another incident occurred at Asia where a man was lowered into the sea and only his leg was brought up, and the sages ruled if the recovered leg contained the part above the knee
Visible and what end did the master of the ask act in such a manner I was really mistaken he replied I was of the opinion that as the water was gathered and stationary it was to be regarded as water which has a visible end but the law is in fact not so for owing to the prevailing waves it might well be assumed that the waves carried the body away Samuel thereupon applied to Rab the scriptural text there shall no mischief befall the righteous while Rab applied to Samuel the following text but in the multitude of counselors there is safety it was taught Rabbi related how it once happened that while two men were casting nets in the Jordan one of them entered a subterranean fish pond and when the sun had set he could not find the entrance of the cave his companion after waiting long enough for his soul to depart returned and reported the accident to his household on the following day when the sun rose the first man discovered the entrance of the cave and on returning he Found his household in deep mourning how great exclaimed Rabbi are the words of the sages who ruled that if a man fell into water which has a visible end his wife is permitted to marry again but if into water which has no visible end his wife is forbidden if so then also in the case of water which has a visible end the possibility of having remained in a subterranean fish pond should be taken into consideration it is not usual for a subterranean fish pond to be found with water which has a visible end Rashi said the ruling of the rabbis that where a man has fallen into water which has no visible end his wife is forbidden to marry again applies only to an ordinary person but not to a learned man for should he be rescued the fact would become known this however is not correct for there is no difference between an ordinary man and a learned man ex post facto the marriage is valid of an issue it is forbidden it was taught our Gamaliel related I was once traveling on board. A ship when I observed the shipwreck and was sorely grieved for the apparent loss of a scholar who had been traveling on board that ship and who was here Akiba when I subsequently landed he came to me and sat down and discussed matters of Halish on my son I asked him who rescued you the plank of a ship he answered me came my way and to every wave that approached me I bent my head hence the sages said that if wicked persons attack a man let him bend his head to them at that hour I exclaimed how significant are the words of the stages who ruled that if a man fell into water which has a visible end his wife is permitted to marry again but if into water which has no visible end she is forbidden it was taught our Akiba related I was once traveling on board a ship when I observed the ship in distress and was much grieved on account of a scholar who was on attend who was at our mayor when I subsequently landed in the province of Cappadocia he came to me and sat down and Discussed matters of Halach my son El said to him who rescued you one wave he answered me tossed me to another and the other to yet another until the sea cast me on the dry land at that hour I exclaimed how significant are the words of the sages who ruled that if a man fell into water which has a visible end his wife is permitted to marry again but if into water which has no visible end she is forbidden our rabbis taught if a man fell into a lion's den no evidence may be legally tendered concerning him but if into a pitful of serpents and scorpions evidence may legally be tendered concerning him or Judah be there a rule even if he fell into a pitful of serpents and scorpions no evidence may legally be tendered concerning him since the possibility must be taken into consideration Talmud Mas be that he might be a charmer but the first ten owing to the pressure they injure him our rabbis taught if a man fell into a burning furnace evidence may be legally tendered concerning him and also if he fell into a boiler that was full of boiling wine or oil evidence may be legally tendered concerning him in the name of our Ahad it was stated if the man fell into a hot boiler of oil evidence may legally be tendered concerning him because it adds fuel to the fire but if into one of wine no evidence may legally be tendered concerning him because it extinguishes the fire they however said to him at first it extinguishes the fire to a certain extent but eventually it causes it to burn with greater vehemence said Armaeur it once happened that a man fell into a large cistern etc it was taught they said to Armaeur miracles cannot be mentioned as proof what did they mean by miracles if it be suggested because he neither eats nor drinks surely it may be pointed out it is written in scripture and fast yet for me and neither eat nor drink three days rather because he does not sleep for our Yohan and stated a man who said I Take an oath that I will not sleep for three days is to be flogged and he may sleep at once what then is our mayor's reason Arkahana replied there were arches above arches and the rabbis they were of marble and our mayor it is hardly possible that the man did not hang on to the arches and doze a while our rabbis taught it once happened that the daughter of Nehonia the well digger fell into a large cistern and people went and reported the accident to our Hannah Bidosa during the first hour he said to them all is well in the second hour he again said all is well in the third he said to them she is saved my daughter he asked her who saved you Ram came to my help with an aged man leading it are you the people asked him a prophet I am he replied neither prophet nor the son of a prophet but should the beneficent work in which the righteous is engaged be the cause of disaster to his seed our Abba stated his son nevertheless died of thirst for it is said in scripture and round about. Him it stormeth mightily which teaches that the Holy One blessed be he deals strictly with those round about him even to a hair's breadth our Hannah said proof may be a dis from here God dreaded in the great council of the Holy Ones and feared of all them that are round about him mission even a man only heard women saying so and so is dead this should suffice for him our Judah said even if he only heard children say behold we are going to mourn for a man named so and so and to bury him it is sufficient whether such statement was made with the intention of tendering evidence or was made with no such intention it is valid our Judah be Baba said with an Israelite the evidence is valid even if the man had the intention of acting as witness in the case of an idolater however the evidence is invalid if his intention was to act as witness Gemara is it not possible that they did not go Rab Judah replied in the name of Samuel our Misha deals with the case where they say Behold we are returning from the morning for and the burial of so and so was it not possible that a mere ant had died and that the children gave it the man's name it is a case where they say such and such rabbis were there or such and such funeral orders were there in the case of an idolater however if his intention was etc said Rab Judah in the name of Samuel this was taught only in the case where it was his intention to enable the woman to be permitted but if his intention was merely to give evidence his testimony is valid how could this be ascertained our Joseph replied if he came to Bethdin and stated so and so is dead allow his wife to marry again such evidence is one where his intention was to enable the woman to be permitted but if he stated he is dead and nothing more his intention was merely to give evidence so it was also stated Rush Lakish said this was taught only in the case where it was his intention to enable the woman to be permitted but if his intention was merely to give evidence his testimony is valid said our Yohanan to him did it not happen with Ashai Birabai that he opposed 85 elders saying to them that this was taught only in the case where it was his intention to enable the woman to be permitted but if his intention was merely to give evidence his testimony is valid but the sages did not agree with him but according to the ruling in our mission that in the case of an idolater however the evidence is invalid if his intention was to act as witness how is it possible for the idolater's testimony ever to be accepted where he makes a statement at random as was the case where one went about saying who of the family of Hiwai is here who is here of the family of Hiwai Hiwai is dead and our Joseph allowed his wife to marry again a man once went about saying alas for the valiant rider who was at Pumadai before he is dead and our Joseph or it might be said Rabbi allowed his wife to marry again a man once went about saying who of the family of Hasa is here Hasa is drowned on hearing this Arnaman exclaimed by God the fish must have eaten Hasa up relying on Arnaman's exclamation Hasa's wife went and married again and no objection was raised against her action said Arashi from this it may be inferred that the ruling of the rabbis that if a man had fallen into water which had no visible end his wife is forbidden to marry again applies only of an issue but if someone had already married her she is not to be taken away from him others read Arnaman allowed his wife to marry again for he said Hasa was a great man and had he come up out of the water his rescue would have become known the law however is not so for there is no difference between a great man and one who is not great in either case it is permitted ex post facto and forbidden of an issue a certain idolater once said to an Israelite cut some grass and throw it to my cattle on the Sabbath if not I will kill you as I have killed so and so that son of an Israelite to whom I said cook for me a dish on the Sabbath and whom as he did not cook for me I killed his wife heard this and came to Abay as he kept her waiting Talmud. Mas Yabamatha for three festivals are at Abay Ahabah said to her apply to our Joseph whose knife is sharp when she came to him he decided her case by deduction
Light or in moonlight and a woman may be given permission to marry again on the evidence of a mere voice it once happened that a man was standing on the top of a hill and cried so and so son of so and so of such and such a place is dead but when they went to the top of the hill they found no one there his wife however was permitted to remarry again it happened at Dalman that a man declared I am so and so son of so and so a serpent has bitten me and I am dying and though when they went to examine the corpse they did not recognize him they nevertheless permitted his wife to remarry tomorrow Rabbi B. Samuel stated attended taught that Beth Shammai ruled that a woman may not be permitted to marry again on the evidence of a mere voice and Beth Hillel ruled that she may be permitted to marry again on the evidence of a mere voice what does he teach us this surely is the ruling in our mission it is this that he teaches us should an anonymous statement be found that a woman in such Circumstances is not permitted to marry again. That statement would represent the view of Beth Shammai, but when they went, they found no one. Is it not possible that it was a demon that cried? Rab Judah replied in the name of Rab. This is a case where they saw in him the likeness of a man, but they also are in the likeness of men. They saw his shadow, but these also have a shadow. They saw a shadow of his shadow. Is it not possible that these also cast a shadow of a shadow? Our Hannah replied. The demon Jonathan told me that they have a shadow, but not a shadow of a shadow. Is it not possible that it was a rival that cried? Atana at the school of Arishmael taught that at a time of danger, a letter of divorce may be written and delivered to the woman, even if the husband who gave the instructions is unknown to the witnesses. Mishnah Arakiba stated when I went down to Nihardia to intercal the year, I met Nehemiah of Beth Deli, who said to me, I heard that in the land of Israel. No one with the exception of our Judah Bibaba permits a married woman to marry again on the evidence of one witness that is so I told him tell them he said to me in my name you know that this country is in confusion by reason of raiders I have this tradition from Argamaliel the elder that a married woman may be allowed to marry again on the evidence of one witness and when I came and recounted the conversation in the presence of Argamaliel he rejoiced at my information and exclaimed we have found a colleague for our Judah Bibaba as a result of this talk Argamaliel recollected that some men were once killed at Tel Arza and that Argamaliel the elder had allowed their wives to marry again on the evidence of one witness and the law was established that a woman shall be allowed to marry again on the evidence of one witness who states that he has heard the report from another witness from a slave from a woman or from a bond woman or Eliza and our Joshua ruled a woman may not be Allowed to marry again on the evidence of one witness, our Akiva ruled a woman is not allowed to marry again on the evidence of a woman on that of a slave on that of a bond woman or on that of relatives. Kamara is our Akiva then of the opinion that on the evidence of a woman a wife is not permitted to marry again. Surely it was taught our Simeon B. Eliezer stated in the name of our Akiva that a woman is eligible to bring her own letter of divorce is inferred to minority admages if those women concerning whom the rabbis ruled that they are not believed when they state her husband is dead are nevertheless eligible to bring her a letter of divorce. How much more reasonable is it that this woman who is believed when she states that her own husband is dead should be eligible to bring her own letter of divorce? Thus it follows that only those women of whom the rabbis have spoken are not believed, but any other woman is believed. This is no difficulty. One ruling was made before the law. Had been established the other after the law had been established Mishnah they said to him it once happened that a number of Levites went to Zor the city of Palms and one of them who fell ill was taken by them into an inn when they returned they asked the innkeeper where is our friend and she replied he is dead and I buried him and it was on this evidence that his wife was permitted to marry again should not then a priest's wife be believed at least as much as the innkeeper he answered. Then when she will be giving such evidence as the innkeeper she will be believed the innkeeper as a matter of fact had brought out to them his staff his bag and the scroll of the law which he had with him Talmud, Mas Yabamath Bigamara what was the inferiority of the innkeeper Arkahana replied she was an innkeeper who was an idolatrous and she said at random this is his staff and this is his bag and this is the grave wherein I buried him so it was also recited by Abba the son of Armenu Hi, she was an innkeeper who was an idolatress, and she said at random, This is his staff, and this is his bag, and this is the grave wherein I buried him. But surely they had asked her, Where is our friend? When she saw them, she began to cry, and when they asked her, Where is our friend? She replied, He died, and I'll bury him. Our rabbis taught it once occurred that a man came to give evidence on behalf of a woman before our tarfan. My son, the master, said to him, What do you know concerning the evidence? For this woman, I and he, the other replied, were going on the same road, and when a raiding gang pursued us, he grasped the branch of an olive tree, pulled it down, and made the gang turn back. Lion, I said to him, I thank you. Whence did you know he asked that my name was Lion? So in fact, I am called in my hometown, Lohan, and son of our Jonathan, the Lion of Farshia, and after some time he fell ill and died, and on this evidence, our tarfan permitted his wife to marry again, does not our tarfan. However, hold that inquiry and examination are necessary. Surely it was taught it once happened that a man came before our Tarfan to give evidence on behalf of a woman. My son, he said to him, What do you know concerning this evidence? I and he, the other replied, We're going on the same road, and when a raiding gang pursued us, he grasped the branch of a fig tree, pulled it down, and drove the gang back. I thank you, Lion. I said to him, and he replied, You have correctly guessed my name, for so I am called in. My hometown, Yohanan, son of Jonathan, the Lion of Farshia, and after some time he died, the master said to him, Did you not tell me thus, Yohanan, son of Jonathan of Farshia, the Lion? No, the other replied, But it is this that I told you, Yohanan, son of Jonathan, the Lion of Farshia, having examined him closely two or three times, and the man's replies invariably agreeing, our Tarfan permitted his wife to marry again. This is a point in dispute between Tanaim, for it was taught witnesses. On matrimonial matters are not to be subjected to inquiry and examination. These are the words of our Akiva Artarfan. However, ruled they are to be subjected and they differ in respect of a ruling of our Hannah. For our Hannah stated Pentateuch Allah, both monetary and capital cases must be conducted with inquiry and examination. For it is said, Ye shall have one manner of law. What then is the reason why they have ordained that monetary cases do not require inquiry and examination in order that you should not lock the door in the face of borrowers? And it is on this principle that they differ. One master is of the opinion that since the woman has a kathuba to receive such cases are on a PAR with those of monetary matters, while the other master is of the opinion that since we are thereby permitting a married woman to marry a stranger, such cases are on a PAR with capital cases. Releaser said in the name of our Hannah scholars, increase peace in the world, for it is said in the scriptures, and all that children shall be to taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of that